introduction to the book of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of life by upton sinclair introductory the writer of this book has been in this world some 42 years this may not seem long to some but it is long enough to have made many painful mistakes and to have learned much from them looking about him he sees others making the same mistakes suffering for lack of that same knowledge which he has so painfully acquired this being the case it seems a friendly act to offer his knowledge minus the blunders and pain there come to the writer literally thousands of letters every year asking him questions some of them of the strangest a man is dying of cancer and do i think it can be cured by a fast a man is unable to make his wife happy and can i tell him what is the matter with women a man has invested his savings in mining stock and can i tell him what to do about it a man works in a sweatshop and has only a little time for self-improvement and will i tell him what books he ought to read many such questions every day make one aware of a vast mass of people earnest hungry for happiness and groping as if in a fog the things they most need to know they are not taught in the schools nor in the newspapers they read nor in the church they attend of these agencies the first is not entirely competent the second is not entirely honest and the third is not entirely up to date nor is there anywhere a book in which the effort has been made to give everyday human beings the everyday information they need for successful living of their lives for the present book the following claims may be made first it is a modern book its writer watches hour by hour the new achievements of the human mind he reaches out for information about them he seeks to adjust his own thoughts to them and to test them in his own living second it is or tries hard to be a wise book its writer is not among those too ardent young radicals who leap to the conclusion that because many old things are stupid and tiresome therefore everything that is old is to be spurned with contempt and everything that proclaims itself new is to be taken at its own valuation third it is an honest book its writer will not pretend to know what he only guesses and where it is necessary to guess he will say so frankly finally it is a kind book it is not written for its author's glory nor for his enrichment but to tell you things that may be useful to you in the brief span of your life it will attempt to tell you how to live how to find health and happiness and success how to work and how to play how to eat and how to sleep how to love and to marry and to care for your children how to deal with your fellow men in business and politics and social life how to act and how to think what religion to believe what art to enjoy what books to read a large order as the boys phrase it there are several ways for such a book to begin it might begin with the child because we all begin that way it might begin with love because that precedes the child it might begin with the care of the body explaining that sound physical health is the basis of all right living and even of right thinking it might begin as most philosophies do by defining life discussing its origin and fundamental nature the trouble with this last plan is that there are a lot of people who have their ideas on life made up in tabloid form they have creeds and catechisms which they know by heart and if you suggest to them anything different they give you a startled look and get out of your way and then there is another and in our modern world a still larger class who say oh shucks i don't go in for religion and that kind of thing 
you offer them something that looks like a sermon, and they turn to the baseball page. Who will read this book of life? There will be, among others, the great American tired businessman. He wrestles with problems and cares all day, and when he sits down to read in the evening, he says, make it short and snappy. There is the wife of the tired businessman, the American perfect lady. She does most of the reading for the family, but she has never got down to anything fundamental in her life, and mostly she likes to read about exciting love affairs, which she distinguishes from the unexciting kind. She knows by the word romance. Then there is the still more tired American working man, who has been speeded up all day under the bonus system or the piecework system, and is apt to fall asleep in his chair before he finishes supper. Then there is the working man's wife, who has slaved all day in the kitchen, and has a chance for a few minutes' intimacy with her husband before he falls asleep. She would like to have something tell her what to do for croup, but she is not sure that she has time to discuss the question whether life is worth living. Yet, I wonder, is there a single one among all these tired people, or even among the cynical people, who has not had some moment of awe when the thought came stabbing into his mind like a knife? What a strange thing this life is! What am I, anyhow? Where do I come from, and what is going to become of me? What do I mean? What am I here for? I have sat chatting with three hobos by a railroad track, cooking themselves a mulligan in an old can, and heard one of them say, By God, it's a queer thing, ain't it, mate? I've sat on the deck of a ship, looking out over the midnight ocean and talking with a sailor, and heard him use almost the identical words. It is not only in the classroom and the schools that the minds of men are grappling with the fundamental problems. In fact, it was not from the schools that the new religions and the great moral impulses of humanity took their origin. It was from lonely shepherds sitting on the hillsides, and from fishermen casting their nets, and from carpenters and tailors and shoemakers at their benches. Stop and think a bit, and you will realize it does make a difference what you believe about life, how it comes to be, where it is going, and what is your place in it? Is there a heaven with a God who watches you day and night and knows every thought you think, and will some day take you to a eternal bliss if you obey his laws? If you really believe that, you will try to find out about his laws, and you will be comparatively little concerned about the success or failure of your business. Perhaps, on the other hand, you have knocked about in the world and have lost your faith. You have been cheated and exploited and have set out to get yours, as the phrase is, to feather your own nest. But some gust of passion seizes you and you waste your substance. You wreck your life. Then you wonder, who set that trap and baited it? Am I a creature of blind instincts, jealousies and greeds and hates beyond my own control entirely? Am I a poor, feeble insect, blown about in a storm and smashed? Or do I make this storm? And can I in any part control it? No matter how busy you may be, no matter how tired you may be, it will pay you to get such things straight, to know a little of what the wise men of the past have thought about them, and more especially what science with its new tools of knowledge may have discovered. The writer of this book spent nine years of his life in colleges and universities. Also, he was brought up in a church. So he knows the orthodox teachings. He can say that he has given to the recognized wise men of all the world every opportunity to tell him what they know. Then, being dissatisfied, he went to the unrecognized teachers, the enthusiasts, and the cranks of a hundred schools. Finally, he thought for himself. He was even willing to try experiments upon himself. As a result, 
he has not found what he claims is ultimate or final truth but he has what he might describe as a rough working draft a practical outline good for everyday purposes he is going to have confidence enough in you the reader to give you the hardest part first that is to begin with the great fundamental questions what is life and how does it come to be what does it mean and what have we to do with it are we its masters or its slaves what does it owe us and what do we owe to it why is it so hard and do we have to stand its hardness and can we really know about all these matters or will we be only guessing can we trust ourselves to think about them or shall we be safer if we believe what we are told shall we be punished if we think wrong and how shall we be punished shall we be rewarded if we think right and will the pay be worth the trouble such questions as these i am going to try to answer in the simplest language possible i would like to avoid long words altogether if i could but some of these long words mean certain definite things and there are no other words to serve the purpose you do not refuse to engage in the automobile business because the carburetor and the differential are words of four syllables neither should you refuse to get yourself straight with the universe because it is too much trouble to go to the dictionary and learn that the word phenomenon means something else than a little boy who can play the piano or do long division in his head end of introductory part one the book of the mind chapters one and two of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one the nature of life attempts to show what we know about life to set the bounds of real truth as distinguished from phrases and self-deception if i could i would begin this book by telling you what life is but unfortunately i do not know what life is the only consolation i can find is in the fact that nobody else knows either we ask the churches and they tell us that male and female created he them and put them in the garden of eden and they would have been happy had not satan tempted them but then you ask who made satan and the explanation grows vague you ask if god made satan and knew what satan was going to do is it not the same as if god did it himself so this explanation of the origin of evil gets you no further than the hindu picture of the world resting on the back of a tortoise and the tortoise on the head of a snake and nothing said as to what the snake rests on let us go to the scientist i know a certain physiologist perhaps the greatest in the world and his eager face rises before me and i hear his quick impetuous voice declaring that he knows what life is he has told it in several big volumes and all i have to do is to read them life is a tropism caused by the presence of certain combinations of chemicals my friend knows this because he has produced the thing in his test tubes he is an exponent of a way of thought called monism which finds the ultimate source of being in forms of energy manifesting themselves as matter he shows how all living things arise from that and sink back into it but question this scientist more closely what is this matter that you are so sure of how do you know it obviously through sensations you never know matter itself you only know its effects upon you and you assume that the matter must be there to cause the sensation in other words matter which seems so real turns out to be merely a permanent possibility of sensation and suppose there were to be sensations caused for example by a sportive demon who liked to make fun of eminent physiologists 
then there might be the appearance of matter and nothing else in other words there might be mind and various states of mind so we discover that the materialist in the philosophic sense is making just as large an act of faith is pronouncing just as bold a dogma as any priest of any religion this is an old-time topic of disputation before mother eddy there was bishop berkeley and before berkeley there was plato and they and the materialists disputed until their hearers cried in despair what is mind no matter what is matter never mind but a century or two ago in a town of prussia there lived a little dried-up professor of philosophy who sat himself down in his room and fixed his eyes on a church steeple outside the window and for years on end devoted himself to examining the tools of thought with which the human mind is provided and deciding just what work and how much of it they are fitted to do so came the proof that our minds are incapable of reaching to or dealing with any ultimate reality whatever but can comprehend only phenomena that is to say appearances and their relations one to another the Königsberg professor proved this once for all time setting forth four propositions about ultimate reality and proving them by exact and irrefutable logic and then proving by equally exact and irrefutable logic their precise opposites and contraries anybody who has read and comprehended the four antinomies of immanuel kant knows that metaphysics is as dead a subject as astrology and that all the complicated theories which the philosophers from heraclitus to arthur balfour have spun like spiders out of their inner consciousness have no more relation to reality than the intricacies of the game of chess the writer is sorry to make this statement because he spent a lot of time reading these philosophers and acquainting himself with their subtle theories he learned a whole language of long words and even the special meanings which each philosopher or school of philosophers give to them when he had got through he had learned so far as metaphysics is concerned absolutely nothing and had merely the job of clearing out of his mind great masses of verbal cobwebs it was not even good intellectual training the metaphysical method of thought is a trap the person who thinks in absolutes and ultimates is led to believe that he has come to conclusions about reality when as a matter of fact he has merely proved what he already wants to believe if he had wanted to believe the opposite he could have proven that exactly as well as his opponents will at once demonstrate if you multiply two feet by two feet the result represents a plane surface or a figure of two dimensions if you multiply two feet by two feet by two feet you have a solid or a figure of three dimensions such as the world in which we live and move but now suppose you multiply two feet by two feet by two feet by two feet what does that represent for ages the minds of mathematicians and philosophers have been tempted by this fascinating problem of the fourth dimension they have worked out by analogy what such a world would be like if you went into this fourth dimension you could turn yourself inside out and come back to our present world in that condition and no one of your three-dimension friends would be able to imagine how you had managed it or to put you back again the way you belonged and in this it seems to me we have the perfect analogy of metaphysical thinking it is the fourth dimension of the mind and plays as much havoc with sound thinking as a physical fourth dimension would play with say the prison system a man who takes up an absolute god immortality the origin of being a first cause free will absolute right or wrong infinite time or space final truth original substance the thing in itself 
that man disappears into a fourth dimension and turns himself inside out or upside down or hindside foremost and comes back and exhibits himself in triumph then when he is ready he effects another disappearance and another change and is back on earth an ordinary human being the world is full of schools of thought theologians and metaphysicians and professors of academic philosophy transcendentalists and theosophists and christian scientists who perform such mental monkey shines continuously before our eyes they prove what they please and the fact that no two of them prove the same thing makes clear to us in the end that none of them has proved anything the christian scientist asserts that there is no such thing as matter but that pain is merely a delusion of mortal mind he continues serene in this faith until he runs into an automobile and sustains a compound fracture of the femur whereupon he does exactly what any of the rest of us do goes to a competent surgeon and has the bone set on the other hand some devoted young socialists of my acquaintance have read hegel and dietzkin and have adopted the dogma that matter is the first cause and that all things have grown out of it and returned to it they have seen that the brain decays after death they declare that the soul is a function of the brain and because of such theories they deliberately reject the most powerful modes of appeal whereby man can be swayed to faith in human solidarity the best books i know for the sweeping out of metaphysical cobwebs are the philosophy of common sense and the creed of a layman by frederick harrison leader of the english positivists a school of thought established by auguste comte but even as i recommend these books i recall with the dissatisfaction with which i left them for it appears that the positivists have their dogmas like all the rest mr harrison is not content to say that mankind has not the mental tools for dealing with ultimate realities he must needs prove that mankind never will and never can have these tools i look back upon the long process of evolution and ask myself what would an oyster think about positivism what would be the opinion let us say of a young turnip on the subject of mr frederick harrison's thesis it may well be that the difference between a turnip and mr harrison is not so great as will be the difference between mr harrison and that super race which some day takes possession of the earth and of all the universe it does not seem to me good science or good sense to dogmatize about what this race will know or what will be its tools of thought what does seem to me good science and good sense is to take the tools which we now possess and use them to our utmost capacity what is it that we know about life we know a seemingly endless stream of sensations which manifest themselves in certain ways and seem to inhere in what we call things and beings we observe incessant change in all these phenomena and we examine these changes and discover their ways the ways seem to be invariable so completely so that for practical purposes we assume them to be invariable and base all our calculations and actions upon this assumption manifestly we could not live otherwise and the spread of scientific knowledge is the further tracing out of such laws that is to say the ways of behaving of existence and the extending of our belief in their invariability to wider and wider fields once upon a time we were told that the wind bloweth where it listeth but now we are quite certain that there are causes for the blowing of the wind and when our researches have been carried far enough we shall be able to account for and to predict every smallest breath of air once we were told that dreams came from a supernatural world but now we are beginning to analyze the dreams and to explain what they come from and what they mean perhaps we still find human nature a bewildering and unaccountable thing but some day we shall know enough of man's body and his mind 
his past and his present to be able to explain human nature and to produce it at will precisely as today we produce certain reactions in our test tubes and do it so invariably that the most cautious financier will invest tens of millions of dollars in a process and never once reflect that he is putting too much trust in the permanence of nature in many departments of thought great specialists are now working experimenting and observing by the methods of science if in the course of this book we speak of certainty we mean of course not the absolute certainty of any metaphysical dogma but the practical certainty of everyday common sense the certainty we feel that eating food will satisfy our hunger and that tomorrow as today two and two will continue to make four end of chapter one chapter two the nature of faith attempts to show what we can prove by our reason and what we know intuitively what is implied in the process of thinking and without which no thought could be the primary fact that we know about life is growth herbert spencer has defined this growth or evolution in a string of long words which may be summed up to mean the process whereby a number of things which are simple and like one another become different parts of one thing which is complex if we observe this process in ourselves and the symptoms of it in others we discover that when it is proceeding successfully it is accompanied by a sensation of satisfaction which we call happiness or pleasure also that when it is thwarted or repressed it is accompanied by a different sensation which we call pain subtle metaphysicians both inside the churches and out have set themselves to the task of proving that there must be some other object of life than the continuance of these sensations of pleasure which accompany successful growth they have proven to their own satisfaction that morality will collapse and human progress come to an end unless we can find some other motive something more permanent and more stimulating something higher as they phrase it all i can say is that i gave reverent attention to the arguments of these moralists and theologians and that for many years i believed their doctrines but i believe them no longer i interpret the purpose of life to be the continuous unfoldment of its powers its growth into higher forms that is to say forms more complex and subtly contrived capable of more intense and enduring kinds of that satisfaction which is nature's warrant of life if you wish to take up this statement and argue about it please wait until you have read the chapter nature and man and noted my distinction between instinctive life and rational life for men the word growth does not mean any growth all growth blind and indiscriminate growth it does not mean growth for the tubercle bacillus nor growth for the anopheles mosquito nor growth for the housefly the spider and the louse neither do we mean that the purpose of man's life is in any pleasure all pleasure blind and indiscriminate pleasure the pleasure of alcohol the pleasure of cannibalism the pleasure of the modern form of cannibalism which we call making money we have survived in the struggle for existence by the cooperative and social use of our powers of judgment and our judgment is that which selects among forms of growth which gives preference to wheat and corn over weeds and to self-control and honesty over treachery and greed so when we say that the purpose of life is happiness we do not mean to turn mankind loose at a hog trough we mean that our duty as thinkers is to watch life to test it to pick and choose among the many forms it offers and to say this kind of growth is more permanent and full of promise it is more fertile 
more deeply satisfactory therefore we choose this and sanction the kind of pleasure which it brings other kinds we decide are temporary and elusive therefore we put in jail anyone who sells alcoholic drink and we refuse to invite to our home people who are lewd and some day we shall not permit our children to attend moving picture shows in which the modern form of cannibalism is glorified the reader no doubt has been taught a distinction between science and faith he is saying now you believe that everything is to be determined by human reason you reject all faith i answer no i am not rejecting faith I am merely refusing to apply it to objects with which it has nothing to do. You do not take it as a matter of faith that a package of sugar weighs a pound. You put it on the scales and find out. In other words, you make it a matter of experiment. But all the creeds of all the religious sects are full of pronouncements which are no more matters of faith than the question of the weighing of sugar. Is pork a wholesome article of food, or is it not? All Christians will readily acknowledge that this is a matter to be determined by the microscope and other devices of experimental science. But then, some Jew rises in the meeting and puts the question, Is dancing injurious to the character? And immediately all members of the Methodist Episcopal Church vote to close the discussion. What is faith? Faith is the instinct which underlies all being, assuring us that life is worth while, and honest, a thing to be trusted. In other words, it is the certainty that successful growth always is and always will be accompanied by pleasure. The most skeptical scientist in the world, even my friend the physiologist, who proves that life is nothing but a tropism, and can be produced by mixing chemicals and test tubes this eager friend is one of the most faithful men i know he is burning up with the faith that knowledge is worth possessing and also that it is possible of attainment with what boundless scorn would he receive any suggestion to the contrary for example the idea that life might be a series of sensations which some sportive demon is producing for the torment of man more than that this friend is burning up with the certainty that knowledge can be spread that his fellow man will receive it and apply it and that it will make them happy when they do why else does he write his learned books in defense of the materialist philosophy and that same faith which animates the great monist animates likewise every child who toddles off to school and every chicken which emerges from an egg and every blade of grass which thrusts its head above the ground not every chicken survives of course and all the blades of grass wither in the fall nevertheless the seeds of grass are spread and the chickens make food for philosophers and the great process of life continues to manifest its faith in the end the life process produces man who as we shall presently see takes it up and judges it and makes it over to suit himself you will know from this that i am what is called an optimist whereas some of the great philosophers of the world have called themselves pessimists but i notice with a smile that these are often the men who work hardest of all to spread their ideas and thus testify to the worthwhileness of truth and the perfectibility of mankind there has come to be a saying among settlement workers and physicians who are familiar with poverty and its effects upon life that there are no bad babies and good babies there are only sick babies and well babies in the same way i would say there are no pessimists and optimists there are only mentally sick people and mentally well people everywhere throughout life both animal and vegetable health means happiness and gives abundant evidence of that fact all healthy life is satisfactory to itself 
when it develops reason it tries to find out why and this is yet another testimony to the fact that having power and using it is pleasant when i was in college the professor would propound the old question would you rather be a happy pig or an unhappy philosopher my answer always was i would rather be a happy philosopher the professor replied perhaps that is not possible but i said i will prove that it is end of chapter two chapters three and four of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the use of reason attempts to show that in the field to which reason applies we are compelled to use it and are justified in trusting it the great majority of people are brought up to believe that some particular set of dogmas are objects of faith and that there are penalties more or less severe for the application of reason to these dogmas what particular set it happens to be is a matter of geography in a crowded modern city like new york it is a matter of the particular block on which the child is born a child born on hester street will be taught that his welfare depends upon his never eating meat and butter from the same dish a child born on tenth avenue will be taught that it is a matter of his not eating meat on fridays a child born on madison avenue will be taught that it is a question of the precise metaphysical process by which bread is changed into human body and wine into human blood each of these children will be assured that his human reason is fallible that it is extremely dangerous to apply it to this sacred subject and that the proper thing to do is to accept the authority of some ancient tradition or some institution or some official or some book for which a special sanction is claimed has there ever been in the world any revelation outside or above human reason could there ever be such a thing in order to test this possibility select for yourself the most convincing way by which a special revelation could be handed down to mankind take any of the ancient orthodox ways the finding of graven tablets on a mountain top or a voice speaking from a burning bush or an angel appearing before a great concourse of people and handing out a written scroll suppose that were to happen let us say at the next yale harvard football game suppose the news were to be flashed to the ends of the earth that god had thus presented to mankind an entirely new religion what would be the process by which the people of london or calcutta would decide upon that revelation first they would have to consider the question whether it was an american newspaper fake by no means an easy question second they would have to consider the chances of its being an optical delusion then assuming they accepted the sworn testimony of ten thousand mature and competent witnesses they would have to consider the possibility of someone having invented a new kind of invisible aeroplane assuming they were convinced that it was really a supernatural being they would next have to decide the chance of its being a visitor from mars or from the fourth dimension of space or from the devil in considering all this they would necessarily have to examine the alleged revelation what was the literary quality of it what was the moral quality of it what would be the effect upon mankind if the alleged revelation were to be universally adopted and applied manifestly all these are questions for the human reason the human judgment there is no other method of determining them there would be nothing for any individual person or for men as a whole to do except to apply their best powers and as the phrase is make up their minds about the matter 
reason would be the judge, and the new revelation would be the prisoner at the bar. Humanity might say, this is a real inspiration, we will submit ourselves to it and follow it, and allow no one from now on to question it. But inevitably there would be some who would say, Tommy Rot. There would be others who would say, this new revelation isn't working, it is repressing progress, it is stifling the mind. These people would stand up for their conviction, they would become martyrs, and all the world would have to discuss them. And who would decide between them and the great mass of men? Reason, the judge, would decide. It is perfectly true that human reason is fallible. Infallibility is an absolute, a concept of the mind, and not a reality. Life has not given us infallibility any more than it has given us omniscience or omnipotence or any of the other attributes which we call divine life has given us powers more or less weak more or less strong but all capable of improvement and development reason is the tool whereby mankind has won supremacy over the rest of the animal kingdom and is gradually taking control of the forces of nature it is the best tool we have, and because it is the best, we are driven irresistibly to use it. And how strange that some of us can find no better use for it than to destroy its own self. Visit one of the Jesuit fathers and hear him seek to persuade you that reason is powerless against faith and must abdicate to faith. You answer, yes, father, you have persuaded me. I admit the fallibility of my mortal powers, and I begin by applying my doubts of them to the arguments by which you have just convinced me. I was convinced, but of course I cannot be sure of a conviction attained by fallible reason. Therefore, I am just where I was before, except that I am no longer in position to be certain of anything. You answer in good faith, and take up your hat and depart, closing the door of the good father's study behind you. But stop a moment. Why do you close the door? You close the door because your reason tells you that otherwise the cold air outside will blow in and make the good father uncomfortable. You put your hat on because your reason has not yet been applied to the problem of the cause of baldness. You step out onto the street, and when you hear a sudden noise, you step back onto the curbstone, because your reason tells you that an automobile is coming, and that on the sidewalk you are safe from it. So you go on, using your reason in a million acts of your life, whereby your life is preserved and developed. And if anybody suggested that the fallibility of your reason should cause you to delay in front of an automobile, you would apply your reason to the problem of that person and decide that he was insane. And I say that just as there is insanity in everyday judgments and relationships, so there is insanity in philosophy, metaphysics, and religion. The seed and source of all this kind of insanity being the notion that it is the duty of anybody to believe anything which cannot completely justify itself as reasonable. Nowadays, as ideas are spreading, the champions of dogma are hard put to it, and you will find their minds a muddle of two points of view. The Jewish rabbi will strive desperately to think of some hygienic objection to the presence of meat and butter on the same plate. The Catholic priest will tell you that fish is a very wholesome article of food and that anyhow we all eat too much. The Methodist and the Baptist and the Presbyterian will tell you that if men did not rest one day in seven, their health would break down. Thus they justify faith by reason and reconcile the conflict between science and theology. Accepting this method, I experiment and learn that it improves my digestion and adds to my working power 
if I play tennis on Sunday. I follow this indisputably rational form of conduct and find myself in conflict with the faith of the ancient state of Delaware, which obliges me to serve a term in its state's prison for having innocently and unwittingly desecrated its day of holiness. If you read Professor Burry's little book, A History of Freedom of Thought, you will discover that there has been a long conflict over the right of men to use their minds. And the victory is not yet. The term free thinker, which ought to be the highest badge a man could wear, is still almost everywhere throughout America a term of vague terror. In the state of California today, there is a Criminal Syndicalism Act, which provides a maximum of 14 years in jail for any person who shall write or publish or speak any words expressive of the idea that the United States government should be overthrown in the same way that it was established that is, by force. Only a few months ago the writer of this book was on the witness stand for two days, and had the painful, almost incredible experience of being battered and knocked about by an inquisitive district attorney who cross-examined him as to every detail of his beliefs and read garbled extracts from his published writings in the effort to make it appear that he held some belief which might possibly prejudice the jury against him. The defendant in this case, a returned soldier who had spent three years as a volunteer in the trenches, and had been twice wounded and once gassed, was accused not merely of approving the Soviet form of government, but also of having printed uncomplimentary references to priests and religious institutions. Nowadays, it is the property class which has taken possession of the powers of government, and which presumes to censor the thinking of mankind in its own interest. But whether it be priestcraft, or whether it be capitalism, which seeks to bind the human mind, it comes to the same thing, and the effort must be met by the assertion that, in spite of errors and blunders, and the serious harm these may do, there is no way for men to advance save by using the best powers of thinking they possess and proclaiming their conclusions to others. Speaking theologically for the moment, God has given us our reasoning powers and also the impulse to use them, and it is inconceivable that he should seek to restrict their use or should give to anyone the power to forbid their use. It is his truth which we seek, and his which we proclaim. In so doing, we perform our highest act of faith, and we refuse to be troubled by the idea that for this service he will reward us by an eternity of sulfur and brimstone. Throughout the remainder of this book, it will be assumed that the reader accepts this point of view, or, at any rate, that he is willing, for the purposes of experiment, to give it a trial, and see where it leads him. We shall proceed to consider the problems of human life in the light of reason, to determine how they come to be, and how they can be solved. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4. The Origin of Morality Compares the ways of nature with human morality and tries to show how the latter came to be. Seventy years ago, Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of the Species, in which he defied the theological dogma of his time by the shocking idea that life had evolved by many stages of progress from the diatom to man. This, of course, did not conform to the story of the Garden of Eden, and so Darwinism was fought as an invention of the devil, and in the interior of America there are numerous sectarian colleges where the dread term evolution is spoken in awed whispers. 
only the other day i read in my newspaper the triumphant proclamation of some clergyman that darwinism had been overthrown this reverend gentleman had got mixed up because some biologists were disputing some detail of the method by which the evolution of species had been brought about do species change by the gradual elimination of the unfit or do they change by sudden leaps the mutation theory of de Vries. are acquired powers transmitted to posterity or is the germ plasm unaffected by its environment concerning such questions the scientists debate but the fact that life has evolved in an ordered series from the lower forms to the higher and that each individual reproduces in embryo and in infancy the history of this long process these facts are now the basis of all modern thinking and as generally accepted as the rotation of the earth you may study this process of evolution from the outside in the multitude of forms which it has assumed and in their reactions one to another or you may study it from the inside in your own soul the emotions which accompany it the impulse or craving which impels it the elan vital as it is called by the french philosopher bergson the christians call it love and nietzsche who hated christianity called it the will to power and persuaded himself that it was the opposite of love you will find in the essays of professor huxley one entitled evolution and ethics in which he sets forth the complete unmorality of nature and declares that there is no way by which what mankind knows as morality can have originated in the process of nature or can be reconciled to natural law this statement coming from a leading agnostic was welcome to the theologians but when i first read the essay as a student of sixteen it seemed to me narrow i thought i saw a standpoint from which the contradiction disappeared the difference between the morality of christ and the morality of nature is merely the difference between a lower and a higher stage of mental development the animal loves and seeks by instinct to preserve the life which it knows that is to say its own life and the life of its young the wolf knows nothing about the feelings of a deer but man in his savage state develops reasoning powers enough to realize that there are others like himself the members of his own tribe and he makes for himself taboos which forbid him to kill and eat the members of that tribe at the present time humanity has developed its reason and imaginative sympathy to include in the tribe one or two hundred million people while to those outside the tribe it still preserves the attitude of the wolf how came it that a mind so acute as huxley's went so far astray on the question of the evolution of morality the answer is that this was the factory age in england and the great scientist a rebel in theological matters was in economics a child of his time we find him using the formulas of bourgeois biology to ridicule henry george and his plea for the freeing of the land competition is the life of trade ran the nineteenth century slogan and competition was the god of the nineteenth century biology tennyson summed it up in a phrase nature red in tooth and claw with raven and this was found convenient by manchester manufacturers who wished to shut little children up for fourteen hours a day in cotton mills and to harness women to drag cars in the coal mines and to be told by the learned men of their colleges and the holy men of their churches that this was the survival of the fittest it was nature's way of securing the advancement of the race but now we are preparing for an era of cooperation 
and it occurs to our men of science to go back to nature and find out what really are her ways if you will read kropotkin's mutual aid as a factor in evolution you will find a complete refutation of the old bourgeois biology and a view of nature which reveals in it the germs of human morality kropotkin points out that everywhere throughout nature it is the social and not the solitary animals which are most numerous and most successful there are many millions of ants and bees for every hawk or eagle and certainly in the state of nature there were thousands of deers for every lion or tiger that preyed upon them and all these social creatures have their ways of being which it requires no stress of the imagination to compare with the tribal customs and the moral codes of mankind the different animals prey upon one another but they do not prey upon their own species except in a very few rare cases the only beast that makes a regular practice of exploiting his own kind is man by hundreds of interesting illustrations kropotkin shows that mutual aid and mutual self-protection are the means whereby the higher forms of being have been evolved insects and birds and fish nearly all the herbivorous mammals and even a great many of the carnivores help one another and protect one another the chattering monkeys in the treetops drove out the saber-toothed tiger from the grove because there were so many of them and when they saw him they all set up a shriek and clamor which deafened and confused him and when by and by these monkeys developed an opposed thumb and broke off a branch of a tree for a club and fastened a sharp stone on the end of it for an axe and fell upon the saber-toothed tiger and exterminated him they did it because they had learned solidarity even as the workers of the world are today learning solidarity in the face of the beast of capitalism man has survived by the cunning of his brain we are told and that is true but first among the products of that cunning brain has been the knowledge that by himself he is the most helpless and pitiful of creatures while standing together and forming societies and developing moralities he is the master of the world he has not yet learned that lesson entirely he has learned it only for his own nation therefore he takes the highest skill of his hand and the subtlest wit of his brain and uses them to manufacture poison gases at the present hour he is painfully realizing that his poison formulas all become known to the tribes whom he calls his enemies and so it is his own destruction that he is engaged in contriving in other words man has come to a time when his mechanical skill his mastery over the forces of nature has developed more rapidly than his moral sense and his imaginative sympathy his ability to destroy life has become dangerously greater than his desire to preserve it so he confronts the fair face of nature as an insane creature wrecking not merely everything that he himself has built up but everything that nature has built in the ages before him he is striving now with infinite agony to make this fact real to himself and to mend his evil ways and the first step in that process is to root out from his mind the devil's doctrine which in his blindness and greed he has himself implanted that there is any way for him to find real happiness or to make any worthwhile progress on this earth by the method of inflicting misery and torment upon his fellow men end of chapter four chapters five and six of the book of life by upton sinclair 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Nature and Man Attempts to show how man has taken control of nature and is carrying on her processes and improving upon them. If the argument of the preceding chapter is sound, human morality is not a fixed and eternal set of laws, but is, like everything else in the world, a product of natural evolution. We can trace the history of it, just as we trace the story of the rocks. It is not a mysterious or supernatural thing, it is simply the reaction of man to his environment, and more especially to his fellow man. The source of it is that same inner impulse, that love of life, that joy in growing, that faith which appears to be the soul of all being. Man is a part of nature and a product of nature. In many fundamental respects, his ways are still nature's ways, and his laws still nature's laws. But there are other and even more significant ways in which man has separated himself from nature and made himself something quite different. In order to reveal this clearly, we draw a distinction between nature and man. This is a proper thing to do, provided we bear in mind that our classification is not permanent or final. We distinguish frogs from tadpoles, in spite of the fact that at one stage the creature is half tadpole and half frog. We distinguish the animal from the vegetable kingdom, despite the fact that in their lower forms they cannot be distinguished. What precisely is the difference between nature and man? The difference lies in the fact that nature is apparently blind in her processes. She produces a million eggs in order to give life to one salmon. She produces countless millions of salmon to be devoured by other fish, apparently no better than salmon. Poets may take up the doctrine of evolution and dress it out in theological garments, talking about the one far-off divine event towards which the whole creation moves. But for all we can see, nature, apart from man, is just as well satisfied to move in circles, and to come back exactly where she started. Nature made a whole world of complicated creatures in the steamy, lukewarm swamps of the Mesozoic era, and then, as if deciding that the pattern of a large body and a small brain was not a success, she froze them all to death with a glacial epoch, and we have nothing but the bones to tell us about them. No one understands anything about evolution until he has realized that the phrase the survival of the fittest does not mean the survival of the best from any human point of view, it merely means the survival of those capable of surviving in some particular environment. We consider our present civilization as fit. But if astronomical changes should cause another ice age, we should discover that our fitness depended upon our ability to live on lichens, or on something we could grow by artificial light in the bowels of the earth. So much for our ancient mother, nature. But now, whether we say with the theologians that it was divine providence, or with the materialist philosophers that it was an accidental mixing of atoms, at any rate it has come about that nature has recently produced creatures who are conscious of her process, who are able to observe and criticize it, to take up her work and carry it on in their own way, for better or for worse. Whether by accident or design, there has been on parts of our planet such a combination of climate and soil as has brought into being a new product of nature, a heightened form of life, which we call intelligence. Creation opens its eyes and beholds the work of the Creator, and decides that it is good, yet not so good as it might be. Creation takes up the work of the Creator, and continues it, in many respects annulling it, in other respects revising it entirely. Whether a sonnet 
is a better or higher product than a spider is a question it would be futile to discuss but this at least should be clear nature has produced an infinity of spiders but nature never produced a sonnet nor anything resembling it man the creature of god takes over the functions of god this fact may shock us or it may inspire us to the metaphysically minded it offers a great variety of fascinating problems can it be that god is in the process of becoming that there is no god until he has become in us and through us h g wells sets forth this curious idea and then of course the bishops and the clergy rise up in indignation and denounce mr wells as an upstart and a trespasser upon their field they have been worshipping their god for some three or four thousand years and know that he has been from eternity he created the world at his will and how shall impious man presume to rise up and criticize his product and imagine that he can improve upon it man with his cheap and silly little toys his sonnets and scientific systems his symphony concerts and such pale imitations of the celestial harmonies mr wells in his character of god in the making has created a bishop of his own and no doubt would maintain the thesis that he is a far better bishop than any created by the god of the anglican churches we will leave mr wells bishop to argue these problems with god's bishops and will merely remind the reader of our warning about these metaphysical matters you can prove anything and everything whichever and however all or both and discussions of the subject are merely your enunciation of the fact that you have your private truth as you want it it may be that there is an infinite consciousness which carries the whole process of creation in itself and that all the seeming wastes and blunders of nature can be explained from some point of view at present beyond the reach of our minds on the other hand it may be that consciousness is now dawning in the universe for the first time it may be that it is an accident a fleeting product like the morning mist on the mountain top on the other hand it may be that it is destined to grow and expand and take control of the entire universe as a farmer takes control of a field for his own purposes it may be that just as our individual fragments of intelligence communicate and merge into a family a club a nation a world culture so we shall some day grope our way toward the consciousness of other planets or of other states of being subsisting on this planet unknown to us or perhaps even toward the cosmic soul the universal consciousness which we call god but meantime all we can say with positiveness is this man the created is becoming the creator he is taking up the world purpose he is imposing upon it new purposes of his own he is attempting to impose upon it a moral code to test it and discipline it by a new standard which he calls economy to the present writer this seems the most significant fact about life the most fascinating point of view from which life can be regarded the reader who wishes to follow it into greater detail is referred to a little book by professor e ray lancaster the kingdom of man especially the opening essay with its fascinating title nature's insurgent son in what ways have the reasoned and deliberate purposes of man revised and even supplanted the processes of nature the ways are so many that it would be easier to mention those in which he has not done so a modern civilized man is hardly content with anything that nature does nor willing to accept any of nature's products he will not eat nature's fruits he prefers the kinds that he himself has brought into being 
he is not content with the skin that nature has given him he has made himself an infinite variety of complicated coverings he objects to nature's habit of pouring cold water upon him and so he has built himself houses in which he makes his own climate he has recently taken to creating for himself houses which roll along the ground or which fly through the air or which swim under the surface of the sea so he carries his private climate with him to all those places it was nature's custom to remove her blunders and her experiments quickly from her sight but man has decided that he loves life so well that he will preserve even the imbeciles the lame and the halt and the blind in a state of nature if a man's eyes were not properly focused he blundered into the lair of a tiger and was eaten but civilized man despises such a method of maintaining the standard of human eyes he creates for himself a transparent product ground to such a curve that it corrects the focus of his eyes and makes him as good as any other eyes in ten thousand such ways we might name man has rebelled against the harshness of his ancient mother and has freed himself from her control but still he is the child of his mother and so it is his way to act first and then to realize what he has done so it comes about that very few even of the most highly educated men are aware how completely the ancient ways of nature have been suppressed by her insurgent son it is a good deal as in the various trades and professions which have developed with such amazing rapidity in the modern civilization the paper man knows how to make paper the shoe man knows how to make shoes the optician knows about grinding glasses but none of these knows very much about the other's specialty and has no realization of how far the other has gone so it comes about that in our colleges we are still teaching ancient and immutable laws of nature which in the actual practice of men at work are as extinct and forgotten as the dodo in all colleges except a few which have been tainted by socialist thought the students are solemnly learning that the so-called malthusian law that population presses continuously upon the limits of subsistence there are always a few more people in every part of the world than that part of the world is able to maintain at any time we increase the world's productive powers the population will increase correspondingly so that there can never be an end to human misery and abortion war and famine are simply nature's eternal methods of adjusting man to his environment thus solemnly we are taught in the colleges and yet nine out of ten of the students come from homes where the parents have discovered the modern practice of birth control all the students are themselves finding out about it in one way or another and will proceed when they marry to restrict themselves to two or three children in vain will the ghost of their favorite statesman and hero theodore roosevelt be traveling up and down the land denouncing them for the dreadful crime of race suicide that is to say they're presuming to use their reason to put an end to the ghastly situation revealed by the malthusian law overpopulation eternally recurring and checked by abortion war and famine in vain will the ghost of their favorite saint and moralist anthony comstock be traveling up and down the land putting people in jail for daring to teach to poor women what every rich woman knows and for attempting to change the entirely man-made state of affairs whereby an intelligent and self-governing anglo-saxon land is being in two or three generations turned over to a slum population of italians poles hungarians portuguese french canadians mexicans and japanese likewise in every orthodox college the student is taught what his professors are pleased to call the law of diminishing returns of agriculture that is to say additional labor expended upon a plot of land does not result in an equal increase of produce 
and the increase grows less until finally you come to a time when no matter how much labor you expend you can get no more produce from that plot of land all professors teach this because fifty years ago it was true and since that time it has not occurred to any professor of political science to visit a farm and all the while out in the suburbs of the city where the college is located market gardeners are practicing on an enormous scale a new system of intensive agriculture which makes the law of diminishing returns a foolish joke as kropotkin shows in his book fields factories and workshops the modern intensive gardener by use of glass and the chemical test tube has developed an entirely new science of plant raising he is independent of climate he makes his own climate he is independent of the defects of the soil he would just as soon start from nothing and make his soil upon an asphalt pavement but doubling his capital investment he raises not twice as much produce but ten times as much if his methods were applied to the british isles he could raise sufficient produce on this small surface to feed the population of the entire globe so we see that by simple and entirely harmless devices man is in position to restrict or to increase population as he sees fit also he is in position to raise food and produce the necessities of life for a hundred or a thousand times as many people as on now on the earth but superstition ordains involuntary parenthood and capitalism ordains that land shall be held out of use for speculation or shall be exploited for rent and this is done in the name of nature that old nature of the tooth and claw whose ancient plan it is that they shall take who have the power and they shall keep who can that ancient nature which has been so entirely suppressed and supplanted by civilized man and which survives only as a ghost a skeleton to be resurrected from the tomb for the purpose of frightening the enslaved when a predatory financier wishes a fur overcoat to protect himself from the cold or when he hires a masseur to keep up the circulation of his blood you do not find him troubling himself about the laws of nature never will he mention this old scarecrow except when he is trying to persuade the workers of the world to go on paying him tribute for the use of the natural resources of the earth end of chapter five chapter six man the rebel shows the transition stage between instinct and reason in which man finds himself and how he can advance to a securer condition in the state of nature you find every creature living a precarious existence incessantly beset by enemies and the creature survives only so long as it keeps itself at the top of its form the result is the maintenance of the type in its full perfection and under the competitive pressure a gradual increase of its powers excepting when sudden eruptions of natural forces occur every creature is perfectly provided with a set of instincts for all emergencies it is in harmonious relationship to its environment it knows how to do what it has to do and even its fears and its pains serve for its protection but now comes man and overthrows this state of nature abolishes the competitive struggle and changes at his own insolent will both his environment and his reaction thereto man's changes are in the beginning all along one line they are for his own greater comfort the avoidance of the inconveniences of nature and the stresses of the competitive struggle in a state of nature there are no fat animals but in civilization there are not merely fat animals but fat men to eat the fat animals in a state of nature no animal loafs very long it has to go out and hunt its food again 
but man by his superior cunning compels the animals to work for him and also his fellow men so he produces unlimited wealth for himself not merely can he eat and drink and sleep all he wants but he builds a whole elaborate set of laws and moral customs and religious codes about this power he invents manners and customs and literatures and arts expressive of his superiority to nature and to his fellow men and of his ability to enslave and exploit them so he destroys for his imperious self the beneficent guardianship which nature had maintained over him he develops a thousand complicated diseases a thousand monstrous abnormalities of body and mind and spirit and each one of these diseases and abnormalities is a new life of its own it develops a body of knowledge a science and perhaps an art it becomes the means of life the environment and the determining destiny of thousands perhaps millions of human beings so continues the growth of the colossal structure which we call civilization in part still healthy and progressive but in part as foul and deadly as a gigantic cancer. What is to be done about this cancer? First of all, it must be diagnosed, the extent of it precisely mapped out, and the causes of it determined. Man, the rebel, has rejected his mother nature, and has lost, and for the most part forgotten, the instincts with which she provided him. He has destroyed the environment, which, however harsh to the individual, was beneficent to the race, and has set up in the place of it a gigantic pleasure house, with talking machines and moving pictures and soda fountains and manicure parlors and gents' furnishing establishments. Shall we say that man is to go back to a state of nature, that he shall no longer make asylums for the insane and homes for the defective, eyeglasses for the astigmatic, and malted milk for the dyspeptic? There are some who preach that. Among the multitudes of strange books and pamphlets which come in my mail, I found the other day a volume from England, Social Chaos and the Way Out by alfred baker reed a learned and imposing tome of three hundred and sixty four pages wherein with all the paraphernalia of learning it is gravely maintained that the solution for the ills of civilization is a return to the ancient greek practice of infanticide every child at birth is to be examined by a committee of physicians and if it is found to possess any defect or if the census has established that there are enough babies in the world for the present this baby shall be mercifully and painlessly asphyxiated you might think that this is a joke after the fashion of swift's proposal for eating the children of famine-stricken ireland i have spent some time examining this book before i risk committing myself to the statement that it is the work of a sober scientist with no idea whatever of fun if we are going to think clearly on this subject the first point we have to understand is that nature has nothing to do with it we cannot appeal to nature because we are many thousands of years beyond her sway we left her when the first ape came down out of the treetop and fastened a sharp stone to the end of his club we bade irrevocable good-bye to her when the first man kept himself from freezing and altered his diet by means of fire. Therefore it is no argument to say that this, that, or the other remedy is unnatural. Our choice will lie among a thousand different courses, but the one thing we may be sure of is that none of them will be natural baron's father in one of his war cartoons portrays a british officer on leave who got homesick for the trenches and went out into the garden and dug himself a hole in the mud and sat shivering in the rain all night and this amuses us vastly but we should be even more amused if any kind of reformer physician moralist clergyman or legislator 
should suggest to us any remedy for our ills that was really according to nature. Civilized man, creature of art and of knowledge, has no love for nature except as an object for the play of his fancy and his wit. He means to live his own life, he means to hold himself above nature with all his powers. Yet, obviously, he cannot go on accumulating diseases. He cannot give his life blood to the making of a cancer while his own proper tissues starve. He must somehow divert the flow of his energies, his social bloodstream, so to speak, from the cancer to the healthy growth. To abandon the metaphor, man will determine by the use of his reason what he wishes life to be. He will choose the highest forms of it to which he can attain. He will then, by the deliberate act of his own will, devote his energies to those tasks. He will make for himself new laws, new moral codes, new customs, and ways of thought, calculated to bring to reality the ideal which he has formed. So only can man justify himself as a creator. So can he realize the benefit and escape the penalties of his revolt from his ancient mother. And then, perhaps, we shall make the discovery that we have come back to nature, only in a new form, nature harsh and cruel, wasteful and blind, as we call her, yet had her deep wisdom. She cared for the species, she protected and preserved the type. Man, in his new pride of power, has invented a philosophy which he dignifies by the name of individualism. He lives and works for himself. He chooses to wear silk shirts, and to break the speed limit, and to pin ribbons and crosses on his chest. Now what he must do with his new morality, if he wishes to save himself from degeneration, is to manifest the wisdom and far vision of the old mother whom he spurned, and to say to himself deliberately as an act of high daring, I will protect the species, I will preserve the type, I will deny myself the raptures of alcoholic intoxication, because it damages the health of my offspring. I will deny myself the amusement of sexual promiscuity, for the same reason. I will devise imitations of the chase and of battle in order that I may keep my physical body up to the best standard of nature, because I understand that all civilized life is based upon intelligence, I will acquire knowledge and spread it among my fellow men. Because I perceive that civilization is impossible without sympathy, and because sympathy makes it impossible for me to be happy while my fellow men are ignorant and degraded, therefore I dedicate my energies to the extermination of poverty, war, parasitism, and all forms of exploitation of man by his fellows. Professor William James is the author of an excellent essay entitled A Moral Equivalent for War. He sets forth the idea that men have loved war through the ages because it has called forth their highest efforts, has made them more fully aware of the powers of their being. He asks, May it not be possible for man, of his own free impulse, born of his love of life and the wonderful potentialities which it unfolds, to invent for himself a discipline, a code based not upon the destruction of other men and their enslavement, but upon cooperative emulation in the unfoldment of the powers of the mind. That this can be done by men, I have never doubted. That it will be done, and done quickly, has been made certain by the late world conflict, which has demonstrated to all thinking people that the progress of the mechanical arts has been such that man is now able to inflict upon his own civilization more damage than it is able to endure. End of chapter 6 End of section 3
Chapters 7 and 8 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Making Our Morals Attempts to show that human morality must change to fit human facts, and there can be no judge of it save human reason. Assuming the arguments of the preceding chapters to be accepted, it appears that human life is in part at least a product of human will, guided by human intelligence. Man finds himself in the position of the crew of a ship in the middle of the ocean. He does not know exactly how the ship was made or how it came to be in its present position, but he has discovered how the engines are run and how the ship is steered and the meaning of the compass. So now he takes charge of the ship, and keeps it afloat amid many perils, and meantime on the bridge of the vessel there goes on a furious argument over the question what port the ship shall be steered to, and what chart shall be used. It is not well as a rule to trust to similes, but this simile is useful because it helps us to realize how fluid and changeable are the conditions of man's life, and how incessant and urgent the problems with which he finds himself confronted. The moral and legal codes of mankind may be compared to the steering orders which are given to the helmsman of the vessel. Northeast by north, he is told, and if during the night a heavy wind arises and pushes the bow of the vessel off to the starboard then the helmsman has to push the wheel in the opposite direction if he does not do so he may find that his vessel has swung round and is going to some other part of the world next morning the passengers may wake up and find the ship is on the rocks because the helmsman persisted in following certain steering directions which were laid down in an ancient Hebrew book two or three thousand years ago. If life is a continually changing product, then the laws which govern conduct must also be continually changing, and morality is a problem of continuous adjustment to new circumstances and new needs. If man is free to work upon this changing environment, he must be free to make new tools and devise new processes. If it is the task of reason to choose among many possible courses and many possible varieties of life, then clearly it is man's duty to examine and revise every detail of his laws and customs and moral codes. This is, of course, in flat contradiction to the teachings of all religions. So far as I know, there is no religion which does not teach that the conduct of man in certain matters has been eternally fixed by some higher power, and that it is man's duty to conform to these rules. It is considered to be wicked even to suggest any other idea. In fact, to do so is the most wicked thing in the world far more dangerous than any actual infraction of the code, whatever it may be. Let us see how this works out in practice. Let us take, for a test, the Ten Commandments. These commandments were given upon stone tablets some four thousand years ago, and are supposed to have been valid ever since. Thou shalt not kill is one. Others phrase it, Thou shalt do no murder and in this double version we see at once the beginnings of controversy. If you are a Quaker, you accept the former version, while if you are a member of the military general staff of your country, you accept the latter. You maintain the right to kill your fellow men, provided that those who do the killing have been previously clad in a special uniform, indicating their distinctive function as killers of their fellow men. You maintain, in other words, the right of making war, and presently, when you get into making war, you find yourself maintaining the right to kill, not merely by the old established method of the sword and the bullet, but by means of poison gases, which destroy the lives of women and children, perhaps a whole city full at a time. 
and also of course you maintain the right to kill provided the killing has been formally ordered and sanctioned by a man who sits upon a raised bench and wears a black robe and perhaps a powdered wig you consider that by the simple device of putting this man into a black robe and a powdered wig you endow him with the authority to judge and revise the divine law in other words you subject this divine law to human reason and if some religious fanatic refuses to be so subjected you call him by the dread name pacifist and if he attempts to preach his idea you send him to prison for ten twenty years which means in actual practice that you kill him by the slow effects of malnutrition and tubercular infection if he is ordered to put on the special costume of killing and refuses to do so you call him a c o and you bully and beat him and perhaps administer to him the water cure in your dungeons or take the commandment that we shall not commit adultery surely this is a law about which we can agree but presently we discover that unhappily married couples desire to part and that if we do not allow them to part we actually cause the commission of a great deal more adultery than otherwise therefore our wise men meet together and revise this divine law and decide that it is not adultery if a man takes another wife provided he has received from a judge an engraved piece of paper permitting him to do so but some of the followers of religion refuse to admit this right of mere mortal man the catholic church attempts to enforce its own laws and declares that people who divorce and remarry are really living in adultery and committing mortal sin the episcopal church does not go quite so far as that it allows the innocent party in the divorce to remarry other churches are content to accept the state law as it stands is it not manifest that all these groups are applying human reason and nothing but human reason to the interpreting and revising of their divine commandments or take the law thou shalt not steal surely we can all agree upon that let us do so but our agreement gets us nowhere because we have to set up a human court to decide what is stealing is it stealing to seize upon land and kill the occupants of it and take the land for your own and hand it down to your children forever yes of course that is stealing you say but at once you have to revise your statement it is not stealing if it was done a sufficient number of years ago in that case the results of it are sanctified by law and held unchangeable forever also we run up against the fact that it is not stealing if it is done by the state by men who have been dressed up in the costume of killers before they commit the act again is it stealing to hold land out of use for speculation while other men are starving and dying for lack of land to labor upon some of us call this stealing but we are impolitely referred to as radicals and if we venture to suggest that anyone should resist this kind of stealing we are sentenced to slow death from malnutrition and tubercular infection again is it stealing for a victim of our system of land monopoly to take a loaf of bread in order to save the life of his starving child the law says that this is stealing and sends the man to jail for this act yet the common sense of mankind protests and i have heard a great many respectable americans venture so far in radicalism as to say that they themselves would steal under such circumstances one could pile up illustrations without limit but this is enough to make clear the point that it is perfectly futile to attempt to talk about divine rules for human conduct regardless of any ideas you may hold or any wishes you are forced at every hour of your life to apply your reason to the problems of your life 
and you have no escape from the task of judging and deciding. All that you do is to judge right or to judge wrong, and if you judge wrong, you inflict misery upon yourself and upon all who come into contact with you. How much more sensible, therefore, to recognize the fact of moral and intellectual responsibility, to investigate the data of life with which you have to deal, the environment by which you are surrounded, and to train your judgment so that you will be able to fit yourself to it with quickness and certainty. But, the believer in religion will say, this leaves mankind without any guide or authority. How can human beings act? How can they deal with one another if there are no laws, no permanent moral codes? The answer is that to accept the idea of the evolution of morality does not mean at all that there will be no permanent laws and working principles. Many of the facts of life are fixed for all practical purposes the purposes not merely of your life and my life but the life of many generations we are not likely to see in our time the end of the ancient hebrew announcement that the sins of the father are visited upon the children therefore it is possible for us to study out of a course of action based upon the duty of every father to hand down to his children the gift of a sound mind in a sound body the Catholic Church has had for a thousand years or more the mortal sin of gluttony upon its list, and today comes experimental science with its new weapons of research and discovers auto-intoxication and the hardening of the arteries, and makes it very unlikely that the moral codes of men will ever fail to list gluttony as a mortal sin. Indeed, science has added to gluttony not merely drunkenness, but all use of alcoholic liquor for beverage purposes. We have done this in spite of the manifest fact that the drinking of wine was not merely an Old Testament virtue, but a New Testament religious rite. To say that human life changes, and that new discoveries and new powers make necessary new laws and moral customs, is to say something so obvious that it might seem a waste of paper and ink man has invented the automobile and has crowded himself into cities and so has to adopt a rigid set of traffic regulations so far as i know it has never occurred to any religious enthusiast to seek in the book of revelation for information as to the advisability of the left-hand turn at broadway and forty-second street new york at five o'clock in the afternoon but modern science has created new economic facts, just as unprecedented as the automobile. It has created new possibilities of spending and new possibilities of starving for mankind. It has made new cravings and new satisfactions, new crimes and new virtues. And yet the great mass of our people are still seeking to guide themselves in their readjustments to these new facts by ancient codes which have no more relationship to these facts than they have to the affairs of Mars. I am acquainted with a certain lady, one of the kindest and most devoted souls alive, who seeks to solve the problems of her life and of her large family of children and grandchildren according to sentences which she picks out, more or less at random, from certain more or less random chapters of ancient Hebrew literature. This lady will find some words which she imagines apply to the matter, and will shut her devout eyes to the fact that there are other texts bearing on the matter which say exactly the opposite. She will place the strangest and most unimaginable interpretations upon the words, and yet will be absolutely certain that her interpretation is the voice of God speaking directly to her. If you try to tell her about socialism, she will say, The poor ye have always with you, which means that it is interfering with the divine providence to try to remedy poverty on any large scale. This lady is ready instantly to relieve any single case of want. She regards it as her duty to do this, 
in fact she considers that the purpose of some people's poverty is to provide her with a chance to do the noble action of relieving it you would think that the meaning of the sentence spare the rod and spoil the child would be so plain that no one could mistake it but this good lady understood it to mean that god forbade the physical chastisement of children and preferred them spoiled she held this idea for half a lifetime until it was pointed out to her that the sentence was not in the bible but in hudibra an old english poem end of chapter seven chapter eight the virtue of moderation attempts to show that wise conduct is an adjustment of means to an end and depends upon the understanding of a particular set of circumstances some years ago i used to know an ardent single tax propagandist who found my way of arguing intensely irritating because as he phrased it i had no principles we would be discussing for example a protective tariff and i would wish to collect statistics but discovered to my bewilderment that to my single tax friend a customs duty was stealing on the part of the government the government had a right to tax land because that was the gift of nature but it had no right to tax the products of human labor and when it took a portion of the goods which anyone brought into a country the government was playing the part of a robber of course such a man was annoyed by the suggestion that in the early stages of a country's development it might possibly be a good thing for the country to make itself independent and self-sufficient by encouraging the development of its manufactures that on the other hand when these manufactures had grown to such a size that they controlled the government it might be an excellent thing for the country to subject them to the pressure of foreign competition in order to lower their value as a preliminary to socializing them the reader who comes to this book looking for hard and fast rules of life will be disappointed it would be convenient if someone could lay down for us a moral code and lift from our shoulders the inconvenient responsibility of deciding about our own lives there may be persons so weak that they have to have the conditions of their lives thus determined for them but i am not writing for such persons i am writing for adult and responsible individuals and i bear in mind that every individual is a separate problem with separate needs and separate duties there are of course a good many rules that apply to everybody in almost all emergencies but i cannot think of a single rule that i would be willing to say i would apply in my life without a single exception thou shalt not kill is a rule that i have followed so far without exception but as soon as i turn my imagination loose i can think of many circumstances under which i should kill i remember discussing the matter with a pacifist friend of mine an out and out religious non-resistant i pointed out to him that people sometimes went insane and in that condition they sometimes seized hatchets and killed anyone in sight what would my pacifist friend do if he saw a maniac attacking his children with a hatchet it did not help him to say that he would use all possible means short of killing the maniac he had finally to admit that if he were quite sure it was a question of the life of the maniac or the life of the child he would kill and this is not mere verbal quibbling because such things do happen in the world and people are confronted with such emergencies and they have to decide and no rule is a general rule if it has a single exception there is a saying that the exception proves the rule but this is very silly it is a mistranslation of the latin word probat which means not proves but tests no exception can prove a rule what the exception does is to test the rule by showing that the result does not follow 
in the exceptional case. The only kind of rule which can be laid down for human conduct is a rule in such general terms that it escapes exceptions by leaving the matter open for every man's difference of opinion. Any kind of rule which is specific will sooner or later pass out of date. Take, by way of illustration, the ancient and well-established virtue of frugality. Obviously, under a state of nature or of economic competition, it is necessary for every man to lay by a store for a rainy day. But suppose we could set up a condition of economic security under which society guaranteed to every man the full product of his labor, and the old and the sick were fully taken care of, then how foolish a man would seem who troubled to acquire a surplus of goods. It would be as if we saw him riding on horseback through the main street of our town in a full suit of armor. I devote a great deal of space to this question of a fixed and unchangeable morality, because it is one of the heaviest burdens that mankind carries upon its back. The record of human history is sickening, not so much because of blood and slaughter, but because of fanaticism, because wherever the mind of man attempts to assert itself, to escape from the blind rule of animal greed, it adopts a set of formulas and proceeds to enforce them, regardless of the consequences, upon the whole of life. Consider, for example, the rule of the Puritans in England. The Puritans glorified conscience, and it is perfectly proper to glorify conscience, but not to the entire suppression of the beauty-making faculties in man. Mockley summed up the Puritan point of view in the sentence that they objected to bear-baiting, not because it gave pain to the bear, but because it gave pleasure to the spectators. As a result of applying that principle, and lacing mankind in a straitjacket by legislation, England swung back into a reaction under the Cavaliers in which debauchery held more complete sway than ever before or since in English life. This is a hard lesson, but it must be learned. There is no virtue that does not become a vice if it is carried to extremes. There is no virtue that does not become a vice if it is applied at the wrong time, or under the wrong circumstances, or at the wrong stage of human development. In fact, we may say that most vices are virtues misapplied. The so-called natural vices are simply natural impulses carried to excess, while the unnatural vices result from the suppression and distortion of natural impulses. The Greeks had as their supreme virtue what they called sophrosune. It is a beautiful word, worth remembering, it means a beautiful quality called moderation. We shall find, as we come to investigate, that life is a series of compromises among many different needs, many different desires, many different duties, and reason sits as a wise and patient judge and appoints to each its proper portion, and denies to it an excess which would starve the others. Such is true morality, and it is incompatible with the existence of any fixed code, whether of human origin or divine. The fixed morality is a survival of a far-off past, of the days of instinct and servitude. Human reason has developed, but slowly, and perhaps only a few people are as yet entirely capable of taking control of their own destiny. Perhaps it is really dangerous to think for oneself. But if we investigate carefully, we may decide that the danger is not so much to ourselves as it is to others. The most evil of all the habits that man has inherited from his far-off past is the habit of exploiting his fellows. And in order to exploit them more safely, the ruling castes of priests and kings and nobles and property owners 
have taken possession of the moralities of the world and shaped them for their own convenience. They have taught the slave virtues of credulity and submission. They have surrounded their teachings with all the terrors of the supernatural. They have placed upon rebellion the penalties not merely of this world, but of the next. Not merely of the dungeon and the rack, but of hellfire and brimstone. I do not wish to go to extremes and say that the moral codes now taught in the world are made wholly in this evil way. As a matter of fact, they are a queer jumble of the two elements, the slave terrors of the past and the common sense of the present. There is not one moral code in the world today, there are many. There is one for the rich, and an entirely different one for the poor, and the rich have had a great deal more to do with shaping the code of the poor than the poor have had to do with shaping the code of the rich. There is one code for governments, and an entirely different one for the victims of governments. There is one code for business, and an entirely different one, a far more human and decent one, for friendship. Above all, there is one code for Sunday, and another code for the other six days of the week. Most of our idealisms and our sentimental fine phrases we reserve for our Sunday code while for our everyday code we go back to the rule of the jungle dog eat dog or do unto others as they would do unto you but do it first when you attempt to suggest a new moral code to our present-day moral authorities it is the fine phrases of the sunday code they bring out for exhibition purposes and perhaps you are impressed by their arguments until monday morning when you attempt to apply this code at the office and they stare at you in bewilderment or burst out laughing in your face what i am trying to do here is to outline a code that will not be a matter of phrases but a matter of practice it will apply to all men rich as well as poor and to all seven days of the week I am not so much suggesting a code as pointing out to you how you can work out your own code for yourself. I am suggesting that you should adopt it, not because I tell you to, but because you yourself have taken it and tested it, precisely as you would test any other of the practical affairs of your life. Potatoes is an article of diet, or some particular sack of potatoes that a peddler was trying to sell you it is not yet possible for you to be as sure about everything in your life as you can be about the sack of potatoes human knowledge has not gone that far but at least you can know what is to be known and if anything is a matter of uncertainty you can know that such knowledge is often the most important of all just as the driver of an automobile wants to know if a bridge is not to be depended on so I say to you that if you want to find happiness in this life, look with distrust upon all absolutes and ultimates, all hard and fast rules, all formulas and dogmas, and general principles. Bear in mind that there are many factors in every case, there are many complications in every human being, there are many sides to every question. Try to keep an open mind and an even temper. Try to take an interest in learning something new every day and in trying some new experiment. This is the scientific attitude toward life. This is the way of growth and of true success. It is inconvenient because it involves working your brains, and most people have not been taught to do this and find it the hardest kind of work there is. But how much better it is to think for yourself and to protect yourself than to trust your thinking to some group of people whose only interest may be to exploit you for their advantage. End of chapter 8 End of section 4
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. The Choosing of Life discusses the standards by which we may judge what is best in life and decide what we wish to make of it. We have made the point about evolution, that it may go forward or it may go backward. There is no guarantee in nature that because a thing changes it must necessarily become better than it was. On the contrary, degeneration is as definitely established a fact as growth, and it is of the utmost importance in studying the problem of human happiness and how to make it, to get clear the fact that nature has produced, and continues to produce, all kinds of monstrosities and parasites and failures and abortions. And all of these blunders of our great mother struggle just as hard desire life just as ardently as normal creatures, and suffer just as cruelly when they fail. Blind optimism about life is just as fatuous and just as dangerous as blind pessimism. And if we propose to take charge of our life and to make it over, we shall find that we have to get quickly to the task of deciding what our purpose is. Choose well, your choice is brief and yet endless, says Carlyle. You are driven in your choice by two facts. First, that you have to choose regardless of whether you want to or not. And second, that upon your choice depend infinite possibilities of happiness or of misery. The interdependence of life is such that you are choosing not merely for the present, but for the future. You are also choosing for your posterity, forever. And to some extent, you are choosing for all mankind. Matthew Arnold has said that conduct is three-fourths of life. But I, for my part, have never been able to see where he got his figures. It seems to me that conduct is practically everything in life that really counts. Conduct is not merely marriage and birth and premature death. It is not merely eating and drinking and sleeping. It is thinking and aspiring. It is religion and science, music and literature and art. It is not yet the lightning and the cyclone, but with the spread of knowledge it is coming to be these things, and I suspect that some day it may be even the comet and the rising of the sun. We are now going to apply our reason to this enormous problem of human conduct. We are going to ask ourselves the question, what kind of life do we want? What kind of life are we going to make? What are the standards by which we may know excellence in life, and distinguish it from failure and waste and blunder in life? Obviously, when we have done this, we shall have solved the moral problem. All we shall have to say is, act so that your actions help to bring the desirable things into being, and do not act so as to hinder or weaken them. We shall not be able to go to nature to settle this question for us. This is our problem, not nature's. But we shall find, as usual, that we can pick up precious hints from her. We shall be wise to study her ways and learn from her successes and her failures. We are proud of her latest product, ourselves. Let us see how she made us and what were the stages on the way to man. First, in the scale of evolution, it appears came inert matter. We call it inert because it looks that way, though we know, of course, that it consists of infinite numbers of molecules vibrating with speed which we can measure even though we cannot imagine it. This matter is enormously fascinating, and a wise man will hesitate to speak patronizingly about it. Nevertheless, Considering matter apart from the mind which studies it, we decide that it represents a low stage of being. We speak contemptuously of stones and clods and lumps of clay. 
we award more respect to things like mountains and tempest-tossed oceans because they are big in the early days of our race we used to worship these things but now we think of them merely as the raw material of life and we should not be in the least interested in becoming a mountain or an ocean almost everyone would agree therefore that what we call life is a higher and more important achievement of nature and if we wish to grade this life we do so according to its sentience that is to say the amount and intensity of the consciousness which grows in it we are interested in the one-celled organisms which swarm everywhere throughout nature and we study the mysterious processes by which they nourish and beget themselves we suspect that they have a germ of consciousness in them but we are sure of the meaning and importance of the consciousness we detect in some complex organism like a fish or bird we learn to know the signs of consciousness of dawning intelligence and we esteem the various kinds of creatures according to the amount of it they possess we reject mere physical bigness and mere strength joyce kilmer may write poems are made by men like me but only god can make a tree and that seems to us a charming bit of fancy but the common sense of the thing is voiced to us much better in the lines of old ben jonson it is not growing like a tree in bulk doth make man better be if we take two animals of equal bulk the hippopotamus and the elephant we shall be far more interested in the elephant because of the intelligence and what we call character which he displays there are good elephants and bad elephants kind ones and treacherous ones we love the dog because we can make a companion of him that is because we can teach him to react to human stimuli of all animals we are fascinated most by the monkey because he is nearest to man and displays the keenest intelligence someone may say that this is all mere human egotism and that we have no way of really being sure that the life of elephants and hippopotami is not more interesting and more significant than the life of men never having been either of these animals i cannot say with assurance but i know that i have the power to exterminate these creatures or to pen them in cages and they are helpless to protect themselves or even to understand what is happening to them so i am irresistibly driven to conclude that intelligence is more safe and more worthwhile than unintelligence in short that intelligence is nature's highest product up to date and that to foster and develop it is the best guess i can make as to the path of wisdom that is of intelligence when we come to deal with human values we find that we can trace much of the same kind of evolution back in the days of the caveman it was physical strength which dominated the horde but nowadays except in the imagination of the small boy the strong man does not cut much of a figure we go once perhaps to see him lift his heavy weights and break his iron bars but then we are tired of him mere strength had to yield in the struggle for life to quickness of eye and hand to energy which for lack of a better name we call nervous the pugilist who has nothing but muscle goes down before his lighter antagonist who can keep out of his reach and the crowd loves the football hero who can duck and dodge and make the long runs one might cite a thousand illustrations such as the british bowmen breaking down the heavily armored knights or the quick moving light vessels of the british overcoming the huge galleons of spain and as society develops and becomes more complex the fighting man becomes less and less a man of muscle and more and more a man of nerve alexander caesar and napoleon would have stood a poor chance in personal combat against many of their followers they led because they were men of energy and cunning able to maintain the subtle thing we call prestige now the world has moved into an industrial era 
and those who are the great men of our time the men whose lightest words are heeded whose doings are spread upon the front pages of our newspapers obviously they are men of money we may pretend to ourselves that we do not really stand in awe of a morgan or a rockefeller but that we admire let us say an edison or a roosevelt but edison himself is a man of money and will tell you that he had to be a man of money in order to be free to conduct his experiments as for our politicians and statesmen they either serve the men of money or the men of money suppress them as they did roosevelt the morgans and the rockefellers do not do much talking they do not have to they content themselves with being obeyed and the shaping of our society is in their hands and yet some of us really believe that there are higher faculties in man than the ability to manipulate the stock market we consider that the great inventor the great poet the great moralist contributes more to the human happiness than the man who by cunning and persistence succeeds in monopolizing some material necessity of human life poets says shelley are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind if this strange statement is anywhere near to truth it is surely of importance that we should decide what are the higher powers in men and how they may be recognized and how fostered and developed what is in its essence the process of evolution from the lower to the higher forms of mental life it is a process of expanding consciousness the developing of ability to apprehend a wider and wider circle of existence to share it to struggle for it as we do for the life we call our own the test of the higher mental forms is therefore a test of universality of sympathetic inclusiveness or to use commoner words it is a test of enlightened unselfishness every human individual has the will to life the instinct of self-preservation which persuades him that he is of importance but the test of his development is his ability to realize that important though he may be he is but a small part of the universe and his highest interests are not in himself alone his highest duties are not owed to himself alone and as the life becomes more of the intellect this fact becomes more and more obvious more and more dominating men who monopolize the material things of the world and their control are necessarily self-seeking but in the realm of the higher faculties this element in the very nature of the case is forced into the background it is evident that truth is not truth for the standard oil company nor for j p morgan and company nor yet for the government of the united states it is truth for the whole of mankind and one who sincerely labors for the truth does so for the universal benefit there may be of course an element of selfishness in the activities of poets and inventors they may be seeking for fame they may be hoping to make money out of their discoveries but the greatest men we know have been dominated by an overwhelming impulse of creation and when we read their lives and discover in them signs of petty vanity or jealousy or greed we are pained and shocked what touches us most deeply is some mark of self-consecration and humility as for example when newton tells us that after all his life's labors he felt himself as a little child gathering seashells on the shore of the great ocean of truth or when alfred russell wallace discovering that darwin had been working longer than himself over the theory of the origin of the species generously withdrew and permitted the theory to go to the world in darwin's name there are three faculties in man usually described as intellect feeling and will according as one or the other faculty predominates we have a great scientist a great poet or a great moralist 
we might choose a representative of each type let us say newton shakespeare and jesus and spend much time in controversy as to which of these three types is the greatest which makes the greatest contribution to human happiness but it will suffice here to point out that the three faculties do not exclude one another every man must have all three and a perfectly rounded man should seek to develop all three jesus was considerable of a poet and we should pay far less heed to shakespeare if he had not been a moralist also there have been instances of great poets and painters who were scientists for example leonardo and goethe the fundamental difference between the scientist and the poet is that one is exploring nature and discovering things which actually exist whereas the other is creating new life out of his own spirit but the poet will find that his creations take but little hold upon life if they are not guided and shaped by a deep understanding of life's fundamental nature and needs in other words if the poet is not something of a scientist and in the same way the very greatest discoveries of science seem to us like leaps of creative imagination as if the mind had completed nature through some intuitive and sympathetic understanding of what nature wished to be the point about these higher forms of human activity is that they renew and multiply life we may say that if jesus had never lived others would have embodied and set forth with equal poignancy the revolutionary idea of the equality of all men as children of one common father and perhaps this is true but we have no way of being sure that it is true and as we look back upon the last nineteen hundred years of human history we are unable to imagine just what the life of mankind during those centuries would have been if jesus had died when he was a baby we do not know what modern thought might have been without kant or what modern music might have been without beethoven we are forced to admit that if it had not been for the patient wisdom and persuasive kindness of lincoln the slave power might have won its independence and america today might have been a military camp like europe and the lives and thoughts of every one of us would have been different or take the activities of the poet many years ago the writer was asked to name the men who had exercised the greatest influence upon him and after much thought he named three jesus hamlet and shelley and now consider the significance of this reply one of the people shelley was what we call a real person that is a man who actually lived and walked upon the earth concerning hamlet it is believed that there once was a prince of denmark by that name but the character who is known to us as hamlet is the creation of a poet's brain as to the third figure jesus the authorities dispute some say that he was a man who actually lived others believe that he was god on earth yet others very learned maintain that he is a legendary name around which a number of traditions have gathered to me it does not make a particle of difference which of these three possibilities happens to be true about jesus if he was god on earth he was god in human form under human limitations and in that sense we are all gods on earth and whether he really lived or whether some poet invented him matters not a particle so far as concerns his effect upon others the emotions which moved him the loves the griefs the high resolves existed in the soul of someone whether his name were jesus or john and these emotions have been recorded in such form that they communicate themselves to us they become a part of our souls they make us something different from what we were before we encountered them in other words the poet makes in his own soul a new life and then projects it into the world 
and it becomes a force which makes over the lives of millions of other people. If you read the vast mass of criticism which has grown up around the figure Hamlet, you learn that Hamlet is the type of the modern man. Shakespeare was able to divine what the modern man would be, or perhaps we can go farther and say that Shakespeare helped to make the modern man what he is. The modern man is more of Hamlet, because he has taken Hamlet to his heart and pondered over Hamlet's problem. Or take Don Quixote. No doubt the follies of the age of chivalry would have died out of men's heart in the end, but how much sooner they died because of the laughter of Cervantes. Or take Les Miserables. Our prison system is not ideal by any means, but it is far less cruel than it was half a century ago, and we owe this in part to Victor Hugo. Every convict in the world is to some degree a happier man because of this vision which was projected upon the world from the soul of one great poet. No one can estimate the part which the writings of Tolstoy have played in the present revolution in Russia, but this we may say with certainty. There is not one man, woman, or child in Russia at the present moment who is quite the same as he would have been if resurrection had never been written. In discussing the highest faculties of man, we have so far refrained from using the word genius. It is a word which has been cheapened by misuse, but we are now in position to use it. The things which we have just been considering are the phenomena of genius. And we can say this even though we may not know exactly what genius is. Perhaps it is, as Frederick Myers asserts, a subliminal uprush, the welling up into consciousness of some part of the content of the subconscious mind. Or perhaps it is something of what man calls divine. Or perhaps it is the first dawning, the first hint of that super race which will some day replace mankind. Perhaps we are witnessing the same thing that happened on earth when the glimmerings of reason first broke upon the mind of some poor, bewildered ape. We cannot be sure. But this much we can say, the man of genius represents the highest activity of the mind of which we as yet have knowledge. He represents the spirit of man, fully emancipated, fully conscious, and taking up the task of creation, taking human life as raw material and making it over into something more subtle, more intense, more significant, more universal than it ever was before, or ever would have been, without the intervention of this new God-man. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Myself and my neighbor compares the new morality with the old, and discusses the relative importance of our various duties. So now we may say that we know what are the great and important things in life. Slowly and patiently, with infinite distress and waste and failure, but yet inevitably, the life of man is being made over and multiplied to infinity by the power of the thinking mind, impelled by the joy and thrill of the creative action and guided by the sense of responsibility, the instinct to serve, which we call conscience. To develop these higher faculties is the task we have before us, and the supreme act to which we dedicate ourselves. So now we are in a position to define the word moral. Assuming that our arguments be accepted, that action is moral which tends to foster the best and highest forms of life we know, and to aid them in developing their highest powers. That is immoral which tends to destroy the best life we know, or to hinder its rapid development. Let us now proceed to apply these tests to the practices of man, first as an individual, and then as a social being. 
what are my duties to myself and what are my duties to the world about me you will note that these questions differ somewhat from those of the old morality jesus told us first that we should love the lord our god and second that we should love our neighbor as ourself some would say that modern thought has dismissed god from consideration but i would prefer to say that modern thought has decided that the place where we encounter god most immediately is in our miraculously expanding consciousness our duty toward god is our duty to make of ourselves the most perfect product of the divine incarnation that we can become our duty to our neighbor is to help him do the same of course as we come to apply these formulas we find that they overlap and mingle inextricably the two duties are really one duty looked at from different points of view we decide that we owe it to ourselves to develop our best powers of thinking and we discover that in so doing we make ourselves better fitted to live as citizens better equipped to help our fellow men we go out into our city to serve others by making the city clean and decent and we find that we have helped to save ourselves from a pestilence the most commonly accepted or at any rate the most commonly preached of all formulas is the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you this formula is good so far as it goes but you note that it leaves undetermined the all-important question what ought we to want others to do unto us if i am an untrained child what i would have others do unto me is to give me plenty of candy therefore under the golden rule my highest duty becomes to distribute free candy to the world the golden rule is obviously consistent with all forms of self-indulgence and with all forms of stagnation it might result in a civilization more static than china or let us take the formula which the german philosopher kant worked out as the final product of his thinking act so that you would be willing for your action to become a general rule of conduct here again is the same problem there are many possible general rules of conduct some would prefer one some others and there is no possible way of escape from the fact that before men can agree what to do they must decide what they wish to make of their lives to the formula of jesus thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself the answer is obvious enough suppose my neighbor is not worthy of as much love as myself to be sure it is a perilous thing for me to have to decide this question nevertheless it may be a fact that i am a great inventor and that my neighbor is a sexual pervert there is of course a sense in which i may love him even so i may love the deeper possibilities of his nature which religious ecstasy can appeal to and arouse but in spite of all ecstasies and all efforts it may be that his disease physical mental and moral has progressed to such a point that it is necessary to confine him or to castrate him or even to asphyxiate him painlessly to say that i must love such a man as myself is to say the least to be vague we can see how much the indiscriminate preaching of such a formula would open the floodgates of sentimentality and fraud modern thinking says thou shalt love the highest possibilities of life and thou shalt labor diligently to foster them moreover because life is always growing and new possibilities are forever dawning in the human spirit thou shalt keep an open mind and an inquiring temper and be ready at any time to begin life afresh such is the formula it is not simple and when we come to apply it we find that it constantly grows more complex when we attempt to decide our duty to ourselves we find that we have in us a number of different beings each with separate and sometimes conflicting duties and needs 
we have in us the physical man and the economic man and these clamor for their rights and must have at least a part of their rights before we can go on to be the intellectual man the moral man or the artistic man so our life becomes a series of compromises and adjustments between a thousand conflicting desires and duties between the different beings which we might be but can be only to a certain extent and at certain times we shall see as we come to investigate one field after another of human activity that we never have an absolute certainty never an absolute right never an absolute duty never can we shut our eyes and go blindly ahead upon one course of action to the exclusion of every other consideration on the contrary we sit in the seat of self-determination as a highly trained and skillful engineer we keep our eyes upon a dozen different gauges we press a lever here and touch a regulator there and we decide that now is the time for speed and now for caution and knowing all the time that the safety not merely of ourselves but of many passengers depends upon the decisions of each moment End of chapter 10 End of section 5Chapters 11 and 12 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Mind and the Body discusses the interaction between physical and mental things, and the possibility of freedom in a world of fixed causes. It is our plan, so far as possible, to discuss the problems of the mind in one section of this book and the problems of the body in another but just as we found that we could not separate our duties to ourself from our duties to our neighbors so we find that the mind and the body are inextricably interwoven and that whenever we probe deeply into one we discover the other the interaction of the mind and the body is a fascinating problem into which we must look for a moment not because we expect to solve it but because it illuminates the whole subject the human body is a machine it takes in carbon and oxygen and burns them and gives out carbon dioxide and other waste products and develops energy in proportion to the amount of carbon it consumes this machine has its elaborate apparatus of action and reaction its sensory organs where outside stimuli are received its nerves like telegraph wires to carry these impressions its brain cells to store them and to transform them into reactions we know to some extent how these brain cells work we know what portions of the brain are devoted to this or that activity we know that if we stick a pin into a certain spot we shall paralyze the left forefinger we know that by injecting a certain drug or by breathing a certain gas we can cause this or that sensation or reaction such as laughing or weeping or mania we know what poisons are generated in the system by anger and what chemical changes take place in a muscle that is tired all this is a part of a vast new science which is called biochemistry or the chemistry of life our bodies therefore are part of the material universe and subject to the laws or ways of being of this universe the first of these laws that we know is the law of causation every change in the universe has its cause and that in turn had another cause this chain is never broken no matter how far we go and the same causes universally produce the same effects if you see a ball move on a billiard table you know that the ball did not move itself you know that something struck the ball or tilted the table you discover that the motion of the ball moves the air around it and the waves of that motion are spread through the room 
they strike the walls and the motion is carried on through the walls and if we had instruments sensitive enough we could feel the motion of that billiard ball at the other side of the world and a few million years from now at the most remote of the stars this is what is called the law of the conservation of energy and when we discover something like radium which seems to violate that law by giving out unlimited quantities of energy we investigate and discover a new form of energy locked up in the atom in the disintegration of the atom we have a source of power which when we have learned to use it will multiply perhaps millions of times the powers we are now able to use on this earth but energy no matter how many times it is transformed and in what strange way it reappears always remains and is never destroyed and never created out of nothing my friend the great physiologist once took me into his laboratory and showed me a little aquarium in which some minute creatures were wiggling about young sea urchins if i remember the physiologist took a bottle containing some chemical and dropped a single drop into the water and instantly all these little black creatures which had been darting aimlessly in every direction through the water turned and swam all in one direction toward the light they swam until they touched the walls of the aquarium and there they stuck trying their best to swim farther and now said my friend that is what we call a tropism and all life is a tropism what you see in that aquarium means that some day we shall know just what combination of chemicals causes a human being to move this way or that to do this thing or that when biochemistry has progressed sufficiently we shall be able to make human qualities perhaps in the sperm perhaps in the embryo perhaps day by day by means of diet or injection said i some day when biochemistry has progressed far enough you will know what combination of chemicals causes a man to vote the democratic or republican ticket why not answered my friend he has a sense of humor about all things except this sacred biochemistry said i when you have got to that stage keep the secret carefully and we will fix up a scheme and a few days before the election we will release some gas in our big cities and sweep the country for the socialist ticket but jesting aside if the human body is a material thing existing in the material world and subject to causation there must be material reasons for the actions of human bodies just the same as for the moving of billiard balls we hear the sound of a billiard ball striking the cushion and we are prepared to accept the idea that the thing we call hearing in us is caused by the impinging of sound waves upon our eardrums and if we investigate human beings in mass we find every reason to believe that they act according to laws and that there are material causes for their act if you get up and shout fire in a theater you know how the audience will behave if you study statistics you can say that in any large city a certain fixed number of human beings are going to commit suicide every month you can even say that more are going to commit suicide in the month of june than in any other month you can say that more people are going to die at two o'clock in the morning than at any other hour you know that certain changes in the weather will cause all human beings to behave in the same way you know that an increase of prices or an increase of unemployment will cause a certain additional number of men to commit crimes and a certain additional number of women to become prostitutes you know that if a man overeats his thoughts will change their color he will have what he calls the blues I might cite a thousand other illustrations to prove that human minds are subject to material laws and therefore to investigation by the biochemists but now 
stop a moment here you sit reading a book something in the book pleases you and you say good perhaps you slap your knee or clench your fist now here is a motion of your hand which stirs the air about you and which according to the laws of energy will spread its effects to the other side of the world and even to the farthest of the stars or perhaps the book makes you angry and you throw it down in disgust an entirely different motion which will affect the other side of the world and the farthest of the stars in an entirely different way the machine of the universe will be forever altered because of that slapping of your knee or that throwing down of your book and what was the cause of these things so far as we can see the material cause was exactly the same in each case the reading of certain letters two human beings sitting side by side and reading exactly the same letters might be affected in exactly opposite ways it seems hardly rational to maintain that the material difference of two pairs of eyes moving over exactly the same set of letters could have resulted in two such different motions of the hands as a matter of fact the very same letters may affect the same person in different ways the composer edward mcdowell once told me how on his birthday his pupil sent him a gift with a card containing some lines from the opera rheingold beginning o zingefort that is o sing on but the composer happened when glancing at the card to think french instead of german and got the message o powerful monkey this of course was disconcerting to a famous piano performer and his pupils if they had been watching his face would have seen an unexpected reaction it seems manifest does it not that the cause of this difference of reaction was not any difference of the letters but purely a difference of thought so it appears that thoughts may change the material universe they may break the chain of causation and interfere with material events compare two things a state of consciousness and say a steam shovel they are entirely different and so far as we can see entirely incompatible and unrelated can anyone imagine how a thought can turn into a steam shovel or a steam shovel into a thought we can understand how a steam shovel lifts a mass of earth out of the ground and we can understand how a human hand moves a lever which causes the shovel to act but we are unable to conceive how a state of mind whether it be a desire for pay or an ideal of service or a vision of the panama canal can so affect the steam shovel as to cause it to move we can sit and think motion at a billiard ball for a thousand years and it does not move but when we think motion at our hand it moves instantly and passes on the motion to the billiard ball or the steam shovel when a fire touches our hand it sends some kind of vibration to the brain and in some inconceivable way that vibration is turned into a state of consciousness called pain and that is turned as quick as a thought into another kind of motion the jerking back of our hand so it seems certain that consciousness really does butt in on the chain of natural causes and yet just see in what position this leaves the scientist who is investigating life imagine if you can the plight of a doctor who wanted to prescribe a diet for a sick person if he knew that every piece of chicken and every fish were free to decide of its own impulse whether or not it would be digested in the human stomach but the plight of this doctor would be nothing to the plight of the chemist or the biologist or the engineer who was asked to do his thinking and his planning in a world containing a billion and a quarter human beings each one a lawless agent each one a source of new and unforeseeable energies each one acting as a first cause and starting new chains of activity 
tearing the universe to pieces according to his own whims. What kind of a universe would that be? It would simply be a chaos. There could be no thinking, there could be no life in it. There could be no two things the same in it, and no laws of any sort. So then we fall back into the hands of the determinists, who assert one unbreakable chain of natural causation, and regard the human body as an automaton. We go back to the biochemist, who purposes some day to ascertain for us just exactly what molecules of matter in just what positions and combinations in the brain cells of William Shakespeare caused him to perpetrate a mixed metaphor. We go back to the belief that human beings act as they must act, because the clock of life wound up and started must move in such and such a fashion. But now, let us see what are the implications of that theory. Here am I writing a book appealing to men to act in certain ways. Of course, I know that not all will follow my advice. Some will be foolish, or what seems to me foolish. Others will be weak and will resolve to act in certain ways and then go and act in other ways. But some will be just, some will be free, some will use their brains, because, you see, I am convinced that they can use their brains. I am convinced that ideas will affect and stir them, in complete defiance of the biochemist, who tells me that they act that way because of certain chemicals in their brain cells, and that I write my book because of other chemicals, and that my idea that I am writing this book because I want to write it is a delusion and that the whole thing is happening just so because the universe was wound up that way. Now, this is an unsolved problem, and I have no solution to offer. What I have set forth is, in substance, one of the four antinomies of Kant. And you can see for yourself how it is possible to prove either side, and impossible to be sure of either. Perhaps there is really a duality in life. Perhaps there are two aspects of the universe, the material and the spiritual. And perhaps they do not really interact as they seem to. But both are guided and determined by some higher reality of life of which we know nothing. In that case, there would really be a chemical equivalent for every thought and there would be a trace of consciousness for every material atom in the universe. Maybe the theologians are right. And in the universal consciousness of God, the whole future exists predetermined. Maybe to God there is no such thing as time. The past, the present, and the future are all alike to him. There is nothing more painful to the human mind than to have to confess its own impotence. Yet I can see no escape from the dilemma which we are here facing. There is not a man alive who does not assume the freedom of the will, who does not show in all his acts that he agrees with old Dr. Samuel Johnson. We know we are free, and there's an end on't. Without a belief in freedom, we cannot get beyond the animal. We cannot become the masters of our own souls. And yet, the man who swallows that idea whole and goes out into the world and preaches personal morality to the neglect of the fundamental economic facts, the facts of the body in its relationship to all other bodies, we know what happens to that man. He becomes a shouting fool. Unless he is literally a fool or a knave, he quickly discovers his own futility and proceeds to use his common sense. In spite of all his theories, Come to Jesus, cried William Booth, and he went out in the streets of London to save souls with a bass drum. But presently, in day-by-day -day contact with the degradation of the London slums, he realized that he could not save souls so long as those souls were dwelling in starved and lousy bodies. 
so william booth with his salvation army took to starting night shelters and cast off clothing bureaus and of exactly the same sort is the bewilderment which falls to the lot of the scientist who is honest and willing to face the facts the biochemist with his test tubes and his microscopes and his complex apparatus of research sits himself down and accumulates a mass of information about the human body he investigates the diseases of the body and learns in detail just how these diseases spread and sometimes how they are caused he can present you with a diagnosis showing the exact stage to which the degeneration of a certain organ has proceeded and perhaps he can suggest to you a change of diet or some drug which will for a time at least check the process of the breakdown but in other cases he will be perfectly helpless he will be as it were buried under the mass of detail which he has accumulated he will find the vital energy depressed and he will not know any way to renew it but along will come some mental specialist who in a half hour's talk with the patient by a simple change in the patient's ideas will completely make over the patient's life and set going a new vital process which will restore the body to its former health a religious enthusiast may do this a psychotherapist may do it a moral genius may do it and the physician with all his learning will find himself like a man on the outside of a house peering in through the windows and trying in vain to find out something about the life of the family and its guests this is humiliating to the chemist and the medical man but they have to face it because it is a fact in the seat of authority over the human body there sits a higher being which without any religious implications we may call the soul or if it is impossible to get away from the religious implication of that word we will call it the consciousness or the personality this master of the house of life is in many ways dependent upon the house if the furnace goes out he freezes and if the house takes fire and burns up well he disappears and leaves no address but in other ways the master of the house is really master and is a worker of miracles he does things which we do not at all understand and cannot yet even foresee but which often completely makes the house over william james a scientist of real authority has a wonderful essay the powers of men in which he sets forth the fact that human beings as a general rule make use of only a small portion of their energies which dwell in their beings and that one of our problems is to find out the ways by which we can draw upon stores of hidden energy which we have within us also in a fascinating book varieties of the religious experience james has endeavored to study and analyze the phenomena which hitherto the physician and the biologist have been disposed to ridicule and neglect but unless i am mistaken every scientist in the end will be forced to come back to the central fact that life is a unity and that the heart of it is the spirit that what we call the will is not an accident not a delusion not some by-product of nature but is the very secret of life and that behind it is a vast ocean of power which now and then sweeps away all dikes and floods into the human consciousness the writer of this book is now a patient and plodding teacher of a certain economic doctrine a preacher of what he might call anti-parasitism he has come to the conclusion that the habit of men to enslave their fellows and exploit them and draw their substance from them without return that this habit is destructive to all civilization and is incompatible with any of the higher forms of life intellectual moral or artistic he has come to the conclusion that there is no use attempting to build a structure of social life until there is a sound foundation 
in other words, until the capitalist system has been replaced by cooperation. But in his youth he was, or thought he was, a poet, and touched upon that strange and wonderful thing which we call genius. He saw his own consciousness, as it were a leaf driven before a mighty tempest of spiritual energy, and he believes that this experience was no delusion, but was a revelation of the hidden mysteries of his being. He still has memories of this startling experience, still hints of it in his consciousness. Something still leaps in his memory, like a racehorse, or like the war horse of revelation, which senteth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Because of these things, he can never accept any philosophy which shackles the human spirit. He will never in his thought attempt to set bounds to the possibilities of human life. The very heart of life beats in us. The wonder of it and the glory of it swells like a tide behind us. New universes are born in us or, if you prefer, they are made by us, and the process is one of endless joy, of rapture beyond anything that the average man can at present imagine, or that any instruments invented by science can weigh or measure. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Mind of the Body discusses the subconscious mind, what it is, what it does to the body, and how it can be controlled and made use of by the intelligence. The importance of the mind in matters of health becomes clearer when we understand that what we commonly call our minds, the mental states which confront us day by day in our consciousness, are really but a small portion of our total mind. In addition to this conscious mind, there is an enormous mass of our personality which is like a storehouse attached to our dwelling, a place to which we do not often go, but to which we can go in case of need. This storehouse is our memory, the things we know and can recall at will. And then there is another, still vaster storehouse. No one has ever measured or guessed the size of it which apparently contains everything that we have ever known, perhaps also everything that our ancestors have known. A common simile for the human mind is that of an iceberg. A certain portion of it appears above the surface of the sea, but there is seven times as much of it floating out of sight under the water. This subconscious mind seems to be the portion most closely united with the body. It has its seat in the back parts of the brain, in the spinal cord and the greater nervous ganglia, such as the solar plexus. It is the portion of our mind which controls the activities of our body, all those miraculous things which went on before we first opened our eyes to the light, and which go on while we sleep, and never cease until we die. When we cut our finger and admit foreign germs to our blood, some mysterious power causes millions of our blood corpuscles to be rushed to this spot to destroy and devour the invading enemy. We do not know how this is done, but it is an intelligent act, measured and precisely regulated, as much so as a railroad timetable. When the supply of nourishment in the body becomes low, something issues a notice by way of our stomach which we call hunger. When we take food into the stomach, something pours out the gastric juice to digest it. When this digested food is prepared and taken up in the bloodstream, something decides what portion of it shall be turned into muscle, what into brain cells, what into hair, what into fingernails. Sometimes, of course, mistakes are made, and we have diseases. But for the most part, all this infinitely intricate process goes on day and night without a hitch, and it is all the work of what we might call the mind of the body. And just as our material bodies are the product of an age-long process of development repeated in embryo by every individual, so is this mental life 
a product of long development, and carries memories of this far-off process. In our instincts there dwells all the past, not merely of the human race, but of all life. And if we should ever succeed in completely probing the subconscious mind and bringing it into our consciousness, it would be the same as if we were free to ramble about in all the past. Huxley set forth the fact that all the history of evolution is told in a piece of chalk. And we probably do not exaggerate in saying that all the history of the universe is in the subconscious mind of every human being. When the partridge which has just come out of the egg sees the shadow of a hawk flit by and crouches motionless as a leaf, the partridge is not acting upon any knowledge which it has acquired in the few minutes since it was hatched. It is acting upon a knowledge impressed upon its subconscious mind by the experience of millions of partridges, perhaps for tens of thousands of years. When the physician lifts the newly born infant by its ankle and spanks it to make it cry, the physician is using his conscious reason, because he has learned from previous experience, or has been taught in the schools, that it is necessary for the child's breathing apparatus to be instantly cleared. But when the child responds to the spanking with a yell, it is not moved by reason indignation at an undeserved injury. It is following an automatic reaction, as a result of the experience of infants in the Stone Age, experience which in some obscure way has been registered and stored in the infant cerebellum. Science is now groping its way through this underworld of thought. Obviously, we should have here a most powerful means of influencing the body, if by any chance we could control it. We are continually seeking in medical and surgical ways to stimulate or to retard activities of the body, which are controlled entirely by the subconscious mind. If we are suffering intense pain in a joint, we put on a mustard plaster, what we call a counter-irritant, to trouble the skin and draw the congested blood away from the place of the pain. On the other hand, we may stimulate the functions of the intestines by the application of hot fomentations, to bring the blood more actively to the region. But if by any means we could make clear our wishes to the subconscious mind, we should be dealing with headquarters, and should get quicker and more permanent results. Can we by any possibility do this? To begin with, let me tell you of a simple experiment that I have witnessed. I once knew a man who had learned to control the circulation of his blood by his conscious will. I have seen him lay his two hands on the table, both of the same color, and without moving the hands, cause one hand to turn red and the other to turn pale. And obviously, so far as this man is concerned, the problem of counter-irritants has been solved. He is a mental mustard plaster. And what was done by this man's own will can be done to others in many ways. The most obvious is a device which we call hypnotism. This is a kind of sleep which affects only the conscious control of the body, but leaves all the senses awake. In this hypnotic sleep, or trance, we discover that the subconscious mind is a good deal like the Henry Dubb of the socialist cartoons. It is faithful and persistent, very strong in its own limited field, but comically credulous, willing to believe anything that is told it, and to take orders from anyone who climbs into the seat of authority. You have perhaps attended one of the exhibitions which traveling hypnotists are accustomed to give in country villages. You have seen some bumpkin brought upon the stage and hypnotized, and told that he is in the water and must swim for his life, or that he is in the midst of a hornet's nest, or that his trousers are torn in this seat, any comical thing that will cause an audience to howl with laughter. These facts were first discovered nearly a hundred and fifty years ago by a French doctor named Mesmer. He was a good deal of a charlatan, and would not reveal his secrets, and probably the scientific men of that time were glad to despise him, 
because what he did was so new and strange. There is a certain type of scientific mind which sits aloft on a throne with a framed diploma above its head, and says that what it knows is science, and what it does not know is nonsense. And so mesmerism was left for the quacks and the traveling showmen. But half a century later, a French physician named Libo took up this method of hypnotism without all the fakery that had been attached to it. He experimented and discovered that he could cure not merely phobias and manias, fixed ideas, hysterias, and melancholias, he could cure definite physical diseases of the physical body, such as headache, rheumatism, and hemorrhage. Later on, two other physicians, Janet and Charcot, developed definite schools of psychotherapy. They rejected hypnotism as, in most cases, too dangerous, but used a milder form, which is known as hypnoidization. You would be surprised to know how many ailments which baffle the skill of medical men and surgeons yield completely to a single brief treatment by such a mental specialist. All that is necessary is some method to tap the subconscious mind. In many cases, the subconsciousness knows what is the matter and will tell at once a secret that is completely hidden from the consciousness. For example, a man's hands shake. They have been shaking for years, and he has no idea why. But his subconscious mind explains that they first began to shake with grief over the death of his wife. Also, the subconscious mind meekly and instantly accepts the suggestion that the time for grief is past, and that the hands will never shake again. Or here is a woman who has become convinced that worms are crawling all over her. Everything that touches her becomes a worm. Even the wrinkles in her dress are worms. And she is wild with nervousness and, of course, is on the way to the lunatic asylum. She is hypnotized and sees the operator catching these worms one by one and killing them. She is told that he has killed the last. But she insists, no, there is one more. The operator clutches that one, and she is perfectly satisfied and completely cured. Her husband writes, expressing his relief that he no longer has to sleep every night in a fish pond. This instance, with many others, is told by Professor Quackenboss in his book, Hypnotic Therapeutics. Among the most powerful means to influence the subconscious personality is religious excitement. Religion has come down to us from ancient times, and its fears and ecstasies are a part of our instinctive endowment. Those who can sway religious emotions can cure disease, not merely fixed ideas, but many diseases which appear to be entirely physical, but which psychoanalysis reveals to be hysterical in nature. Of course, these religious persons who heal by laying on of hands or by purely mental means deny indignantly that they are using hypnotism or anything like it. I am aware that I shall bring upon myself a flood of letters from Christian scientists if I identify their methods of curing with animal magnetism and manipulation and other devices of the devil which they repudiate. All I can say is that their miracles are brought about by affecting the subconscious mind. There is no other way to bring them about, and for my part, I cannot see that it makes a great difference whether the subconscious mind is affected by a hand laid on the forehead, or by a hand waved in the air, or by an incantation pronounced, or by a prayer thought in silence. If you can persuade the subconscious mind that God is operating upon it, that God is omnipotent and is directing this particular healing, that is the most powerful suggestion imaginable, and is the basis of many cures. But if in order to achieve this, it is necessary for me to persuade myself that I can find some meaning in the metaphysical moonshine of Mother Eddie, why, then, I am very sorry, but I really prefer to remain sick. But such is not the case. You do not have to believe anything that is not true. You simply have to understand the machinery of the subconscious and how to operate it. We are only beginning to acquire that knowledge, and we need an open mind, free both from dogmatism of the medical men 
and the fanaticism of the faith curists. A few years ago in London I met a number of people who were experimenting in an entirely open-minded way with mental healing, and I was interested in their ideas. I happened to be traveling on the continent, and on the train my wife was seized by a very dreadful headache. She was lying with her head in my lap, suffering acutely, and I thought I would try an experiment. So I put my hand upon her forehead, without telling her what I was doing, and concentrated my attention with the greatest possible intensity upon her headache. I had an idea of the cause of it. I understood that headaches are caused by the irritation of the sensory nerves of the brain by fatigue poisons or other waste matter which the blood has not been able to eliminate. I formed in my mind a vivid picture of what the blood would have to do to relieve that headache, and I concentrated my mental energies upon the command to her subconscious mind that it should perform these particular functions. In a few minutes, my wife sat up with a look of great surprise on her face and said, Why, my headache is gone. It went all at once. That, of course, might have been a coincidence. But I tried the experiment many times, and it happened over and over. On another occasion, I was able to cure the pain of an ulcerated tooth. I was able to cure it half a dozen times, but never permanently. It always returned, and finally the tooth had to come out. My wife experimented with me in the same way, and found that she was able to cure an attack of dyspepsia. But, curiously enough, she at once gave herself a case of dyspepsia, something she had never known in her life before. So now I will not allow her to experiment with me, and she will not allow me to experiment with her. But we are quite sure that people with psychic gifts can definitely affect the subconscious mind of others by purely mental means. We are prepared to believe in the miracles of the New Testament and in the wonders of Lourdes, as well as in the healings of the Christian scientists and new thoughters, which cannot be disputed by anyone who is willing to take the trouble to investigate. We can face these facts without losing our reason, without ceasing to believe that everything in life has a cause, and that we can find out this cause if we investigate thoroughly. End of chapter 12 Chapters 13 and 14 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Exploring the Subconscious Discusses automatic writing, the analysis of dreams, and other methods by which a whole new universe of life has been brought to human knowledge. One of the most common methods of exploring the subconscious mind is the method of automatic writing. I have never tried this myself, but tens of thousands of people are sitting every night with a Ouija board in front of them, holding a pencil on a piece of paper and letting their subconscious minds write what they please. Most of them are hoping to get messages from the dead, a problem which we shall discuss in the next chapter. Suffice it for the moment to say that automatic writing and table wrapping and other devices of mediumship have opened up to us a vast mass of subconscious mentality. A part of the scientific world still takes a contemptuous attitude and calls this all humbug. But many of our greatest scientists have been persuaded to investigate and have become convinced that in this mass of subconsciousness there is mingled not merely the mind of the medium, but the minds of all those present, and possibly other minds as well. For my part, I do not see how anyone can study disinterestedly the proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research and not become convinced that telepathy at least is one of the powers of the subconscious mind. Telepathy is what is popularly known as thought transmission. Everyone must know people who are what is called psychic, and will know what is happening to some friend in another part of the world, or will go upstairs because they sense that someone wants them, 
or will go to the door because they have a hunch that someone is coming. And maybe these things are only chance. But you will be unscientific if you do not take the trouble to read and learn what modern investigators have brought out on such subjects. This much is certain, and is denied by no competent investigator. Whatever has been in your mind is there still, and it is possible to find a way of tapping that buried memory. An old woman, delirious with fever, begins to babble in a strange language, and it is discovered that she is talking ancient Hebrew. The woman is entirely illiterate, and her conscious memory knows no language but her own. Her conscious mind has no ideas behind those of her domestic life and the gossip of the village. But investigation is made, and it is discovered that when this woman was a girl, she worked in the home of a Hebrew scholar, and heard him reading aloud. She did not understand a word of what she heard, and was not consciously listening to it. Nevertheless, every syllable of it had been stored away forever by her subconscious mind. Innumerable cases of this sort have been established, and, as a matter of fact, we might have been prepared for such discoveries by the memory feats of the conscious mind. It is well known that Mozart, when a child, could listen to a new opera and go home and play it over, note for note. At present there is a child in America, given exhibitions in public, carrying on thirty games of chess at the same time. There have been others who do sums of mental arithmetic, such as multiplying thirty-two figures by thirty-two figures, or reciting the Bible backwards. All this seems incredible, and yet there is something still more incredible. Suppose that these same powers, which are stored in our subconscious minds, were stored also in the minds of animals. A few years ago, Maurice Metterlink published a book, The Unknown Guest, in the course of which he tells about his experiments with the so-called Elberfeld horses two animals which had been trained for years by their owner to give signals by moving their forefeet, and which apparently could count and divide and multiply large sums and extract square and cube root, and spell out names, and recognize sounds and scents and colors, and read time from the face of a watch. Of course it is easy to say that this is absurd, that the horses must have got some signals from their trainer, but, as it happened, they would do their work in the absence of their trainer. They would do it in the dark, or with a sack over their heads, and the best scientific minds of Germany were unable to suggest any test conditions which could not be met. There have been many gigantic frauds in the world, and this may have been one of them. On the other hand, there have been many new discoveries and I, for my part, will finish exploring the miracles of the subconscious mind of man, before I presume to say that anything is impossible in the subconscious mind of a horse or a dog. Also, I will wait for some learned person to explain to me how the subconscious minds of horses and dogs know enough to build and repair their bones and teeth, so cleverly that modern architectural and engineering science could teach them nothing. I ask also, if it is possible to find a region in the subconsciousness which is common to two people, why is it absurd to suggest that there might be a region common to a man and a horse? Why is this any more absurd than that they should eat the same food and breathe the same air and feel the same affection and be frightened at the same dangers? The only persons who will be dogmatic about such subjects are the persons who are ignorant. Those who take the trouble to investigate discover more wonderful things every day, and they realize that we have here a whole universe of knowledge, to which we have as yet barely opened the doors. Consider, for example, the facts which we are acquiring on the subject of personality and what it means. You would say, perhaps, that if there is anything you know positively, 
it is that you are one person and have never been anybody else and that your body belongs to you and that nobody else ever has used or ever can use it but what would you say if i told you that tomorrow you might cease to be and somebody else might be in possession of your body walking it around and wearing its clothes and spending its money what if i were to tell you that there might be in you or in your body half a dozen different personalities which you have never known or dreamed of and that tomorrow there might break out a war between them and you as to which of the half dozen people should hear with your ears and speak with your tongue and walk about with your clothes on unless you are familiar with the literature of multiple personality you would surely say that this was unbelievable quite as much so as a mathematical horse let us begin with the case of rev ansel bourne who was many years ago a perfectly respectable clergyman in a rhode island town one day he disappeared and his family did not hear of him a year or two later there was a storekeeper in a town in pennsylvania who suddenly came to himself as the rev ansel bourne not knowing what he had been in the meantime or how he came to be keeping a store under hypnotism it developed that he had in him two personalities and his trance personality recollected all that had been happening in the meantime and told about it freely or take the still more fascinating case of a young lady who is known in the literature of psychotherapy as miss beauchamp her story is told in the book the dissociation of personality by dr morton prince of boston some thirty years ago miss beauchamp a very conscientious and dignified young lady became nervous and ill and took to doing strange things which were a source of shame and humiliation to her under hypnotism it was discovered to be a case of multiple personality the other personality who finally gave herself the name of sally was entirely different in character from miss beauchamp being mischievous vain and primitive as a child she conceived an intense dislike for miss beauchamp whom she called by abusive names at times when she could get possession of miss beauchamp's body she delighted in playing humiliating tricks upon her enemy spending her money running her into debt breaking her engagements disgracing her before her friends sally was always well and miss beauchamp was always ill and sally would take the body for which they fought for possession and take it for long and exhausting walks and leave it cold and miserable lost and penniless in the possession of miss beauchamp and of course this made miss beauchamp more and more a wreck and sally took possession of more and more of her time sally knew everything that miss beauchamp did and thought but miss beauchamp did not know about sally she only knew that there were gaps in her life during which she did things she could not explain and because she did not want her friends to think her insane she would try to hide this dreadful condition of affairs but sally would spoil her plans by writing letters to her friends and also by writing insulting letters for miss beauchamp to find when she took possession again then one day after several years of treatment there appeared yet another personality who knew nothing about miss beauchamp or sally either and only knew what miss beauchamp had known up to some years before miss beauchamp had a college education and wrote and spoke french sally knew no french and tried in vain to learn it the new personality did not have a college education at all nevertheless after long experiment the story of which is as fascinating as any novel you ever read dr prince discovered that this was the real miss beauchamp the others were split off personalities he traced the cause to a severe mental shock and succeeded in the end in combining the first miss beauchamp with the last and in suppressing the obstinate and wanton sally as you read this story you watch him mentally murdering a human being sally clamors pitifully for life but he condemns her to death 
and relentlessly executes his sentence. It is a movie thriller with a happy ending, and I should think it would make disconcerting reading to persons who believe that each of us is one immortal soul, or has one immortal soul, and is responsible for it to a personal God. There is never any end to the problems of these multiple personalities, and each case is a test of the judgment and ingenuity of the specialist. He will try to make one personality stick, and will fail, and will have to accept another, or a combination of two. In one case, he found that he could not get the right personality to stick, except under hypnosis. So he decided to leave the man in a mild state of trance, and the new personality lived all the rest of its life in that condition. If you wish to know more about this subject, you can find books in any well-equipped library. I mention one, The Riddle of Personality, by H. Addington Bruce, because it contains in the appendix an excellent list of the literature of the subconscious in all its many aspects. There is another and most fascinating method of exploring the underworld of the mind, and that is the study of dreams. Some fifteen years ago, a psychotherapist in New York told me about the discoveries of a physician in Vienna, and gave me some pamphlets, written in very difficult and technical German. Since then, this Professor Freud has been translated and has become a fad, and the absurdities of his followers make one a little apologetic for him. But we do not give up Jesus because of the torturers and bigots who call themselves Christians, and in the same way we have no right to blame Freud for all the absurdities of the psychoanalysts. Probably there never was a time in human history when there were not people who interpreted dreams, and you can still buy dream books for 25 cents and learn that a white horse means that you are going to get a letter from your sweetheart tomorrow, and then you can buy another dream book telling you that a white horse means that there is going to be a death in your family within the year. Naturally, this prejudice is thinking people against dream analysis. Yet, dreams are facts, and every fact has its cause. And if you dream about a white horse, there must assuredly be some reason for your dreaming this particular thing. Of course we know that if you eat mince meat pie and Welsh rabbit at midnight, you'll dream about something terrible. But will it be snakes, or will it be a railroad wreck, or will it be white horses trampling over you? Obviously, it may be a million different unpleasant things. And what is it that picks out this or that from the infinite store of your memory and brings it into the region of half-consciousness, which we call dream? Professor Freud's discovery is, in brief, that the dream is a wish-fulfillment. Our instincts present to our consciousness a great mass of impulses and desires, and among these the consciousness selects what it pleases and represses and refuses to recognize or to act upon the others. But maybe these decisions are not altogether satisfactory to the subconsciousness. The mind of the body is in rebellion against the mind, shall we say, of reason, or shall we say, of society. The mind of society, otherwise known as the moral law, says that you shall be a good little boy and shall go to school and learn what you are told, and on Sunday go to church and sit very still through a long sermon, whereas the body of a boy would rather be a savage, hunting birds' nests and scalping enemies and exploring magic caves full of precious jewels. So the subconsciousness of the boy balked and miserable, awaits its time and finds its satisfaction when the boy is asleep and his moral censor has relaxed its control. This dream mind is not a logical and orderly thing like the conscious mind. It is not businesslike and civilized. It does not deal in abstractions. It is far more interested in things than in words. It does not present us with formulas but with pictures, 
and with stories of weird and wonderful happenings. It is like the mind of the race, which we study in legends and religions. It does not tell us that the sun is a mass of incandescent hydrogen gas, so and so many miles in diameter. It tells us that the sun is a cosmic hero who slays the black dragon of night. So the mind of our body presents us with innumerable pictures and symbols exactly such as we find in poetry. There may be, and frequently is, dispute as to just what a poet meant by this or that particular image. But if we read all the work of any particular poet, we get a certain impression of that poet's individuality. If he is always talking about the perfume of women's hair and the gleam of the white flesh of nymphs in the thickets, we are not left in doubt as to what is wrong with this poet. And just so, when the expert sets to work to examine all the dreams that any one person can remember, day after day, sooner or later the expert observes that these dreams hover continually about one particular subject and by questioning the person he can find out what is the secret which is troubling the person perhaps without the person himself being aware of it of course there are many people who like nothing so much as to talk about themselves and many are spending their time and their money on the latest fad of being psyched who would in any properly organized world be put to work at hoeing weeds or washing their own clothes Nevertheless, it is a fact that there are real mental disorders in the world, and innumerable honest and earnest people who have something the matter with them which they do not understand. Here is one way by which the conscientious investigator can find out what the trouble is and make it clear to them, and by establishing harmony between their conscious and their subconscious minds can many times put them in a way of health and happiness. Through psychoanalysis, we are enabled to understand the split personality and its cause. We discover that almost everyone has more or less rudimentary forms of multiple personality hidden within them, made out of desires and traits which he does not like, or which the world forces him to drive into the deeps of his being. These may be evil impulses of sex or violence, they may be the most noble altruisms, or artistic yearnings, ridiculous things in a world of hustle. A quite normal man or woman may keep a separate self, apart from the world, living a jekyll life of business propriety and a hyde life of religious or musical ecstasy. Or again, the repressed impulses may integrate themselves in the unconscious, and you may have genius or lunacy, or both great wits to madness near allied the modern knowledge on such dark mysteries you may find in hearts the psychology of insanity end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen the problem of immortality discusses the survival of personality from the moral point of view that is have we any claim upon life entitling us to live forever? As we explore the deeps of the subconsciousness, our own and other people's, we find ourselves confronting the strange question. Is it all our own mind and that of other living people, or are we by any chance dealing with the minds of those who are dead? A great many earnest people and some very learned people are fully convinced that the latter is the case, and we have now to consider their arguments. When I was a little boy, I used to read and hear ghost stories, and would shudder over them, but I was given to understand that all this was just imagination. I must not take ghosts seriously, any more than fairies or dragons or nymphs or satyrs. For an educated person to take ghosts seriously, well, such a person would be almost as comical as that supremely comical person, the flying machine man. Would you believe it? In those days, there actually were people who believed that they could learn to fly in the air, 
and spent their time manufacturing machines for this purpose. There was a scientist in Washington who had this bug and built himself a machine and started to fly, and he fell into the Potomac River. We all laughed at him. We laughed so long and so loud that we killed the poor man. And then, a few years later, somebody took that machine of Professor Langley's and actually did fly with it. But that was after I had grown up a bit more, and was not quite so ready to laugh at an idea because it was new. I remember vividly my first meeting with a man who believed in ghosts. He was a Unitarian clergyman, the Reverend Minot J. Savage of New York. I was sixteen years old, and just breaking out of my theological shell, and Dr. Savage helped to pry me loose. He was a grave and kindly man, of great learning and intelligence, and I remember vividly my consternation when one day he told me, oh yes, he had seen many ghosts. He was accustomed to talk with ghosts every now and then. There was no doubt whatever that ghosts existed. He told me many stories. I remember one so well that I do not have to go back to his books to look up the details. It was in the days before the Atlantic Cable, and he had a friend who took a steamer to England. One night Dr. Savage was awakened and found the ghost of his friend standing by his bedside. The ship had gone down off the Irish coast, so the ghost declared, but the friend did not want Dr. Savage to think that he had suffered from the pangs of drowning. He had been struck on the left side of the head by a beam of the ship and had been killed instantly. Dr. Savage wrote down these circumstances and had them witnessed by a number of people, and two or three weeks later he received word that the body of his friend had been found on the Irish coast, with the left side of his head crushed in. So then, of course, I studied the subject of ghosts. I have studied it off and on ever since, and have read most of the important new discoveries and arguments of the psychic researchers. To begin with, I will mention the contents of two large volumes, Gurney's Phantasms of the Living. In this book are narrated many hundreds of cases of which Dr. Savage's story is a type. It appears that persons at the moment of death or in times of great mental stress do somehow have the power to communicate with other people, even at the other side of the world. A few such cases might be attributed to coincidence or to fraud, but when you have so many cases attested in minute detail by so many hundreds of otherwise honest people, you are not being scientific, but simply stupid if you dismiss the whole subject with contempt. Gurney discusses the phenomenon and its probable causes. We know, of course, that hallucinations are among the most common of psychic phenomena. Your subconscious mind can be caused to see and hear and feel anything. Likewise, it has power to cause you to see and hear and feel anything. In practically all cases of multiple personality, some of the split-off personalities can cause the others to see and hear and feel. And the consciousness, you must understand, takes these things to be just as real as real things. There is no way you can tell a hallucination from reality, except to ask other people about it. And if we admit the idea of telepathy, we may say that phantasms are hallucinations caused by this means. That is, the subconscious mind of your wife or your mother or your friend who is ill or dying transmits to your subconscious mind some vivid impression which causes your own subconscious mind to present to your consciousness a perfect image of that person walking and talking with you and your consciousness has no way of telling but that the image is real so much for phantasms of the living. But are there any phantasms of the dead? Are there any cases in which the time of the appearance can be proven to be subsequent to the time of death? Even this would not prove survival, of course, 
it is perfectly possible that the telepathic impulse might be delayed in our own minds it might not flash into consciousness until our own state of mind made it possible. Can we say that there are cases in which the facts communicated are such as to convince us that the person was already dead, and was telling us something as a dead person, and not as a living one? Before we go into this question, let us clear the ground for the subject by discussing the survival of personality from a more general standpoint. What is it that we want to prove? What are the probabilities of its being true? What would be the consequences of its not being true? Have we any grounds other than those of psychic research for thinking that it is true, or that it may be true, or that it ought to be true? What, so to speak, are the morals of the doctrine of immortality well to begin with the survival of the soul after death and forever is one of the principal doctrines of the christian religion many devout christians will read this book and i will seem to them blasphemous when i say that this argument does not concern me i count myself one of the lovers and friends of jesus i am presumptuous enough to believe that if he were on earth I would understand him, and get along with him excellently. But I do not know any reason why I should believe this, that, or the other doctrine about life, because any religious sect founded upon the name of Jesus commands me so to believe. I see no more reason for adopting the idea of heaven because it is a Christian idea than I see for adopting the idea of reincarnation because it is a precious and holy idea to hundreds of millions of Buddhists. I have some very good friends who are theosophists, and are quite convinced of this idea of reincarnation. That is, that the soul comes back to life over and over again in many different bodies, thus completing itself and renewing itself and expiating its sins. My theosophist friends have a most elaborate and complicated body of what they consider to be knowledge on this subject. Yet I have to take the liberty of saying that I cannot see that it has any relation to reality. It seems to me as completely unproven as any other fairy story or myth or legend. For example, the seven infernos of Dante, and the elaborate and complicated torments that are suffered there. But it will be argued jesus rose from the dead and thus proved the immortality of the soul now in the first place there are many learned investigators who consider there is insufficient evidence for believing that jesus ever lived and certainly if this be so it will be difficult to prove that he rose from the dead again it was a common occurrence for crucified men not to die Sometimes it happened that their guards allowed them to be spirited away. Even nowadays we have known of prison guards being bribed to allow a prisoner to escape. Again, the events of the return of Jesus may have been just such psychic phenomena as we are trying in this chapter to explain. Or, once more, they may have been purely legends. A very brief study will convince a thinking person that the people of that time were ready to believe anything, and to accept facts upon such authority, and to make them the basis for a scientific conclusion, is simply to be childish. I shall be told, of course, that it is in the Bible, and therefore it must be true. The Bible is inspired, you say, and perhaps this is so, but then a great deal of other literature is inspired and that does not relieve me of the task of comparing these various inspirations and judging them and picking out what is of use to me the bible is the literature of the ancient hebrews for a couple of thousand years it represents what the race mind of a great people for one generation after another judged worth recording and preserving you may get an idea what this means if you will picture to yourself a large volume of English literature, containing some Teutonic myths, and the Saxon Chronicles, and the Mort d'Artur, and several of Chaucer's stories, 
and some Irish fairy tales, and some of Bacon's essays, and Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, and the English prayer book, and the architect's specification for Westminster Abbey, and a good part of Burke's peerage, also Blackstone's commentaries, a number of Wesley's hymns, and Pope's essay on man, and some chapters from Carlyle's past and present, and Gladstone's speeches, and Blake's poems, and Captain Cook's story of his voyage around the world, and Southey's life of Nelson, and Morris's news from nowhere, and Blatchford's Merry England, and scores of pages from Hansard, which is the equivalent of our congressional record. You may find this description irreverent, but do not think it is meant so. Do me the honor to get out your Bible and look it over from this point of view. But if you say, if we die altogether when we finish this earthly life, what becomes of moral responsibility and the punishment of sins? What shall we say to the wicked man to make him be good, if we cannot reward him with a heaven and frighten him with a hell? Well, my first answer is that we have been trying this process for a couple of thousand years, and the results seem to indicate that we might better seek out some other method of inducing men to behave themselves. They do not believe so completely in heaven and hell these days, but there were times in history when they did believe completely, and not merely were the believers just as cruel, they were just as treacherous and just as gluttonous and just as drunken. If you want to satisfy yourself on this point, I refer you to my book, The Prophets of Religion, page 129. Now, as a matter of fact, I think I can discern the outlines of a system of rewards and punishments automatically working in the life of men. I am not sure that I can prove that the wicked always get punished and the virtuous always rewarded. Yet, when I stop and think, I am sure that I would not care to change places with any of the wicked people that I know in this world. Life may not always be getting them, but it has a way of getting their descendants. And I could not be entirely happy if I knew that my son and his sons were going to share the fate which I now observe befalling, for example, the Grand Dukes of Russia and their children. Life is one thing, and it does not exist for the individual, but for the race. Its causes and effects do not always manifest themselves in one individual, but in a line of descendants. Why are they called dynasties? asked one of my professors of history, and a student brought the session to an end by answering, because that is what they always seem to do. But this is not perfect justice, you will argue. It is not perfect, from the point of view of you or of me. But then I ask, what else is there in the world that is perfect from that point of view? Why should our justice be any more perfect than, for example, our health, or our thinking, or our climate, or our government? And... May it not very well be that our justice is up to us in precisely the same way that some of these other things are up to us? Maybe what we have to do is to set to work to see to it that virtue does always get rewarded and vice does always get punished, right here and now, instead of waiting for an omnipotent God to attend to it in some hypothetical heaven. I find this life of mine very wonderful and enormously interesting. I am willing to take it on the terms that it is given, and to try to make the best of it, and I do not see that I have any right to dictate what shall be given me in some future life. If my father gives me a Christmas present, I am happy and grateful, and of course if I know that he is going to give me another present next Christmas, I am still more happy but I do not see that I have any right to argue that because he gives me one Christmas present, he must give me an unlimited number of them. And I think it would be very ungrateful of me to refuse to thank him for a Christmas present until I made sure that I was going to get one the next time. 
neither do i find myself such a wonderful person that i can assert that the morality of the universe absolutely depends upon the fact that i am immortal of course i should like to live forever and to know all the wonderful things that are going to happen in the world and if it is true that i am so to live i shall be immensely delighted but i cannot say that it must be true and all I can do is to investigate the possibilities. On this point my view is stated in a sentence of Spinoza's. He who would love God rightly must not desire that God love him in return. To sum up, the question of immortality is purely a question of fact. It is one to be approached in a spirit of open-minded inquiry, entirely unaffected by hopes or fears or dogmas or moral claims. It is worthwhile to get clear that we may be immortal, even though we do not know it and cannot now prove it. It is possible that all psychic research might end in telepathy, and still, when we die, we might wake up and find ourselves alive. It might possibly be that some of us are immortal, and not all of us. It might be that some parts of us are immortal, but not the rest. It might be that our subconsciousness is immortal, and not our consciousness. It might be that all of us, or some part of us, survive for a time, but not forever. This last is something which I myself am inclined to think may be the case. Also, it seems worthwhile to mention that it is no argument against immortality that we cannot imagine it that we cannot picture a universe consisting of uncountable billions of living souls, or what these souls would do to pass the time. It may very well be that among these souls there is no such thing as time. It may be that they are thoroughly occupied in ways beyond our imagining. Or, again, that they are not occupied, and under no necessity of being occupied. Let the person who presents such arguments begin by picturing to you how the brain cells manage to store up the uncounted millions of memories which you have, the thousands of words and combinations of words, and the thoughts which go with them, musical notes and tunes, colors and odors and visual impressions, memories of the past and hopes of the future and dreams that never were. Where are all these hundreds of millions of things? And what are they like when they are not in our consciousness? And how do they pass the time? And where were they in the hundreds of millions of years before we were born? And where will they be in the hundreds of millions of years of the future? When our wise men can answer these questions completely, it will be time enough for them to tell us about the impossibility of immortality. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The Evidence for Survival Discusses the data of psychic research and the proofs of spiritism thus put before us. Let us now take up the question of survival of personality after death, from the strictly scientific point of view. Let us consider what facts we have, and the indications they seem to give. First, we know that to all appearances the consciousness and the subconsciousness are bound up with the body. They grow with the body, they decline with the body, they seem to die with the body. We can irretrievably damage the consciousness by drawing a whiff of cyanogen gas into our lungs, or by sticking a pin into the brain, or by clogging one of its tiny blood vessels with waste matter. It is terrible to us to think that the mind of a great poet or prophet or statesman may be snuffed out of existence in such a way. But then, it is no argument against the fact to say that it is terrible. Insanity is terrible, war is terrible, pestilence is terrible. So also are tigers and poisonous snakes. 
but all these things exist and all these things have power over the wisest and greatest mind to put an end to its work on this earth at least and now we come with the new instrument of psychic research to probe the question what becomes of this consciousness when it disappears can we prove that it is still in existence and is able by any method to communicate with us those who answer yes argue that the mind of the dead person unable to use its own bodily machinery any longer manages in the hypnotic trance to use the bodily machinery of another person called a medium and by it to make some kind of record to identify itself this of course is a strange idea and requires a good deal of proof the law of probability requires us not to accept an unlikely explanation if there is any more simple one which can account for the facts when we examine the product of automatic writing table tipping and other psychic phenomena we have first to ask ourselves is there anything in all this which cannot be explained by what we already know then second we have to ask is there any other supposition which will explain the facts and which is easier to believe than the spirit theory these spirits apparently desire to convince us of their reality and they tell us many things which are expected to convince us they tell us things which we ourselves do not know and which spirits might know but here again we run up against the problem of the subconsciousness with its infinite mass of forgotten knowledge it is not so easy for the spirits to tell us things which we can be sure our subconscious mind could not possibly contain also there comes the additional element of telepathy it appears to be a fact that under trance conditions or under especially exciting conditions of the consciousness one mind can reach out and take something out of another mind or one mind can cause something to be passed over to another mind and so information can be communicated to the mind of a medium and can appear in automatic writing or in clairvoyance or in crystal gazing one of the most conscientious and earnest of all the investigators of this subject was the late professor hislop who many years ago sought to teach me practical morality from the bourgeois point of view in columbia university professor hislop worked for fifteen years with a medium by the name of mrs piper who was apparently sincere and was never exposed in any kind of fraud in professor hislop's books you will find innumerable instances of amazing facts brought out in mrs piper's trances you will find professor hislop arguing that the only way telepathy can account for these facts is by the supposition that there is a universal subconscious mind or that the subconscious mind of the medium possesses the power to reach into the subconscious mind of every other living person and take out anything from it but for my part i cannot see that the case is quite so difficult professor hislop recites for example how mrs piper would tell him facts about some long dead relative the facts which he did not know but was later able to verify but that proves simply nothing at all because there could be no possible way for professor hislop to be sure that he had never known these facts about his relatives the facts might have been in his subconscious mind without having ever been in his conscious mind at all he might have heard people talking about these matters while he was reading a book or playing as a boy paying no attention to what was said and then came sir oliver lodge with his investigations i will say this for his work he was the first person who was able to make real to my mind the startling idea that perhaps after all the dead might be alive and able to communicate with us you will find what he has to say in his book the survival of man and it seems fair that a great scientist and a great man should have a chance to convince you of what seemed to him the most important facts in the world sir oliver's son raymond was killed in a war 
and it is claimed that he began at once to communicate with his family. Among other things, he told them of the existence of a picture, which none of them had ever seen or heard of, a group photograph, which he described in detail. But, of course, other people in this group knew of the existence of the photograph, and so we have again the possibility that some member of Sir Oliver's family may have taken into his subconscious mind, without knowing it, an impression or description of that picture. If you care to experiment, you'll find that you can frequently play a part in dreams of a child by talking to it in its sleep. And that is only one of a thousand ways by which some member of a family might acquire, without knowing it, information of the existence of a photograph. There is another possibility to be considered, that a portion of the consciousness may survive, and not necessarily forever. We are accustomed when death takes place to see the body before us, and we know that we can preserve the body for thousands of years if we wish. Why is it not possible that when conscious life is brought to a sudden end, there may remain some portion of the consciousness or of the subconsciousness cut off from the body and slowly fading back into the universal mind energy, whatever we please to call it. There's a hard part of the body, the skeleton, which survives for some time. Why might there not be a central core of the mind, which is similarly tough and enduring? Of course, if consciousness is a function of the brain, it must decay as the brain decays. But how would it be if the brain were a function of the consciousness? Which is, so far as I can see, quite as likely a guess. I find many facts which seem to indicate the plausibility of this idea. I notice that in trance phenomena, it is the spirits of those recently dead which seem to manifest the most vitality. Of course, you can go to any seance in the white light district of your city and receive communications from the souls of Caesar and Napoleon and Alexander the Great and Pocahontas. And if the medium does not happen to be literary, you can communicate with Hamlet and Don Quixote and Siegfried and Achilles. But you will not find much reality about any of these people. They will not tell you very much about the everyday details of their lives. This fact that so much of what the spirits tell us is of our own time tends to cast down on the idea that the dead survive forever. How simple it would be to convince us if the spirit of Sophocles would come back to earth and tell us where to dig in order to find copies of his lost tragedies. You would think that the soul of Sophocles, seeing our great need of beauty and wisdom, would be interested to give us his works. From genius operating under the guidance of the conscious mind, we get sublimity, majesty, and power. But what the trance mediums give us suggests, both in its moral and intellectual quality, the operation of the subconscious. It is exactly like what we get, for example, from dissociated personalities. There are, to be sure, the books of patients' worth, produced by the automatic writing of a lady in St. Louis, who tells us in evident good faith that her conscious personality is entirely innocent of patience and all her thoughts and doings. Patience writes long novels and dramas in a quaint kind of old English, and the lady in St. Louis knows nothing about this language. But does she positively know that when she was a child, she never happened to be in the room with someone who was reading old English aloud? Nothing seems more likely than that her subconscious mind heard some quaint, strange language, and took possession of it, and built up a personality around it, and even made a new language and a new literature from that starting point. That is precisely the kind of thing in which the subconscious revels. It creates new characters with an imagination infinite and inexhaustible. Who has not waked up and has been astounded at the variety and reality of a dream? Who has not told his dreams and laughed over them? The subconscious will play at games. It will act and rehearse elaborate roles. 
it will put on costumes and delight in being caesar and napoleon and alexander the great and pocahontas and hamlet and don quixote and siegfried and achilles yes it will even play at being spirits it will be mischievous and impish it will be swallowed up with a sense of its own importance taking an insolent delight in convincing the world's most learned scientists of the fact that its play-acting is reality it will call itself raymond to move and thrill a grief-stricken family it will call itself finuit and dr hodgson and cause an earnest professor of practical morality to give up a respectable position in columbia university and write books to convince the world that the dead are sending him messages consider for example the multiple personality of miss beauchamp remember that here we are not dealing with any guesswork about spirits here we have half a dozen different controls none of them the least bit dead but all of them a part of the consciousness of one entirely alive young lady a specialist has spent some six years investigating the case day after day week after week writing down the minute details of what happens and now consider the miscreant known as sally sally is just as real as any child whom you have ever held in your arms sally has love and hate fear and hope pain and delight and sally is a little demon created entirely out of the subconsciousness of a highly refined and conscientious young college graduate of boston sally spends miss beauchamp's money on candy and eats it sally pawns miss beauchamp's watch and deliberately loses the ticket sally uses miss beauchamp's lips and tongues to tell lies about miss beauchamp sally strikes miss beauchamp dumb or makes her hear exactly the opposite of what is being spoken to her yes and sally pleads and fights frantically for her life sally enters into intrigues with other parts of miss beauchamp and for years deliberately fools dr prince who is her recording angel and heavenly judge and can anybody doubt that sally could have fooled a grieving mother and made that mother think she was talking to the ghost of a long-lost child can anybody doubt that sally could and would play the part of any person she had ever known or of any historic character she had ever read about and don't overlook the all-important fact that the conscious miss beauchamp was absolutely innocent of all this and was horrified when she was told about it so here you have the following situation no matter of guesswork but definitely established your dearest friend may act as a medium and in all good faith may bring to the surface some part of his or her subconsciousness which masquerades before you in a hundred different roles and plays upon you with deliberate malice the most subtle and elaborate and cruel tricks and how much worse the situation becomes when to this there is added the possibility of conscious fraud when the medium is a person who is taking your money and thrives by making you believe in the spirits she produces you may go to lilydale in new york state the home of the spiritualists where they have a convention every summer and in row after row of tents you may hear and even see every kind of spirit you ever dreamed of ringing bells shaking tambourines and dancing jigs and you may see poor farmers wives with tears streaming down their cheeks listening to the endearments of their dead children and to wisdom from the lips of oliver wendell holmes speaking with a bowery accent this kind of thing was exposed many years ago by will irwin in a book called the medium game and then after traveling from one kind of medium to another and studying all their frauds irwin tells how he went into a parlor on sixth avenue and there by a fat old woman who had never seen him before was suddenly told the most intimate secrets of his life it has recently been announced that thomas edison is at work upon a device to enable spirits to communicate with the living if there really are spirits seeking to do this it is edison's idea 
that spirits may inhabit a kind of infinitely rarefied astral body, and he proposes to manufacture an instrument which is sensitive to an impression many millions of times fainter than anything the human body can feel. This should make it easier for the spirits, and should constitute a fairer test, possibly a decisive one. When that machine is perfected and put to work by scientific men, I wish to suggest a few tests which will convince me that there really are spirits, and that the results are not to be explained by telepathy. First, assuming that the spirits live forever, there are some useful things which were known to the people of ancient time, and are not known to anyone living now. For example, let one of the Egyptian craftsmen come forward and tell us the secret of their glass staining, which I understand is now a lost art. And then Sophocles, as I have already suggested, will tell us where we can find his lost dramas. Or if he doesn't know where any of the copies are buried, let him find in the spirit world some scribe or librarian or book lover who can give us this priceless information. All over the ancient lands are buried and forgotten cities, and in those cities are papyrus scrolls and graven tablets and bricks. Infinite stores of knowledge are thus concealed from us. And how simple for the ancient ones who possess this information to make it known to us, and so to convince us of their reality. Or again, supposing that spirits are not immortal, but that they slowly fade from life as do their bodies. Suppose that a Raymond Lodge or other recently dead soldier wishes to communicate with his father and to convince his father that it is really an independent being and not simply a part of the father's subconscious mind. Let him try something like this. Let the father write six brief notes and put them in six envelopes all alike and shuffle them up and put them in a hat and draw out one of them. Now, assuming that the experimenter is honest, there is no living human being who knows the content of that envelope. And if the medium is dipping into the subconscious mind of the experimenter, the chances are one in six of the right note being hit upon. Assuming that spirits may not be able to get inside an envelope and read a folded letter, there is no objection to the experimenter, providing he is honest, and provided there are no mirrors or other tricks, holding the envelope behind his back, tearing it open, spreading it out for the convenience of the spirit. And now, if the spirit can read that letter correctly every time, we shall be fairly certain that, whatever force we are dealing with, it is not the subconscious mind of the experimenter. Or let us take another test. Let us have a roulette wheel in a covered box, or hidden away so that no one but the spirit can see it. We spin the wheel, and any one of the habitués of Monte Carlo can figure out the chance of the little ball dropping into any particular number. If now the spirit can tell us each time where we shall find the ball, we shall know that we are dealing with knowledge which does not exist either in the conscious or the subconscious mind of any living human being. Among the things that spirits have been accustomed to do, since the days when they first made their appearance with the Fox sisters in America, are the lifting of tables and the ringing of bells and the assuming of visible forms. These are what is known as materializations. And when I was a boy and used to hear people talking about these things, there was always one test required. Let the materializations manifest themselves upon recording instruments scientifically devised. Let photographs be taken of them. Let them be weighed and measured, and so on. Well, time has moved forward, and these tests have been met, and it appears that materializations are facts, although it is still as uncertain as ever what they are materializations of. An English scientist, Professor Crawford, has published a book entitled The Reality of Psychic Phenomena, in which he tells the results of many years of testing materializations by the strictest scientific methods. When the medium levitates a table, that is, causes it to go up in the air without physical contact, 
it appears that her own weight increases by exactly the weight of the table. When she exerts any force, which apparently she can do at a distance, the recording instruments show the exact counterforce in her own body. The results of these investigations are calculated at first to take your breath away. It begins to appear that the theosophists may be right, and that we may have one or more astral bodies within or coincident with the physical body, and that under trans conditions we mold and make over this astral body in accordance with our imaginations, precisely as a sculptor molds the clay. At any rate, our subconsciousness has the power to project from it masses of substance and to cause these to take all kinds of forms, for example, human faces, which have been photographed innumerable times. Or the body can shoot out long rods or snaky projections which lift tables and exert force which has been recorded upon pressure instruments and weighed by scales. As I write, a friend lends me a $15 volume, a translation just published of an elaborate work by Baron von Schrenk Dotzing, a physician of Munich, giving minute details of four years' experiments in this field. So rigid was this investigator in his efforts to exclude fraud that not merely was the medium stripped and sewed up in black tights, but the cabinet in which she sat was a big sack of black cloth, everywhere sewed tight by the machine. Every crevice of the medium's body was searched before and after the tests, and every inch of the cabinet gone over. The investigator sat within a couple of feet of the medium, and would draw back the curtains, and while holding her hands and feet, would watch great masses of filmy gray and white stuff exude from the medium's mouth, from her armpits and breasts and sides. This would happen in red light of a hundred candle power, by which print could easily be read, and the medium would herself illuminate the phenomena with a red electric torch. The investigators would be privileged to examine these phantom forms, to touch them gently and be touched by them, soft and slimy, like the tongue of an animal, but sometimes the things would misbehave and strike them in the eye, hurting them. The medium, a young French girl living in the home of the wife of a well-known French playwright, had begun with spiritualist ideas, but came to take a matter-of-fact attitude to what happened, and in her trances would labor to mold these emanations into hands or faces as requested by those present. She finally succeeded in allowing them to separate the soft mucus stuff from her body and keep it for chemical and bacteriological examination. All this time she would be surrounded by a battery of cameras, nine at once, some of them inside the cabinet. When the desired emanation was in sight, all of these cameras would be set off by flashlight, and in the book you have over 200 such photographs showing faces and hands from every point of view. There are even moving pictures showing the material coming out of her mouth and going back. It is evident that we have here a whole universe of unexplored phenomena, and it seems that many of the old-time superstitions which were dumped overboard have now to be dragged back into the boat and examined in the light of new knowledge. What could smack more of magic and fraud than crystal gazing? Yet it appears that the subconsciousness has power to project an image of its hidden memories into a crystal ball, where it may be plainly seen. We find so well recognized an authority as Dr. Morton Prince using this method to enable one of the many Miss Beauchamps to recall incidences in her previous life, which were otherwise entirely lost to her. Likewise, this explanation of the disintegration of personality enables us to watch in the making all the phenomena of the trance and ecstasy, which have had so much to do with the making of religions. We know now how Joan of Arc heard the voices, and we can make her hear more voices, or make her stop hearing voices, as we prefer. Also, we know all about demons and demoniac possession. We can cast out demons, 
and without having to cause them to enter a herd of swine. We may some day be prepared to investigate the wonder stories which the yogis tell us about their ability to leave their physical bodies in a trance and to appear in England at a few moments' notice for the transaction of their spiritual business. But we want things proven to us, and we don't want the people with whom we work to be animated either by religious fanaticism or by money greed. We are ready to unlimber our minds and prepare for long journeys into strange regions. But we want to move cautiously, and choose our route carefully, and be sure we do not lose our way. We want to deal rationally with life. We don't want to make wild guesses or to choose a complicated and unlikely solution when a simple one will suffice. But on the other hand, we must be alive to the danger of settling down on our little pile of knowledge and refusing to take the trouble to investigate any more. That is a habit of learned men, I am sorry to say. The law of inertia applies to the scientist as well as to the objects he studies. The scientists of our time have had to be prodded into considering each new discovery about the subconscious mind, precisely as the scientists of Galileo's time had to be prodded to watch him drop weights from the Tower of Pisa. When he told them that the earth moved round the sun instead of the sun round the earth, they tortured him in a dungeon to make him take it back. And he did so, but whispered to himself, and yet it moves. And it did move, of course, and continued to move. And in exactly the same way, if it be true that we have these hidden forces in us, they will continue to manifest themselves and masses of people will continue to flock to Lily Dale and to pay out their hard-earned money until such a time as our learned men set to work to find out the facts and tell us how we can utilize these forces without the aid of either superstition or charlatanry. End of chapter 15 End of section 8Chapters 16 and 17 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 The Powers of the Mind sets forth the fact that knowledge is freedom and ignorance is slavery, and what science means to the people. We have now completed a brief survey of the mind and its powers. Whatever we may have proved or failed to prove, this much we may say with assurance. The reader who has followed our brief sketch attentively has been disabused of any idea he may have held that he knows it all. And this is always the first step towards knowledge. The mind is the instrument whereby our race has lifted itself out of beasthood. It is the instrument whereby we hold ourselves above the forces which seek to drag us down, and whereby we lift ourselves higher, if higher we are to go. How shall we protect this precious instrument? How shall we complete our mastery of it? What are the laws of the conduct of the mind? The process of the mind is one of groping outward after new facts, and digesting and assimilating them, as the body gropes after and digests and assimilates food. The senses bring us new impressions, and we take these and analyze them, tear them into the parts which compose them, compare them with previous sensations, recognize difference in things which seem to be alike, and resemblances in things which seem to be different. We classify them and provide them with names, which are, as it were, handles for the mind to grasp. Above all, we seek for causes, those chains of events which make what we know as order in the world of phenomena. And when the mind has what it seems to be a cause, it proceeds to test it according to methods it has worked out, the rules and principles of experimental science. It is a comparatively small number of sensations which the body brings to the mind of itself, it is a narrow world in which we should live if our minds adopted a passive attitude toward life. 
but some minds possess what we call curiosity they set out upon their own impulse to explore life they discover new laws and make new experiences and new sensations for themselves the mind forms an idea and at first after the fashion of the ancient greek philosophers it glorifies that idea and sets it in the seat of divinity but presently comes the empirical method which refuses authority to any idea unless it can stand the test of experiment and prove that it corresponds with reality nowadays the thinker amasses his facts and forms a theory to explain them and then proceeds to try out this theory by the most rigid method that he or his critics can devise if the theory doesn't work that is if it doesn't explain all the facts and stand all the tests it is thrown away like a worn-out shoe so little by little a body of knowledge is built up which is real knowledge which will serve us in our daily lives which we can use as foundation stones in the structure of our civilization by this method of research man is expanding his universe beyond anything that could have been conceived in the pre-scientific days hour by hour while we work and play and sleep the mind of our race is discovering new worlds in which our posterity will dwell for uncounted ages man walked upon the earth surrounded by infinite swarms of bacterial life of whose existence he never dreamed the invisible rays of the spectrum beat upon him and he knew nothing of what they did to him whether good or evil he lifted his head and saw vast universes of suns in comparison with which his world was a mere speck of dust and yet to him these universes were globes or lanterns which some divinity had hung in the sky one of the most fascinating illustrations of how the mind runs ahead of the senses is the story of the planet uranus which less than two hundred years ago had never been beheld by the eye of man a mathematician seated in his study working over the observations of other planets their motions in relation to their masses and distance discovered that their behavior was not as it should be at certain times none of them were in quite the right place and he decided that this variation must be due to the existence of an unknown body he worked out the problem of what must be the mass and the exact orbit of this body in order for it to be responsible for the variations observed and when he had completed these calculations he announced to the astronomical world turn your telescopes to a certain spot in the heavens and at a certain minute of a certain night you will find a new planet of a certain size and so for the first time the human senses became aware of a fact which by themselves they might not have discovered in all eternity now the importance of exact knowledge concerning a new planet May not be apparent to the ordinary man and if the thing which is discovered is for example an unknown ray which will move an engine or destroy a cancer then we realize the worthwhileness of the research and the masters of the world's commerce are willing to give here and there a pittance for the increase of such knowledge but men of science who have by this time come to a sense of their own dignity and importance understand that there is no knowledge about reality which is useless no research into nature which is wasted you might say that to describe and classify the fleas which inhabit the bodies of rats and ground squirrels and to study under the microscope the bacteria which live in the blood of these fleas that this would be an occupation hardly worthy of the divinity that is in man but presently as a result of this knowledge about fleas and flea diseases being in existence and available a bacteriologist discovers the secret of the dread bubonic plague which hundreds of times in past history has wiped out a great part of the population of europe and asia mark twain tells in his connecticut yankee how his hero was able to overcome the wizard merlin because he knew in advance of an eclipse of the sun and this was fiction of course but if you prefer a fact you may read in the memoirs of houdin the french conjurer 
how he was able to bring the arab tribes into subjection to the french government by depriving the great chieftains of their strength he gathered them into a theater and invited their mighty men upon the stage and there was an iron weight and they were able to lift it when houdin permitted and not to lift it when he forbade these noble barbarians had never heard of the electromagnet and could not conceive of a force that could operate through a solid wooden floor beneath their feet such things trivial as they are serve to illustrate the difference between ignorance and knowledge and the power which knowledge gives the man who knows is godlike to those who do not know he may enslave them he may do what he pleases with their lives and they are powerless to help themselves anyone who would help them must begin by giving them knowledge real knowledge there is no such thing as freedom without knowledge and it must be the best knowledge it must be new knowledge he who goes against new knowledge armed with old knowledge is like the chinese who went out to meet machine guns with bows and arrows and with umbrellas over their heads once upon a time knowledge was the prerogative of kings and priests and ruling castes but this supreme power has been wrested from them and this is the greatest step in human progress so far taken seek and ye shall find is the law concerning knowledge today knock and it shall be opened unto you in this my book of the mind i say to you that knowledge is your priceless birthright and that you should repudiate all men and all institutions and all creeds and all formulas which seek to keep this heritage from you beware of men who bid you to believe something because it is told you or because your fathers believed it or because it is written in some ancient book or embodied in some ancient ceremonial break the chains of these venerable spells and at the same time beware of the modern spells which have been contrived to replace them beware of party cries and shibboleths the idols of the forum as plato called them the prejudices which are set as snares for your feet beware of cant that paraphernalia of noble sentiments artificially manufactured by politicians and newspapers for the purpose of blinding you to their knaveries remember that you live in a world of class conflicts at every moment of your life your mind is besieged by secret enemies it is exposed to poison gas clouds deliberately released by people who seek to make use of you for purposes which are theirs and not yours in the fairy tales we used to love the hero was provided with magic protection against the perils of those times but what hero and what magic will guard the modern man against the propaganda of militarism nationalism and capitalist imperialism the mind is like the body in that it can be trained it can be taught sound habits its powers can be enormously increased there are many books on mind and memory training some of which are useful and some of which are trash there is an english system widely advertised called pelmanism of which i have personally made no test but it has won endorsements of a great many people who do not give their endorsements lightly this is the subject of applied psychology and just as in medicine or in law or in any of the arts there is a vast amount of charlatanry but there is also genuine knowledge being patiently accumulated and standardized when the united states government had to have an army in a hurry it did not make its millions of young men into teamsters or aviators at random it used the new methods of determining reaction times and testing the coordination of mind and body recently i visited the whittier reform school in california where delinquent boys are educated by the state a boy had been set to work in a tailor shop and it had been found that he was unable to make buttons and the buttonholes of a coat come in the right place for nine years the state of california and before it the state of georgia had been laboring to teach this boy to make buttons and buttonholes meet the effort had cost some five thousand dollars to say nothing of all the coats which were spoiled and all the mental suffering of the victim and his teachers 
finally someone persuaded the state of california to spend a few thousand dollars and install a psychological bureau for the purpose of testing all the inmates of the institution so by a half hour's examination the fact was developed that this boy was mentally defective although he was eighteen years old in body his mind was only eight years old and so he would never be able to achieve the feat of making buttons and buttonholes meet this is a new science which you may read about in Terman's the measurement of intelligence by testing normal children it is established that certain tasks can be performed at certain ages a child of three can point to his eyes his nose and his mouth he can repeat a sentence of six syllables and repeat two digits and give his family name older children are asked to look at a picture and then tell what they saw to note omissions in the picture to arrange blocks according to their weight to arrange words into sentences to note absurdities in statements to count backwards and to make change children of fifteen are asked to interpret fables to reverse the hands of a clock and so on of course there are always variations every child will be better at some kinds of tests than at others but by having a wide variety and taking the average you establish a mental age for the child which may be widely different from its physical age you may find some whose minds have stopped growing altogether and can only be made to grow by special methods of education enlightened communities are now conducting separate schools for defective children replacing the old-fashioned schoolmaster who wore out the birch rods trying to force poor little wretches to learn what was beyond their power in the same way psychology can be applied in industry and in the detection of crime here too there is a vast amount of fake but also the beginning of a science our laws do not as yet permit the use of automatic writing and hypnotic trance in the investigation of crime but they have sometimes permitted some of the simpler tests for example those of memory association the examiner prepares a list of a hundred names of objects and reads those names one after the other and asks the person he is investigating to name the first thing which is suggested to him by each word in turn engine will suggest steam or perhaps it will suggest train coat will suggest trousers or perhaps it will suggest pocket and so on the examiner holds a stopwatch and notes what fraction of a second each one of these reactions takes the ordinary man who is not trying to conceal anything will give all his associations promptly and the reaction times will be approximately alike but suppose the man has just murdered somebody with an axe and buried the body in a cellar with a fire shovel and taken a pocketbook and a watch and a locket and a number of various objects and climbed out of the cellar window by breaking the glass and now suppose that in his list of a hundred objects the psychologist introduces unexpectedly a number of these things in each case the first memory association of the criminal will be one which he does not wish to give he will have to find another and that inevitably takes time one or two such delays might be accidental but if every time there is any suggestion of the murder or the method or scene of the murder there's a notice confusion and delay you may be sure that the conscious mind is interfering with the subconscious mind the difference between the conscious and the subconscious mind is always possible to detect and if you are permitted to be thorough in your experiments you can make certain what is in the subconscious mind that the conscious mind is trying to conceal here as everywhere in life knowledge is power and expert knowledge confers mastery over the shrewdest untrained mind the only trouble is that under our present social system the trained mind is very apt to be working in the interest of class privilege the psychologist who is employed by a great corporation or by a police department may be as little worthy of trust as a chemist who is engaged in making poison gases to be used by capitalist imperialism for the extermination of its rebellious slaves but what this proves is not that scientific knowledge is untrustworthy 
but merely that the workers must acquire it. They must have their own organizations and their own experiments in every field. To give knowledge to the masses of mankind, slow and painful as the process seems, is now the most important task confronting the enlightened thinker. The method of psychoanalysis gives us also much insight into the phenomena of genius, and the hope that we may ultimately come to understand it. At present, we are embarrassed because genius is so often closely allied to eccentricity. The supernormal appears in connection with the subnormal, and it is often hard to tell them apart. Great poets and painters, in revolt against the world of smug commercialism, adopt irresponsibility as their religion. They live in a world of their own. They dress like freaks. They refuse to pay their debts or to be true to their wives. They are followed by a host of disciples who adopt the defects of the master as a substitute for his qualities. And so there grows up a perverted notion of what genius is, and wholly false standards of artistic quality. There is nothing mankind needs more than sure and exact tests of mental superiority, not merely the ability to acquire languages and to solve mathematical equations, but the ability to carry in the mind intense emotions while at the same time shaping and organizing them by the logical faculty, selecting masses of facts and weaving them into a pattern calculated to awaken the emotion in others. This is the last and greatest work of the human spirit, and to select the men who can do it and foster their activity is the ultimate purpose of all true science. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 The Conduct of the Mind Concludes the Book of the Mind with a study of how to preserve and develop its powers for the protection of our lives and the lives of all men. Someone wrote me the other day asking, when is the best time to acquire knowledge? I answer, the time is now. It is easier to learn things when you are young, but you cannot be young when you want to be, and if you are old, the best time to acquire knowledge is when you are old. It is true that the brain cells seem to harden, like the body, and it is less easy for them to take on new impressions, but it can be done, and just as Seneca began to learn Greek at eighty, I know several old men whom the recent war has shaken out of their grooves of thought and compelled them to deal with modern ideas. But if you are young, then so much the better. Then the divine thrill of curiosity is keenest. Then your memory is fresh and can be trained. Your mind is plastic and you can form sound habits. You can teach yourself to respect truth and seek it, you can teach yourself accuracy, open-mindedness, flexibility, persistence in the search of understanding. First of all, I think, is accuracy. Learn to think straight. Let your mind be as a sharp scalpel, penetrating unrealities and falsehoods, cutting its way to the facts. When you set out to deal with a certain subject, acquire mastery of it, so that you can say, I know. And yet, Never be too sure that you know. Never be so sure that you are not willing to consider new facts and to change your way of thinking, if it should be necessary. I look about me at the world and see tigers and serpents, dynamites and poison gas and 42 centimeter shells. Yet I see nothing in the world so deadly to men as an error of the mind. Look at the mental follies about you. Look at all the prejudices, the delusions, the lies deliberately maintained, and realize the waste of it all, the pity of it all. Every man, it seems, has his pet delusions, which he hugs to his bosom and he loves, because they are his own. If you try to deprive him of those delusions, it is as though you tore from a woman's arms the child she has born. I have written a book called The Prophets of Religion and never a week passes that there do not come to me letters from people who tell me they have read this book with pleasure and profit. They are grateful to me for teaching them so much about the follies and delusions of mankind. And it is all right and all true 
and save for two or three pages, in which I deal with the special hobby which happens to be their hobby. And it is all right and all true, save for the two or three pages in which I deal with a special hobby which happens to be their hobby. What I say about all the other creeds is correct, but I fail to understand that the Mormon religion is a dignified, inspired religion, a gift from on high. And if only I would carefully study the Book of Mormon, I would realize my error. Or, it is all right except what I say about Christian scientists, or the theosophists, or perhaps one particular sect of the theosophists, who are different from all the others. Today there lies upon my book a letter... Today there lies upon my desk a letter from a man who has read many of my books, and now is grief-stricken, because he must part company from me. He discovers that I permit myself to speak disrespectfully about the Seventh-day Adventist religion, whereas he is prepared to show the marvels of biblical prophecy now achieving themselves in the world. How could any save a divinely revealed religion have foreseen the present movement to establish the Sabbath by law? Yes, and presently I shall see the last atom of the prophecy fulfilled. There will be a death penalty for failure to obey the Sabbath law cultivate the great and precious virtue of open-mindedness. Keep your thinking free, not merely from outer compulsion, but from the more deadly compulsions of its own making, from prejudices and superstitions. The prejudices and superstitions of mankind are like those diseased mental states which are discovered by the psychoanalyst, which he calls a complex in the subconscious mind, a tangle or knot, which is a center of disturbance and keeps the whole being in a state of confusion. Each group of men, each sect or class, have their precious dogmas, their shibboleths, their sacred words and stock phrases, which set their whole beings aflame with fanaticism. They also have their phobias, their words of terror, which cannot be spoken in their presence without causing a brainstorm. At present, the dread word of our time is communist. You can scarcely say the word without someone telephoning for the police. And yet, when you meet a communist, what is he? A worn, fragile student who has thought out a way to make the world a better place to live in, and whose crime is what he tells others about his idea. Or perhaps you belong to the other side, and then the word of terror is the word capitalist. You meet a capitalist, and what do you find? Very likely you find a man who is kindly, generous in his personal impulses, but bewildered, possibly a little frightened, and still more irritated and made stubborn. So you realize that nearly all men are better than the institutions and systems under which they live. You realize the urgent need of applying your reasoning powers to the problem of social reorganization. Cultivate also in the affairs of your mind the ancient virtue of humility. There is an old-time poem, which perhaps was in your school, readers. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? My answer is, for innumerable reasons. The spirit of mortal should be proud and must be proud because life throbs in it, and because life is a marvelous thing, and the excitement of life is perpetual. Yesterday I met a young mother, and of what avail is all the pessimism of the poets against the pride of a young mother? Oh, she cried, and her face lighted up with delight. He said, Goo! Yes, he said, Goo, and never since the world began had there been a baby which had achieved that marvel. Presently it will be, Look, look, he's trying to walk then he will be getting marks at school, and presently he will be displaying signs of genius. Always it will take an effort of the mind of that young mother to realize that there are other children in the world as wonderful as her own, and perhaps it will take many generations of mental effort before there will be young mothers capable of realizing that some other child is more wonderful than her child. In other words, 
it is by a definite process of broadening our minds that we come to realize the lives of others to transfer to them the interest we naturally take in our own lives and to admit them to a state of equality with ourselves this is one of the services the mind must render for us it is the process of civilizing us and there is another and yet more important task which is to make clear to us the fact that we do not altogether make this life of ours that there is a universe of power and wisdom which is not ours but on which we draw the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom said the psalmist we know now that fear is an ugly emotion destructive to life but it may be purified and made into a true humility which every thinking man must feel towards life and its miracles also the man will have joy because it is given to him to share the high marvelous adventure of being to the pleasures of the body there is a limit and it comes quickly but the pleasures of the mind are infinite and no one who truly understands them can have a moment of boredom in life to a man who possesses the key to modern thought who knows what knowledge is and where to look for it the life of the mind is a panorama of delight perpetually unrolled before him to the minds of our ancestors there was one universe but to our mind there are many universes and new ones continually discovered the only question is which one will you choose will you choose the universe of outer space the material world of infinity consider the smallest insect that you can see crawling upon the surface of the earth small as that insect is in relation to the earth it is not so small by millions of times as is the earth in relation to the universe made visible to our eyes by the high-powered telescope plus the photographic camera plus the microscope if you want to know the miracles of this world of space read arrhenius's the life of the universe or simon newcomb's sidelights on astronomy suffice it here to say that we have a chemistry of the stars by means of the spectroscope that we can measure the speed and direction of stars by the same means that we have learned to measure the size of the stars and are studying stars which we cannot even see and then along comes einstein with his theories of relativity and makes it seem that we have to revise a great part of this knowledge to allow for the fact that not merely everything we look at but also we ourselves are flying every which way through space or will you choose the universe of the atom the infinity of the material world followed the other way so to speak big as the universe is in relation to our world and big as our world is in relation to the insect that crawls on it the insect is bigger yet in relation to the molecules which compose its body and these in turn are millions of millions of times bigger than the atoms which compose them and then behold in the atom there are millions and millions of electrons tiny particles of electric energy we cannot see these infinitely minute things any more than we can see the electricity which runs our trolley cars but we can see their effects and we can count and measure them and deal with them in complicated mathematical formulas and be just as certain of their existence as we are of the dust under our feet if you wish to explore this wonderland read duncan's the new knowledge or dr henry smith williams miracles of science or will you choose the universe of the subconscious our racial past locked up in the secret chambers of our mind or will you choose the universe of the superconscious the infinity of genius manifested in the arts by the device of art man not merely creates new life he tests it he weighs it and measures it he tries experiments with it as the physicist with the molecule and the astronomer with light he finds out what works and what does not work and so develops his moral and spiritual muscles training himself for his task as a maker of life written words can give but a feeble idea of the wonders that are found in these enchanted regions of our minds 
here are palaces of splendor beyond imagining here are temples with sacred shrines and treasure chambers full of gold and priceless jewels into these places we enter as aladdin in the ancient tale we are the masters here and all that we see is ours he who has once got access to it he possesses not merely the magic lamp he possesses all the wonderful fairy properties of all the tales of our childhood he is the tarnhelm and the magic ring which gives him power over his foes his is the sword excalibur which none can break and the silver bullet which brings down all game and the flying carpet upon which to travel over the earth and the house made of gingerbread and the three wishes which always come true and the filter of love and the elixir of youth and the music of the spheres and who knows some day he may come upon heaven with saint peter and his golden key and the seraphim singing and the happy blessed conversing end of chapter seventeen end of the book of the mind end of section nine Book Two, Chapter Eighteen of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two, The Book of the Body, Chapter Eighteen, The Unity of the Body, discusses the body as a whole and shows that health is not a matter of many different organs and functions, but is one problem of one organism. The reader who has followed our argument this far will understand that we are seldom willing to think of the body as separate from the mind. The body is a machine, to be sure, but it is a machine that has a driver. And while it is possible for a sound machine to have a drunken and irresponsible driver, such a machine is not apt to remain sound very long. Frequently, when there is trouble with the machine, we find the fault to be with the driver. In other words, we find that what is needed for the body is a change in the mind. If you wish to have a sound body, and to keep it sound as long as possible, the first problem for you to settle is what you want to make of your life. You must have a purpose, and confront the tasks of life with energy and interest. What is the use of talking about health to a man who has no moral purpose? He may answer, Indeed, I have heard victims of alcoholism answer, Let me alone. I have a right to go to hell in my own way. I am aware, of course, that the opposite of the proposition is equally true. A man cannot enjoy much mental health while he has a sick body. It is a good deal like the old question, Which comes first, the hen or the egg? The mind and the body are bound up together, and you may try to deal with each by turn, but always you find yourself having to deal with both. Most physicians have a tendency to overlook the mind, and Christian scientists make a religion of overlooking the body, and each pays the penalty in greatly reduced effectiveness. My first criticism of medical science as it exists today is that it has a tendency to concentrate upon organs and functions and to overlook the central unity of the system you will find a doctor who specializes in the stomach and its diseases, and is apt to talk as if the stomach were a thing that went around in a world all by itself. He will discuss the question of what goes into your stomach, and overlook to point out to you that your stomach is nourished by your bloodstream, which is controlled by your nervous system, which in turn is controlled by hope, by ambition, by love, by all the spiritual elements of your being. A single pulse of anger or of fear may make more trouble with the contents of your stomach than a doctor's pepsins and digestive ferments can remedy in a week. Of course, you may do yourself some purely local injury, and so for a time have a purely local problem. You may smash your finger, and that is a problem of the finger. But neglect it for a few days, and let blood poison set in, and you will be made aware that the human body is one organism, 
and also that, in spite of any metaphysical theories you may hold, your body does sometimes dominate and control your mind. Someone has said that the blood is the life, and certainly the blood is both the symbol and the instrument of the body's unity. The blood penetrates to all parts of the body and maintains and renews them. If the blood is normal, the work of renewal does not often fail. If there is a failure of renewal, that is, a disease, we shall generally find an abnormal condition of the blood. The distribution of the blood is controlled by the heart, a great four-chambered pump. One chamber drives the blood to the lungs, a mass of fine porous membranes where it comes into contact with the air and gives off the poisons which it has accumulated in its course through the body, and takes up a fresh supply of oxygen. By another chamber of the heart, the blood is then sucked out of the lungs, and by the next chamber it is driven to every corner of the body. It takes to every cell of the body the protein materials which are necessary for the body's renewal, and also the fuel materials which are to be burned to supply the body's energy. Also it takes some 30 million millions of microscopic red corpuscles, which are the carriers of oxygen, and an even greater number of the white corpuscles, which are the body's scavengers, its defenders from invasion by outside germs. There are certain outer portions of the body, such as nails and the scales of the skin, which are dead matter produced by the body and pushed out from it and no longer nourished by the blood. But all the still living parts of the body are fed at every instant by the stream of life. Each cell in the body takes the fuel which it needs for its activities and combines it with the oxygen brought by the red corpuscles. And when the task of power production has been achieved, the cell puts back into the bloodstream not merely the carbon dioxide, but many complex chemical products, ammonia, uric acid, and the fatigue poisons indol, phenol, and scatol. The bloodstream bears these along and delivers some to the sweat glands to be thrown out and some to the kidneys and the rest to the lungs. All of this complicated mass of activities is in normal health perfectly regulated and timed by the nervous system. You lie down to sleep and your muscles rest and the vital activities slow up. Your heart beats only faintly, but let something frighten you and you sit up and these faculties leap into activity, your heart begins to pound, driving a fresh supply of blood and vital energy. You jump up and run, and these organs all set to work at top speed. If they did not do so, your muscles would have no fresh energy. They would become paralyzed by the fatigue poisons, and you would be, as we say, exhausted. All the rest of the body might be described as a shelter and accessory to the life-giving bloodstream. All the rest is the bloodstream's means of protecting itself and renewing itself. The stomach is to digest and prepare new blood material. The teeth are to crush it and grind it. The hands are to seize it. The eyes are to see it. The brain is to figure out its whereabouts. Man, in his egotism, imagines his little world as the center of the universe. But the wise old fellow who lives somewhere deep in the subconsciousness and looks after the welfare of our bloodstream, he has far better reason for believing that all our consciousness and personality exist for him. Now, disease is some failure of this bloodstream properly to renew itself or properly to protect itself, and its various subsidiary organs. When you find yourself with a disease, you call in a doctor, and unless this doctor is a modern and progressive man, he makes the mistake of assuming that the disease is in the particular organ where it shows itself. You have, let us say, follicular tonsillitis. These medical men have a love for long names, which have the effect of awing you and convincing you that you are in desperate need of attention. Your throat is sore, your tonsils are swollen and covered with white spots. 
so the doctor hauls out his little black bag and makes a swab of cotton and dips it say in lysol and paints your tonsils he knows by means of the microscope that your tonsils are covered and filled with a mass of foreign germs which are feeding upon them also he knows that lysol kills these germs and he gives you a gargle for the same purpose puts you to bed and gradually the swelling goes down and he tells you that he has cured you and sends you a bill for services rendered but maybe the swelling does not go down maybe it gets worse and you die then he tells your family that nature was to blame nature is to blame for your death but it never occurs to anyone to ask what nature may have had to do with your recovery I do not know how many thousands of diseases medical science has now classified, and for each separate disease there are complex formulas, and your system is pumped full of various mineral and vegetable substances which have been found to affect it in certain ways. Perhaps you have a fever, then we give you a substance which reduces the temperature of your bloodstream. It never occurs to us to reflect that maybe nature has some purpose of her own in raising the temperature of the blood and this might be so to speak the heat of conflict a struggle she is waging to drive out invading germs and that possibly it would be better for the temperature to stay up until the battle is over or maybe the heart is failing then our medical man is so eager to get something into the system that he cannot wait for the slow process of the mouth and the stomach he shoots some strychnine directly into the bloodstream it does not occur to him to reflect that maybe the heart is slowing up because it is overloaded with fatigue poisons of which it cannot rid itself and that the effect of stimulating it into fresh activity will be to leave it more dangerously poisoned than before we are dealing here with processes which our ancient mother nature has been carrying on for a long time and which she very thoroughly understands we ought therefore to be sure that we know what is the final effect of our actions more especially we ought to be sure that we understand the cause of the evil so that we may remove it and not simply waste our time treating symptoms putting plasters on cancer this is the fundamental problem of health and in order to make clear what i mean i am going to begin by telling a personal experience a test which i made of medical science some twelve or fourteen years ago in connection with one of the simplest and most external of the body's problems the hair first i will tell you what medical science was able to do for my hair and second what i myself was able to do when i put my own wits to work on the problem i had been overworking and was in a badly run-down condition i was having headaches insomnia ulcerated teeth many symptoms of a general breakdown among these i noticed that my hair was coming out i decided that it was foolish to become bald before i was thirty and that i would take a little time off and spend a little money and have my hair attended to I did not know where to go but i wanted the best authority available so i wrote to the superintendent of the largest hospital in new york asking him for the name of a reliable specialist in diseases of the scalp the superintendent replied by referring me to a certain physician who was the hospital's consulting dermatologist and i went to see this physician whose home and office were just off fifth avenue he examined my scalp and told me that i had dandruff in my hair and that he would give me a prescription which would remove this dandruff and cause my hair to stop falling out he charged me ten dollars for the visit which in those days was more money than it is at present being of an inquiring turn of mind i tried to get my money's worth by learning what there was to learn about the human hair i questioned this gentleman and he told me that the hair is a dead substance and that its only life is in the root he explained that barbers often persuade people to have their hair singed to keep it from falling out and that this was an utterly futile procedure and likewise all shampooing and massage 
which only caused the hair to fall out more quickly. It was better even not to wash the hair too often. All that was needed was a mixture of chemicals to kill the dandruff germs, and so I had the prescription put up at a drug store, and for a couple of years I religiously used it according to order, and it had upon my hair absolutely no effect whatsoever. So here was the best that medical science could do. But still, I did not want to be bald. So I went among the health cranks, people who experiment without license from the medical schools. Also, I experimented upon myself, and now I know something about the human hair, something entirely different from what the rich and successful consulting dermatologist taught me, but which has kept me from becoming entirely bald. First, the human hair is made by the body, and it is made, like everything else in the body, out of the bloodstream. It is perfectly true that the dandruff germ gets into the roots and makes trouble, and that the process of killing this germ can be helped by chemicals. But it does not take a $10 prescription. It only takes 10 cents worth of borax and salt from the corner's grocery. Put a little into a saucer, moisten it, rub it onto the scalp, wash it out again. But infinitely more important than this is the fact that healthy hair roots are a product of healthy blood, and that unhealthy blood produces sick hair roots, which cannot hold in the hair. Most important of all is the fact that in order to make healthy hair roots, the blood must flow fully and freely to these hair roots, whereas I had been accustomed for many hours every day of my life to clap around my scalp a tight band which almost entirely stopped the circulation of life-giving blood to my sick hair roots. In other words, by wearing civilized hats, I was literally starving my hair to death. As soon as I realized this, I took off my civilized hat and have never worn one since. As a rule, I don't wear anything. On the few occasions when I go into the city, I wear a soft cap. Now and then, I experience inconvenience from this, the elevator boy in some apartment house tells me to come in by the delivery entrance, or the porter of a sleeping car will not let me in at all. I remember discussing these embarrassments with Jack London, who went even further in his defiance of civilization, and wore a soft shirt. It was his custom, he said, to knock down the elevator boys and sleeping car porters. I realized that that might be all right for him, because he could do it, whereas I was reduced to the painful expedient of explaining politely why I went about without the customary symbols of my economic superiority. The consulting dermatologist had very solemnly and elaborately warned me concerning the danger of moving my hair too violently, and thus causing it to come out. But now my investigations brought out the fact that moving the hair, that is, massaging the scalp, increases the flow of blood to the hair roots and further increases resistance to disease. As for causing the hair to fall out, I discovered that the more quickly you cause a hair to fall out, the greater is the chance of your getting another hair. If a hair is allowed to die in the root, it kills that root forever. But if it is pulled out before it dies, the root will make a new hair. Every beauty parlor specialist knows this. She knows that if a hair is pulled, it grows back bigger and stronger than ever, and so to pull out hair is the last thing you must do if you want to get rid of hairs. I know a certain poet who happens to have been well endowed with physical graces by our mother nature. He finds it worthwhile to preserve them, they being accessory to those amorous experiences which form so large a part of the theme of poetry. Anyhow, this poet values his beautiful hair, and you will see him sitting in front of his fireplace reading a book, and meanwhile his fingers run here and there over his head, and he grabs a bunch of hair and he pulls and twists it. He has cultivated this habit for many years, and as a result his hair is as thick and heavy as the fuzzy wuzzies of Kipling's poems. It is a favorite sport of this poet to lure some rival poet into a contest. He will mildly suggest that they take hold of each other's hair and have a tug of war. The rival poet 
all unsuspecting, will accept the challenge, and my friend will proceed to haul him all over the place to the accompaniment of howls of anguish from the victim, and howls of glee from the victor, who has, of course, a scalp as tough as a rhinoceros hide. I am not a poet, and it is not important that I should be beautiful, and I have been too busy to remember to pull my hair, but by giving up tight hats and by limiting the amount of my overworking, I have managed to keep what hair I had left when the hair specialist had got through with me. I tell this anecdote at the beginning of my discussion of health because it illustrates so well the factors which appear in every case of disease, and which you might understand in seeking to remedy the trouble. We have a phrase which has come down to us from the ancient Latins, vis medicatrix naturae, which means the healing power of nature. So long ago men realized that it is our ancient mother who heals our wounds, and not the physician. Out of this have grown the cults of nature cure enthusiasts, and according to the fashion of men, they fly to extremes just as unreasonable and as dangerous as those of the pill doctors they are opposing. I have in mind a man who taught me probably more than any other writer on health questions, and with whom I once discussed the subject of typhoid, how it seemed to affect able-bodied men in the prime of their physical being. This, of course, was contrary to the theories of nature cure. And my friend had a simple way of meeting the argument. He refused to believe it. He insisted that, as with all other germ infections, it must be a question of bodily tone. No germ could secure lodging in the human body unless the body's condition was reduced. But how can you be sure of that, I argued? You know that if you go into the jungle, you are not immune against the scorpion or the cobra or the tiger. There is nothing in all nature that is safe against every enemy. What possible right have you to assert that you are immune against every enemy which can attack your bloodstream? We shall find here, as we find nearly always, that the truth lies somewhere between the extremes of two warring schools. Our race has been existing for a long time in a certain environment, and its very existence implies superiority to that environment. The weaklings for whom its hardships were too severe were weeded out. Hostile parasites invaded their bloodstream and conquered and devoured them. But those who survived were able to make in their bloodstream the substance known as antibodies, the opsonins, to help the white blood corpuscles devour the germs. As a result of their victory, we carry those antibodies in our system, which gives us immunity to those particular diseases, or at any rate gives us the ability to have the diseases without dying. Every time we go into a streetcar, we take into our throat and lungs the germs of tuberculosis. Examination proves that we carry around with us in our mouths the germs of all the common throat and nose diseases, colds, bronchitis, tonsillitis. No matter what precautions we might take, no matter if we were to gargle our throats every few minutes, we could never get rid of such germs and they wage continual war upon the body's defenses. They batter in vain upon the gates of our sound health. But take us to some new environment, to which we are not accustomed. Take us to Panama in the old days of yellow fever, or take us to Africa, and let the tsetse fly bite us, and infect us with sleeping sickness. Here are germs to which our systems are not accustomed and before them we are as helpless as the ancient knights-at-arms who had conquered everything in sight and ruled the continent of europe for many hundreds of years but were wiped off the earth by a chemist mixing gunpowder in the marquesas islands in the south seas there lived a beautiful and happy race of savages believed to have been descended long ages ago from aryan stock from the point of view of physical perfection, they were an ideal race, living a blissful outdoor life, which you may read about in Melville's Typee and in O'Brien's White Shadows in the South Seas. This race conformed to all the requirements of the nature enthusiast. They went practically naked, 
Their houses were open all the time. They lived on the abundant fruits of the earth. To be sure, they were cannibals, uh, but this was more a matter of religious ceremony than of diet. They ate their war captives, but this was only after battle, and not often enough to count, one way or the other, in matters of health. They had lived for uncounted ages in perfect harmony with their environment. They were happy and free, and certainly, if such a thing were possible to human beings, they should have been proof against germs. But a ship came to one of these islands, and put ashore a sailor dying of tuberculosis. And in a few years, four-fifths of the population of this island had been wiped out by the disease. What tuberculosis left were finished by syphilis and smallpox, and today the Marquesans are an almost extinct race. But there is another side to the argument, and one more favorable to the nature cure enthusiast. We civilized men, by soft living, by self-indulgence and lack of exercise, may reduce the tone of our body too far below the standard which our ancestors set for us. And then the common disease germs get us. Then we have colds, sore throats, tuberculosis. The nature cure advocate is perfectly right in saying that there is no use treating such diseases. The thing is to restore the body to its former tone, so that we may be superior to our normal environment and its strains. You know the poem of the One Hoss Shay, which was so perfectly built in every part that it ran for fifty years and then collapsed all at once in a heap. But the human body is not built that way. It always has one or more places which are weaker than the others, and which first show the effects of strain. In one person it will take the form of dyspepsia, in another it will be headaches, in another colds, in another decaying teeth, in another hardening of the arteries or stiffening of the joints. But whatever the symptoms may be, the fundamental cause is always the same, an abnormal condition of the bloodstream, and a consequent lowering of the body's tone. Therefore, studying any disease and its cure, you have first the emergency question, are there any germs lodged in the body, and if so, how can you destroy them? As part of the problem, you have to ask whether the bloodstream is normal, and if not, what are the methods by which you can make it normal and keep it so? Also, you have to ask, what are the reasons why your trouble manifests itself in this or that particular organ? Is there some weakness or defect there, and can the defect be remedied? Or can your habits be changed so as to reduce the strain on that organ? Are there any measures you can take to increase the flow of blood to that organ and to promote its activity? In the study of your health, you will find that circumstances differ, and the importance of one factor or the other will vary. But you will seldom find any problem in which all these factors do not enter, and you will seldom find an adequate remedy unless you take all the factors into consideration. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Experiments in Diet narrates the author's adventures in search of health and his conclusions as to what to eat. Students of the body assure us that every particle of matter which composes it is changed in the course of seven years. It is obvious that everything that is a part of the body has at some time to be taken in as food. So the problem of our diet today is the problem of what our body shall consist of seven years from now, and probably a great deal sooner. I begin this discussion by telling my own personal experiences with food. I am not going to recommend my diet for anyone else, because one of the first things I have to say about the subject is that every human individual is a separate diet problem. 
but I am going to try to establish a few principles for your guidance, and more especially to point out the commonest mistakes. I tell about my own mistakes, because it happens that I know them more intimately. I was brought up in the South, where it is the custom of people to give a great deal of time and thought to the subject of eating. Among the people I knew, it was always taken for granted that there should be at least one person in the kitchen devoting all her time to the preparing of delicious things for the family to eat. This person was generally a negress, and, needless to say, she knew nothing about the chemistry of foods, nothing about their constituents or nutritive qualities. All she knew was about their taste. She had been trained to prepare them in ways that tasted best, and was continually being advised and exhorted and sometimes scolded by the ladies of the family on this subject. At the table, the family and the guests never failed to talk about the food and its taste. And, not infrequently, the cook would be behind the door listening to their comments, or else she would wait until after the meal for the report which somebody would bring her. In addition to this, the ladies of the family were skilled in what is called fancy cooking. They did not bother with meats and vegetables, but they mixed batter cakes and made all kinds of elaborate desserts, and exchanged these treasures and the recipes for them with other ladies in the neighborhood. In addition to this, there were certain periods of the week and of the year especially devoted to the preparing and consuming of great quantities of foods. Once every seven days, the members of the family expressed their worship of their creator by eating twice as much as usual. And at another time, they celebrated the birth of their redeemer by overeating systematically for a period of two or three weeks. Needless to say, of course, the children brought up in such an environment all had large appetites and large stomachs, and their susceptibility to illness was recognized by the setting apart for them of a whole classification of troubles, children's diseases, they were called. In addition to children's diseases, there were coughs and colds and sore throats and pains in the stomach and constipation and diarrhea, which the children shared with their adults. I had a little more than my share of all these troubles. Always a doctor would be sent for, and always he was wise and impressive, and always I was impressed. He gave me some pills or a bottle of liquid, a teaspoonful every two hours, or something like that. I can hear the teaspoon rattle in the glass as I write. I had a profound respect for each and every one of those doctors. He was wisdom walking about in trousers, and whenever he came, I knew that I was going to get well, and I did, which proved the case completely. Then I grew up, and at the age of 18 or 19 became possessed of a desire for knowledge, and took to reading and studying literally every minute of the day and a good part of the night. I seldom let myself go to sleep before two o'clock in the morning, and was always up by seven and ready for work again. I did this for ten years or so, until nature brought me to a complete stop. During these ten years, I was a regular experiment station in health. That is, I had every kind of common ailment, and had it over and over again, so that I could try all the ways of curing it, or failing to cure it, and kept on trying until I was sure, one way or the other. I came recently upon a wonderful saying by John Burroughs, which will be appreciated by every author. This writing is an unnatural business. It makes your head hot and your feet cold, and it stops the digesting of your food. This trouble with my digestion began when I was writing my second novel, camping out on a lonely island at the foot of Lake Ontario. I went to see a doctor in a nearby town, and he talked learnedly about dyspepsia. The cause of it, he said, was failure of the stomach to secrete enough pepsin, and the remedy was to take artificial pepsin obtained from the stomach of a pig. He gave me this pig pepsin in a bottle of red liquid, and I religiously took some after each meal. It helped for a time, but then I noticed that it helped less and less. I got so that a simple meal of cold meat and boiled potatoes would stay in my stomach for hours in spite of any amount of the pig pepsin. 
I would lie about in misery because I wanted to work, and my accursed stomach would not let me. All the time, of course, I was using my mind on this problem, groping for causes. I found that the trouble was worse if I worked immediately after eating. I found also that it was worse when I was writing books. When I got sufficiently desperate, I would stop writing books and go off on a hunting trip. I would tramp twenty miles a day over the mountains looking for deer, and I would come back at night too tired to think, and in a week or two every trace of my trouble would be gone. So my life regimen came to be, first the writing of a book, and then a hunting trip to get over the effects of it. But as time went on, alas, I noticed the recuperation was more slow and less certain. The working times grew shorter, the hunting times grew longer, until finally I got to a point where I couldn't work at all. I would go to pieces in a few days if I tried it. It was apparently the end of my stomach, and the end of my sleeping, and the end of my writing books. My teeth were decaying, not merely outside, but inside. I would have abscesses, and most frightful agonies to endure. I would lie awake at night, and it would seem to me that I could feel my body going to pieces, an extremely depressing sensation. I had been trying experiments all this time. I had been going to one doctor after another, and had got to realize that the doctors only treated symptoms. They treated the diseases when they appeared, but nobody ever told you how to keep the diseases from appearing. Why could there not be a doctor who would look you over thoroughly and tell you everything that was wrong with you and how to set it right? A doctor who would tell you exactly how to live so that you might keep well all the time. I was studying economics and becoming suspicious of my fellow man. It occurred to me that possibly it might be embarrassing to a doctor if he cured all his patients and taught them how to live so that none of them would ever come to him again. It occurred to me that possibly this might be the reason why preventive medicine, constructive health work, was getting so little attention from the medical fraternity. Two things that plagued me were headache and constipation, and they were obviously related. For constipation, the world had one simple remedy. You took something every night or every morning and thought no more about it. My stout and amiable grandmother had drunk a glass of Hunyadi water every morning for the last thirty or forty years, and that she finally died of fatty degeneration of the heart was not connected with this in the mind of anyone who knew her. As for headaches, people would tell you this, that, and the other remedy, and I would try them, and that is, unless they happened to be drugs. I was getting more and more shy of drugs. I had some blessed instinct which saved me from stimulants and narcotics. I had never used tea, coffee, alcohol, or tobacco, and in my worst periods of suffering, I never took to putting myself to sleep with chloral or to stopping my headaches with phenacetin. At the end of six or eight years of purgatory, I came upon a prospectus of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. This seemed to me exactly what I wanted. This was constructive. It dealt with the body as a whole. So I spent a couple of months at the sand and paid them something like a thousand dollars to tell me all they could about myself. The first thing they told me was that meat eating was killing me. It was perfectly obvious, was it not, that meat is a horrible feeding place for germs, that rotten meat is dreadfully offensive, and likewise digested meat Consider the excrete of cats, for example. I listened solemnly while Dr. Kellogg read off the numbers of billions of bacteria per gram and the contents of the colon of a carnivorous person. It certainly seemed proper that the author of The Jungle should be a vegetarian. So I became one, and did my best to persuade myself that I enjoyed the taste of the patent meat substitutes which are served in hundred calorie portions in the big sanitarium dining room. There also I met Horace Fletcher and learned to chew every particle of food thirty-two times, and often more. I exercised in the sanitarium gymnasium and watched the sterilized dancing, the men with the men and the women with the women. 
I was patiently polite with the Seventh-day Adventist religion, and laid in a supply of postage stamps on Friday evening. Finally, and most important of all, I went once a day to the treatment rooms, and had my abdomen doctored, alternately with hot cloths and ice. By this means I kept up a flow of blood in the intestinal tract, and stimulated these organs to activity. So my constipation was relieved, and my headaches were less severe, so long as I stayed at the sanitarium and was boiled and frozen once every day. But when I left the sanitarium and abandoned these treatments, the troubles began to return. Meantime, however, I had written a book in the praise of vegetarianism, a book which has got into the libraries and cannot be got out again. I went on to a new variety of health crank, the real nature cure practitioners. Vegetarianism was not enough, they insisted. The evil had begun long before, when man first ruined his food and destroyed its nutritive value by means of fire. There was only one certain road to health, and that was by the raw food route, the monkey and squirrel diet. I had gone out to California for a winter's rest, and decided I would give this plan a thorough trial. For five months I lived by myself, and the only cooked food I ate was shredded wheat biscuit. For the rest, I lived on nuts and salads and fresh and dried fruits, and during this period I enjoyed such health as I had never known in my life before. I had literally not a single ailment. I was not merely well, but bubbling over with health. I had a friend who said it cheered him just to see me walk down the street. I thought that it was entirely the raw food, and that I had solved the problem forever. But I overlooked the fact that during those five months I had done no hard brain work, no writing. I went back to writing again, and things began to go wrong. My wonderful raw foods took to making trouble in my stomach, and I assure you that until you try it, you have no idea the amount of trouble that can be made in your stomach by a load of bananas and soaked prunes which had gone wrong. For a year or two I agonized. I could not give up my wonderful raw food diet because I had always before me the vision of those months in California and I could not understand why it was not that way again. But the time came when I would eat a meal of raw food, and for hours afterwards my stomach would feel like a blown-up football. Then somebody gave me a book by Dr. Salisbury on the subject of the meat diet. Of all the horrible things in the world, a meat diet sounded to me the worst. I had been a vegetable enthusiast for three years, and thought of eating meat as you would think of cannibalism. But there has never been a time in my life when I could not hear something new and give it a trial if it sounded well. So I read the books of Dr. Salisbury, which have long been out of print and have been curiously neglected by the medical profession. Salisbury was a real pioneer, an experimenter. He wrote in the days before the germ theory, and so missed his guess regarding tuberculosis, but he perceived that most of the common diseases are caused by dietetic errors, and he set to work to prove it. He showed that hog cholera and army diarrhea are the same disease, and come from the same cause. He took a squad of men and fed them an army biscuit for two or three weeks until they were nearly dead and then he put them on a diet of lean beef and completely cured them in a few days. He did the same thing with one kind of food after another, and in each case he would bring his men as near to death as he dared, and then he would cure them. He showed that meat is the only food which contains all the elements of nutrition, the only food upon which a person can live for an unlimited period. As Salisbury said, beef is first, mutton is second, and the rest, nowhere. It was his idea that tuberculosis of the lungs is caused by spores of fermenting starch clogging the minute blood vessels. He claimed that there is an early stage of tuberculosis in which the spores are floating in the bloodstream. He put large numbers of patients upon a diet of lean beef, ground and cooked, and he cured them of tuberculosis. 
and if one of them would break the diet and yield to a craving for starch or sugar, Salisbury claimed that he could find it out an hour or two later by examining a drop of their blood under the microscope. In his books he described vividly the effects of an excess of starch and sugar in the diet. He called it making a yeast pot of your stomach. And you can imagine how that hit my stomach, full of half-digested bananas and prunes. I tried the Salisbury diet and satisfied myself of this one fact, that lean meat is for brain workers the most easily assimilated of all foods. Salisbury claimed that you could not overeat on meat, but I do not believe there is any food you cannot overeat on, nor do I believe that anyone should try to live on one kind of food. We are by nature omnivorous animals. Our digestive tracts are similar to those of hogs and monkeys, which eat all varieties of food they can get. One of the common errors of the nature cure enthusiast is to cite the monkey and the squirrel as fruit and nut eating animals when the fact is that monkeys and squirrels eat meat when they can get it, and the ardor with which they go bird-nesting is evidence enough that they crave it. If there is any race of man which is vegetarian, you will find that it is from necessity alone. The beautiful South Sea Islanders, who are the theme of the raw fooder's ecstasy, spend a lot of their time catching fish, and sometimes they kill a pig, and celebrate the event precisely as Christians celebrate the birth of their Redeemer. From this you may be able to guess my conclusions. As a result of much painful blundering and experimenting, so far as diet is concerned, I belong to no school. I have learned something from each one, and what I have learned from a trial of them all is to be shy of extreme statements and of hard and fast rules. To my vegetarian friends who argue that it is morally wrong to take sentient life, I answer that they cannot go for a walk in the country without committing that offense, for they walk on innumerable bugs and worms. We cannot live without asserting our right to subject the lower forms of life to our purposes. We kill innumerable germs when we swallow a glass of grape juice, or for that matter, a glass of plain water. I shall be much surprised if the advance of science does not some day prove to us that there are rudimentary forms of consciousness in all vegetable life. So we shall justify the argument of Mr. Dooley, who said in reviewing the jungle, that he could not see why it was any less crime to cut off a young tomato in its prime, or to murder a whole cradle full of baby peas in the pod. There is no question that meat-eating is inconvenient, expensive, and dirty. I have no doubt that some day we shall know enough to be able to find for every individual a diet which will keep him at the top of his power, without the maintenance of the slaughterhouse. But we do not possess that knowledge at present. At least, I personally do not possess it. I happen to be one of those individuals, there are many of them, with whom milk does not agree, and if you rule out milk and meat, you will find yourself compelled to get a great deal of your protein from vegetable sources, such as peas, beans, and nuts. All these contain a great deal of starch, and thus there is no way you can arrange your diet to escape an excess of starch. Excess of starch, so my experience has convinced me, is the deadliest of all dietetic errors. It is also the commonest of errors. The cause not merely of the common throat and nose infections, but of constipation, and likewise of diarrhea, of anemia, and thus through the weakening of the bloodstream of all disorders that spring from this source, decaying teeth and rheumatism, boils, bad complexion, and tuberculosis. Starch foods are the cheapest, therefore they form the common diet of the poor, and are responsible for the diseases of undernourishment to which the poor are liable. On the other hand, of course, there are perfectly definite diseases of overnourishment, high blood pressure, which culminates in apoplexy, kidney troubles, which result from the inability of these organs to eliminate all the waste matter that is delivered to them, fatty degeneration of the heart, or of the liver, or any of the vital organs. You may cause a headache by clogging the bloodstream through overeating, 
or you may cause it by eating small quantities of food if those foods are unbalanced and do not contain the mineral elements necessary to making of normal blood whatever the trouble with your health it is my judgment that in two cases out of three you will find it dates back to errors in diet i do not think i exaggerate in saying that a knowledge of what to eat and how much to eat is two-thirds of the knowledge of how to keep yourself in permanent health end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty errors in diet discusses the different kinds of foods and the part they play in the making of health and disease it is my purpose in this chapter to lay down a few general principles to aid you in the practical problem of selecting the best diet for yourself but it must be made clear at the outset that there can be no hard and fast rule all human bodies are more or less alike but on the other hand all are more or less different modern civilization has given very few bodies the chance to be perfect nearly all have some weakness some abnormality and need some special modification in diet to fit their particular problem the ideal in each case would be a complete study of the individual system some day no doubt medical science will analyze the digestive juices and the gland secretions of the bloodstream of every human being and say you need a certain percentage of starch and a certain percentage of protein you need such and such proportion of phosphorus and iron you should avoid certain acids and so on but at present we are devoting our science to the task of killing and maiming other people instead of enabling ourselves to live in health and happiness so it is that most of those who read this book will be too poor to command the advice of a diet specialist the best you can do is to get a few general ideas and try them out watching your own body and learning its peculiarities human food contains three elements proteins fats and carbohydrates the proteins are the body-building material and the foods which are rich in proteins are lean meat the white of eggs milk and cheese nuts peas and beans a certain amount of this kind of food is needed by the body if it is missing the body will gradually waste away if too much of it is taken the body can turn it into energy-making material but this is a wasteful process and the best evidence appears to be that it is a strain upon the system experiments conducted by professor chittenden of yale have proven conclusively that men can live and maintain body weight upon much less protein food than previously dietetic standards have indicated the fats are found in fat meats and dairy products and in nuts olives and vegetable oils the body is prepared to digest and assimilate a certain amount of fat no one knows how much i have found in my own case that i require a great deal less than people ordinarily eat i have for many years maintained good health upon a diet containing no more fat than one gets with lean meat once or twice a day i never use butter or olive oil nor any fat in cooking my reason for this is that fats are the most highly concentrated form of food and the easiest upon which to overeat excess of fat is a cause not merely of obesity but also of boils and pimples and pasty complexion and other signs of a clogged bloodstream the third variety of food is the carbohydrates and of these there are two kinds starches and sugars starch is the white material of the grains and tubers the principal food element of bread and cereals rice potatoes bananas and many prepared substances such as cornstarch tapioca farina and macaroni starchy foods compose probably half the diet of the average human being in my own case 
they compose about one-sixth. So you see to what extent my beliefs differ from the common. Starch is not really necessary in the diet at all. I have a friend who is subject to headaches and finds relief from them by a diet of meat, salads, and fresh fruits exclusively. The first thing that excess of starch or sugar does is to ferment in the system and cause flatulence and gas. But strange as it may seem, if the excess of starch is perfectly digested and assimilated into the system, the condition may be worse yet, because you may have a great quantity of energy-producing material without the necessary mineral elements which the body requires in the handling of it. If you cremate a human body and study the ashes chemically, you find a score or more of mineral salts. You find these in the blood, and no blood is normal and no body can be kept normal which does not contain the right percentage of these elements. It is not merely that they are needed to build bones and teeth. They are needed at every instant for the chemistry of the cells. Every time you move a muscle, you fill the cells of that muscle with a certain amount of waste matter. You may prove how deadly this matter is by binding a tight cord about your arm and then trying to use the arm. We are only at the beginning of understanding the subtle chemistry of the body, but this much we know. The cells transform the waste products and they are thrown out of the system as ammonia, uric acid, etc., and for this process the blood must have a continuous supply of many mineral salts. So vital are they, and so fatal to health is their absence, that it is far better for you to eat nothing at all than to eat improperly balanced foods, or foods which are deficient in the organic salts. You may prove this to yourself by simple experiment. Put two chickens in separate pens, where nobody can feed them but yourself. Feed one of them on water and white bread, or cornstarch, or sugar, or any energy-making substance which contains little of the mineral elements. Feed the other chicken on plain water. You will find that the one which has the food will quickly become droopy and sickly, its feathers will fall out, it will have what in human beings would be known as headaches, colds, sore throats, decaying teeth, and boils. At the end of a couple of weeks, it will be a dead chicken. The one which you feed on water alone will not be a happy chicken, neither will it be a fat chicken, but it will be a live chicken and a chicken without disease. I am going later on to discuss the subject of fasting. For the present, I will merely say that a chicken which has nothing but water is living upon its own flesh, and therefore has a meat diet, containing the mineral elements necessary to the elimination of the fatigue poisons. I am going to try not to be dogmatic in this book and not to say things that I do not know. I confess to innumerable uncertainties about the subject of diet, but one thing I think I do know, and that is that human beings should eliminate absolutely from their food those modern artificial products which look so nice, and are so easy to handle, and are put up in packages with pretty labels, and have been in some way artificially treated to remove the wastes and impurities, including the vital mineral salts. Among such food substances, I include lard, and its imitations made from cottonseed oil, white flour, all the prepared and refined cereals, polished rice, tapioca, farina, cornstarch, and granulated and powdered sugar. Any of these substances will kill a chicken in a couple of weeks, and the only reason they take a longer time to kill you is because you mix them with other kinds of foods. But to the extent that you eat them, your diet is deficient. And do not console yourself with the idea that the mineral elements will be made up from the other foods, because you don't know that, and nobody else knows it. Nobody knows just how much of any particular organic salt the body needs. 
all we know is that the primitive races which ate natural foods enjoyed vigorous health while the american people who consume the greatest proportion of the so-called refined foods have the very best dentists and the very worst teeth in the world there are many kinds of sugar found in the sugar cane and the beet and in all fruits sugar may also be made from any form of starch this is glucose which is put up in cans and sold as an imitation of maple syrup the ordinary granulated and powdered sugar is made by taking from the natural syrup every trace of mineral elements so i have no hesitation in saying that the ordinary cane sugar and beet sugar of our breakfast tables and our confectionery stores is not a food but a slow poison the causes of the wonderful progress of american dentistry which is the marvel of the civilized world are cane sugar white flour and the frying pan each of which dietetic crimes i shall take up in turn we have the richest country in the world we eat more food probably by fifty per cent and we waste more food probably by five hundred per cent than any other people in the world and yet go to any small farming community in america and what do you find you find the teeth of the young children rotting in their heads and having to be pulled out before their second teeth come you find these second teeth rotting often before the age of twenty a friend of mine who knows the american farmer sums it up this way he has two things that he requires if he is to be really respectable and happy first he wants to get all the fireplaces in his home boarded up and all the windows nailed tight and second he wants to get all his teeth out and an artificial set installed out of the farmer's wives in my neighborhood not one in ten keeps her own teeth until she is thirty if you go to the balkans where the peasants live on sour milk with grains which they grind at home or to southern italy and sicily where they live on cheese and black bread and olives or among savage people where they hunt and fish and gather the natural fruits you find old men without a single decayed tooth there must be some reason for this and the reason is found in our denatured grocery store foods the farmer's wife will gather up her eggs and her butter and cheeses and take them to the store and bring back cans of lard and packages of sugar the farmer will sell his perfectly good wheat and cornmeal and bring back in his wagon cases of refined cereal foods for which he has paid ten times the price of the grain dentists will tell you that the way candy injures the teeth is by sticking to them and fermenting forming acids which destroy the tooth structure and that may be a part of the reason but the principal reason why the teeth decay is because the bloodstream is abnormal and is unable to keep up the repairs of the body your teeth are living structures just as much as any other part of you and they will resist decay if you supply them with the proper nourishment you need sugar you need a considerable quantity of it every day nature provides this sugar in combination with the organic salts and also with the precious vitamins whose function in the body we are only beginning to investigate all the mineral substances which give the color and flavor to oranges apples peaches grapes figs prunes raisins all these you take out when you make sugar or perhaps you put in some imitations of them made from coal tar chemicals and then drink them at your soda fountains so little appreciation has the american farmer's wife of natural fruits that when she preserves them she considers it necessary to fill them full of cane sugar in fact she has a notion that they won't keep unless she cooks them up with sugar so snobbish are we americans about our eating that we make the best of our foods into bywords we make jokes in our comic papers about the 
boarding-house prune, and yet prunes and raisins are among the wholesomest foods we have, and if we fed them to our children instead of cakes and candy and coal tar flavorings, our dental industry would rapidly decline. And the same thing is true of bread. When I was a boy, I thought I had to have hot bread at least twice a day, and if I were called upon to eat bread that was more than a day old, I felt that I was being badly abused by life. I used to read fairy stories, in which something called black bread was mentioned. Something obscure and terrible. The symbol of human misery was Cinderella sitting in the ashes and eating a crust of dry black bread. But now, since I have studied diet, I have taken my place with Cinderella. I can afford to buy whatever kind of bread I want. I can have the best white bread piping hot three times a day if I want it. But what I eat three times a day is a crust of hard, dry black bread. Black bread is the fairy tale name for bread made of the whole grain. It is eaten that way by the peasant because he has no patent milling machinery at his disposal to fan away the life-giving elements of his food. Nearly all the mineral elements of the grain are contained in the outer dark-colored portion. The white part is almost pure starch, and when you use white flour, you are not merely starving your bloodstream, your bones, and your teeth, you are also depriving the digestive tract of the rough material which it is accustomed to handle, and which it needs to stimulate it to action. I am aware that the whole grain products are a trifle less easy of digestion, but we should not pamper and weaken our digestive tract any more than we let our muscles get flabby for lack of action. We should require our stomachs to handle the ordinary natural foods precisely as we accustom our body to react from cold water and to stand honest hard work. For ages, Japanese peasants have lived on rice with a little dried fish. Quite recently, there began to spread throughout Japan a mysterious disease known as beriberi. It was especially prevalent in the army, and so the scientists of Japan set out to discover the cause. And it proved to be the modern practice of polishing rice, which takes off the outer coating of the grain. Rice is one of the most wholesome of foods if it is eaten in the natural state. But in order to get it in that state, in this country, you have to find a special food store of the health cranks and have to pay a special price for it. You have to pay a higher price for the whole wheat bread, because 99 people out of 100 are ignorant and insist upon having their foodstuffs pretty to look at. Probably you have read sea stories and know the horrors of scurvy. Scurvy and beriberi are similar diseases with a similar cause. The men on the old sailing ships used to have to live on white biscuit and salt meat, and they always knew that to recover from their gnawing illness they must get to port and get fresh vegetables and fruits, especially onions and lemons, which contain the vitamins as well as the salts. But you will see the modern housewife going into the grocery store and surveying the shelves of package goods and in her ignorance picking out the scurvy-making products and frequently paying for them a much higher price than for the health-making ones. Then, when she has got her white flour and her cane sugar and her lard, she will take it home and mix it up and put it in the frying pan and serve it hot to her husband and children. Nature has so constituted her husband and children that they digest starch before they digest fat. That is to say, the starch is digested mainly in the stomach, while the fat is digested mainly after the food has been passed on into the small intestine. But by frying the starch before it is eaten, the housewife carefully takes each grain of starch and protects it with a little covering of fat. Thus the digestive juices of the stomach cannot get at the starch, 
and the starch goes down into the small intestine a good part undigested if some evil spirit wishing to make trouble for the human organism had charge of the laying out of our diet he could hardly devise anything worse than that and yet it would be no exaggeration to say that the average american especially the average farmer eats out of a frying pan if his potatoes have to be warmed over they go into the frying pan his precious batter cakes and doughnuts are cooked in the frying pan and all his precious hot breads are mixed with lard if it were not for the fact that you cannot broil a beefsteak over a modern gas range i would tell you that the first step toward health for the average american would be to throw the frying pan out of the window and to throw the cookbook after it the whole modern art of cooking is largely a perversion a product of idleness vanity and sensuality it is one of the monstrous growths consequent upon our system of class exploitation we have a number of idle people with nothing to do but eat and who demonstrate their superiority to the rest of us by their knowledge of superior foods and superior ways of preparing them they have the wealth of the world at their disposal also the services of their fellow man without limit and they set their fellow man to work to enable them to give elaborate banquets and to sit in solemn state and gorge themselves and to have a full account of their behavior published in the next morning's newspapers a great part of this perverse art we owe to what is called the ancient regime in france a regime which starved the french peasantry until they were black-skinned beasts hiding in caves and hollowed trees so it comes about that our modern food depravity parades itself in french names and american snobbery requires of its devotees a course in the french language sufficient to read a menu card needless to say this elaborate gastronomic art has been developed without any relation to health or any thought of the true needs of the body it is one of the products of the predatory system which we can say is absolute waste having done my own cooking for the past twenty-five years i make bold to say that i can teach anybody all he needs to know about cooking in one lesson of half an hour and that the total amount of cooking required for a large family can be done by one person in twenty minutes a day in the first place a great many foods do not have to be cooked at all and are made less fit by cooking in the next place the only cooking that is ever required is a little boiling or in the case of meat roasting or broiling in the next place the art of combining foods in cooking is a waste art because no foods should be combined in cooking every food has its own natural flavor which is lost in combination and if anybody is unable to enjoy the natural flavors of simply cooked foods there is one thing to say to that person and that is to wait until he is hungry let him take a ten-mile walk in the open air and he will have more interest in his next meal i am not a fanatic and have no desire to destroy the pleasures of life i am recommending to people that they should seek the higher pleasures of the intellect and those pleasures are not found in standing over a cook stove nor in compelling others to stand over a cook stove moreover i know that the artificial mixing of foods to tempt people's palates is one of the principal causes of overeating and therefore of ill health and therefore of the ultimate destruction of the pleasure of life i went out from the world of cooks before i was twenty i wanted to write a book and to be let alone while i was doing it i lived by myself and found out about cooking by practical experience on a few occasions since then i have lived in a house with a servant and had some cooking done for me 
but it was always because somebody else wanted it and against my protest in the last ten years we have had no servant in our home and because i want my wife to give her energy to more important things than feeding me i do my share of getting every meal we have worked out a system of housekeeping by which we get a meal in five minutes and when we finish it it takes three minutes to clear things away if i tell you what i eat please do not get the impression that i am advising you to eat these same things my diet consists of the foods which i have found by long experience agree with me there are many other foods which are just as wholesome but which i do not eat either because they don't happen to agree with me or because i don't care for them so much i am fond of fruit and eat more of that than anything else it is not a cheap article of diet but you can save a good deal if you buy it in quantities as i do a little later i'm going to discuss the prices of foods for breakfast i eat a slice of whole wheat bread three good-sized apples stewed and eight or ten dates it takes practically no time to prepare this breakfast the bread has to be baked of course but this is done wholesale we buy four loaves at a time and it is just as good at the end of a couple of weeks as when we buy it when i lived in the world of cooks i would call for applesauce which meant that somebody had to pare apples cut them up stew them mix them with sugar grate a little nutmeg over them set them on ice and serve them to me on a glass dish with a little pitcher of cream but now what happens is that i put a dozen apples in a big saucepan and let them simmer while i'm eating we have a rule in our family that we do not do any cooking except while we are eating because if we try it at any other time of the day we get buried in a book or in a manuscript and forget about it until the smoke causes somebody in the street to summon the fire department so the apples for my breakfast were cooked during last night's supper and during the breakfast there will be some vegetable cooking for lunch at this lunch which is my square meal I eat a large slice of beefsteak, say, a third of a pound. Jack London used to say that the only man who could cook a beefsteak was the fireman of a railway locomotive, because he had a hot, clean shovel. The best imitation you can get is a hot, clean frying pan. And when you are sure that it is hot, let it get hotter. The whole secret of cooking meat is to keep the juices inside and to do that you must cook it quickly when you slap it down on a hot frying pan the meat is seared and the juices stay inside and if you do not turn it over until it is almost ready to burn you don't need to cook it very long on the other side that is the one secret of cooking worth knowing it doesn't cost anything and saves time instead of wasting it as i have never found anybody else capable of learning it i reserve the cooking of the beefsteaks as one of my family duties to continue the lunch a slice of whole wheat bread and a large quantity of some fresh salad such as celery or lettuce and tomatoes without dressing for a part of this may be substituted a vegetable one or two beets or turnips cooked during a previous meal and warmed up in a couple of minutes and we do not throw away the tops of the turnips and beets and celery we put them on and cook them and they serve for the next day's meal if you would eat a large quantity of such greens once a day you would escape many of the ills that your flesh is at present heir to finally for dessert an orange and a small handful of raisins or one or two figs the evening meal will be the same as breakfast except once in a while when i am especially hungry and want some meat i am writing this in the winter season so the fruits suggested are those available in the winter the menu will be varied with every kind of fruit at the season when it is cheapest and most easily obtained the beefsteak will appear at about three meals out of four 
occasionally it will be replaced by the lean meat of pork or mutton or by fish the bread may be replaced by rice or boiled potatoes either white or sweet and occasionally by graham crackers i know that these contain a little fat and sugar but i try not to be fanatical about my diet and the rules i suggest do not carry the death penalty there was a time when i used to allow my friends to make themselves miserable by trying to provide me with special foods when they invited me to a meal but now i tell them to forget it and i politely nibble a little of everything and eat most of what i find wholesome if there's nothing wholesome i content myself with a pretense of a meal if i find myself in a restaurant i quite shamelessly get a piece of apple or pumpkin pie omitting most of the crust as i don't go away from home more than once or twice a month i do not have to worry about such indulgence the main thing is to arrange one's home diet on sound lines and to learn to enjoy the simple and wholesome foods of which there is a great variety obtainable and at prices possible to all but the wretchedly poor in conclusion since everybody likes to have a feast now and then i specify that my diet regimen allows for holidays assuming that i am your guest for a day and that you wish to blow me regardless of expense here will be the menu breakfast some graham crackers a bunch of raisins a can of sliced pineapple in the winter or a big chunk of watermelon in the summer dinner or lunch roast pork a baked apple a baked sweet potato and some spinach supper lettuce dates and a dish of popcorn flavored with peanut butter try this next christmas p s after this book had been put into type i chanced to be looking over herbert quick's illuminating book on board the good ship earth discussing the importance of certain organic salts to the body dr quick states animals have been fed as an experiment on foods deficient in phosphorus for a while they seemed to do well and then they collapsed it takes only three months of a ration without phosphorus to wreck an animal individual creatures were killed after a month of this diet and it was found that the flesh was taking the phosphate for the phosphorus exists in the body in that form from the bones to supply its need in other words the body was eating its own bones when this process had robbed the bones to the limit the collapse came and the animal could never recover end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one diet standards discusses various foods and their food values the quantities we need and their money cost i think there is no more important single question about health than the question of how much food we should eat it is one about which there is a great deal of controversy even among the best authorities we shall try here for a common sense solution at the outset we have to remind ourselves of the distinction we tried to draw between nature and man to what extent can civilized man rely upon his instincts to keep him in perfect health let us begin by considering the animals how is their diet problem solved horses and cattle in a wild state are adjusted to certain foods which they find in nature and so long as they can find it they have no diet problem man comes and takes these animals and domesticates them he observes their habits and gives them a diet closely approaching the natural one and they get along fairly well but suppose the man with his superior skill in agriculture taking wild grain and planting it reaping and threshing it by machinery puts before his horse an unlimited quantity of concentrated food 
such as oats, which the horse can never get in a natural state. Will that horse's instincts guide it? Not at all. Any horse will kill itself by overeating on grain. I have read somewhere a clever saying that a farm is a good place for an author to live, provided he can be persuaded not to farm it. But once upon a time I had not heard that wise remark, and I owned and tried to run a farm. I had two beautiful cows, of which I was very proud, and one morning I woke up and discovered that the cows had got into the pear orchard and had been feeding on pears all night. In a few hours they both lay with bloated stomachs, dying. A farmer told me afterwards that I might have saved their lives if I had stuck a knife into their stomachs to let out the gas. I do not know whether this is true or not, but my two dead cows afforded a perfect illustration of the reason why civilized man cannot rely upon his instincts and his appetites to tell him when he has had enough to eat. He can only do this provided he rigidly restricts himself to the foods which he ate in the days when his teeth and stomach and bowels were being shaped by the process of natural selection. If he is going to eat any other than such strictly natural foods, he will need to apply his reason to his diet schedule. In a state of nature, man has to hunt his food, and the amount that he finds is generally limited and requires a lot of exercise to get. Explorers in Africa give us a picture of man's life in the savage state guided by his instincts and very little interfered with by reason. The savages will starve for long periods, then they will succeed in killing a hippopotamus or a buffalo, and they will gorge themselves, and nearly all of them will be ill, and several of them will die. So you see, even in a state of nature, and with natural foods, restraint is needed, and reason and moral sense have a part to play. What do reason and moral sense have to tell us about diet? Our bodily processes go on continuously, and we need at regular intervals a certain quantity of a number of different foods. The most elementary experiment will convince us that we can get along, maintain our body weight and our working efficiency upon a much smaller quantity of food than we naturally crave. Civilized custom puts before us a great variety of delicate and appetizing foods upon which we are disposed to overeat, and we are slow observers, indeed, if we do not note the connection between this overeating and ill health. So we are forced to the conclusion that if we wish to stay well, we need to establish a censorship over our habits. We need a different diet regimen from the haphazard one which has been established for us by a combination of our instincts with the perversions of civilization. Up to a few years ago, it was commonly taken for granted by authorities on diet that what the average man actually eats must be the normal thing for him to eat. Governments which were employing men in armies and at road building and had to feed them and keep them in health made large-scale observations as to what men ate, and thus were established by the old-fashioned diet standards. They are expressed in calories, which is a heat unit representing the quantity of fuel required to heat a certain small quantity of water a certain number of degrees. In order that you may know what I am talking about, I will give a rough idea of the quantity of the more common foods which it takes to make 100 calories. One medium-sized slice of bread, a piece of lean cooked steak the size of two fingers, one large apple, three medium tablespoons of cooked rice or potatoes, one large banana, a tablespoon of raisins, five dates, one large fig, a teaspoonful of sugar, a ball of butter about the size of your thumbnail, a very large head of lettuce, three medium-sized tomatoes, two-thirds of a glass of milk, a tablespoon of oil. 
you observe if you compare these various items how little guidance concerning food is given by its bulk you may eat a whole head of lettuce weighing nearly a pound and get no more food value than from a half ounce of olive oil which you pour over it you may eat enough lean beefsteak to cover your plate and you will not have eaten so much as a generous helping of butter a big bowl of strawberries will not count half so much as the cream and sugar you put over them so you may realize that when you eat olive oil butter cream and sugar you are in the same danger as the horse eating oats or as my two cows in the pear orchard and if some day a surgeon has to come and stick a knife into you it may be for the same reason the old-fashioned diet standards are as follows swedish laborers at hard work over four thousand seven hundred calories russian workmen at moderate work german soldiers in active service italian laborers at moderate work between three thousand five hundred and three thousand seven hundred calories english weavers nearly three thousand five hundred calories austrian farm laborers over five thousand calories some twenty years ago the united states government made observations of over fifteen thousand persons and established the following known as the atwater standards men at very hard muscular work five thousand five hundred calories men at moderately active muscular work three thousand four hundred calories men at light to moderate muscular work three thousand fifty calories men at sedentary or women at moderately active work two thousand seven hundred calories in the last ten or fifteen years there has arisen a new school of dietetic experts headed by professors chittenden and fisher of yale university professor chittenden has published an elaborate book the nutrition of man in which he tells of long continued experiment upon a squad of soldiers and a group of athletes at yale university also upon average students and professors he has proved conclusively that all these various groups have been able to maintain full body weight and full working efficiency upon less than half the quantity of protein food hitherto specified and upon anywhere from one-half to two-thirds the calorie value set forth in former standards when i first read this book i set to work to try its theories upon myself during the five or six months that i lived on raw food i took the trouble to weigh everything that i ate and to keep a record it is of course very easy to weigh raw foods exactly and i found that i lived an active life and kept physical health upon slightly less than two thousand five hundred calories a day i have set this as my standard and have accustomed myself to follow it instinctively and without wasting any thought upon it sometimes i fall from grace for i still crave the delightful cakes and candies and ice cream upon which i was brought up i always pay the penalty and know that i will not get back to my former state of health until i skip a meal or two and give my system a chance to clean house the average man will find the regimen set forth in this book austere and awe-inspiring i do not wish to pose as a paragon of virtue so perhaps i should quote a sarcastic girl cousin who remarked that when i was a boy that the way to my heart was with a bag of ginger snaps I live in the presence of candy stores and never think of their existence but if someone brings candy into the house and puts it in front of me i have to waste a lot of moral energy in letting it alone a few years ago i had a young man as a secretary who discovered this failing of mine and used to afford himself immense glee by buying a box of chocolates and leaving it on top of my desk i would give him back the box with some of the chocolates missing but he would persist in forgetting it on my desk he would hide and laugh hilariously behind the door until my wife discovered his nefarious doings and warned me of them 
Professor Chittenden states quite simply the common-sense procedure in the matter of food quantity. Find out by practical experiment what is the very least food upon which you can do your work without losing weight. That is the correct quantity for you. And if you are eating more, you certainly cannot be doing your body any good, and all the evidence indicates that you are doing it harm. You need not have the least fear in making this experiment that you will starve yourself. Later on, in a chapter on fasting, I shall prove to you that you carry around with you in your body sufficient reserve of food to keep you alive for eighty or ninety days. And if you draw in a small quantity of this, you do not do yourself the slightest harm. Cut down the amount of your food. Eat the bulky foods which contain less calorie value, and weigh yourself every day, and you will be surprised to discover how much less you need to eat than you have been accustomed to. One of the things you will find out is that your stomach is easily fooled. It is largely guided by bulk. If you eat a meal consisting of a moderate quantity of lean meat, a very little bread, a heaping dish of turnip greens, and a big slice of watermelon, you will feel fully satisfied. Yet you will not have taken in one-third the calorie value that you would at an ordinary meal with gravies and dressings and dessert. The bulky kind of food is that for which your system was adapted in the days when it was shaped by nature. You have a large stomach, many times as large as you would have had if you had lived on refined and concentrated foods such as butter, sugar, olive oil, cheese, and eggs. You have a long intestinal tract adapted to slowly digesting foods and to the work of extracting nutrition from a mass of roughage. You have a very large lower bowel, which Metchnikoff, the Russian scientist, one of the greatest minds who ever examined the problems of health, declares a survival, a relic of a previous stage of evolution, and a source of much disease. The best thing you can do with that lower bowel is to give it lots of hay, as it requires, in other words, to eat the salads and greens which contain cellulose material. This contains no food value and does not ferment, but fills the lower bowel and stimulates it to activity. If you eat too much food, three things may happen. First, it may not be digested, and in that case it will fill your system with poisons. Second, it may be assimilated, but not burned up by the body. In that case, it has to be thrown out by the kidneys or the sweat glands, and this puts upon these organs an extra strain, to which, in the long run, they may be unequal. Or third, the surplus material may be stored up as fat. This is an old-time trick which nature invented to tide you over the times when food was scarce. If you were a bear, you would naturally want to eat all you could and be as fat as possible in November, so that you might be able to hunt your prey when you came out from your winter sleep in April. But you are not a bear and you expect to eat your regular meals all winter. You have established a system of civilization which makes you certain of your food, and the place where you keep your surplus is in the bank, or sewed up in the mattress, or hidden in your stocking. In other words, a civilized man saves money, and the habit of storing globules of grease in the cells of his body is a survival of an old instinct, and a needless strain upon his health. Not merely does the fat man have to carry all the extra weight around with him, but his body has to keep it and tend it. And what are the effects of this is fully shown by life insurance tables. People who are five or ten percent overweight have five or ten percent more chance of dying all the time, while people who are five or ten percent underweight have five or ten percent more than the average of life expectation. There is no answer to these figures, which are the result of the tabulation of many hundreds of thousands of cases. The meaning of them to the fat person is to put himself on a diet of lean meat 
green vegetables and fresh fruits until he has brought himself down not merely to the normal fatness of the civilized man but to the normal leanness of the athlete the soldier and campaign the student who has more important things to think about than stuffing his stomach there is of course a certain kind of leanness which is the result of ill health there are wasting diseases tuberculosis for example and anemia there are people who worry themselves thin and there are a few rare spiritual people so-called who fade away from lack of sufficient interest in their bodies that is not the kind of leanness i mean but the act of wiry leanness which sometimes lives a hundred years nearly always you will find that such people are spare eaters and you will find that our ideal of rosy plumpness both for adults and children is a wholly false notion we once had in our home as servant an irish girl who was what is popularly called a picture of health with those beautiful flaming cheeks that irish and english women so often have she was in her early twenties and nobody who knew her had any idea but that her health was perfect but one morning she was discovered in bed with one side paralyzed and in a couple of weeks she was dead with erysipelas the color in her cheeks had been nothing but diseased blood vessels overloaded with food material and with the blood in that condition one of those tiny vessels in the brain had become clogged in the same way i have seen children two or three years old plump and rosy and considered to be everything that children should be but pneumonia would hit them and in two or three days they would be at death's door i do not mean that children should be kept hungry on the contrary they should have four or five meals a day so that they do not have a chance to become too hungry but at those meals they should eat in great part bulky foods which contain the natural salts needed for building the body if a child asks for food you may give it an apple or you may give it a slice of bread and butter with sugar on it the child will be equally well content in either case but it is for you with your knowledge of food values to realize that the bread with butter and sugar contains two or three times as much nutriment as the apple but contains practically none of the precious organic salts which will make the child's bones and teeth so far i have discussed the subject as if all foods grew on bushes outside your kitchen door and all you had to do was go out and pick off what you wanted but as a matter of fact foods cost money and under our present system of wage slavery the amount of money the average person can spend for food is strictly limited in a later book i am going to discuss the problem of poverty its causes and remedies all that i can do here is to tell you what foods you ought to have and if society does not pay you enough for your work to enable you to buy such foods you may know that society is starving you and you may get busy to demand your rights as human beings meantime however such money as you do have you want to spend wisely and the vast majority of you spend it very unwisely indeed in the first place a great many of the simplest and most wholesome foods are cheap often because people do not know enough to value them we insist upon having the choice cuts of meat because they are more tender to the teeth but the cheaper cuts are exactly as nutritious we insist upon having our meats loaded with fat although fatness is an abnormal condition in an animal an excess of fat is a grave error in diet i live in a country where jackrabbits are a pest and in the market they sell for perhaps one-fourth the cost of beef and yet i can hardly ever get them because people value them so little as food they prefer the meat of a hog which has been wallowing in a filthy pen and has been deliberately made so fat that it can hardly walk 
I have already spoken of prunes, a much despised and invaluable food. All the dried fruits are rich in food values, and if we could get them untreated by chemicals, they would be worth their cost. I was brought up to despise the cheaper vegetables, such as cabbage and turnips. I never tasted boiled cabbage until I was forty, and then to my great surprise I made the discovery that it is good. Raw cabbage is as valuable as any other salad. It is a trifle harder to digest for some people, but I do not believe in pampering the stomach. Both potatoes and rice are cheap and wholesome. If only we would get unpolished rice, and if we would leave the skins on the potatoes until after they are cooked. Nearly all the mineral salts of the potato are just under the outer skin, and are removed by the foolish habit of peeling them. The prices of food differ so widely at different seasons and in different parts of the world that there is not much profit in trying to figure how cheaply a person can live. I have found that I spend for the diet I have indicated here from sixty to eighty cents a day. I do not buy any fancy foods, but, on the other hand, I do not especially try to economize. I buy what I want of the simple everyday foods in their season. Most everyone will find that it is a good business proposition to buy the foods which he needs to keep in health. If the average working man would add up the money he spends, and not merely in the restaurants, but in the candy stores, the drug stores, the tobacco stores, and the offices of doctors and dentists, he would find, I think, that he could afford to buy himself the necessary quantity of wholesome natural foods. For a family of three, in the place where I live, enough of these foods can be purchased for a dollar a day and this is about one-fourth of what common labor is being paid, and one-eighth of what skilled labor is being paid. I will specify the foods. A pound and a half of shoulder steak, a loaf of whole wheat bread, or a box of shredded wheat biscuit, a head of cabbage, a pound of prunes, and four or five pounds of apples. There are many ways of saving in the purchase of food if you put your mind upon it. If you are buying prunes, you may pay as high as fifty cents or a dollar a pound for the big ones, and they are not a bit better than the tiny ones, which you can buy for as low as eight cents a pound in bulk. When bread is stale, the bakers sell it for half price, despite the fact that only then has it become fit to eat. If you buy canned peaches, you will pay a fancy price for them and they will be heavy with cane sugar. But if you inquire, you find what are known as pie peaches, put up in gallon tins without sugar and at about half the price. The butcher will sell you what he calls Hamburg steak at a very low price, and if you let him prepare it out of your sight, he will fill it with fat and gristle. But let him make some while you watch, and then you will have a very good food. One of my diet rules is that I do not trust the capitalist system to fix me up any kind of mixed or ground or prepared foods. I have not eaten sausage since I saw it made in Chicago. Also, there is something to know about the cooking of foods, since it is possible to take perfectly good foods and spoil them by bad cooking. Once upon a time our family discovered a fireless cooker, and thought that was a wonderful invention for an absent-minded author and a wife who is given to revising manuscripts. But recent investigations which have been made into the nature of the vitamins, food ferments which are only partly understood, suggest a prolonged cooking of food may be a great mistake. The starch has to be cooked in order to break the cell walls by the expansion of the material inside. Twenty minutes will be enough in the case of everything except beans, which need to be cooked four or five hours. Meat should be eaten rare, except in the case of pork, which harbors a parasite dangerous to the human body. Therefore, pork should always be thoroughly cooked. The white of eggs is made less digestible by boiling hard or frying. 
eggs should never be allowed to boil put them on in cold water and take them off as soon as the water begins to boil it is not necessary to cook either fresh fruit or dried the dried fruits may be soaked and eaten raw but i find that several fruits especially apples and pears do not agree with me well if they are eaten raw so i stew them for fifteen or twenty minutes i have no objection to canned fruits and vegetables provided one takes the trouble in opening them to make sure there is no sign of spoiling if you put up your own fruits do not put in any sugar all you have to do is let them boil for a few minutes and to seal them tightly while they are boiling hot the whole secret of preserving is to exclude the air with its bacteria if you live on a farm you will have no trouble in following the diet here outlined for you can produce for yourselves all the foods that i have recommended only do not make the mistake of shipping out your best foods and taking back the products of a factory just because you have read lying advertisements about them take your own wheat and oats and corn to the mill and have it ground whole and make your own breads and cereals try the experiment of mixing whole cornmeal with water and a little salt and baking it into hard crisp corn dodgers i do not eat these but only because i cannot buy them and have no time to make them another common article of food which i do not recommend is salted and smoked meats i do not pretend to know the effects of large quantities of salt and saltpeter and wood smoke upon the human system but i know that dr wiley's poison squad proved definitely that a number of these inorganic minerals are injurious to health and i prefer to take fresh meat when i can get it i use a moderate quantity of common salt on meat and potatoes because there seems to be a natural craving for this i know that many health enthusiasts insist that i am thus putting a strain on my kidneys but i will wait until these health enthusiasts make clear to me why deer and cattle and horses in a wild state will travel many miles to a salt lick i have learned that it is easy to make plausible statements about health but not so easy to prove them for example i was told that it is injurious to drink water at meals and for years i religiously avoided the habit but it occurred to some college professor to find out if this was really true and he carried on a series of experiments which prove that the stomach works better when its contents are diluted the only point about drinking at meals is that you should not use the liquid to wash down your food without chewing it i can suggest two other ways by which you may save money on food one is by not eating too much and another is by eating all that you buy the amount of food that is wasted by the people of america would feed the people of any european nation the amount of food that is thrown out from any of our big american leisure class hotels would feed the children of a european town i think it may fairly be described as a crime to throw into the garbage pail food which might nourish human life in our family we have no garbage pail what little waste there is we burn in the stove and my wife turns into roses it consists of the fat which we cannot help getting at the butchers and the bones of meat and the skins of some fruits and vegetables it would never enter into our minds to throw out a particle of bread or meat or other wholesome food if we have something that we fear may spoil we do not throw it out we put it into a saucepan and cook it for a few minutes if you will make the same rule in your home you will stop at least that much of the waste of american life and as to the big leisure class hotels and the banquet tables of the rich just wait a few years and i think the social revolution will attend to them end of chapter twenty one Chapter 22 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter 22 Foods and Poisons concludes the subject of diet and discusses the effect upon the system of stimulants and narcotics. A few years ago there died an old gentleman who had devoted some twenty years of his life to teaching people to chew their food. Horace Fletcher was his name, and his ideas became a fad, and some people carried them to comical extremes. But Fletcher made a real discovery, what he called the food filter. This is the automatic action of the swallowing apparatus, whereby nature selects the food which has been sufficiently prepared for digestion. If you chew a mouthful of food without ever performing the act of swallowing, you will find that the food gradually disappears. What happens is that all of it, which has been reduced to a thin paste, will slip unnoticed down your throat, and you may go on putting more food into your mouth and chewing, and you can eat a whole meal without ever performing the act of swallowing. Fletcher claimed that this is the proper way to eat, and that you can train yourself to follow this method. I have tried his idea and adopted it. One of my diet rules, to which there is no exception, is that if I haven't the time to chew my food properly, I haven't the time to eat. I skip that meal. The habit of bolting food is a source of disease. To be sure, the carnivorous animals bolt their food, but they are tougher than we are, and do not carry the burden of a large brain and a complex nervous system. If you swallow your meals half-chewed, and wash them down with liquids, you may get away with it for a while, but some day you will pay for it with dyspepsia and nervous troubles. And the same thing applies to your habit of jumping up from meals and rushing away to work, whether it be work of the muscles or of brain and nerves. Proper digestion requires the presence of a quantity of blood in the walls of the stomach and digestive tract. It requires the attention of your subconscious mind, and this means rest of your muscles and brain centers. If you cannot rest for an hour after meals, omit that meal, or make it a light one, of fruit juices, which are almost immediately absorbed by the stomach, and of salads which do not ferment. You may rest assured that it will not hurt you to skip a meal, and make up for it when you have time to be quiet. I have been many times in my life under very intense and long-continued nervous strain. For example, during the Colorado coal strike, I led a public demonstration which kept me in a state of excitement all the day and a good part of the night several weeks. During this period I ate almost nothing. A baked apple and a cup of custard would be as near as I would go to a meal and as a result I came through the experience without any injury whatever to my health. I lost perhaps ten pounds in weight, but that was quickly made up when I settled back into a normal way of life. I have been on camping trips, when I had a great deal of hard work to do, carrying a canoe long distances on my back, or paddling it forty miles a day. On the mornings of such a trip, I have seen a guide cook himself an elaborate breakfast of freshly baked bread, bacon, and even beans, and make a hearty meal, and then go straight to work. My meal, on the contrary, would consist of a small dish of stewed prunes, or perhaps some huckleberries or raspberries, if they could be found. I will not say that I could do as much as the guide, because he was used to it, and I was not. But I can say this, if I had eaten his breakfast at the start of the day, I would have been dead before night and I mean the word dead, quite literally. I know a man who started to climb Whiteface Mountain in the Adirondacks. He climbed halfway and then ate lunch, which consisted of nine hard-boiled eggs. Then he started to climb the rest of the mountain and dropped dead of acute indigestion. There are few poisons which can affect the system more quickly or more dangerously than a mass of food which is not digested. The stomach is an ideal forcing house for the breeding of bacteria. It provides warmth and moisture, and you, in your meal, provide the bacteria and the material upon which they thrive. 
under normal conditions the stomach pours out a gastric juice which kills the bacteria but let this gastric juice for any reason be lacking because your nervous energy has gone somewhere else or because your bloodstream from which the gastric juice must be made has been drawn away to the muscles by hard labor then you have a yeast pot with great quantities of gases and poisons in acute cases the results are evident enough violent pains and convulsions followed by coma and the turning black of the body but what you should understand is that you may produce a milder case of such poisoning and may do it day after day habitually and little by little your vital organs will be weakened by the strain it does not make any difference at what hour of the twenty-four you take the great bulk of your food it is one of the commonest delusions that you get some strengthening effect from your food immediately and must have this strength in order to do hard work to be sure there are substances such as grape sugar which require practically no digesting you can hold them in the mouth and they will be digested by the saliva and absorbed at once into the bloodstream. But unless you have been starved for a long period, you do not need to get your strength in this rush fashion. If you ate your normal meals on the previous day, your bloodstream is fully supplied with nutriment which has been put through a long process of preparation, and you can get up in the morning and work all day, if necessary, upon what is already in your system. To be sure, you may feel hungry and even faint, but that is merely a matter of habit. Your system is accustomed to taking food and expects it. But if you are a laborer doing hard work, you can easily train yourself to eat a light meal in the morning and another light meal at noon, and to eat a hearty meal when your work is done and you can rest. Two light meals and a hearty meal are all that any person needs, and you can prove it to yourself by trying it, and watching your weight once a week. I have tried many experiments, and the conclusion to which I have come is that there is no virtue in any particular meal hours or any particular number of meals. For several years I tried the experiment of two meals a day. I was living a retired life and had little contact with the world, and I would make it a hearty meal at ten o'clock in the morning, and another at five in the afternoon. But later on I found that inconvenient, and now I take a light breakfast and two moderate-sized meals at the conventional hours of lunch and dinner. I can arrange my own time, so after meal times is when I get my reading done. Sometimes, when I am tired, I feel sleepy after meals, but I have learned not to yield to this impulse. I do not know how to explain this. I have observed that animals sleep after eating, and it appears to be a natural thing to do, but I know that if I go to sleep after a meal, nature makes clear to me that I have made a mistake, and I do not repeat it. I never eat at night, and always go to bed on an empty stomach, so I am always hungry when I open my eyes in the morning. I never know what it is not to be hungry at meal times, and my habits are so regular that I could set my watch by my stomach. Another common habit which is harmful is eating between meals. I have known people who are accustomed to nibble at food nearly all the time. Shelley records that he tried it as an experiment, thinking it might be a convenient way to get digestion done, but he found that it did not work. The stomach is apparently meant to work in pulses, to do a job of digesting, and then to rest and accumulate the juices for another job. It will accustom itself to a certain regime, and will work accordingly. But if, when it has half digested a load of food, you pile more food in on top, you make as much trouble as you would make in your kitchen if you required your cook to prepare another meal before she has cleaned up after the last one. Three times a day is enough for any adult to eat. Children require to eat oftener, because their bodies are more active, and they not merely have to keep up weight, but to add to it. The simplest way to arrange matters with children 
is to give them three good meals at the hours when adults eat, and then to give them a couple of pieces of fruit between breakfast and lunch, and again between lunch and supper. I have never seen a child who would not be satisfied with this, when once the habit was established. I have already spoken of the cooking and serving of food. I consider that the gastronomic art, as it is pompously called, is 99% plain rubbish. To be sure, if foods are appetizingly prepared and look good and smell good and taste good, they will cause the gastric juices to flow abundantly, as the Russian scientist Pavlov has demonstrated by practical experiment with the stomach pump. But I know without any stomach pump that the best thing to make my gastric juices flow is hard work and a spare diet. When I come home from five sets of tennis and have a cold shower and a rub down, my gastric juices will flow for a piece of cold beefsteak and a cold sweet potato quite as well as for anything that is served by a leisure class chef. Needless to say, I want food to be fresh and I want it to be clean, but I have other things to do with my time and money than to pamper my appetites and encourage food whims. If you have a grandmother, or ever had one, you know what grandmothers tell you about hot, nourishing food. But I have tried the experiment and satisfied myself that there is absolutely no difference in nourishing qualities between hot food and cold food. If you chew your food sufficiently, it will all be 98 and 6 tenths degree food when it gets to your stomach. And that is the way your stomach wants it. Of course, if you have been out in a blizzard and are chilled and want to restore the body temperature, a hot drink will be one of the quickest ways. And if the emergency is extreme, you may even add a stimulant. On the other hand, if you are suffering from heat, it is sensible to cool your body by a cold drink. But you should use as much judgment with yourself as you do with a horse which you would not permit to drink a lot of cold water when he is heated up and is going into his stall to stand still. I have mentioned the word stimulants, and this opens a large subject. There are drugs which affect the body in two different ways. Some excite the nerves, and through the nerves, the heart and bloodstream, to more intense activity. Others have the effect of deadening the nerves and dulling the sense of exhaustion and pain. One of these groups is called stimulants. The other is called narcotics. But as a matter of fact, the stimulants are really narcotics, because they operate by dulling the nerves whose function it is to prevent the overaccumulation of fatigue poisons. In other words, they keep the nerves and muscles from knowing that they are tired, so they go on working. It is possible, of course, to conceive of an emergency in which that is necessary. Once upon a time, on a hunting trip, I had been traveling all day and was caught in a rainstorm and exhausted and chilled to the bone. I had to make camp without a fire, so when I got the tent up, I wrapped myself in blankets and drank a couple of tablespoons full of whiskey. That is the only time I have ever taken whiskey in my life, and it warmed me almost instantly, and did me no harm. In the same way, there were two or three occasions when I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, could not sleep, and let the doctor give me a sleeping powder. But in each case, I knew that I was fooling with a dangerous habit, and I did no more fooling than necessary. No one should make use of either stimulants or narcotics except in extreme emergency, and never but a few times in a lifetime. What you should do is to change your habits so that you will not need to overstrain. All these drugs are habit-forming, that is to say, they leave the body no better, and with a craving for repetition of the relief. When you are tired, it is because your muscles and nerves are storing up fatigue poisons more rapidly than your bloodstream can get rid of them. You need to know about this condition, and exhaustion and pain are nature's protective warning. 
if you put a stop to the warning, you are as unintelligent as the eastern despots who used to cut off the head of the messenger who brought bad tidings. If, when you have a headache, you go to the drug store and let the druggist mix you one of those white fizzy drinks, what you are doing is not to get rid of the poisons in your bloodstream, but merely to reduce the action of your heart so as to keep the blood from pressing so fast into the aching blood vessels and nerves. You may try that trick with your heart a number of times, but sooner or later you will try it once too often, and your heart will stop a little bit quicker than you meant it to. Drugs are poisons and their action depends upon their poisoning some particular portion of the body and temporarily paralyzing it. And bear this in mind, they are nonetheless poisonous because they are natural products. You can kill yourself by cyanide of potassium, which comes out of a chemist's retort, or you can kill yourself just as dead with laudanum, which comes out of a plant, or with the contents of the venom sac of a snake. You are poisoning yourself nonetheless certainly if you use alcohol, which is made from the juices of beautiful fruits, and has had hosts of famous poets writing songs about it, or you can poison yourself with the caffeine, which you get in a lovely brown bean which comes from Brazil, fragrant to the nostrils and delicious to the taste. You may drink wine and tea and coffee for a hundred years, and have your picture published in the newspapers as a proof that these habits conduce to health. But nothing will be said about the large number of people who practiced these habits and didn't live so long, and about how long they might have lived if they hadn't practiced these habits. I was brought up in the South, and my elders belonged to a generation which had grown up in wartime. For this reason, many of the men both drank and smoked to excess, and in my boyhood I lived among them and watched them, and with the help of advice from a wise mother, I conceived a horror of every kind of stimulant. The alcoholic poets could not fool me. I had been in the alcoholic wards of hospitals. I had seen one man after another beautiful and kindly and gracious men dragged down into a pit of torment and shame. Alcohol is, I think, the greatest trap that nature ever set for the feet of the human race. It is responsible for more degradation and misery than any other evil in the world. And I say this, knowing well that my socialist friends will cry, What about capitalism? My answer is that I doubt if there ever would have been any capitalism in the world if it had not been for alcohol. If the workers had not been systematically poisoned and all their savings taken away from them by the gin mill, they would never have submitted to the capitalist system. They would have built the cooperative commonwealth at the time they were building the first factories. I listened to the arguments of my radical friends about personal liberty. But I note that in Russia, when it was a question of making a practical revolution and keeping it alive, the first thing the leaders did was to drag out the contents of the wine cellars of the palaces and smash them in the gutters. Tea and coffee are, of course, much milder in their effects than alcohol. You can play with them longer, and the punishment will be less severe. But if you make habitual use of them, you will pay the penalty which all drugs exact from the system. Your brain and your nerve centers will be less sensitive, less capable of working except under the influence of drugs. Their reacting power will be dulled, and they will wear out more quickly. I have watched the slaves of the morning cup of coffee, and know how they suffer when they do not get it. Likewise, I have watched the tea drinkers. It is comical to live in England and see all the able-bodied men obliged to leave their work at four o'clock in the afternoon and seek the regular stimulus for their tired nerves. If you are to meet anybody, it is always for tea that the ceremony is set. And if you refuse to drink tea, 
your hostess will be uncomfortable, unable to talk about anything but the strange, incredible notion that one can live without tea. I discovered after a while the solution of this problem. I would say that I preferred a little hot water, if you please, and so my hostess would pour me a cup of hot water, and I would sit and gravely sip it, and everybody would be perfectly content. I was conforming to the outward appearance of normality, which is what the British conventions require. I have never drunk a cup of coffee, so I do not know what its effect on me would be. But some fifteen years ago I drank a glass of very weak iced tea at eight o'clock in the evening, and did not get to sleep until four or five the next morning. So I know that there is really a drug in tea. I know also that I might accustom my system to it, just as I might learn to poison my lungs with nicotine without being made immediately and suddenly ill. But why should I wish to do this? Life is so interesting to me that I do not need to stimulate my brain centers in order to appreciate the thrill of it. And when I am tired, I can rest myself by listening to music or by reading a worthwhile novel, things which I have found do not leave the after-effects of nicotine. I remember the first time I met Jack London. Our meeting consisted in good part of his kidding me because I was lacking in the congenial vices of the café. He told me how much I had missed because I had never been drunk. One ought to try the great adventure at least once. Poor Jack is gone because his kidneys gave out at forty, and nothing could seem more ungracious than to point out that I am still alive, and finding life enjoyable. Yet in this book we are trying to find out how to live, and if there are habits which wreck and destroy a magnificent physique and bring a great genius to death at the age of forty, surely the rest of us want to know about it and to be warned in time. I mention Jack London in this connection, because he has said the last word on the subject of alcohol. Read John Barleycorn, and especially read between the lines of it, and you will not need my argument to persuade you to be glad that the 18th Amendment has been written into the Constitution, and that it's your duty as a socialist not merely to obey it, but to vote for its enforcement. I am proceeding on the assumption that your life is of importance to you, that you have a job to do which you know to be worthwhile, to which you desire to apply your powers. You agree with me that the workers of the world are suffering, and that it is necessary for them to find their freedom, and that this takes hard work and hard thinking. You may say that I exaggerate the amount of harm that is done to the system by tea and coffee, alcohol and tobacco. Well, let us assume that in moderate quantities they do no harm at all. Even so, I have the right to ask you to show that they do some good. Otherwise, surely, it is a mistake for the workers to spend their savings upon them. Consider, for example, the amount of money which the wage slaves of the world spend upon tobacco. Suppose they could be persuaded for two or three years to spend this amount upon good reading matter. Do you not think there would be an improvement in their condition? Surely you cannot maintain that the use of tobacco is necessary to the activities of the brain. Surely you do not think that a man has to have a cigarette in order to stimulate his thoughts, or to smoke a pipe to rest himself after his work is done? I offer myself as evidence in such a controversy. I have written as many books as any man in the radical movement, and the sum total of my lifetime smoking amounts to one half of one cigarette. I tried that when I was eight years old, and somebody told me a policeman would arrest me if he caught me, and I threw away the cigarette, and ran and hid in the alley, and have not yet got over my scare. In the Journal for Industrial Hygiene for October 1920 is an article entitled 
fatigue and efficiency of smokers in a strenuous mental occupation. Experiments were conducted among telegraph operators, and the result showed that the heavy smokers of the group showed a higher output rate at the beginning of the day than the light smokers, but their rate falls off more markedly in the late hours, and their production for the whole day is definitely less than that of the light smokers. The heavy smokers also show less ability than the light smokers to respond to increasing pressures of work in the late hours of the day by handling their full share of the work presented. One point upon which every medical authority agrees is that the use of nicotine is of deadly effect upon the immature organism. Half-grown youths who smoke cigarettes will never be full-sized men. They will never have normal lungs or a normal heart. And likewise, all authorities agree about the effect of smoking upon the organism of women. I gave what little help I could to the task of helping to set women free and to make them the equals of men. But I was always pained when I discovered that some of my feminist friends understood by women's emancipation no more than her right to adopt men's vices. I would say to these ardent young female radicals who cultivate the art of dangling a cigarette from their lower lip and sip cocktails out of coffee cups in Greenwich Village cafes, that they will never be able to bear sound children. But I know that this would not interest them. They don't want to bear any children at all. So I say that they will never be able to think straight thoughts and will be nervous invalids when they are thirty. We went to war to make the world safe for democracy, and we put several millions of our young men into armies, and if there were any of them who did not already know how to smoke cigarettes, they learned it under official sanction. So now we have a national tobacco bill that runs up to two billions, and will ensure us a new generation of Class C rating. Speaking to the young radicals who are reading my books, I say we want to make the world over, to make it a place of freedom and kindness instead of the hell of greed and hate that it is today. For that purpose, we need a new moral code, and we can never win our victory without it. I have attended radical conventions, sitting in unventilated halls amid clouds of tobacco smoke, and listening to men wrangle all through the day and a great part of the night. I have watched the fatal dissensions in the movement, the quarrelings of the right-wingers and the left-wingers, and all stages and all degrees in between, and I have wondered, not jestingly, but in pitying earnest, how much of all those personalities and factional misunderstanding had their origin in carbon dioxide and nicotine. There is no use suggesting such ideas to the older men whose habits are fixed, but a new generation is coming on with a new vision of the enormous task before it. And is it too much to expect of these young men and women that they shall realize in advance the grim tasks they have to do and shall learn to run the machine of their bodies so as to get out of it the maximum amount of service? Is it too much to hope for that some day we shall have a race of young fighters for truth and justice who are willing to live abstemious lives and consecrate themselves to the task of delivering mankind from wage, slavery, and war? End of chapter 22 Chapters 23 and 24 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 More About Health Discusses the subjects of breathing and ventilation, clothing, bathing, and sleep. In discussing the question of health, we have given the greater part of the space to the subject of diet, for the reason that experience has convinced us that diet is two-thirds of health, and that nearly always in disease you find errors of diet playing a part. 
there are however other important factors in health now to be discussed everything of which the body makes use is taken in the form of food and drink with the exception of one substance the oxygen we get out of the air every time we draw a breath we take in a certain amount of oxygen and every time we expel a breath we drive out a certain amount of a gas called carbon dioxide which is what the body makes of the fuel it burns the body can get along for several days without water and for two or three months without food but it can only get along for two or three minutes without oxygen it should be obvious that when the body expels carbon dioxide with a slight mixture of other more poisonous gases and sucks back what it expects will be a fresh supply of oxygen it wants to get oxygen and not the same gases it has just expelled nor gases which have been expelled from the lungs of other people in the days when primitive man lived outdoors he did not have to think about this problem when he breathed poison from his lungs the moving air of nature blew it away and the infinite vegetation of nature took the carbon dioxide and turned it back into oxygen and even when man built himself shelters he was not cunning enough to make them airtight he had to leave a big hole for the smoke to get out and smaller holes through which to get light but now our wonderful civilization has solved these problems we make our houses out of airtight plaster and we have invented a substance which will admit light without admitting air so we have the white plague of tuberculosis and so we have the innumerable minor plagues of coughs and colds and sore throats in the summer time the solution of the problem is easy have as many doors and windows in your home as possible and keep them open and have nothing in your home to make dust or to retain dust but then comes stormy and cold weather and you have to close your doors and windows and keep your home at a higher temperature than the air outside how shall you do this and at the same time get a continuous supply of fresh air i will take the various methods of heating one by one the problem in each case is simple and can be made clear in a sentence or two first the open fireplace this is a perfect solution if you have enough fuel and do not have to worry about the waste of heat an open fireplace draws out all the air in the room in a short time and you do not have to bother about opening doors or windows you may be sure that the air is getting in through some cracks or else the fire would not burn second a wood or coal or gas stove in the room provided with a proper vent so that all the gases of combustion are drawn up the chimney this changes the air more slowly than an open fireplace but it does the work fairly well all that you have to be careful about is that your vent is sufficiently large and is working properly if your fire does not draw you will have smoke or coal gas in the house and this is bad for the lungs but worse for the lungs is a gas that you can neither see nor smell nor taste the deadly carbon monoxide this gas is produced by incomplete combustion and whenever you see yellow flames from gas or coal you are apt to have this poisonous substance small quantities of it are sufficient to cause violent headaches and repeated doses of it are fatal men who work in garages which are not properly ventilated run this risk all the time because carbon monoxide is one of the products of imperfect combustion in the gas engine next the furnace a furnace sends fresh warm air into your house the only trouble is that it takes out all the moisture and some authorities say that this is bad for the lungs and throat i do not know whether this is true but all furnaces are supposed to have a water chamber to supply moisture to the air and you should keep a pan of water on every stove or radiator in your house next steam heat which includes hot water heating 
this is one of the abominations of our civilization and one of the methods by which our race is committing suicide there is nothing wrong about steam heat in itself the room is warmed in a harmless way but the trouble is it stays warm only so long as the doors and windows are kept shut you are in an air-tight box and can be warm provided you do not mind being suffocated the moment you open a door or a window you have a cold draft on your feet and if you wish to change the air entirely you have to let out all the heat so of course you never do change it entirely but go on breathing the same air over and over and every time you breathe it the condition of your body is a little more reduced the solution of this problem is not to heat the air in the room but to use your steam coils to heat fresh air and then drive this air already warmed into the room at the same time providing a vent through which the old air can be pushed out this is the hot air system of heating and it requires some kind of engine or dynamo and therefore is expensive it has been installed in a few office buildings and theaters one of the most perfect systems i ever inspected is in the building of the new york stock exchange where the air is warmed in winter and cooled in summer and freed from dust and exactly the right quantity is supplied it is a humorous commentary upon our civilization that we take perfect care of the breathing apparatus of our stock gamblers but pay no attention to the breathing apparatus of our senators and congressmen whose one business in life is to use their lungs the stately old building with its white marble domes looks impressive in moving pictures and on illustrated postcards but it has no system of ventilation whatever and is a death trap to the poor wretches who are compelled to spend their days and sometimes their nights within its walls this contrast is one symptom of the rise of industrial capitalism and the collapse of political democracy we have reserved to the last a method of heating which is the worst and can only be described as a crime against health the use of gas and oil stoves set out in the middle of the room without a vent and discharging their fumes into the room these stoves are simply instruments of slow death and their manufacture should be prohibited by law in the meantime what you have to do is to refuse to live in a room or work in an office where such stoves are used i have heard dealers insist that this or the other kind of gas or oil stove was so contrived as to consume all the fumes do not let anybody fool you with such nonsense there has never been any form of combustion devised which consumes all the fumes no such thing can be because the products of combustion are not combustible the so-called wickless blue flame stoves do burn all the oil and a properly regulated gas stove will burn all the gas but that simply means that it turns the oil and gas into carbon dioxide the very substance which your lungs are working day and night to get out of your body moreover there is no oil or gas stove which ever burns perfectly all the time either because there is too much gas or insufficient air oil and gas stoves sometimes give a partly yellow flame you can cause them to give a yellow flame at any time by blowing air against them and that yellow flame means imperfect combustion and a probability of the deadly carbon monoxide these facts are known to every chemist and to every student of hygiene and the fact that civilized people continue to burn such oil and gas stoves in their homes and offices is simply one more proof that our civilization values human welfare and health at nothing whatever in comparison with profits not merely should you see that you have a continuous supply of fresh air in your home but you should try to keep down dust in your home and especially fine particles of lint once upon a time our ancestors were unable to make houses and floors tight so they put rugs on the floors and hung tapestries on the walls to keep out the wind we civilized people are able to make both floors and walls absolutely tight and yet 
we continue to use rugs and curtains it being the first principle of our education that propriety requires us to continue to do the things which our ancestors did i am unable to think of a more silly or stupid thing in the world than a rug or a curtain but i have lived in the house with them all my life because alas the ladies cannot be happy otherwise they want their homes to be pretty and so they continue to set dust traps and to set themselves futile jobs of house cleaning and shopping not all of us are able to be out of doors as much as we ought to be but all of us spend seven or eight hours out of every twenty-four in sleep and this time at least we ought to spend out of doors i understand that this is a futile advice to give to the very poor i was poor myself for many years and had to put all my clothes on at night in order to keep warm and even then i could not always do it nevertheless from the time i first realized the importance of ventilation i never slept in a room with a closed window i say sleep outdoors if you possibly can you do not have to be afraid of exposure for cold will not hurt you if you keep your body in proper condition i have slept out in a rubber blanket with the rain beating on my head and face i have spread a rubber blanket on a hammock in the midst of a swamp and waked up in the morning with my hair and face soaked in cold white fog but i never caught cold from such things there is no harm whatever in dampness or in night air if you are in proper condition of course you may get your ears frostbitten in the middle of winter but you can have a sleeping hood to remove that danger the nature cure enthusiasts who lay so much stress upon an outdoor life also insist that the wearing of clothes is a harmful civilized custom they urge us to take sun baths and to ventilate the skin now as a matter of fact the skin does not breathe it merely gives out moisture and it does not give out any less because we have clothing on us provided the clothing is dry and clean and will absorb the moisture but by and by the clothing becomes loaded with the waste substances given out by the skin and then it will absorb no more and if you do not change your clothing no doubt it may have some effect upon health but the principal evil of civilized clothing is that it binds the body and prevents the free play of the muscles and more important yet stops the free circulation of the blood i have already discussed hats which are the principal cause of baldness i will go to the other extremity of the body and mention tight shoes which strange as it may seem cause headaches and colds you will be able to find a few civilized men with normal feet but you will hardly ever find a woman whose toes are not crowded together and misshapen i have said that the human body is one organism and that it is fed and its health maintained by the bloodstream i say now that the circulation of blood is one thing and if you block it in any one place you block it everywhere of course not all the bloodstream goes down into the feet but some of it does and if it is clogged in the feet and the blood vessels cramped and crowded there is a certain amount of poison kept in the system which the system should have got rid of why do women wear tight shoes because the leisure class members of their sex have been kept in harems and used as the playthings of men to be fragile and delicate was the thing admired by the masters of wealth and to have small hands and feet was a sign that women belonged to this parasite class therefore at all hazards women's feet must be kept small even at the expense of their health and happiness and so they put themselves up on several inches of heels which caused them to toddle around like marionettes on a stage with all their toes crowded down into a lump why do men wear tight bands around their scalps which cause their hair to drop out and tight stiff columns around their necks which stop the circulation of blood into their heads and cause them to have headaches instead of ideas the reason is that for ages the rulers of the tribe have wished to demonstrate publicly their superiority to the common herd 
which does the menial tasks. In England, all gentlemen wear tall black silk band boxes on their heads, and in America they have a choice among several varieties of round tight boxes. All men who work in offices wear stiffly starched collars and cuffs as a means of demonstrating their superiority to the common workers who have to sweat at their necks. I think it is not too much to hope that when class exploitation is done away with, we shall also get rid of these class symbols, and choose our clothing because it is warm and comfortable, and not according to the perverted imbecilities of style. The skin gives out perspiration, which is greasy. Also the skin is constantly growing, putting out layers of cells which dry up and are worn off. We need to bathe the soap to remove the grease, and we need to rub with a towel to brush away the dead cells of the skin, so that the pores may be kept open. No one is taking care of his body who does not wash and rub it once every twenty-four hours, and once or twice a week with warm water and soap. It is often stated that hot baths are weakening, but I have never found it so. However, I think it is a bad practice to pamper the body, which should be accustomed to the shock of cold water. The rule as to bathing, both as to temperature and time, is simple. If, after the bath and rub-down, your body has reacted and you feel vigorous and fresh, that bath has done you good. If, on the other hand, you feel chilled and depressed, then you have been too long in the water, or its temperature was too low. Every person has to find his own rules in such matters. The only general rule is that as one grows older, the body reacts less quickly. All day, as we work and think, we store up more poisons in our cells than the body can get rid of. And the time comes when the cells are so loaded with poisons that we have to stop for a while and let our bloodstream clean house. The quantity of sleep one needs is a problem like that of cold water. Each person has to find his own rule. In general, one needs less and less sleep as one grows older. Infants sleep the greater part of the time. Growing children should sleep 10 or 11 hours. Adults, 7 or 8. And old people, unless they have let themselves get fat, generally do not want to sleep more than 6, and part of this in short naps. When you sleep, your bodily energies relax, and you make less heat, therefore you need extra clothing. But this clothing should never cover the mouth and nose, nor should it be so heavy as to make breathing a burden. If you are in good condition, it will do you no harm to be chilly when you sleep, except that you do not sleep so soundly. Sleeping too much is just as harmful as sleeping too little. Nature will tell you that. The important thing, as in all other problems of health, is to have something interesting to think about, some exciting work to do in the world, and then you will sleep as little as you have to. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 Work and Play Deals with the question of exercise, both for the idle and the overworked. In discussing the important question of exercise, there is one fundamental fact to begin with, that our present civilization divides men sharply into two classes, those who do not get enough exercise and those who get too much. Obviously, it would be folly to make the same recommendations to the two classes. I will begin with those who get too much exercise. They include a great number probably the majority of those who do the manual work of the world. They include the farmers and the farm hands who work from dawn to sunset, and sometimes by lantern light. They include also the farmers' wives, the kitchen slaves of whom the old couplet tells, Man's work ends from sun to sun, but woman's work is never done. I am aware that men have worked that way for countless ages, and yet the race is still surviving. 
but I am aware also that men wither up with rheumatism and contract chronic diseases of the kidneys and blood vessels consequent upon the creation of greater quantities of fatigue poisons than the body can regularly eliminate. I have very little interest in the past, and none whatever in finding fault with it. My purpose is to criticize the present for the benefit of the future, and therefore I say that modern machinery and the whole development of modern large-scale production make it absolutely unnecessary that women should have to slave all their waking hours in the kitchens, or that men should slave all day. I say it is monstrous folly that the men should work for twelve-hour stretches in steel mills, and for ten and eleven hours in factories and mines. Organized labor has adopted the slogan, eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for play. But my slogan is four hours for work, four hours for study, eight hours for sleep, and eight hours for play. I know, and am prepared to demonstrate to any thinking man, that modern civilization can produce not merely all the necessities, but all the comforts of life for every man, woman, and child in the community, by the expenditure of four hours a day work of the adult, able-bodied men and women. So to all the wage slaves of the factories and mines, the fields and kitchens, I say that too much exercise is what is the matter with you and what you need is to get off in a quiet nook in the woods and read a good novel. Not merely for a few hours, but for a few months, until you get over the effects of capitalist civilization. I know that not many of you can get away as yet, but I urge you to insist upon getting away, to fight for the chance to get away. And I will here suggest a few of the novels for you to read when you finally do get away. I choose the easy ones, which the dullest and most tired of you will love. I say, make up your mind to read these thirty-two books before you die, and do not let the world cheat you of the chance. Mark Twain, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Charles D. Stewart, the Fugitive Blacksmith. W. Clark Russell, the Wreck of the Grosvenor. R. L. Stevenson, Treasure Island kidnapped jack london the sea wolf the call of the wild martin eden joseph conrad youth h g wells the war of the worlds when the sleeper wakes the sea lady the history of mr polly the food of the gods the island of dr moreau upton sinclair the jungle king cole jimmy higgins one hundred percent Theodore Dreiser, Sister Carrie, George Moore, Esther Waters, Frank Norris, The Octopus, Brand Whitlock, The Turn of the Balance, Defoe, Robinson Crusoe, Fielding, Tom Jones, Jonathan Wilde the Great, Thackeray, The Adventures of Barry Lyndon, Marmaduke Pictal, The Adventures of Haji Baba, Blasco Ibanez, The Fruit of the Vine, Frank Harris, Montes de Matador, Frederick von Eden, The Quest, Tolstoy, Resurrection. And now for the people who do not get enough exercise. In the armies of King Cyrus, it was the law that every man was required to sweat once every twenty-four hours and that is still the law for every businessman and office worker and writer of books. There is no substitute for it, and there is no health without it. I have heard Dr. Kellogg say that the modern woman sends out her health with her washing. And I have heard the leisure class ladies at the sanitarium discuss this cryptic utterance and wonder what he meant by it. I know that there is use telling leisure class ladies what exercise at their wash tub would do for their abdomens and backs. I will only tell them that unless they can find some kind of vigorous activity which keeps them in a free perspiration for an hour or two each day, they will never be really well, 
and will never bear children without agony and abortion. For myself, I have found that the minimum is three or four times a week. Unless I get that much hard exercise, I am soon in trouble. So my advice to the businessman is to take off his coat and collar and turn out to help his truck man. My advice to the white-collar slave is to get a part-time job and dig ditches the rest of the time. To the man who has cares which pursue him, and likewise to the ardent student and brain worker, I say that they should find not merely exercise, but play. The distinction between the two things is important. There can be play that is not exercise, for example, cards and chess, and of course there can be exercise that is not play. What you must have is something that is both play and exercise, something that not merely causes your heart to beat fast, and your lungs to pump fast, and your sweat glands to throw out poisons from your body, but something that fully occupies your mind and gives your higher brain centers a chance to relax. Our civilization has very largely destroyed the possibility of play and the spirit of play. We civilized people no longer know what play is, and regard the desire to play as something abnormal, a form of vice. We allow children to play after school hours and on Saturdays, but for grown-up, serious-minded men and women to want to play would be almost as disreputable as for them to want to get drunk. What could be more pitiful than the spectacle of tens of thousands of men crowded into our baseball parks and amusement fields to watch other men play for them? Imagine, if you can, a crowd of people gathering in a restaurant or a theater to watch other people eat for them. Imagine yourself a man from Mars coming down to a world with so many people in want and finding whole classes of men forbidden to do any work under penalty of disgrace, and compelled, in order to exercise their muscles, to pull on rubber straps and lift weights and wave dumbbells in Indian clubs in the air, methods of expending their muscular energy, which are respectable because they accomplish nothing. When I was a boy, I was fond of all kinds of games. I was a good tennis player, and in the country an incessant hunter and fisherman. When, on the city streets, we boys could not find any other game to play, we would get up on the roofs of the houses and throw clothespins and snowballs at the dagos working in the nearby excavations. So we had the fine game of being chased by the dagos, with the chance, real or imaginary, of having a knife stuck into us. But then, as I grew older and became aware of the pain and the misery of the world, I lost my interest in games and for ten years or so I never played. I did nothing but study and write. So my health gave way, and I had the problem of restoring it. And I spent some twenty years wrestling with this problem before I thoroughly convinced myself on the point that there can be no such thing as sound and permanent health without a certain amount of play. I don't think there is any kind of hard physical work I fail to try in the course of my experiments. I rode horseback, and took long walks, and climbed mountains, and swam, and dug gardens, and chopped down whole groves of trees, and cut them up, and carried them to the fireplace. I have done this latter work for the whole winter in the country, several hours every day, and it has done my health no good to speak of. I have been ready for a breakdown at the end of it. The reason is that all the time I was doing these things with my body, I was going right on working my brain. While I was swimming, or climbing a mountain, or galloping on horseback, I was absorbed in the next chapter of the book I was writing, so that I literally did not know where I was. I would make up my mind that I would not think about my work, and I would make desperate efforts not to do so, but it was like walking along the edge of a slippery ditch. Sooner or later I was bound to fall in, and go floundering along unable to get out again. And the same thing applies to all gymnastic work. I have experimented with a dozen different systems of exercises, and with all kinds of water treatments, 
I have used dumbbells and Indian clubs and Swedish gymnastics, McFadden's exercises in bed, and the yogi breathing exercises, and more kinds of queer things than I can remember now. But for me, there is only one solution of the problem, which is to have an antagonist. It may be a deer I'm trying to shoot, or some trout I'm trying to lure out of their holes. It may be some boys I'm trying to beat at football or hockey, or it may be the game I know best and find most convenient, which is tennis. If it is tennis, then it has to be someone who can make me work as hard as I know how. For if it is someone I can beat easily, why, before I have been playing ten minutes, I am busily working out the next chapter of a book, or answering letters I have just got in the mail. Recently I came upon a book, The Psychology of Relaxation, by Dr. Patrick, in which the theory of this is set forth. Civilized man is working his higher brain centers more than his body can stand. His brain is running away with him, absorbing a constantly increasing share of his energies. True relaxation is only possible where the higher brain centers are lulled, and the back lobes of the brain brought into activity. One of the means of doing this is alcohol. And that is why, through the ages, all races of men have craved to get drunk. There is a method which is harmless and does not break down the system, and that is play. When we become really interested in play, we are, as children, or as primitive man, we do all the things that our race used to do many ages ago. We hunt and fight, we pit our wits against the wits of our enemies, and struggle with desperation to get the better of them. If our play is physical play, if we are absorbed in a game or bodily contest, then we are exerting and developing all those portions of us which civilization tends to atrophy and deaden. There are people who will dispute with you about socialism, and ask how we are going to provide incentives if we do away with wage slavery. When you tell them that activity is natural to human beings, and that if there were no work, men and women would have to make some, they shake their heads mournfully and tell you about the problem of human nature. But consider games and sports. Men do not have to work their bodies, yet they go out and deliberately hunt for trouble. They invent themselves subtle and complicated games, and are not content until they find people who can beat them at it, or at any rate can make them work to the limit of their strength, until they are in a dripping perspiration and thoroughly exhausted. I may be too optimistic about human nature, but I believe that this is the attitude every normal human being takes toward the powers, both mental and physical, which he possesses. He wants to use them, and for all they are worth. If you don't believe it, just take any group of youngsters, give them a baseball and bat, turn them loose in a vacant lot, and watch them choose up sides and fall to work, screaming and shouting in wild excitement. There are some races of the earth which do not yet know baseball, but the Filipinos and the Japanese have learned it, and even the war-worn Poilus and their supercilious Tommies condescended to experiment with it. And if you think it is only physical competition that young human animals enjoy, try them at putting on a play, or printing a magazine, or conducting a debate, or building a house, anything whatever that involves healthy competition and is related to the big things of life, but without being for the profit of some exploiter. Get clear the plain and simple distinction between work and play. Play is what you want to do, while work is what the profit system makes you do. End of chapter 24 Chapters 25 and 26 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 The Fasting Cure deals with nature's own remedy for disease and how to make use of it. 
we have next to consider the various human ailments what causes them and how they can be remedied as it happens i know of a cure that comes pretty near being that impossible thing a cure-all at any rate it is so far ahead of other cures that a discussion of it will cover three-fourths of the subject when i was a boy living in new york there was a man by the name of dr tanner who took a forty-day fast he was on public exhibition at the time and was supposed to be watched day and night the newspapers gave a great deal of attention to the story and crowds used to come to gaze at him i remember very well the conversations i heard about the matter people were quite sure that it couldn't be true the man must be getting something to eat on the sly he must have some nourishment in the water he drank no human being could fast more than five or six days without starving to death in the year nineteen ten i published in the united states and england a magazine article telling how on several occasions i had fasted ten or twelve days and what i had accomplished by it i found that i had the same difficulty to confront as old dr tanner i received scores of letters from people who called me a faker and i read scores of newspaper editorials to the same effect the new york times published a dispatch about three young ladies on long island who were trying a three-day fast and the times commented editorially to the effect that these young ladies were the victims of a shallow and unscrupulous sensationalist the notion that human beings can perish for lack of food in a few days is deeply rooted in people's minds recently a group of eleven irishmen in jail set to work to starve themselves to death as a protest against british rule in their country day after day the newspapers reported the news from cork prison and at about the twentieth day they began to state that the prisoners were dying that the priest had been sent for that their relatives were gathered on the prison steps day after day such reports continued through the thirties and the forties and the fifties and the sixties and the seventies one man died on the eighty-eighth day and mcswinney died on the seventy-fourth the other nine gave up after ninety-four days and were all restored to health i watched carefully the newspaper and magazine comment on this incident yet i did not see a single remark on the medical aspects of it i could not discover that scientific men had learned anything whatever about the ability of the body to go without food for long periods get this clear at the outset nobody ever starved to death in less than two months and it is possible for a fat person to go without food for as long as three or four months people who starve to death in shorter times do not die of starvation but of fright the first time i fasted happened to be at the time of the messina earthquake i was walking about perfectly serene and happy having been without food for three days and i read in my newspaper how the rescue ships had reached messina and found the population ravenous in the agonies of starvation some of the people having been without food for seventy-two hours it sounds so much worse you see when you state it in hours the second point to get clear is that the fast is a physiological process that is to say it is something which nature understands and carries through in her own serene and efficient way when you take a fast you are not carrying out a freak notion of your own or of mine you are discovering a lost instinct every cat and dog knows enough not to take food when it is ill it is only in hospitals conducted by modern medical science that the custom prevails of serving elaborate trays to invalids i remember a story about a man who made himself a reputation and a fortune by curing the pet dogs of the rich these beautiful little creatures which sleep between silken covers and have several servants to wait upon them and are fed from gold and silver dishes upon rich and elaborately cooked foods fall victim to as many diseases as their mistresses and they would be brought to the specialist who conducted his dog hospital in an old brickyard 
in each one of the compartments of the brick kiln, he would shut up a dog with a supply of fresh water, a crust of stale bread, a piece of bacon rind, and the sole of an old shoe. And after a few days, he would go back and find that the dog had eaten the crust of bread, and then he would write to the owner that the dog was on the high road to recovery. He would go back a few days later and find that the dog had eaten the piece of bacon rind, and then he would write that the dog was very nearly cured. He would wait until the dog had eaten the piece of shoe leather, and then he would write that the dog was completely cured and the owner might come and take it away. Just what is the process of the fast cure? I do not pretend to know positively. I can only make guesses and wait for science to investigate. I believe that the main source of diseases of civilized man is improper nutrition and the clogging of the system with food poisons in various stages. And when you fast, you do two things. First, you stop entirely the fresh supply of those food poisons, and second, you allow the whole of the body's digestive and assimilative tract to rest, to go to sleep, as it were, so that all the body's energy may go to other organs. The body carries with it at all times a surplus store of nutriment, which can be taken up and used by the bloodstream, apparently with much less trouble than is required to convert fresh food to the body's uses. In other words, the body can feed on its own tissues more easily than it can feed from the stomach. In the fast, you may lose anywhere from half a pound to two pounds in weight per day, and this will be taken first from your store of fat, and then from your muscular tissues. Every part of your muscular tissue will be taken, before anything is taken from your vital organs, your nerves, or your bloodstream. So long as there is a particle of muscular material left, so long as you can make even the slightest movement of one finger, you are still fasting, and it is only when your muscular tissue is all gone that you begin at last to starve. So far as I know, the cases of McSwinney and the other Irishmen are the only cases on record where fasters have died of starvation. What the body does during the fast is quite plain, and can be told by many symptoms. It begins a thorough house-cleaning, throwing out poisonous material by every channel. The perspiration and breath become offensive, the tongue becomes heavily coated, so that you can scrape the material off with a knife. I have heard vegetarians explain this by saying that when the body is living off its own tissues, it is following a cannibal diet. But that is all nonsense, because you can live on meat exclusively and quickly satisfy yourself that none of these symptoms occurs. It is evident that the body is taking advantage of the opportunity to get rid of waste products, and this will go on for 10 days, for 20 days, in some cases for as long as 40 or 50 days, and then suddenly occurs a strange thing. In spite of the cannibal diet, the symptoms all come to a sudden end. The tongue clears, the breath becomes sweet, the appetite suddenly awakens. During the period of a normal fast, you lose all interest in food. You almost forget that there is such a thing as eating. You can look at food without any more desire for it than you have to swallow marbles and carpet tacks. But then suddenly appetite returns, as I have explained and you find that you can think of nothing but food. This is what students of the subject describe as a complete fast. And while I do not want to go to extremes and say that the complete fast will cure every case of every disease, I can certainly say this. In the letters which have come to me from people who tried the fast at my suggestion, there are cases of every kind of common disease. In my book, the fasting cure, I give the results of cases reported to me after the publication of my first magazine article. I quote two paragraphs. The total number of fasts taken was 277, and the average number of days was six. There were 90 of five days or over, 51 of 10 days or over, 
and six of thirty days are over. Out of the one hundred and nineteen person who wrote to me, one hundred reported benefit, and seventeen no benefit. Of these seventeen, about half give wrong breaking of the fast as the reason for the failure. In cases where the cure had not proved permanent, about half mentioned that the recurrence of the trouble was caused by wrong eating. About half of the rest made this quite evident by what they said. Also, it is to be noted that in the cases of the seventeen who got no benefit, nearly all were fasts of only three or four days. Following is the complete list of diseases benefited. Forty-five of the cases have been diagnosed by physicians. Indigestion, usually associated with nervousness, 27. Rheumatism, 5. Colds, 8. Tuberculosis, 4. Constipation, 14. Poor circulation, 3. Headaches, 5. Anemia, 3. Scrofula, 1. Bronchial trouble, 5. Syphilis, 1. Liver trouble, 5. General debility, 5. Chills and fever, 1. Blood poisoning, 1. Ulcerated leg, 1. Neurasthenia, 6. Locomotor ataxia, 1. Sciatica, 1. Asthma, 2. Excess of uric acid, 1. Epilepsy, 1. Pleurisy, 1. Impaction of bowels, 1. Eczema, 2. Catarrh, 6. Appendicitis, 3. Valvular disease of heart, 1. Insomnia, 1. Gas poisoning, 1. Grip, 1. Cancer, 1. There are many diseases with many causes, and some yield more quickly than others to the fast. In the first group, I put the diseases of the digestive and alimentary tract. Stomach and bowel troubles, and the nervous disorders occasioned by these, stop almost immediately when you fast. Next come disorders of the bloodstream, which are generally a second stage of digestive troubles. Everything immediately due to the impurities of the blood, pimples, boils, and ulcers, inflammation, badly healing wounds, etc., respond to a few days of fasting as to the magic touch of the old-time legends. When it comes to diseases caused by germ infections, you have a double aspect of the problem and must have a double method of attack. I would not like to say that fasting could cure such a disease as sleeping sickness, to the germs of which our systems are not accustomed, and against which they may well be helpless. On the other hand, in the case of common infections, such as colds and sore throats, the fast is again the touch of magic. Having been plagued a great deal by these ailments in past times, I am accustomed to say that I would not trade my knowledge of fasting for everything else that I know about health. The first thing you must do if you want to take a fast is to read the literature on the subject and make up your mind that the experiment will do you no injury. You should also try to get your relatives to make up their minds. Because you are nervous when you are fasting and cannot withstand the attacks of the people around you, who will go into a panic and throw you into a panic. As I said before, it is quite possible for people to die of panic but I do not believe that anybody ever died of a fast. I have known of two or three cases of people dying while they were fasting, but I feel quite certain that the fast did not cause their death. They would have died anyhow. You must bear in mind that among the people who try the fast, a great many are in a desperate condition. Some have been given up by the doctors, and if now and then one of these should die, we may surely say that they died in spite of the fast and not because of it. There is no physician who can save every patient, and it would be absurd to expect this. I have read scores of letters from people who were at the point of death from such fatal diseases as Bright's disease, sclerosis of the liver, and fatty degeneration of the heart, and were literally snatched out of the jaws of death by beginning a fast. I would not like to guess just what percentage of dying people in our hospitals might be saved if the doctors would withdraw all food from them. But I await with interest the time when medical science will have the intelligence to try that simple experiment 
and report the results. Just the other day in the Los Angeles County Jail, a chiropractor went on hunger strike as a protest against imprisonment, and he fasted 41 days. Then he broke his fast, the reason being given that his pulse was down to 54, and he was afraid of dying. I smiled to myself. The normal pulse is 70. I have taken my pulse many times at the end of a 10-day fast, and it has been as low as 32, and I am not dead yet. And if I wait to die from the symptoms of a fast, I expect to live a long time indeed. The first time I fasted, I felt very weak, and lay around and hardly cared to lift my head. If I walked from my bed to the lawn, I was tired in the legs. But since then, I have grown used to fasting. I have fasted for a week, probably twenty or thirty times and on such occasions i have gone about my business as if nothing were happening of course i would not try to play tennis or to climb a mountain but it is a fact that on the seventh day of a fast in new york i climbed the five or six flights of stairs to the top of the metropolitan opera house and felt no ill effects from doing this i climbed slowly and was careful not to tire myself the simple rule is not to have anything that you must do on the fast, and then do what you feel like doing. Lie down and rest, and read a book, and take as much exercise as you find you enjoy. Keep your mind quiet and free from worries, and lock out of the house everybody who tells you that your heart is going to stop beating in the next few minutes, and that you must have an injection of strychnine to start it and some beefsteak and fried onions to restore your strength. Give yourself up to the care of your wise old mother nature, who will attend to your heart just as securely and serenely as she attended to it in the days before you were born. By fasting, I mean that you take no food whatever. I know some nature cure teachers who practice what they call a fruit fast, all I know is that if I eat nothing but fruit, I soon have my stomach boiling with fermentation, and also I suffer with hunger, whereas if I take a complete fast, I promptly forget all about food. You must drink all the water you can on the fast. This helps nature with her house cleaning. It is well to drink a glass of water every half hour at least. Do not try to go without water, and then write me that the fasting cure is a failure. Also, please do not write and ask me if it will be fasting if you take just a little crackers and milk, or some soup, or something else that you think doesn't count. I recommend a dose of laxative to clean out the system at the beginning of a fast, because the bowels are apt to become sluggish at once, and the quicker you get the system cleansed, the better. It does no good to take laxatives if you are going to pile in more food. But if you are going to fast, that is a different matter. You should take a full warm enema every day during the fast, so long as it brings any results. There are some people whose bowels are so frightfully clogged that I have known the enema to bring results even in the second and third weeks. On the other hand, if there is no solid matter to be removed, a small enema every day will suffice. Take a warm bath every day. And, needless to say, you should get all the fresh air you can, and should sleep as much as you can. You may have difficulty in sleeping, because the fast is apt to make you nervous and wakeful. I have known people who could not fast because they could not sleep. And I have taught them a little trick, to put a hot water bottle at the feet and another on the abdomen to draw the blood away from the head, so they would quickly fall asleep and they got great benefit from their fasts. You should supply yourself with good music if you can, and with plenty of good reading matter. You will be amazed to find how active your mind becomes, because you had never known before what a mind you had. Your blood has always been so clogged with food poisons that you didn't know you could think. My three-act play, The Nature Woman, was conceived and written in two days and a half on a fast. But I do not recommend this kind of thing. On the contrary, I strongly urge against it, because if you work your brain on a fast, 
you do not get the good from your fast, and you do not recover so quickly. Put off all your problems until you have got your health back, and seek only to divert your mind while fasting. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Breaking the Fast Discusses various methods of building up the body after a fast, especially the milk diet. There remains the question of how to break the fast, and this is the most important part of the problem. You may undo all the good of your fast by breaking it wrong, and you are a thousand times as apt to kill yourself then as while you are fasting. When your hunger comes back, it comes back with a rush, and some people have not the willpower to control it. I do not advocate a complete fast in any case except of serious chronic disease and then only under the advice of someone with experience. But I advocate a short fast of a week or ten days for almost every common ailment, and I know that such a fast will help, even where it may not completely cure. You may go on fasting so long as you are quiet and happy, but when you find you are becoming too weak for comfort, or for the peace of mind of your family physician and your friends, you may break your fast and show them that it is possible to restore your strength and body weight, and then they won't bother so much when you try it again. Take nothing but liquid foods in the breaking of a fast. I recommend the juices of fruits and tomatoes, also meat broths. If you have fasted a week or two, take a quarter of a glass. If you have fasted a month, take a tablespoonful and wait and see what the results are. Remember that your whole alimentary track is out of action, and give it a chance to start up slowly. Take small quantities of liquid food every two hours for the first day, then you can begin taking larger quantities, and on the next day you can try some milk, or a soft poached egg, or the pulp of cooked apples or prunes. Do not take any solid food until you are quite sure you can digest it, and then take only a very little. Do not take any starchy food until the third day. I have known people to break these rules. I knew a man who broke his fast on a Hamburg steak, and he had to be helped out with a stomach pump. Once I broke a week's fast with a plate of rich soup, because I was at a friend's house and there was nothing else and I yielded to the claims of hospitality, and made myself ill, and had to fast for several days longer. The easiest way to break a fast is upon a milk diet. I have seen hundreds of people take this diet, and very few who did not get benefit. The first time I fasted, which was twelve days, I lost seventeen pounds, and I took the milk diet for twenty-four days thereafter, and gained thirty-two pounds. I took it at McFadden's sanitarium, where I had every attention. Since then, I have many times tried to take a milk diet by myself, but have never been able to get it to agree with me. I do not know how to explain this fact. I state it, to show how hard it is to lay down general rules. On the milk diet, you take into your system two or three times as much food as you can assimilate, and this is a violation of all my diet rules, but it appears that the bacteria which thrive in milk produce lactic acid, which is not harmful to the system, and if you do not take other foods, you may safely keep the system flooded with milk. After a fast, you should begin with small quantities of milk, and by the third day, you may be taking a full glass of warm milk every half hour or every twenty minutes until you have taken seven or eight quarts per day it is better to take it warm but sometimes people take it just as well without warming dr porter who has a book on the milk diet insists upon complete rest and makes his patients stay in bed mcfadden on the other hand recommends gymnastics in the morning before the milk and during the afternoon he recommends a rest from the milk for a couple of hours, followed by abdominal exercises to keep the bowels open. 
this is very important during a fast because you are taking great quantities of material into your system and it must not be permitted to clog therefore take an enema daily if necessary to a free movement also take a warm bath daily take the juice of oranges and lemons if you crave them upon one thing everyone who has had experience with the milk diet agrees and that is the necessity of absolute mental rest if you become excited or nervous or angry on a milk diet you may turn all the contents of your stomach into hard curds and may put yourself into convulsions the wonderful thing about the milk diet is the state of physical and mental bliss it makes possible it is the ideal way of breaking a fast because it leaves you no chance to get hungry you have all the food you want and your system is bathed in happiness a sense of peace and well-being which is truly marvelous and not to be described you gain anywhere from a half a pound to two pounds a day and you feel that you have never before in your life known what perfect health could be the fast sets you a new standard you discover how nature meant you to enjoy life and never again are you content with that kind of half-existence with which you managed to worry along before you discovered this remedy. But let me hasten to add that I do not recommend the fast as a regular habit of life. The fast is an emergency measure to enable the body to cleanse itself and to cure disease. When you have got your body clean and free from disease, it is your business to keep it that way and you should apply your reason to the problem of how to live so that you will not have to fast if you find that you continue to have ailments then you must be eating wrongly or overworking or committing some other offense against nature either that or else you must have some organic trouble a bone in your spine is out of place as the osteopaths tell you or your eyes out of focus or your appendix twisted and infected I do not claim that the fasting cure will supplant the surgeons and the oculists and the dentists. It will not mend your bones if you break them, and it will not repair your teeth, which are already decayed, but it will help to keep your teeth from decaying in the future, and it will help you to prepare for a surgical operation and to recover from it more quickly. I had to undergo an operation for rupture a couple of years ago, and I fasted for two days before the operation, and for three days after it, and I had no particle of nausea from the ether, and was able to tend to my mail the day after the operation. There is one disease for which I hesitate to recommend the fast, and that is tuberculosis, because I have been told of cases in which the patient lost weight and did not recover it. However, in my tabulation of 277 cases, you will note four cases of tuberculosis, and in my book is given a letter from a patient who claimed great benefit. If I had the misfortune to contract tuberculosis, I would take a three or four day rest, followed by a milk diet for a long period. The milk diet is pleasant to take, and it cannot possibly do any harm. If it did not affect a cure, I would try the Salisbury treatment, that is, lean meat ground up and medium cooked and nothing else, except an abundance of hot water between meals. Professor Irving Fisher wrote me that there is urgent need of experiment to determine proper diet in tuberculosis, and until these experiments have been made, we can only grope. I am quite sure that the stuffing system, ordinarily used by doctors, is a tragic mistake. In the case of any other disease, whatever, even though I might take medical or surgical treatment, I would supplement this by a fast, because there is no kind of a treatment which does not succeed better with the blood in good condition. In the case of emergencies, accidents, wounds, etc., I would rest assured that recovery would be more prompt if I were fasting. When David Graham Phillips was shot, I wrote a letter to the New York Call, saying that his doctors had killed him, 
because they had fed him while he was lying in a critical condition in the hospital. To take nutriment into the body under such circumstances is the greatest of blunders. The fast will help children, just as it helps adults, only they do not need to fast so long. It will help the aged and make them feel young. You need not be afraid to fast, no matter how old you are. It is, of course, an immediate cure for fatness, and, strange as it may seem, it is also a cure for unnatural thinness. People with ravenous appetites are just as apt to be thin as to be fat, because it is not what you eat that builds up your body, but only what you assimilate, and if you eat too much, you can make it impossible to assimilate anything properly. If you take a fast and break it carefully, your body will come to its normal weight and all your functions to their normal activity. A physician wrote me, taking me to task for listing among the cures reported in my tabulation a case of locomotor ataxia. This disease, he explained, is caused because a portion of a nerve has been entirely destroyed, and it is a disease that is absolutely and positively and forever incurable. I answered that I knew this to be the teaching of present-day medical science, but I invited him to consider for a moment what happens in nature. When a crab loses a claw, we do not take it as a matter of course that the crab must go about with one claw for the balance of his life. Nature will make that crab another claw. Man has lost the power of replacing a lost leg, but he still retains the power of replacing tissue which has been cut away by a surgeon's knife. And medical science takes this as a matter of course. How shall anybody say that nature has forever lost the power of rebuilding a bit of nervous tissue? How shall anyone say that if the bloodstream is cleansed of poisons and the energy of the whole body restored, one of the results may not be the repairing of a broken nerve connection? I invite my readers who have ailments, and especially I invite all medical men among my readers, to make a fair test of the fasting cure. The results will surprise them, and they will quickly be forced to revise their methods of treating illness. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 Diseases and Cures. Discusses some of the commoner human ailments and what is known about their cause and cure. I begin with the commonest of all troubles, known as a cold. This name implies that the cause of the trouble lies in exposure or chill. All the grandmothers of the world are agreed about this. They have a phrase, or at least they had it when I was a boy, you will catch your death. Every time I went out in the rain, every time I played with wet feet, or sat in a draft, or got under a cold shower, I would hear the formula, you will catch your death. And on the other hand, there are the health cranks, who declare vehemently that the name cold is a misnomer and a trap for people's thoughts. Cold has nothing to do with it, they say, and point to Arctic explorers who frequently got frozen to death, but do not catch cold until they get back into the warm rooms of civilization. As for drafts, the health cranks aver that a draft is merely fresh air moving which is supposed to settle the matter. However, when you come to think about it, you realize that a cyclone is likewise merely fresh air moving, so you have not decided the question by a phrase. While I was writing these chapters on health, I contracted a severe cold, which was a joke on me. The history of this cold is as clear in my mind as anything human can be, and it will serve for an illustration showing how much truth the grandmothers have on their side, and how much the health cranks have. To begin with, I had been overworking, 
all sorts of appeals come to me hundreds of people write me letters and i cannot bear to leave them unanswered i accepted calls to speak and invitations where i had to eat a lot of stuff of which my reason disapproves so one morning i woke up with a slight sore throat i fasted all day and by evening felt all right but there came another call and i consented to take a long automobile ride on a cold and rainy night and when i got back home after five or six hours i was thoroughly chilled and my cold came on during the night this explanation will i imagine be satisfactory to all the grandmothers of the world all the dear good grandmothers know that an automobile ride on a cold rainy night is enough to give any man his death but listen grandmothers i have lain out watching for deer all night in the late fall with only a thin blanket to cover me and gotten up so stiff with cold that i could hardly move yet i did not catch cold when i was a youth i have ridden a bicycle twenty miles to the beach in april with snow on the ground and plunged into the surf and swam and then ridden home again I have bathed in the sea when I had to run a quarter of a mile in a bathing suit along a frost-covered pier, and with an icy wind blowing through my bones, yet I never took cold from that, and never got anything but a feeling of exhilaration. So it must be that there is some reason why exposure causes colds at one time, and not at another. The explanation takes you over to the health cranks they understand that your bloodstream must be clogged your bodily tone reduced by bad air and lack of exercise and more especially by overeating or by an improperly balanced diet but then most of them go to extremes and insist that the automobile ride and the chilled condition of my body had nothing to do with my cold but i know otherwise i have watched the thing happen so often in times when i was run down the slightest exposure would cause me a cold literally in a few minutes i have got myself a sore throat going out to the woodpile on a winter day with nothing on my head i have got a cold by sitting still with wet feet or by sitting in a draft on a warm summer day when i had been perspiring a little how to explain this i am not sure but my guess is that you drive the blood away from the surface of the body at a time when it is weakened and exposed to infection and you drive away the army of the white corpuscles and give the battlefield of your body to the germs i know there are nature curists who argue that germs have nothing to do with disease but they have never been able to convince me germs are too real and too many and too easy to watch if you leave a piece of meat exposed to the air in warm temperature the germs in the air will settle upon it and begin to feed upon it and to multiply the meat being dead is powerless to protect itself but your nose and throat are also meat and just as good food for those germs the only difference is that this meat is alive there is a living bloodstream circulating through it and several score billions of the body's own kind of germs the blood corpuscles if these blood corpuscles are sound and properly nourished and are brought to the place of infection they are able to destroy all the common germs so it is that you do not have diseases but instead have health but your health always implies a struggle of your organism against other organisms and it is the business of your reason to watch your body and give all the help you can in protecting it coughs and colds sore throats and headaches are the first warnings that your defenses are being weakened as a rule these ailments are not serious in themselves but they are signs of a wrong condition and if you neglect this condition pretty soon you will find that you have to deal with something deadly my cure for a cold is to take an enema and a laxative, eat nothing for 24 hours, and drink plenty of water. If you have a severe cold or sore throat, you will be wise to lie in bed for a day or two by an open window. You may also use sprays and gargles if you wish, 
but you will find them of little use because the germs are deep in your mucous membranes and cannot all be reached from the outside in the old sad days of my ignorance i would get a cold and go to the doctor and have my throat and nose pumped full of black and green and yellow and purple liquids which did me absolutely no good whatever the cold would stay on for two or three weeks sometimes for eight or ten weeks and i would be miserable utterly desperate i was dying by inches and not one of the doctors could tell me why the next most common ailment is a headache, and this means poisons in your bloodstream. It may be from improper diet, from alcohol or drugs, or bad air or nervous excitement. If it is none of these things, then you should begin to look for some organic difficulty, eye strain, for example, or perhaps defects in the spine. The osteopaths and the chiropractors specialize on the spine and have made important discoveries. Their doctrine is, in brief, that the nervous force which directs the bloodstream is carried to the organs of the body by nerves which leave the spinal cord through openings between the vertebrae. If any of these openings are pinched, you have a diminished nerve supply, which means ill health in that part of the body to which the nerve leads that such trouble can be corrected by straightening the bones of the spine seems perfectly reasonable but like most people with a new idea the discoverers proceed to carry it to absurd extremes i have before me an official chiropractic pamphlet which states that vertebral displacement is the physical and perpetuating cause of ninety five per cent of all cases of disease the remaining 5% being due to subluxations of other skeletal segments. And naturally, people who believe this will devote nearly all their study to the bones and the nervous system. But surely there are other parts of your body which are necessary besides bones and nerves. And what if some of these parts happen to be malformed and effective? What if your eyes do not focus properly, and you are continually wearing out the optic nerve, thus giving yourself headaches and neurasthenia? What if you have an appendix that has been twisted and malformed from birth and is a center of infection so long as it remains in the body? Several years ago I had an experience with the appendix, from which I learned something about one of the commonest human ailments, constipation, or sluggishness of the bowels. This is a cause of innumerable chronic ailments grouped under the head of auto-intoxication, or the poisoning of the body by the absorption into the system of the products of fermentation and decay in the bowels. The bowels should move freely two or three times every day, and the movements should be soft. I suffered from constipation for some twenty years, and tried, I think, every remedy known to science and to crank them. In the beginning, the doctors gave me drugs, which, by irritating the intestinal walls, caused them to pour out quantities of water and hurry the irritating substances down the intestinal tract. That is all right for an emergency. If you have swallowed a poison, or food which is spoiled, or if you have overeaten and are ill, get your system cleaned out by any and every device but if you habitually swallow mild poisons which is what all laxatives are you weaken the intestinal tract and you have to take more and more of these poisons and you get less results we may set down as positive the statement that drugs are not a remedy for constipation next comes diet eat the rough and bulky foods save the nature curists and stimulate the intestinal walls to activity i tried that i listened to the extreme enthusiast and boiled whole wheat and ate it and consumed quantities of bran biscuit and of a japanese seaweed which dr kellogg prepares and of petroleum oil and even the skins of oranges which are most uncomfortable eating i assure you I would eat things like this until I got myself a case of diarrhea, and so was cured of constipation for a time. Strange as it may seem to you, there are even people who tell you to eat sand. 
I listened to them, and ate many quarts. And then there is exercise. McFadden taught me a whole series of exercises for developing the muscles of the abdominal walls and the back, which are greatly neglected by civilized man. The fundamental cause of constipation is a sluggish life, and to exercise our bodies is a duty. But to me, it was always an agony of boredom to lie on a bed and wiggle my abdomen for a quarter of an hour. The same thing applies to hot water treatments, which are effective, but a nuisance and a waste of time. I never could keep them off, except when I was in trouble. Three or four years ago I began to notice a continual irritating pain on my right side, which I quickly realized must lie in the appendix. I tried massage, and hot and cold water treatments, and my favorite remedy, a week's fast. The pain disappeared, but it returned, so finally I decided, to the dismay of my physical culture friends, to have the appendix out. For years I had been reading the statements of nature curists that the appendix is an important and vital part of the body, which pours an oil or something into the intestinal tract, and so helps to prevent constipation. Well, evidently my appendix wasn't doing its job so I took it to a good surgeon. What I found was that it had been twisted and malformed from birth, so that it was a center of continuous infection. From the time that I had the operation, I have never had to think about the subject of constipation. This experience suggests to me how easy it is for people to make statements about health which have no relationship to facts. I do not recommend promiscuous surgery, and I perfectly well realize that if human beings would take proper care of their health, the great proportion of surgical operations would be unnecessary. I realize also that surgeons get paid by the job, and therefore have a money interest in operating, and it is perfectly futile to expect that none of them will ever be influenced by the profit motive. Nevertheless, it is true that sometimes surgical operations are necessary, and that by standing a little temporary inconvenience, you can save yourself a lifetime of discomfort. Take, for example, rupture. The human body has here a natural weakness from which there results a dangerous and uncomfortable affliction. Hundreds of thousands of men are going around all their lives wearing elaborate and expensive trusses which are almost, if not entirely, useless, and trying advertised cures, which are entirely fakes. An operation takes an hour or two, and two or three weeks in bed, and when our government drafted its young men into the army, and found that fourteen in every thousand of them had rupture, it shipped them into hospitals wholesale and sewed them up. It happens that rupture affords one case where scar tissue is stronger than natural tissue, and there were practically no returns from the great number of army cases. Likewise, you find extreme statements repeated concerning the evils of vaccination. But if you will read Parkman's History of the Jesuits in North America, you will see the horrible conditions under which the Indians lived in the United States, noble savages, you understand, entirely uncontaminated by civilized white men, and whole populations regularly wiped out every few years by epidemics of smallpox. That these epidemics ceased was due to the discovery that by infecting the body with a mild form of the disease, it could be made to develop substances which render it immune to the deadly form. Here in California, we have a law which makes vaccination for school children optional, and so we may some day have another epidemic to test the theories of the anti-vaccinationists. I know, of course, the dreadful stories of people who have been given syphilis and other diseases by impure vaccines. I don't know whether such stories are true, but I do know that people who live in houses are sometimes killed by earthquakes and by lightning yet we do not cease to live in houses because of this chance. It seems to me that the remedy for such vaccination evils is not to abolish vaccination, 
but to take more care in the manufacture of our vaccines. This danger is removed by using vaccines which are sterile and are made especially for each person. Germs are taken from the sick person and injected into an animal. The body of the animal develops with great rapidity the antibodies necessary to resistance to the germs. And as these antibodies are chemical products not affected by heat, we can take a serum from the animal, sterilize it, and then inject it into the system of the patient, thus increasing resistance to the disease. I admit that the best way to increase such resistance is to take care of your health. But sometimes we confront an emergency, and we must use emergency remedies. We have serums that really cure diphtheria and meningitis, and one that will prevent lockjaw. Anyone who has ever seen with his own eyes how the deadly membranes of diphtheria melt away as a result of an injection will be less dogmatic about the efforts of science to combat disease. Of course it is much pleasanter if you can destroy the source of the disease and keep it from getting into the human body. Every few years the southern part of our country used to be devastated by yellow fever epidemics. Every kind of weird and fantastic remedy was tried. People would go around with sponges full of vinegar hung under their noses. They would burn the clothing and bedding of those who died of the disease. They would wear gloves when they went shopping, so as not to touch the money with their hands. But at last, medical experimenters traced the disease to a certain kind of mosquito. And now... If we drain the swamps and screen our houses and stay indoors after sundown, we do not get yellow fever, nor malaria either. In the same way, if we keep our bodies clean with soap and hot water, we do not get bitten by lice, and so do not die of typhus. If we take pains with our drains and water supply so that human excrement does not get into it, and if we destroy the filth-carrying housefly, we do not have epidemics of typhoid. But under conditions of battle, it is not possible for men to take these precautions. And so when they go into the army, they get a dose of typhoid serum. And this illustrates the difference between a true or hygienic remedy for a disease and a temporary or emergency remedy. If you say that you want to abolish war, and with it the need for typhoid vaccination, I cheerfully agree with you in this. All I am trying to do is to point out the folly of flying to extremes and rejecting any remedy which may help. What is the use of making the flat statement that vaccinations and serums never aid in the cure of disease, when any man can see with his own eyes the proof that they do? In the Spanish War, before typhoid vaccination, many times more soldiers died of this disease than died of bullets. But in the late war, there was practically no typhoid at all in the army camps. On the other hand, it was noticed that the men who had just come in, and who therefore had just been vaccinated, were considerably more susceptible to influenza which shows that vaccination does reduce the body condition for a time. The reader may say that in this case I am trying to sit on both sides of the fence. But the truth is that I am trying to keep an open mind and to consider all the facts and to avoid making rash statements. One of the statements you hear most frequently is that drugs can never remedy disease, or help in remedying it. Now, I abhor the drugging system of the orthodox medical men. I have talked with them, and heard them talk with one another, and I know that they will mix up half a dozen different substances in the vague hope that some one of them will have some effect. Even when they know definitely the effects they are producing, they are in many cases merely suppressing symptoms. On the other hand, however, it is a fact that medical science has had, for a generation or two, a specific which destroys the germs of one disease in the blood, without at the same time injuring the blood itself. 
that disease is malaria and the drug is quinine. Of course, the way to avoid malaria is to drain the swamps. But you cannot do that all at once, nor can you always screen your house and stay in at sundown. When you first go into a country, you have no house to screen, and some emergency will certainly arise that exposes you to mosquito bites. So you will need quinine, and will be foolish not to use it, and know how to use it. Recent medical chemists discovered another remedy, this time for syphilis. It is called salvarsan, and while it does not always cure, it frequently does. In laboratories today, men are working over the problem of constructing a combination of molecules which will destroy the germ of sleeping sickness, without at the same time injuring the blood. If they find it, they will save hundreds of millions of lives. I do not see why we cannot recognize such a possibility, while at the same time making use of physical culture, of diet, and fasting. When the manuscript of this book was sent to the printer, there appeared in this place a paragraph telling of the work of Dr. Albert Abrams of San Francisco in the diagnosis and cure of disease by means of radioactive vibrations. As the book is going to press, the writer finds himself in San Francisco attending Dr. Abrams' clinics, and so he finds it possible to give a more extended account of some fascinating discoveries which seem destined to revolutionize medical science. If I were to tell you all that I have seen with my own eyes in the last twelve days, I fear the reader would find his powers of credulity overstretched. So I shall content myself with trying to tell, in very sober and cautious language, the theory upon which Abrams is working, and the technique which he has evolved. Modern science has demonstrated that all matter is simply the activity of electrons, minute particles of electric force. This is a statement which no present-day physicist would dispute. The best evidence appears to indicate that a molecule of matter is a minute reproduction of the universe, a system of electrons whirling about a central nucleus. No eye has ever beheld an electron, for it is billions of times smaller than anything the microscope makes visible. But we can see the effects of electronic activity, and all modern books of physics give photographs of such. It is possible to determine the vibration rates of electrons, and to Dr. Abrams occurred the idea of determining the vibration rates of diseased tissue and disease germs. He discovered that it was invariably the same. Not merely does all cancerous material, for example, yield the same rate, but the blood of a person suffering from cancer yields that rate, at all times and under all circumstances. The vibration of cancer, of tuberculosis, of syphilis, each is different, uniform, and invariable. Likewise in the blood are other vibrations, uniform and dependable, which reveal the sex and age of the patient, the virulence of the disease, and the period of its duration. Yes, and even the location in the body, if there be some definite infected area. So here is a modern miracle, an infallible device for the diagnosis of disease. Dr. Abrams does not have to see the patient. All he has to have is a drop of blood on a piece of white blotting paper, and he sits in his laboratory and tells all about it, and somewhere several thousand miles away in Toronto or Boston or New Orleans, a surgeon operates and finds what he has been told is there. And that is only the beginning of the wonder, because, says Abrams, if you know the vibration rate of the electrons of germs, you can destroy those germs. It used to be a favorite trick of Caruso to tap a glass and determine its musical note and then sing that note at the glass and shatter it to bits. It is well known that horses, trotting swiftly on a bridge, have sometimes coincided in their step with the vibration of the bridge and thus have broken it down. On that same principle, this wizard of the electron introduces into your body radioactivity of a certain rate 
and shall i say that he cures cancer and syphilis and tuberculosis of many years standing in a few treatments i will not say that because you would not and could not believe me i will content myself with the telling what my wife and i have been watching twice a day for the past twelve days the scene is a laboratory with rows of raised seats at one side for the physicians who attend the clinic there is a table with the instruments of measurement and dr abrams sits beside it and before him stands a young man stripped to the waist the doctor is tapping upon the abdomen of this man and listening to the sounds you will find this the weirdest part of the whole procedure for you will naturally assume that this young man is being examined and will be dazed when someone explains that the patient is in toronto or boston or new orleans and that this young man's body is the instrument which the doctor uses in the determining of the vibration rates of the patient's blood dr abrams tried numerous instruments but has been able to find nothing so sensitive to electronic activity as a human body he explains to his classes that the spinal cord is composed of millions of nerve fibers of different vibration rates hence a certain rate communicated to the body is automatically sorted out and appears on a certain precise spot of the body in the form of increased activity increased blood pressure in the cells and hence what all physicians know as a dull area which can be discovered by what is known as percussion a tapping with the finger to map out these areas is merely a matter of long and patient experiment and abrams has been studying the subject for some twenty years he is author of a textbook on what is known as the reactions of abrams so now he provides the world with a series of maps of the human body and he sits in front of his subject and his assistant places a specimen of blood in a little electrically connected box and sets the rheostat at some vibration number say fifty and dr abrams taps on a certain square inch of the abdomen of his subject and announces the dread word cancer then he places the electrode on another part of the subject's body and taps some more and announces that it is cancer of the small intestine left side some more tapping and he announces that its intensity is 12 ohms which is severe and pretty soon there is speeding a telegram to the physician who has sent this blood specimen telling him these facts and prescribing a certain vibration rate upon the oscilloclast the instrument of radioactivity which dr abrams has devised now you watch this thing for an hour or two and you say to yourself here is either the greatest magician in the history of mankind or else the greatest maniac you may have come prepared for some kind of fraud but you soon dismiss that for you realize that this man is desperately in earnest about what he is doing and so are all the physicians who watch him so you seek refuge in the thought that he must be deluding himself and them perhaps unconsciously but you talk with these men and discover that they have come from all over the country and always for one reason they had sent blood specimens to abrams and found that he had never made a mistake he told them more from a few drops of the patient's blood than they themselves had been able to find out from the whole patient and then into the clinic come the doctor's own patients i must have heard sixty or eighty of them tell their story and many of them have been lifted from the grave people ten years blind from syphilis who can see people operated on several times for cancer and given up for dying people with tumors on the brain or with one lung gone from tuberculosis it is literally a fact that when you have sat in abram's clinic for a week all disease loses its terrors this you see is really the mastery of life if we can measure and control the minute universe of the electron and the atom we have touched the ultimate source of our bodily life i might take chapters of this book to tell you of the strange experiments i have seen in this clinic showing you for instance how these vibrations respond to thought 
how by denying to himself the disease the patient can for a few moments cancel in his body the activity of the harmful germs showing how the reactions differ in the different sexes and at different ages and how they respond to different colors and different drugs abram's method has revealed the secret of such efficacy as drugs possess their work is done by their radioactivity and not by their chemical properties also the problem of vaccination has been solved for abrams has discovered a dread new disease which is bovine syphilis originally caused in cattle by human inoculation and now reintroduced into the human being by vaccination and becoming the agent which prepares the soil of the body for such disorders as tuberculosis and cancer and it appears that we can all be rendered immune to these diseases by a few electronic vibrations introduced into our bodies in childhood so is opened up to our eyes a wonderful vision of a new race purified and made fit for life so here at last is science justified of her optimism and our faith in human destiny forever vindicated take my advice whoever you may be that are suffering and find out about this new work and help to make it known to the world there are many romances of medical science some of them as fascinating as murder mysteries and big game hunting turn to mcmaster's history of the people of the united states and read his account of the terrible epidemic of yellow fever in philadelphia a hundred years ago I have already referred to the weird and incredible things the people did in their effort to ward off this plague, sponges of vinegar under their noses and fever fires burning in the streets. And then a mosquito would fly up and bite them, and in a few hours they would be dead. Or what could be stranger than the tracing of the bubonic plague, which has cost literally billions of human lives? to a parasite in the blood of fleas which live on the bodies of rats or what could be more unexpected than the tracing of our rheumatic aches and twinges to the root canals of the teeth one of the most common ailments which afflict poor humanity is rheumatism a cause of endless suffering it was supposed to be due to damp climate and exposure and this is true to a certain extent in the same way that colds are due to exposure but the investigators realized that there must be some bodily condition rendering one susceptible and they set to work to trace this condition down the pains of rheumatism are caused by uric acid settling in the joints of the body what causes the uric acid well there is uric acid in red meat so let us forbid rheumatic people to eat it but this is overlooking the fact that the human body itself is a uric acid factory and also the fact that uric acid taken into the stomach may not remain uric acid by the time it gets to the bloodstream we know that you may eat a great deal of fruit acid without necessarily making acid blood on the other hand you can make acid blood by eating a lot of sugar so you see it isn't as simple as it sounds rheumatism has been traced to its lair which is found to be the roots of the teeth here is a part of the body difficult to get at and as a consequence of bad diet and unwholesome ways of living infections will start there and pus sacs be formed and the poisons absorbed into the bloodstream and distributed throughout the body the first thought is to draw the infected teeth but that is a serious matter because you need your teeth to chew your food so the dentist has to go through a complicated process of opening up the tooth and cleaning out the root canals and treating the infected spots at the roots then he has to fill the tooth all the way down to the roots leaving no place for infection to gather this of course takes time and costs money and is one more illustration of the fact that there is one health law for the rich and another health law for the poor all the time that i write these chapters about health i feel guilty i know that the wholesome food i recommend costs money and i know that surgery and dentistry cost money 
yes even sunlight and fresh air and recreation even a fast because you have to rest while you take it and you have to have a roof over your head and warmth in winter time and somebody to wait upon you when you are weak i know that for a great many of the people who read what i write all these things are impossible of attainment i know that for the great majority of the common people the benefits of science do not exist science discovers how to prevent disease but the discoveries are not applied because the profit system controls the world and the profit system wants the labor of the poor regardless of what happens to their health if the people fall ill they are thrown upon the scrap heap and the profit system finds others to take their place take for example tuberculosis tuberculosis is a germ infection but it practically never gets hold upon a human body except when the body is reduced by undernourishment and lack of fresh air tuberculosis therefore is a disease of slums and jails it is definitely and indisputably a disease of poverty it could be wiped off the face of the earth in a single generation and the same is true of typhus and typhoid there's another whole host of ailments which could be wiped out by measures of public hygiene plus education this includes all the infant diseases and the deadly venereal diseases but the profit system stands in the way and so in these closing paragraphs of this book of the body i say that there is one disease which is the deadliest of all and the source of all others and that disease is poverty i know a certain physician to the rich who is an honest and conscientious man he said i loathe my work i am wasting my time i am called in by these fat overfed rich people in their leisure class hotels and what am i to say to them shall i say to them you are living an abnormal life and you can never be well until you cut out root and branch of all your habits of self-indulgence which are destroying you but no i can't say that not one time in a thousand i am expected to be polite and serious and to listen to them while they tell me their long tiresome story of their symptoms and i have to encourage them and give them some temporary device that will remove some of the symptoms of their trouble and what should one say to this honest physician should one tell him to go and be a physician to the poor would he be any happier there he could tell the poor the causes of their diseases and they would listen patiently they are trained to listen and to accept what they are told here is a girl living in an inside bedroom in a tenement and working ten or eleven hours a day in an unventilated factory and she is ill with tuberculosis the physician tells her that she needs plenty of fresh air and rest and a lot of eggs and milk in her diet he tells her that and he knows that she has as much chance of carrying out his orders as of flying to the moon or maybe he comes upon a typhoid epidemic and discovers as happened to a friend of mine in chicago that there is defective plumbing in some houses owned by the political leader of the district or maybe it is a case of venereal disease in a young man who is drafted into the army and turned loose amid the joys of paris maybe it is just a commonplace everyday story of a room full of school children twenty-two per cent of them undernourished as is the case in new york city and the parents out of work part of the time and with no possibility in their lives of ever earning enough to feed the children properly when you confront these universal facts of our present social order you realize that the problem of disease is not merely a problem of the body but is a problem of the mind as well a problem of politics and religion and philosophy of the whole way of thinking of the so-called civilized world a book of health which did not point out these facts would be not a book of health but a book of sham but meantime while we are trying to change the world's ideas we have to live and we can do our work better if we keep as well as possible I have tried to point out the way it is as you can see a matter in part of the body and in part of the mind 
all the bodily regime here laid out has its basis in mental habits all wise and wholesome ways of life can at the age when our minds are plastic be made into second nature things which we do automatically without effort or temptation to do otherwise this is the real secret of true happiness in the conduct of our personal lives to acquire self-control to rule our desires and our passions not harshly and spasmodically but serenely as one drives a car which he thoroughly understands it is in vain that we preach freedom to men who have not this self-mastery as the poet tells us the sensual and the dark rebel in vain slaves of their own compulsion and of all the personal possessions which man can attain on this earth the most precious is the one of a sound mind controlling a sound body i close this book by quoting some verses written by sir henry wotton three hundred years ago which i have all my life considered one of the noblest pieces of poetry in our heritage the character of a happy life how happy is he born and taught that serveth not another's will whose armor is his honest thought and simple truth his utmost skill whose passions not his masters are whose soul is still prepared for death not tied unto the world with care of public fame or private breath who envies none that chance doth raise or vice who never understood how deepest wounds are given by praise nor rules of state but rules of good who hath his life from rumours freed whose conscience is his strong retreat whose state can neither flatter earth's feed nor ruin make accusers great who god doth late and early pray more of his grace than gifts to lend and entertains the harmless day with a well-chosen book or friend this man is freed from servile bands of hope to rise or fear to fall lord of himself though not of lands and having nothing yet hath all end of chapter twenty seven end of book two the book of the body part three the book of love chapters twenty eight and twenty nine of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight the reality of marriage discusses the sex customs now existing in the world and their relation to the ideal of monogamous love just as human beings through wrong religious beliefs torture one another and wreck their lives and happiness just as through wrong eating and other physical habits they make disease and misery for themselves just so they suffer and perish for lack of the most elementary knowledge concerning the sex relationship the difference is that in the field of religious ideas it is now permissible to impart the truth one possesses if i tell you there is no devil and that believing this will not cause you to suffer in an eternity of sulphur and brimstone no one will be able to burn me at the stake even though he might like to do so if i advise you that it is not harmful to eat beefsteak on friday or to eat thoroughly cooked pork on any day of the week neither the archbishops nor the rabbis nor the vegetarians will be able to lock me in a dungeon but if i should impart to you the simplest and most necessary bit of knowledge concerning the facts of your sex life things which every man and woman must know if we are to stop breeding imbecility and degeneracy in the world then i should be liable under federal statutes to pay a fine of five thousand dollars and to serve a term of five years in a federal penitentiary 
scarcely a week passes that i do not receive a letter from someone asking for information about such matters but i dare not answer the letters because i know there are agencies maintained and paid by religious superstition employing spies to trap people into the breaking of this law i shall tell you here as much as i am permitted to tell in the simplest language and the most honest spirit i believe that human beings are meant to be happy on this earth and to avoid misery and disease i believe that they are given the powers of intelligence in order to seek the ways of happiness and i believe that it is a worthy work to give them the knowledge they need in order to find happiness at the outset of this book of love we are going to examine the existing facts of the sex relationships of men and women in present-day society we shall discover that amid all the false and dishonest thinking of mankind there is nowhere more falsity and dishonesty than here the whole world is a gigantic conspiracy of hush and the orthodox and respectable of the world are like worshippers of some god who spend their daytime burning incense before the altar and in the nighttime steal the sacred jewels and devour the consecrated offerings these worshippers confront you with the question do you believe in marriage and they make the assumption that the institution of marriage exists or at some time has existed in the world but if you wish to do any sound thinking about the subject you must get one thing clear at the outset the institution of marriage is an ideal which has been preached and taught but which has never anywhere in any society at any stage of human progress actually existed as the general practice of mankind what has existed and still exists is a very different institution which i shall here describe as marriage plus prostitution by this statement i do not mean to deny that there are many women and a few men who have been monogamous all their lives nor that there are many couples living together happily in monogamous marriage what i mean is that considering society as a whole wherever you find the institution of marriage you also find coexistent therewith and complementary thereto the institution of prostitution of this double arrangement one part is recognized and written into the law and the other part is hidden and prohibited by law but those who have to do with enforcing the law all know that it exists and practically all of them consider it inevitable and a great many derive income from it so i say if you believe in marriage plus prostitution that is your right but if marriage is what you believe in then your task is to consider such questions as these is marriage a possible thing can it ever become the sex arrangement of any society? What are the forces which have so far prevented it from prevailing, and how can these forces be counteracted? It is my belief that monogamous love is the most desirable of human sex relationships, the most fruitful in happiness and spiritual development. The laws and institutions of civilized society pretend to defend this relationship, but the briefest study of the facts will convince anyone that these laws and institutions are not really meant to protect monogamous love what they are is a device of the property holding male to secure his property rights to women and more especially to secure himself as to the paternity of his heirs in primitive society where land and other sources of wealth were held in common and sex monogamy was unknown there was no way to determine paternity and no reason for doing so but under the system of private property and class privilege it is necessary for some one man to support a child 
if it is to be supported and when a man has fought hard and robbed hard and traded hard and acquired wealth he does not want to spend it in maintaining another man's child that he should let himself be fooled into doing so is one of the greatest humiliations his fellow man can imagine if you read shakespeare's plays and look up the meaning of old words so as to understand old witticisms and allusions you will discover that this was the stock jest of shakespeare's time in order to protect himself from such ridicule the man maintained in ancient times his right to kill the faithless woman with cruel tortures he maintains today the right to deprive her of her children and of all share in his property even though she may have helped to earn it but until quite recent times the beginning of the revolt of women there was never any corresponding penalty for faithlessness in husbands under the english law today the husband may divorce his wife for infidelity but the wife must prove infidelity plus cruelty and the courts have held that the cruelty must consist in knocking her down while i was in england the highest court rendered a decision that a man who brought his mistress to his home and compelled his wife to wait upon her was not committing cruelty in the meaning of the english law this is what is known as the double standard and the double standard prevails everywhere under the system of marriage plus prostitution and proves that capitalist monogamy is not a spiritual ideal but a matter of class privilege it is a breach of honor for the ruling class male to tamper with the wife of his friend it is frequently dangerous for him to tamper with the young females of his own class but it is in general practice taken for granted that the young females of lower classes are his legitimate prey in england a man may have a marriage annulled if he can prove that the woman he married had what is called a past but everybody takes it for granted that the man has had a past it is covered by the polite phrase sowing his wild oats wherever among the ruling class you find men bold enough to discuss the facts of the sex order they have set up you find the idea expressed or implied that this wild oats is a necessary and inevitable part of this order and that without it the order would break down the english philosopher lecky making an elaborate study of morals through the ages speaks of the prostitute in the following frank language herself the supreme type of vice she is ultimately the most efficient guardian of virtue but for her the unchallenged purity of countless happy homes would be polluted and not a few who in the pride of their untempted chastity think of her with an indignant shudder would have known the agony of remorse and despair on that one degraded and ignoble form are concentrated the passions that might have filled the world with shame she remains while creeds and civilizations rise and fall the eternal priestess of humanity blasted for the sins of the people i invite you to study these sentences and understand them fully remember that they are the opinion of the most learned historian of sex customs who has ever written in english a man whose authority is recognized in our schools whose books are in every college library william edward hartpool lecky is not in any sense a revolutionist he is a conventional english scholar an upholder of english law and order and patriotism he is not of my school of thought but of those who now own the world and run it i quote him because he tells in plain language what kind of world they have made i invite you to study his words and then judge my statement that the sex arrangement under which we live in modern society is not monogamous love but marriage plus prostitution it is my hope to point the way to a higher system i should like to call it 
marriage. But perhaps it would be more precise to call it marriage minus prostitution. In working it out, we shall have to think for ourselves and discard all formulas. It is obvious that our present-day religious creeds, ethical ideals, legal codes, and social rewards and punishments have been powerless to protect marriage, or to make it the rule in sex relationships. So we shall have to begin at the beginning and find new reasons for monogamous love, a new basis for marriage other than the protection of private property. We shall have to inform ourselves as to the fundamental purposes of sex. We shall have to ask ourselves, what are the factors which determine rightness and wrongness in the sex relationship? What is love, and what ought it to be? These questions we shall try to approach without any fixed ideas whatever. We shall decide them by the same tests that we have used in our thinking about God and immortality, health, and disease. We shall ask not what our ancestors believed, not what God teaches us, not what the law ordains, not what is respectable, nor yet what is advanced, according to the claim of modern sex revolutionists and free lovers. We shall ask ourselves, what are the facts? We shall ask what can be made to work in practice, what can justify itself by the tests of reason and common sense. End of chapter 28. Chapter 29. The Development of Marriage. Deals with the sex relationship, its meaning and its history, the stages of its development in human society. What in the most elemental form is sex? It is a difference of function which makes it necessary for two organisms to take part in the reproduction of the species. The purpose, or at any rate the effect, of this sex difference is the mixing of characteristics and qualities. If the sex relationship were unnecessary to reproduction, variations might begin and be propagated and carried to extremes in one line of inheritance without ever affecting the rest of the species. Very soon there would be no species, or rather an infinity of them. Each line of descent would fly apart and become a group all by itself. You have perhaps heard people comment on the fact that blondes so frequently prefer brunettes, and that tall men are apt to marry short women, and vice versa. This is perhaps nature's way of keeping the type uniform, of spreading qualities widely and testing them thoroughly. Nature is continually trying out the powers of every individual in every species, and by the process of sexual selection, she chooses for the reproduction of the species the individuals which are best fitted for survival. This, of course, refers to nature, considered apart from man. In human society, as I shall presently show, sexual selection has been distorted and partly suppressed. Sex differentiation and sexual selection exist almost universally throughout the animal and vegetable kingdoms everywhere save in the lowest forms of being. They take strange and startling forms, and like everything else in nature, manifest amazing ingenuity. People who wish to prove this or that about human sex relations will advance arguments from nature, but, as a matter of fact, we can learn nothing whatever from nature, except her determination to preserve the products of her activity and to keep them up to standard. Sometimes nature will give the precedence in power, speed, and beauty to the male, and sometimes to the female. She is perfectly ruthless and willing in the accomplishment of her purpose to destroy the individuals of either sex. She will content the most rabid feminist by causing the female spider to devour her mate when his purpose has been accomplished or by causing the male bee to fall from his mating in the air, a disemboweled shell. As for man, 
he has won his supremacy over nature by his greater power to combine in groups by his more intense gregarious or herd instincts which enabled him to fight and destroy creatures which would have exterminated him if he had fought them alone so in primitive society everywhere we find that the individual is subordinated to the group and the folk ways give but little heed to personal rights very thorough investigations have been made into the life of primitive man in many parts of the world and the anthropologists are now arguing over the exact meaning of the data we shall not here attempt to decide among them but rest content with the statement that communism and tribal ownership is a widespread social form among primitive man so much so as to suggest that it is an early stage in social evolution and this communism includes not merely property but sex in the very earliest days there was often no barrier whatever to the sex relationship not even between brothers and sisters nor between parents and children in fact we find savages who do not know that the sex relationship has anything to do with procreation but as knowledge increases sex taboos develop some wise and some foolish from causes not entirely clear but which we discuss in chapter forty eight there gradually evolves a widespread form of sex relationship of primitive man the system of the gents as it is called this is the latin word for family but it does not mean family in the narrow sense of mother and father and children but in the broad sense of all those who have blood relationship however far removed uncles and aunts and cousins as far as memory can trace in primitive communism a man is not permitted to enter into the sex relationship with a woman of the same gents but with all other women of some other gents. It is difficult for us to imagine a society in which all the men named Jones would be married to all the women named Smith. But that was the way whole races of mankind lived for many thousands of years. In that primitive communist society, the woman was generally the equal of the man. It is true that she did the drudgery of the camp, but the man, on the other hand, faced the hardships of battle and the chase on land and sea. The woman was as big as the man, and except when handicapped by pregnancy, as strong as the man. She was as respected, if not more so. Her children bore her name, and were under her control, and she was accustomed to assert herself in all affairs of the tribe. And Frederick O'Brien's white shadows in the south seas you may read a comical story of a journey this traveler made into the interior of one of the cannibal islands everywhere he was treated with courtesy and hospitality but was embarrassed by continual offers from would-be wives in one case a powerful cannibal lady whose advances he rejected picked him up and proceeded to carry him off and he was quite helpless in her grasp he might have been a cannibal husband today if it had not been for the intervention of his fellow travelers the basis of this sex equality under primitive communism is easy to understand all goods belonged to the tribe and were shared alike according to need children were the tribe's most precious possession therefore the women suffered little handicap from having a child to bear and feed primitive woman would bear her child by the roadside and pick it up in her arms and continue her journey and when she needed food she did not have to beg for it if there was food for anyone there was food for her and her child she did her share of the gathering and preparing of food because that was the habit and law of her being she had energies and had never heard of the idea of not using them this primitive communism generally disappears as the tribe progresses we cannot be sure of all the stages of its disappearance or of the causes but in a general way 
we can say that it gives way before the spread of slavery. In the beginning, primitive man does not have any slaves. He does not have sufficient foresight or self-restraint for that. When he kills his enemies in battle, he builds a fire and roasts their flesh and eats them. And those whom he captures alive, he binds fast and takes with him to be sacrificed to his voodoo gods. But as he comes to more settled ways of living, and as the tribe grows larger, it occurs to the chiefs in battle that the captives would be glad to give their labor in return for their lives, and that it would be convenient to have some people to do the hard and dirty work. So gradually there comes to be a class at the bottom of society, and another class at the top. Those who capture the slaves and keep them at work lay claim to the products of their labor, at first better weapons and personal adornments, then separate homes for the chiefs and priests, separate gardens, separate flocks and herds, and, what more natural, separate women. This process becomes complete when the tribe settles down to agriculture, and the ruling classes take possession of the land. When once the land is privately owned, classes are fixed, and class distinctions become the most prominent fact in society. And step by step as this happens, we see women beaten down from the position of the cannibal lady who could ask for the man she wanted and carry him off by force if necessary, to the position of the modern woman, who is physically weak, emotionally unstable, economically dependent, and socially repressed. You may resent such phrases, but all you have to do is to read the laws of civilized countries written into the statute books by men to define the rights and duties of women, you will see that everywhere. Before the recent feminist revolt, women were classified under the law with children and imbeciles. Maternity imposes on woman a heavy burden, and before the discovery of birth control, a burden that is continuous. For nine months she carries the child in her body, and then for a year or two she carries it in her arms or on her back, and by that time there is another child and this continues until she is broken down. Having this burden, she cannot possibly compete with the unburdened male for the possession of property. So wherever there is economic competition, wherever certain individuals or classes in the tribe or group are allowed to seize and hold the land, wherever the products of labor cease to be the community property and become private property, the objects of economic strife, then invariably and by natural process woman comes to be placed among those who cannot protect themselves, that is, among the children and the imbeciles and the slaves. Of course, some children are well cared for, and so are some imbeciles and some slaves and some women but they are cared for as a matter of favor, not as a matter of their own power. They proceed no longer as the cannibal lady, but by adopting and cultivating the slave virtues, by making themselves agreeable to their masters, by flattering their master's vanity and sensuality. In other words, by exercising what we are accustomed to call feminine charm. From early barbaric society up to the present day, we observe that there are classes of women just as there are classes of men. The position of these classes changes within certain limits, but in broad outline the conditions are fixed and may be easily defined. There is, first of all, the ruling class woman. She must have birth. She may or may not have wealth, according as to whether the laws of that society or tribe permit her to have possessions of her own, or to inherit anything from her parents. If she has no wealth, then she will need beauty. She is the woman who is selected by the ruling class man to bear his name and his children, 
and to have charge of the household where these children are reared and trained for the inheriting of their father's wealth and the carrying on of his position this confers upon the ruling class woman great dignity and makes her a person of responsibility she rules not merely over the slaves of the household but over men of inferior social classes and in a few cases an exceptionally able woman has become a queen and ruled over men of her own class this ruling class woman has been known through all the ages by a special name and the ways and customs regarding her have been studied in an entertaining book the lady by emily james putnam next in privilege and position to the lady is the mistress the woman who is selected by the ruling class man not primarily to bear his children but to entertain and divert him she may of course bear children also in barbaric societies and up to quite recent times the importance of the ruling class man was indicated by the number of concubines he had and the position of these women was hardly inferior to that of the wife or queen in the days of the french monarchy the king's mistress was frequently more important than the queen she was a woman of ability maintaining her supremacy in the intrigues of the court in ancient greek society the heteri were a recognized class and aspasia the mistress of pericles was the most brilliant and most conspicuous woman in athens in modern france the position of the mistress is recognized by the phrase demi monde or half world the american plutocracy has developed upon a superstructure of puritanism and therefore in america hypocrisy is necessary but in the great cities of america the vast majority of the ruling class men keep mistresses before marriage and a great many keep them afterwards and these mistresses are coming to be more and more openly flaunted and to acquire more and more of what is called social position it is possible now in the smart set for a lady to accept the status of mistress delicately veiled without losing caste thereby and actresses and other freelance women who get their start in life by taking the position of a mistress are coming more and more to be recognized as ladies and to be received into what are called the best circles there remains to be considered the position of lower class women in barbarous societies these women were very little different from slaves they had no rights of their own except such rights as their master man chose to allow them for his own convenience they were sold in marriage by their parents and they went where they were sold and obeyed their new master they became his household drudges and reserved their affections for him if they failed to do this he stoned them to death or strangled them with a cord and tied them in a sack and threw them into the river and of course the rights of the master man yielded to the rights of the men of higher classes the king or nobleman could take any woman he wished at any time and he made laws to this effect and enforced them in feudal society the lord of the manor claimed the right of the first knight with the wives of his serfs this was one of the ruling class privileges which was abolished in the french revolution wherever the french revolution did not succeed in effecting land tenure the right of the landowner to prey upon his tenant and girls continues as a custom even though it is not written in the law and would be denied by the hypocritical it prevails in poland as you may discover by reading sienkiewicz's whirlpools it prevails in england as you may discover from hardy's tests of the d'urbeville you will find that it prevails in every part of the world where women have poverty and men have wealth and prestige dress suits and automobiles you will find it wherever there are leisure class hotels or colleges or other gatherings of ruling class young males you will find it in the theatrical and moving picture worlds 
it is well understood in the theatrical world of broadway that the woman star in the profession gets her start in life by becoming the mistress of a manager or angel in the moving picture world of southern california it is a recognized convention known to everyone familiar with the business that a young girl parts with her virtue in exchange for an important job end of chapter twenty nine Chapters 30 and 31 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 Sex and Young America discusses present day sex arrangements as they affect the future generation. Our first task is to consider how people actually behave in the matter of sex as distinguished from the way they pretend to behave. The first and most necessary step in the cure of any disease is a correct diagnosis, and in this case we have not merely to make the diagnosis, but to prove it, because the most conspicuous fact about our present sex arrangements is a mass of organized concealment not merely do teachers and preachers for the most part suppress all mention of these subjects but the defenders of our present economic disorder are accustomed to acclaim the private property regime as the only basis of family life so long as people hold such an idea there is no use trying to teach them anything on the subject there is no use talking to them about monogamous love because all they understand is hypocrisy in this chapter therefore we shall proceed to hold up the mirror in front of capitalist morality i pause and consider where shall i begin at the top of society or at the bottom with the city or the country with the old or the young i think you care most of all about your boys and girls so i am going to tell you what is happening to the youth of america in these days of triumphant reaction i have a son about whom naturally i think a great deal just now he is a student at one of our state universities and he wrote me the other day i went to a dance and believe me father if you knew what these modern dances mean you would write something about them i know what they mean they have come to us straight from the brothels of the argentine among the vilest haunts of vice in the world others have come from the jungle where they were natural the poor creature of the jungle has his sex desire and nothing else he is not troubled with brains he does not have a complicated social organism to build up and protect consequently he does not need what are called morals but we civilized people need morals and we are losing them and our society is disintegrating going back to the howling and fighting and cannibalism of the jungle professor william james america's greatest psychologist tells us that going through the motions appropriate to an emotion automatically causes that emotion to be felt if you watch an actor preparing to rush on the stage in an emotional scene you will see him walking about clenching his fists stamping his feet making ferocious faces working himself up and now what do you think is going on in the minds of young men and women while with their bodies they are going through procedures which are nothing and can be nothing but imitations of sexual contact the parents it appears are ignorant and unsophisticated and have left it for their children to find out what these dances mean in rhode island one of our oldest states is brown college chosen by new england's aristocracy for the education of its sons and these boys go to social affairs in the best homes in providence and they call them petting parties 
and here's what they write in their college paper the modern social bud drinks not too much often but enough she smokes unguardedly swears considerably and tells dirty stories all in all she is a most frivolous passionate sensation-seeking little thing this statement published in a college paper causes a scandal and a newspaper reporter goes to interview the college boy who edits the paper and this boy talks he tells how he met a lovely girl at a dance and his heart was thrilled with the rapture of young love frankly between you and me i was pretty smitten with this particular little lady felt about her don't you know like a real guy feels about a girl he could imagine himself married to thought she was too nice to touch almost you know the grave sort of love affair a man always has once in a lifetime well we talked a bit and i guess i didn't say much for a while i felt plenty respectfully just the same and as we turned the corner of one of the buildings here she grasped my hand hers was trembling love and let love is my motto dearie said this seraph of my dreams come we're losing a lot of time getting started that girl thought i was dead slow she didn't know that just then i imagined the great love of my life was just entering the door it was cruel the way she got down from the pedestal i had built for her suppose i should ask you to name the influence that is having most to do with shaping the thoughts of young america what would you answer undoubtedly the moving pictures it is from the movies that your children learn what life is if i can show you that a certain thing is in the movies you can surely not deny that it is passing every day and night into the hearts and minds of millions of our boys and girls take a vote among the girls what would they consider the most delightful destiny in life surely nine out of ten would answer to become a screen star and pose before a world of admirers and be paid a million dollars a year make a test and see and put that fact together with the one i have already stated that in order to get an important job in the movies a girl must regularly and as a matter of course part with her virtue you will be told no doubt that this is a slanderous statement so let me give you a little evidence i happened within the past year to be in the private office of a well-known moving picture producer a man who is married and takes care to tell you that he loves his wife he was producing a play the heroine of which was supposed to be a daughter of puritan new england to play this part he had engaged a chaste girl and as a result was in the midst of a queer trouble which he poured out to me his leading man had refused to act with this girl insisting that no girl could act a part of love unless she had had passionate experience no such thing had ever been heard of in moving pictures before likewise the director agreed that no girl who is chaste could act for the screen and the producer asked my advice about it mr william allen white of kansas was present in the office and authorizes me to state that he substantiates this anecdote we both advised the producer to stand by the girl and he did so and the picture went out and proved to be what in trade parlance is termed a frost that is to say your children didn't care for it and it cost the producer something like a hundred thousand dollars to make this attempt to defy the conventions of the moving picture world i will tell you another story i have a friend a prominent man in los angeles who was appealed to by a young lady who wished to act in the movies my friend introduced this young lady to a very prominent screen actor who in turn introduced her to one of the biggest producers in america one of the men whose million dollar feature pictures are regularly exploited the producer examined the young lady's figure and told her that she would do he added quite casually and as a matter of course that she would be expected to pay the price 
the young lady took exception to this proposition and gave up the chance she told my friend about it and he being a man of the world accustomed to dealing with the foibles of his fellow men wrote a note to the actor explaining that inasmuch as this young lady had been socially introduced to him and by him socially introduced to the manager she should not have been expected to pay the price to this the actor answered that my friend was correct and he would see the manager about it the manager conceded the point and the young lady got her chance in the movies and made good without paying the price this story tells you all you need to know about the difference in sex ethics that society applies to the lady and to the daughter of common people you know of course what is the stock theme of all moving pictures the virtuous daughter of the people who resists all temptations and is finally rescued from her would-be seducer by the strong and sturdy arm of a male doll could one ask a more perfect illustration of capitalist hypocrisy than the fact that the girl who plays this role is required to pay with her virtue for the privilege of playing it and if you knew anything about young girls you can watch her playing it on the screen and see from her every gesture that what i am telling you is true my wife knows young girls and i took her the other day to see a moving picture she said i have solved a problem when i come home on the street cars it happens that i ride with a lot of young girls from the high school I have been watching them, and I couldn't imagine what was the matter with them. All simple, girlish straightforwardness has gone out of them. They are making eyes in the strangest manner, and at nobody. Just practicing, apparently. They wear yearning facial expressions. When they start to walk, they do not walk, but writhe and wiggle. I thought there must be some nervous eye and lip disease got abroad in the school, but now, when I go to a moving picture, I discover what it means. They are imitating the stars on the screen. In these pictures, you know, there are ingenues, young girls engaged in making a happy ending to the story by capturing a rich lover. And then there are vamps, engaged in seducing young men or breaking up some happy home. In old-style melodrama, it was possible to tell the ingenue from the vamps. The former would trip lightly and glance coyly out of the corners of their eyes, while the vamp moved with slow, languished, writhing, blinking, heavy-lidded, sinister eyes. But nowadays, the vamps have learned to post as ingenue, and the ingenue are as vicious as the vamps, they both make the same glances and culminate in the same sensual swoon it is all sex and nothing else except revolvers and fighting and wild rushing about and then too there are the musical comedies made wholly out of sex being known as girl shows or more frankly still leg shows a row of half-naked women prancing and gyrating on the stage and in front of them rows of bald-headed old men gazing at them greedily also college boys or boys too imbecile to get through college sending in their cards with boxes of costly flowers you will be shocked as you read my plain statements of fact but if you are the average american you will take your family to a musical show which has come straight from the brothels of paris every illusion of which is obscene. I remember once being in a small town in the South when one of these road shows arrived from New York, and I realized that this institution was simply a traveling house of ill fame. The whole male portion of the town was a quiver with excitement, a mixture of lust and fear. I live in Southern California, one of the many places in America where the idle rich gather for their diversion. The country is dotted with palatial hotels, and a golden flood of pleasure seekers come in every winter. I have talked with some of the college boys in this part of the country, and also with teachers who try to save the boys. They report these swell hotels as hotbeds of vice, 
haunted by married women with automobiles and nothing to do, who wish to go into the canyons for sexual riots. Even elderly women, white-haired women, old enough to be your grandmother. I have had them pointed out to me in these hotels, their cheeks and lips covered with rouge, with pink silk tights on their calves, and nothing else, almost up to their knees, and nothing at all halfway down their backs. These old women seek to prey on boys, wanting their youth and being willing to lavish money upon them. They are preying on your boys, you prosperous businessmen who have preached the gospel of each for himself and are proud of your skill to prey upon society. You heap up your fortunes and call it success and are secure and happy. You have made your children safe against want you think. But how are you going to make them safe against the vamps who prey upon the overwhelming excitements of youth and betray your sons before your very eyes, teaching them lust in their youth so that love may never be born in their stunted hearts? All the haunts of gilded vice are thriving, and somebody's boy is paying the interest on the capital to say nothing of paying the police. Many years ago I paid a call upon Anthony Comstock, head of the Society for the Prevention of Vice. Comstock was an old-style Puritan, and many insist that he was likewise an old-style grafter. However that may be, he had a collection of literature of pornography which would cause any man to hesitate in condemning his activities. There is a vast traffic in this kind of thing. It is sold by pack peddlers all over the country, and it is sold in little shops in the neighborhood of public schools. You may be sure that in your school there are some boys who know where to get it, even though they will not tell what they know. I will describe just one piece that a schoolboy brought to me, a catalog of obscene literature for sale in Spain, and to be ordered wholesale. You know how men with wares to sell will expend their imaginations and exhaust their vocabulary in describing to you the charms of each particular article for sale? Here was a catalog of one or two hundred pages listing thousands of items, pictures, pamphlets and books, and various implements of vice, all set forth in that imitation ecstasy of department stores and seed catalogs. Here was something neat. Here was a fancy one, this one was a peach, and that one was a winner. When I was a lad, I was tramping in the Adirondack Mountains and was picked up by an itinerant photographer. We rode all day together, and he became friendly and showed me some obscene pictures. Presently, he discovered that he was dealing with a young moralist and apparently it was the first time he had ever had that experience. He talked honestly, and we became friends on a different basis. This man had a wife and children at home, but he traveled all over the mountains, and was like the sailor with a girl in every port. Also, he was thoroughly familiar with all forms of unnatural vice, and took this also as a matter of course, and spread it on his journeys. The other day I read a statement by a prominent physician in New York. He had been talking with a police captain, and had asked him to state what, in his opinion, was the most significant development in the social life of New York. The answer was, the spread of male prostitution. Here is a subject to which I have to admit my courage is unequal. I cannot repeat the jokes which I have heard young men tell about these matters and about the attitude of the police to them. Suffice it to say that these hideous forms of vice are now the commonplace of the underworld of all our great cities. The other day a friend of mine was talking with a prostitute who had left a high-class resort where the price charged was ten dollars, and gone to live in a fifty-cent house frequented by sailors. She was asked the reason, and her explanation was, the sailors are natural. 
dr william j robinson has written in his magazine an account of the haunts in berlin which are frequented by the victims of unnatural vice there allowed to meet openly and to solicit frank harris in his life of oscar wilde tells how when that scandal was at its height and further exposure threatened swarms of the most prominent men in england suddenly discovered that it was advisable for them to travel on the continent the great public schools of england are rotten with these practices the younger boys learn them from the older ones and are victims all the rest of their lives and the corruption is creeping through our own social body and you think that all you have to do is not to know about it my friend floyd dell reading this manuscript insists that this chapter and the one following are too severe in case others should agree with him i quote two newspaper items which appear while i am reading the proofs the first is from an interview with h gordon selfridge the london merchant telling his impressions of america he tells about the flappers and then about the shifters the other is the newly exploited shifters the shifters are an organization of mushroom growth among high school girls and boys which is spreading through the eastern states and winning converts among youngsters it is described as the flapper ku klux and its emblem if worn by a girl according to high school teachers and children's society leaders who oppose it to be nothing more or less than an invitation to be kissed to call it an organization even is an exaggeration for the shifters are better described as a secret understanding without any responsible head from being a seemingly harmless group whose emblem was originally a brass paper clip fastened in the coat lapel it has developed by rapid strides manufacturers of emblems are coining money by the sale of hands palm outstretched the significance is to take what you want or as the motto of the order says be a good fellow get something for nothing one of the principles is to do one's parents referred to as they the second item is an associated press dispatch st louis march 10 in reiterating his statements that a girls and boys secret organization requiring that all applicants must have violated the moral code before admission was granted existed in a local high school victor j miller president of the board of police commissioners tonight named the solden high school as the one in which the alleged immoral conditions exist the school is attended largely by children of the wealthy west end citizens End of chapter 30. Chapter 31. Sex and the Smart Set portrays the moral customs of those who set the fashion in our present day world. We have discussed what is happening to our young people. Let us next consider what our mature people are doing. Having mentioned conditions in England, I will give a glimpse of London high life two years before the war as a visiting writer i was invited to luncheon at the home of a woman novelist whose books at that time were widely read both in her country and here present at the luncheon was a prominent publisher who i afterwards learned was the lady's lover also the lady's grown and married son the publisher looked like a buxom hunting squire but the lady told me that he was very unhappy because his wife would not divorce him the lady had just come from a weekend party at the home of an earl who at this moment occupies one of the highest posts in the gift of the british empire things had gone comically wrong at this country house party she said because the hostess had failed to remember that lord so-and-so was at present living with lady somebody else one of the duties of the hostesses at house parties it appears is to know who is living with whom in order that they may be put in connecting rooms in this case his lordship had been grouchy and everybody's pleasure had been spoiled this produced a discussion of the subject of marriage and the son remarked that marriage was like an old slipper you wore it because you had got used to it but you did not talk about it because it was unimportant and stupid 
I went away and happened to mention these matters to a friend who had met this woman novelist in Nice. The novelist had there, in a group of people, been introduced to a young girl who was suffering from neurasthenia. My dear, said the novelist affectionately, what you need is to have an illegitimate baby. This, you will say, is the old world, and you always knew that it was corrupt. If so, let me tell you a few things that I have seen among the upper circles of our own great and virtuous democracy. My first acquaintance with New York society came after the publication of The Jungle. As the author of that book, I was a sensation, almost as much so as if I had won the heavyweight championship of the world. Out of curiosity, I accepted an invitation for a weekend amid what is called the hunting set of Long Island. Here was a gorgeous palace with many tapestries and soft-footed servants and decanters and cocktails at every stage of one's journey about the place, like coaling stations on the trade routes of the British Empire. One of the first sights that caught my young eye was a large and stately lady in semi-undress, smoking a big black cigar. If I were to mention her name, every newspaper reader in America would know her, and before I had been introduced to her, I heard two young men in evening dress make an obscene remark about her, and what she was waiting for that evening. I discovered quickly, while there was a great deal of sex among these people, there was very little love. There was principally a wish to score cleverly and subtly at the expense of another person's feelings. It is called the smart set, you understand, and I will give you an idea of how smart it is. I was walking down a passage with a lady, and on a couch sat another lady, side by side, with a certain very famous lawyer, whose golden eloquence you have probably listened to from platforms, and whom, for the purpose of this anecdote, I will name Jones. Mr. Jones and the lady on the sofa were sitting very close together, and my companion, with a bright smile over her shoulder, called out, "'Be careful, Mary. You'll be scattering a lot of little Joneses around here if you don't watch out.' Quite continental, you perceive, and a long way from the Puritanism of our ancestors. From there I went to the billiard room and observed a young man of fashion trying to play billiards when he was half drunk. It was a funny spectacle, and they took away his cigarette by force for fear he would drop it on the cloth of the billiard table. Pretty soon he was telling about a racing meet and an orgy with a negro woman in a stable. Therefore I returned to where the ladies were gathered, and one middle-aged matron, who had read widely, including some of my books, engaged me in serious conversation. I came later on to know her rather well, and she told me her views of love. The source of all the sex troubles of humanity was that they took the relationship seriously. Modern discoveries made it unnecessary to attach importance to it. She herself, acting upon this theory, probably had relations with... My friends, reading the proofs of this book, begged me to omit the number of men, because you would not believe me. You may argue that it is not typical. Say that I fell into the clutches of some particular group of degenerates. All I can tell you is that these people are as socially prominent as any in New York City. I will say furthermore that I have sat in the home of the best-known corporation lawyer in America, who has paid a million dollars to organize the Steel Trust, the late James B. Dill, at that time a member of the Court of Appeals of New Jersey, and have heard him muckrake his business friends by the hour with stories of that sort. I have heard him tell of the steel crowd hiring a trolley car and a load of prostitutes and champagne, and taking an all-night trip from one city to another, smashing up both the car and the prostitutes. I have heard him tell of sitting on the deck of a sound steamer, and overhearing two of his Wall Street associates and their wives arranging to trade partners for the night. I have mentioned a lady who had a great many lovers once in the dining room of a club on Fifth Avenue, commonly known as the Millionaires, 
a companion pointed out various people, many of whom I had read about in the newspapers, and told me funny stories about them. "'See that old boy with a notebook?' said my host. "'That is Jacob so-and-so, and he is entering a, the cost of his lunch. He keeps accounts of everything, even his women. He told me that he had had over a thousand, and that they had cost him over a million. It is impossible to say what is the most terrible thing in capitalist society, but among the most terrible are assuredly the old men. The richest and most powerful banker in America was in his sex habits the merry jest of New York society. He took toward women the same attitude as King Edward the Seventh. If he wanted one, he went up and asked for her, and it made no difference who she was or where she was. This man's personal living expenses were $5,000 a day, and all women understood that they might have anything within reason. When I was a boy living in New York, there was a certain aged moneylender about whom one read something in the newspapers almost every day. He was a prominent figure because he was worth 80 millions, yet wore an old rusty black suit and saved every penny. Every now and then, you would read in the paper how some woman had been arrested for attempting to blackmail him in his office. It seemed puzzling, because you wouldn't think of him as a likely subject for blackmail. Some years later I met Dorothy Richardson, author of The Long Day, a very fine book which has been undeservedly forgotten. Miss Richardson had been a reporter for the New York Herald, and had been sent to interview this old money-lender. She was ushered into his private office, and as soon as the attendant had gone out and closed the door, the old man came up and, without a word of preliminaries, grabbed her in his arms like a gorilla. She fought and scratched and got out, and was wise enough to say nothing about it. Therefore there was nothing published about another attempt to blackmail the aged moneylender. What this means is that men of unlimited means live lives of unbridled lust, and then in their old age they are helpless victims of their own impulses. There was a certain enormously wealthy United States senator from West Virginia who came very near to being vice president of the United States. This doddering old man would go about the streets of Washington with a couple of very decorous and carefully trained attendants. And whenever an attractive young woman would pass on the street, or when one would approach the senator, these two attendants would quietly slip their arms into his and hold him fast. They would do this so that the ordinary person would not suspect what was going on, but would think the old man was being supported. You do not have to take these things on my word. The newspapers are full of them all the time, and they are proven in court. Just now as I write, the president of the most powerful bank in America is claiming in court that his children are not his own, but that their father is an Indian guide. His wife, on the other hand, is accusing the banker of having played the role of husband to several other women. He would take these women traveling on his yacht, which, quaintly enough, was termed the modesty. Also, the papers have been full of the Hammond case. Here is a wealthy man, Republican National Committeeman from Oklahoma, who is about to go to Washington to advise our new president whom to appoint to office from that state. Before he goes, he casts off his mistress, and she shoots him. She was his secretary, it appears, and helped him to make his fortune. She has made many friends, and a million dollars is spent to save her life. The prosecuting attorney calls her a painted snake, and accuses her of having sat week after week, displaying to the jury twenty-four inches of silk-stockinged shinbone. The jury, apparently unable to withstand this allurement, acquits the woman, and she announces that she intends to bring suit under the man's will to get his money. Also, she is going into the movies, and tells us that it is to be for educational purposes. Everything in our capitalist society must be educational, you understand. It was P.T. Barnum who discovered that the American people would flock to look at a five-legged calf if it was presented as educational. 
the moving pictures and the theaters are the honey pots which gather the feminine beauty and youthful charm of our country for the convenience of rich men's lust these girls swarm in the theatrical agencies and in the artist studios they starve for a while and finally they yield in every great city there are thousands of men of wealth whose only occupation is to prey upon such girls i know a certain theatrical manager the most famous in the united states a sensual stout little jew he is a man of culture and subtle insight and in the course of his conversation he described to me quite casually and as a matter of course the charm of deflowering a virgin nothing could equal that sensation the first time was the last many years ago there was a horrible scandal in new york the most famous architect in america was murdered and the newspapers probed into his life and it was revealed to us that many of the most famous artists and men about town in new york maintained elaborate studios equipped with every luxury all the paraphernalia of all the vices of the ages and through these places there flowed an endless stream of beautiful young girls in every large city in america you will find an athletic club and if you go there and listen to the gossip you'll discover that there are scores of idle rich men with automobiles and private apartments and a staff of procurers used in praying not merely upon young girls but also upon young boys and these are not merely the children of the poor they are the children of all but the rich and powerful in the movies you see pictures of girls lured into automobiles and carried out into the country or seduced by means of knockout drops and you think this is just melodrama but it is happening all the time in every big city of our country the police know that hundreds of young girls disappear every year at a recent convention of police chiefs in washington it was stated from police records that sixty thousand girls disappear every year in the united states leaving no trace unless the parents happen to be in position to make a fuss not even the names of the girls are published in the newspapers i do not ask you to believe such things on my word believe district attorney sims of chicago who made the most thorough study of this subject ever made in america and wrote when a white slave is sold and landed in a house or dive she becomes a prisoner in each of these places is a room having but one door to which the keeper holds the keys here are locked all the street clothes shoes and ordinary apparel the finery provided for the girls is of a nature to make their appearance on the street impossible then in addition to this handicap the girl is placed at once in debt to the keeper for a wardrobe she cannot escape while she is in debt and she can never get out of debt not many of the women in this class expect to live more than ten years perhaps the average is less many die painful deaths by disease many by consumption but it is hardly beyond the truth to say that suicide is their general expectation End of chapter 31、Chapters、32, 33, 34 The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 Sex and the Poor Discusses prostitution, the extent of its prevalence, and the diseases which result from it. It is manifest that the rich cannot indulge in vices without drawing the poor after them. And in addition to this, the poor have their own evil instincts, which fester in neglect. There were several hundred thousand dark rooms, that is, rooms without light or ventilation, in New York City before the war. Now the country is reported to be short a million homes, and in New York City, working girls are sleeping six or eight in a room. In the homes of the poor, in the slums, parents and children and boarders all sleep in one room indiscriminately. And the world moves back to that primitive communism 
in which incest is an everyday affair, and little children learn all the vices there are. I have in my hand a pamphlet by a physician, in charge of a hospital in New York, who in fifteen years has examined nine hundred children who have been raped, and the age of the youngest was eight months. I have another pamphlet by a settlement worker who discusses the problem of the thousands of deserted wives, most of them with children, many with children yet unborn. As I write, there are millions of men out of work in our country, and these men are desperate, and they quit and take to the road. They join the army of the casual workers, the blanket stiffs, and, of course, the more there are of these men, the more prostitutes there have to be, and the more homosexuality there will inevitably be. Also, the girls are out of work and are on the streets. Many years ago I visited the mill towns of New England, she towns they are called, and one of the young fellows said to me that you could buy a girl there for the price of a sandwich. Read The Long Day to which I have previously referred, and see how our working girls live. Dorothy Richardson describes her roommate, who read cheap novels which she found in the gutter weeklies. She read them over and over. When she had got to the bottom of the pile, she began again, because her mind was so weak that she had forgotten everything. And then one day Miss Richardson happened to be groping in a corner of a closet, and came upon a great pile of bottles and examined them, and was made sick with horror. Abortion mixtures. Dr. William J. Robinson, an authority on the subject, estimates that there are one million abortions in the United States every year. Some of these are accidental, caused by venereal disease, but the vast majority are deliberate acts, crimes under the law, murder of human life. Dr. Robinson also estimates, from the many thousands of cases which come to him, that 95% of all men have at some time practiced self-abuse. He is a strenuous opponent of what he calls hysteria on the subjects of venereal disease, and insists that its prevalence is exaggerated, that instead of one person in ten being syphilitic, as is commonly stated, the proportion is only one in twenty. He insists that the percentage of persons having had gonorrhea is only twenty-five percent instead of seventy-five or eighty-five. I find that other authorities generally agree in the statement that fifty percent of young men become infected with some venereal disease before they reach the age of thirty. The Committee of Seven in New York estimated in 1903 that there were 200,000 cases of syphilis in the city, and 800,000 of gonorrhea. There were villages in France before the war in which 25% of the inhabitants were syphilitic, and in Russia there were towns in which it was said that every person was syphilitic. We may safely say that these latter are the only towns in Europe in which there was not an enormous increase of this disease during and since the war. What are the consequences of these diseases? The consequences are frightful suffering, not merely to persons guilty of immorality, but to innocent persons. Dr. Morrow, generally recognized as the leading authority on this subject, estimates that 10% of all wives are infected with venereal disease by their husbands. He estimates that 30% of all the infected women in New York were wives who had got the disease from their husbands. It is estimated that 30% of all births where either parent has syphilis result in abortions. It is estimated that 50% of childlessness in marriage is caused by gonorrhea and 25% of all existing blindness. In Germany, before the war, there were 30,000 persons born blind from this cause. It is estimated that 95% of all abdominal operations performed upon women are due to gonorrhea. 
and any of these horrors may fall upon persons who lead lives of the strictest chastity there was a case reported in germany of two hundred and thirty six children who contracted venereal disease from swimming in a public bath all of these things are products of our system of marriage plus prostitution they are all part of that system and no study of the system is complete without them everywhere throughout modern civilization prostitution is an enormous and lucrative industry in new york it is estimated to give employment to two hundred thousand women to say nothing of the managers and the runners and the men who live off the women there are thousands of resorts large and small high priced and cheap and the police know all about it and derive a handsome income from it and you find it the same in every great city of the world in every port where sailors land or every place where crowds of men are expected if there is to be a football game or a political convention the managers of the industry know about it and while they may never have heard the libel that socialism preaches sexual license they all know that capitalism practices it and they provide the necessary means in the united states there are estimated to be a half a million prostitutes counting the inmates of houses alone during the late war at the army bases in france the british government maintained official brothels but if you published anything about this in england you ran a chance of having your paper suppressed during the occupation of the rhine country the french sent in negro troops savages from the heart of africa whose custom it is to cut off the ears of their enemies in battle and the french army compelled the german population to supply white women for these troops i have quoted in the brass check a pious editorial from the los angeles times bidding the mothers of america to be happy because our boys in france were safe in the protecting arms of the y m c a and the knights of columbus i dared not publish at this time a passage which i had clipped from the london clarion in which a m thompson told how he watched the doughboys in the cafes of paris with a girl on each knee and a glass of wine in each hand i will add one little anecdote giving you a glimpse of the sex conventions of war the american army made desperate efforts to keep down venereal disease and required all men to report to their regimental surgeon immediately after having had sex relations our army moved into coblenz and the regulations strictly forbade any fraternizing with the inhabitants but immediately it was discovered that there was an increase of disease an investigation was made and revealed that men had been ceasing to report to the surgeons because they were afraid of being punished for having fraternized with the enemy so a new order was issued providing that having sexual intercourse would not be considered as fraternizing i do not know any better way to distinguish my ideal of morality from the military ideal than to say that according to my understanding of it the sex relationship should always and everywhere imply and include fraternizing finally in concluding this picture of our present-day sex arrangements there is a brief word to be said about divorce in the year 1916 the last statistics available as i write there were just over a million marriages in the united states and there were over one hundred and twelve thousand divorces this would indicate that one marriage in every nine resulted in shipwreck but as a matter of fact the proportion is greater because the marriages necessarily precede the divorces and the proportion of divorces in nineteen sixteen should be calculated upon the number of marriages which took place some five or ten years previously of the one million marriages in nineteen sixteen we may say that one in seven or one in eight will end in the divorce courts let this suffice for a glimpse of the system of marriage plus prostitution 
a field of weeds which we have somehow to plow up and prepare for a harvest of rational and honest love. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 Sex and Nature maintains that our sex disorders are not the result of natural or physical disharmony. Ailey Metchnikoff, one of the greatest scientists, wrote a book entitled The Nature of Man, in which he studied the human organism from the point of view of biology, demonstrating that in our bodies are a number of relics of past stages of evolution, no longer useful, but rather a source of danger and harm. We have, for example, in the inner corner of the eye a relic of that third eyelid whereby the eagle is enabled to look at the sun. This is a harmless relic, but we have also an appendix, a degenerate organ of digestion, or gland of secretion, which now serves as a center of infection and source of danger. We have likewise a lower bowel, a survival of our hay-eating days, and a cause of auto-intoxication and premature death. Among the sources of trouble, Metchnikoff names the fact that the human male possesses a far greater quantity of sexual energy than is required for the purposes of procreation. This becomes a cause of disharmony and excess. It causes man to wreck his health and destroy himself. Manifestly, this is a serious matter, for if it is true, our efforts to find health and happiness in love are doomed to failure. And Lecky is right when he describes the prostitute as the guardian of virtue, the eternal and necessary scapegoat of humanity. But I do not believe it is true. I think that here is one more case of the endless blundering of scientists and philosophers who attempt to teach physiology, politics, religion, and law without having made a study of economics. I do not believe that the sex troubles of mankind are physiological in their nature, but have their origin in our present system of class privilege. I believe they are caused not by the blunders of nature, but by the blunders of man as a social animal. Let us take a glimpse at primitive man. I choose the Marquesas Islands because we have complete reports about them from numerous observers. Here was a race of people, not interfered with by civilization, who manifested all that overplus of sexual energy to which Metchnikoff calls attention. They placed no restraint whatever upon sex activity, they had no conception of such an idea. Their games and dances were a sex play, and so also in great part was their religion. Yet we do not find that they wrecked themselves. Physically speaking, they were one of the most perfect races of which we have record. Both the men and women were beautiful. They were active and strong from childhood to old age, and here is the significant thing. They were happy. They were a laughing, dancing, singing race. They hardly knew grief or fear at all. They knew how to live, and they enjoyed every process and aspect of their lives, just as children do, naively and simply. This included their sex life, and I think it assures us that there can be no such fundamental physical disharmony in the human organism as the great Russian scientist thought he had discovered. Is it not a fact that throughout nature a superfluity of any kind of energy or product may be a source of happiness, rather than distress? Consider the singing of birds, or consider nature's impulse to cover a field with useless plants, and how, by a little cunning, we are able to turn it into a harvest for our own use. In the life of our bodies, one may show the same thing again and again. We have within us the possibility of, and the impulse toward, more muscular activity than our survival makes necessary. But we do not regard this additional energy as a curse of nature and a peril to our lives. We turn out and play baseball. 
we have an impulse to see more than is necessary. So we climb mountains or go traveling. We have an impulse to hear more. So we go to a concert. We have an impulse to think more. So we play chess or whist or write books and accumulate libraries. Never do we think of these activities as signs of an irrevocable blunder on the part of nature. But about the activities of love, we feel differently. And why is this? If I say that it is because we have an unwholesome and degraded attitude toward love, because as a result of religious superstition we fear it and dare not deal with it honestly, the reader may suspect that I am preparing to hint at some self-indulgence, some form of sex orgy, such as the turkey trot and the bunny hug and the grizzly bear, the shimmy and the toddle and the cuddle. I hasten to explain that I do not mean any of the abnormalities and monstrosities of present-day fashionable life. Neither do I mean that we should set out to emulate the happy cannibals in the South Seas. In the Book of the Mind, I set forth as carefully as I knew how the difference between nature and man, the life of instinct and the life of reason. It is my conviction that if civilized life is to go on, there must be a far wider extension of judgment and self-control in human affairs. Our lost happiness will be found, not by going back to nature, but by going forward to a new and higher state, planned by reason and impelled by moral idealism. But we find ourselves face to face with horrible sex disorders, and a great scientist tells us they are nature's tragic blunder, of which we are the helpless victims. Manifestly, the way to decide this question is to go to nature and see if primitive people, having the same physical organism as ours, had the same troubles and spent their lives in the same misery. If they did, then it may be that we are doomed. But if they did not, then we can say with certainty that it is not nature, but ourselves who have blundered. Our task, then, becomes to apply reason to the problem, to take our present sex arrangements, our field of bad-smelling weeds, and plow it thoroughly, and sow it with good seed, and raise a harvest of happiness and love. It is my belief that, admitting true love, honest and dignified and rational love, it is possible to pour into it any amount of sex energy, to invent a whole new system of beautiful and happy love play. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 Love and Economics maintains that our sex disorders are of social origin due to the displacing of love by money as a motive in mating. If the cause of our sex disorders is not physiological, what is it? Everything in nature must have a cause, and this includes human nature. The actions and feelings of men, both as individuals and as groups. We hear the saying, you can't change human nature. But the fact is that human nature is one of the most changeable things in the world. We can watch it changing from age to age, for better or for worse, and if we had the intelligence to use the forces now at our command, we could mold human nature as precisely as a brewer converts a carload of hops into a certain brand of beer. Voltaire was the author of the saying, Vice and virtue are products like vinegar. Our civilization is based upon industrial exploitation and class privilege. The monopoly of the means of production and the natural sources of wealth by a group. This enables the privileged group to live in idleness upon the labor of the rest of society. It confers unlimited power with practically no responsibility, a strain which not one human being in a thousand has the moral strength to endure. 
history for the past five thousand years is one demonstration after another that the conferring upon a class of power without responsibility means the collapse of that class and the downfall of its civilization so far as concerns the ruling class male what the system of privilege does is to give him unlimited ability to indulge his sex desires what it does for the female is to submit her to the male desires and to abolish that mutuality in sex that interaction between male and female influence which is the very essence of its purpose woman in a predatory society is subject to a double enslavement that of class as well as of sex and the result is the perverting of sexual selection and a constantly increasing tendency towards the survival of the unfit in a state of nature the males compete among themselves for the favor of the female the female is not raped nor is she kidnapped on the contrary she exercises her prerogative she inspects the various male charms which are set before her and selects those which please her according to her deeply planted instincts the result is that the weak and unfit males seldom have the chance to reproduce themselves and the procreating is done by the highest specimens of the type but now we have a world which is ruled by money in which opportunity and indeed survival depend upon money and the whole tendency of society is to make money standards supreme we do not like to admit this of course our instincts revolt against it and our higher faculties reinforce the revolt so we carefully veil our money motives and invent polite phrases to conceal them you will hear people deny it is money which determines admission into what is called society the intimate life of the ruling class they will tell you that it is not money it is good taste refinement a charm of personality and so on but if you analyze all these things you speedily discover that they are made out of money they are symbols of the possession of money devised by those who possess it as a means of keeping themselves apart from those who do not possess it i would safely defy a member of the ruling class to name a single element in what he calls refinement or good taste that is not in its ultimate analysis a symbol of the possession of money let it be the pronunciation of a word or the cut of a coat or the method of handling a fork whatever it may be it is part of a code revealing that the person or more important yet the ancestors of the person have belonged to the leisure class and have had time and opportunity to learn to do things in a certain precise conventional way i say conventional for very frequently these tests have no relationship whatever to reality considered as a matter of common sense and convenience it is a great deal better to eat peas with a spoon and with a fork and to use both a knife and fork in eating lettuce but if you eat peas with a spoon or use a knife on lettuce every member of the ruling class will instantly know that you are an interloper as much so as if you took to throwing the china at your hostess our culture is a money culture our standards are money standards and our sex decisions are based upon money not upon love any man can have money in our society provided the accident of birth favors him and it is everywhere known that any man who has money can get a wife it is certainly not true that any man with no money can get a wife and it is true that most men who have little money have to take wives who have less that is who belong to a lower class according to the world's standards the average young girl of the property classes is trained for marriage as for any other business she is taught to be sexually cold 
but to imitate sexual excitement deliberately so as to arouse it in the male and to keep herself surrounded with a swarm of males this being the basis of her prestige the factor which will cause the eligible man the catch to desire her in polite society this proceeding is known as coquetry or charm and it would be no exaggeration to say that seventy five per cent of all the novels so far written in the world are expositions of this activity also that when we go to the theater we go in order to watch and sympathize with these manifestations of pecuniary sexuality as a rule the young girl knows what she is doing but she is taught to camouflage it to preserve her innocence she would not dream of marrying for money she wants to marry something distinguished that is to say something which has received the stamp of approval from a world which approves money she wants to marry somebody who is elegant who is in good form she wants to marry without having to think about the horrid subject of money at all and so she is carefully chaperoned and confined to a world where nothing but money is to be met in tennyson's poem the northern farmer the old fellow is coaching his son on the subject of marriage and they are driving along a road and the farmer listens to his horse's hoofs and they are saying property 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 the farmer sums up in one sentence the doctrine of pecuniary marriage as it is taught to the ruling class virgin don thee marry for money but go where money is in this process of course the ruling class virgin must spend a great deal of money in order to keep up her own prestige and when she is married she must spend it to keep up the prestige of her unmarried sisters and then of her children as a result of this the only ruling class males who can afford to marry are the rich ones there are always some who are richer and these are the most desirable so the tendency with each generation is to put the period of marriage further off the man has to wait until he has accumulated enough property to satisfy the girl of his desires a girl whom he admires because of her pecuniary prestige he delays and meantime he satisfies his passions with the daughters of the poor as a result of this when he does finally come to marry he is apt to be unlovely and unlovable the woman frequently does not love him at all but takes him cold-bloodedly because he is eligible in that case she is a cold and sexless wife or else after she has married him she discovers his unloveliness and either decides that all men are selfish brutes and reconciles herself to a celibate life or she goes out and preys upon the domestic happiness of other women End of chapter thirty four chapters thirty five thirty six and thirty seven of the book of life by upton sinclair this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35. Marriage and Money. Discusses the causes of prostitution and that higher form of prostitution known as the marriage of convenience. I realize that all these sex problems are complicated. Every case is individual, and in no two cases can you give exactly the same explanation. But it is my thesis that whatever the cause, if you trace down the causes of the cause, you will find economic inequality and class privilege. It is evident in the lives of the rich, and it is even more evident in the lives of the poor who are not permitted the luxury of pretense. The poor live in a world dominated by forces which they seldom understand subjected to enormous pressure which crushes and destroys them without their being able to see it or touch it 
in the world of the poor there is first of all poverty there is insecurity of employment and insufficiency of wage and the daily and hourly terror of starvation and ruin above this is a world of power and luxury a wonderland of marvels and thrills seen through a colored mist of romance the working-class girl born to drudgery and perpetual childbearing has a brief hour in which her cheeks are red and her beauty is ripe and out of the heaven above her steps a male creature panoplied in the armor of ruling class prestige that is to say a dress suit and scattered about him a shower of automobile rides jewelry and candy and flowers she opens her arms to him and then when her brief hour of rapture is past she becomes the domestic drudge of some working man or else the inmate of a brothel it is a custom of social workers and church people seeking data about these painful subjects to interview numbers of prostitutes and question them as to the cause of their fall so you read statistics to the effect that seventeen per cent of prostitution has an economic cause that twenty six per cent is caused by love of finery etc these pious people employed by the ruling class to maintain ruling class prestige by demonstrating that wage slavery has nothing to do with white slavery attain their purpose by restricting the word economic to food and shelter forgetting that young girls do not live by bread alone but also by ribbons and silk stockings and moving picture shows and trips to coney island and everything else that gives a momentary escape from drudgery into joy we all understand of course that the daughters of the rich are entitled to joy and we provide them with it as a matter of course but the daughters of the poor are supposed to work in a cotton mill ten or eleven hours a day from earliest childhood and the joy we provide for them is vicarious as a woman poet sets it forth the golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day the laboring children can look out and see the men at play some years ago my wife and i were invited to meet mrs mary j good a keeper of brothels in the tenderloin who had revolted against the system of police graft and had exposed it in the newspapers my wife questioned her closely as to the psychology of people in her business and she insisted that the majority of prostitutes were not oversexed nor were they feeble-minded they were women who had loved and trusted and had been thrown down as mrs good phrased it they said to themselves never again after this they'll pay as a matter of fact the causes of prostitution are so largely economic that the other factors are hardly worth mentioning the sale of sex is unknown in the savage society and would be unknown in a socialist society if here and there some degenerate individual would rather sell her sex than do her share of honest labor in a free and just world such an individual would become a patient in the psychopathic ward of a public hospital economic forces drive women to prostitution first by direct starvation and second by teaching them money standards of prestige the ideal of living without working which is the heaven achieved by the rich and longed for by the poor contributory to the process are policemen politicians and judges who protect the property of the rich and prey upon the disinherited also newspaper editors college professors priests of god and preachers of jesus who attribute the social evil to original sin or the weakness of human nature so far as men are concerned economic forces operate by three main channels late marriage loveless marriage and drudgery in wives you will find patronizing and maintaining the brothels the following kinds of males first young boys who have been taught that it is manly to gratify their sex impulses second young men who take it for granted that they cannot afford to marry third 
old bachelors who have looked at marriage and decided that it is not a paying proposition. Fourth, married men who have been picked out for their money and have come to the conclusion that good women are necessarily sexless. And finally, married men whose wives have lost the power to charm them by continuous childbearing and the physical and nervous strain of domestic slavery. This latter applies not merely to wives of the poor. It applies to members of the middle classes, and even of the richer classes, because the job of managing many servants is often as trying as the doing of one's own work. To explain how domestic drudgery is caused by economic pressure would require a little essay in itself. The home is the place where the man keeps his sex property apart, under lock and key, and it is, therefore, the portion of our civilization least influenced by modern ideas. Women still drudge in separate kitchens and nurseries, as they have drudged for thousands of years. They cook their dinners over separate fires, and have each their own little group of children, generally ill cared for because the work is done by an untrained amateur. Moreover, the prestige of this home has to be kept up because the social position and future prosperity of the man depend upon it. The children must be dressed in frilled and starched clothing, which makes them miserable and wears out the tempers and pocketbooks of the mothers. Costly entertainments must be given, and twice a day a meal must be prepared for the father of the family. All good wives have learned the ancient formula for the retention of masculine affections. Feed the brute! Living in a world of pecuniary prestige, every particle of the woman's surplus energy must go into some form of ostentation, into buying or making things which are futile and meaningless. In such a blind world, dazed by such a struggle, women become irritable. They lose their sex charm. They forget all about love. So the husband gives up hoping for the impossible, accepts the common idea that love and marriage are incompatible, and adopts the formula that what his wife doesn't know will not hurt her. And, step by step, as economic evolution progresses, as vested wealth becomes more firmly established and claims for itself a larger and larger share of the total product of society, so, step by step, you find the pecuniary ideals becoming more firmly established. You will find marriage becoming more and more a matter of property, and less and less a matter of love. In European countries, there may still be some love marriages among the poor, but in the upper classes there is no longer any pretense of such a thing. And if you spoke of it, you would be considered absurd. In countries of fresh and naive commercialism like America, the women select the men because of their money prestige. But in Germany, the process has gone a step further. The men are so firmly established in their class positions that they insist upon being bought with a fortune. The same is true when titled foreigners condescend to visit our land of the dollar. They will stoop to a vulgar American wife only in case her parents will make a direct settlement of a fortune upon the husband. And then they take her back home and find their escape from boredom in the highly cultivated mistresses of their own land. Everywhere on the continent, and in Great Britain also, it is accepted that marriages are matters of business, and only incidentally and very slightly of affection. The initiative is commonly taken, not by the young people, but by the heads of the families. Preliminary protocols are exchanged, and then the family solicitors sit down and bargain over the matter. If they were making a deal for a carload of hams, they would be governed by the market price of hams at the moment, also by the reputation of that particular brand of ham, and similarly, in the case of marriage, they are governed by the prestige of the family names, and the market price of husbands prevailing. Always the man exacts a cash settlement, and in Catholic countries, 
he becomes the outright owner of all the property of his wife, thus reducing her completely to the status of a chattel. If any young couple dares to break through these laws of their class, the whole class unites to trample them down. One of the greatest of English novelists, George Meredith, wrote his greatest novel, The Ordeal of Richard Feverell, to show how, under the most favorable circumstances, the union of a ruling class youth with a farmer's daughter could result in nothing but shipwreck. The country in which the property marriage is most firmly established is probably France, and in France the rights of nature are recognized in a kind of supplementary union, which constitutes what is known as the domestic triangle, or in the French language, la vie trois. The young girl of the French ruling class is guarded every moment of her life like a prisoner in jail. She is sold in marriage and is expected to bear her husband an heir, possibly two or three children. After that, she is considered not under the law or by the church, but by the general common sense of the community, to be free to seek satisfaction of her love needs. Her husband has mistresses, and she has a lover, and to that lover she is faithful, and in her dealings with him she is guided by an elaborate and subtle code. Practically all French fiction and drama deal with this life in threes, and the complications and tragedies which result from it. I name one novel, simply because it happens to be the last that I myself have read, The Red Lily, by Anatole France. Of course, every human being knows in his heart that this is a monstrous arrangement. And there are periods of revolt when real feelings surge up in the hearts of men, and we have stories of true love, young and unselfish love, such, for example, as Goethe's Hermann und Dorothea, or St. Pierre's Paul and Virginia, or Halevy's Lab Constantine. Everybody reads these stories and weeps over them, but nobody knows that they are like the romantic shepherds and shepherdesses of the ancient regime. They never had any existence in reality, and are not meant to be taken seriously. If anybody attempts to carry them into action, or to preach them seriously to the young, then we know that we are dealing with a disturber of the foundations of the social order, a dangerous and incendiary villain and would give him a name which sends a shudder down the spine of every friend of law and order, we call him a free lover. I see before my eyes the wretch cowering upon the witness stand, and the virtuous district attorney, who has perhaps spent the previous night in a brothel, pointing a finger of accusing wrath in his face, and thundering, Do you believe in free love? The wretch, if he is wise, will not hesitate or parley. He will not ask what the district attorney means by love, or what he means by freedom. Here, in very truth, is the case where he who hesitates is lost. Let the wretch instantly answer, No, he does not believe in free love. He believes in love that pays cash as it goes. He believes in love that investigates carefully the prevailing market conditions, decides upon a reasonable price, has contracted in writing, and lives up to the bargain till death do us part. If the witness be a woman, let the answer be that she believes in slave love, that she expects to be sold for the benefit of her parents, the prestige of her family, and the social position of her future offspring. Let her say that she will be a loyal and devoted servant, and will never do anything at any time to invalidate the contract which is signed for her by her parents or guardians. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 Love versus Lust Discusses the sex impulse, its use and misuse, when it should be followed, and when repressed. We have considered the sex disorders of our age and their causes. We have now to grope our way toward a basis of sanity and health in these vital matters. Consider man, as Menchnikoff describes him, with his overplus of sex energy. 
from early youth he is besieged by impulses and desires and as a rule is left entirely uninstructed on the subject having to pick up his ideas from the conversation of older lads who have nothing but misinformation and perversions to give him nearly all these older lads declare and believe that it is necessary to gratify the sex impulse that physically it is harmful not to do so i have even heard physicians and trainers maintain that idea opposed to them are the official moralists and preachers of religion who declare that to follow the sex impulse except when officially sanctioned by the church is to commit sin at different times in my life i have talked with all kinds of people young and old men and women doctors and clergymen teachers and trainers of athletes and a few wise and loving mothers who have talked with their own boys and other boys as a result i have come to agree with neither side in this debate i believe that there is a distinction which must be drawn and i ask you to consider it carefully and to bear it in mind in all that i say on the problem of happiness and health in sex i believe that a normal man is one being manifesting himself in various aspects physical emotional intellectual i believe that all these aspects of human activity go normally together and cannot normally be separated and that the separation of them is a perversion and a source of harm i believe that the sex impulse as it normally manifests itself and would manifest itself in a man if he were living a normal life is an impulse which includes every aspect of the man's being it is not merely physical desire and emotional excitement it is intellectual curiosity a deep and intense interest not merely in the body but in the mind and heart and personality of the woman i appreciate that there is opportunity for controversy here as a matter of psychology it is not easy to separate instinct from experience to state whether a certain impulse is innate or acquired some may argue that savages know nothing about idealism and sex neither do those modern savages whom we breed in city slums some may make the same assertion concerning a great mass of loutish and sensual youth we have got so far from health and soundness that it is hard to be sure what is normal and what is ideal but without going into metaphysics i think we can reasonably make the following statement concerning the sex impulse at its first appearance in the average healthy youth in civilized societies that this impulse going to the roots of the being affecting every atom of energy and every faculty is accompanied not merely by happiness but by sympathetic delight in the happiness of the woman by interest in the woman by desire to be with her to stay with her and share her life and protect her from harm in what i have to say about the subject from now on i shall describe this condition of being and feeling by the word love but now suppose that men should for some reason or other evolve a set of religious ideas which denied love and repudiated love and called it a sin and a humiliation or suppose there should be an economic condition which made love a peril so that the young couple which yielded to love would be in danger of starvation or of seeing their children starve suppose there should be evolved classes of men and women held by society in a condition of permanent semi-starvation then under such conditions the impulse to love would become a trap and a source of terror then the energies of a great many men would be devoted to suppressing love and strangling it in themselves then the intellectual and spiritual sanctions of love would be withdrawn the beauty and charm and joy would go out of it and it would become a starving beggar at the gates 
or a thief skulking in the night-time, or an assassin with a dagger and club. In other words, sex would become all the horror that it is today, in the form of purchased vice, and more highly purchased marriage, and secret shame, and obscure innuendo. So we should have what is, in a civilized man, a perversion, the possibility of love which is physical alone, a purely animal thing in a being who is not purely animal, but is body, mind, and spirit altogether. So it would be possible for pitiful, unhappy man, driven by the blind urge of nature to conceive of desiring a woman only in the body and with no care about what she felt, or what she thought, or what became of her afterwards. That purely physical sex desire I will indicate in our future discussions by the only convenient word that I can find, which is lust. The word has religious implications, so I explain that I use it in my own meaning as above. There is a great deal of what the churches call lust, which I call true and honest love. On the other hand, in Christian churches today, there are celebrated innumerable marriages between innocent young girls and mature men of property, which I describe as legalized and consecrated lust. We are now in position to make a fundamental distinction. I assert the proposition that there does not exist in any man at any time in his life or in any condition of his health, a necessity for yielding to the impulses of lust. And I say that no man can yield to them without degrading his nature and injuring himself, not merely morally, but mentally, and in the long run physically. I assert that it is the duty of every man, at all times and under all circumstances, to resist the impulses of lust, to suppress and destroy them in his nature by whatever expenditure of will power and moral effort may be required. I know physicians who maintain the unpopular thesis that serious damage may be done to the physical organism of both man and woman by the long-continued suppression of the sex life. Let me make plain that I am not disagreeing with such men. I do not deny that repression of the sex life may do harm. What I do deny is that it does any harm to repress a physical desire which is unaccompanied by the higher elements of sex, that is to say, by affection, admiration, and unselfish concern for the sex partner and her welfare. When I advise a man to resist and suppress and destroy the impulse toward lust in his nature, I am not telling him to live a sexless life. I am telling him that if he represses lust, then love will come, whereas if he yields to lust, then love may never come. He may make himself incapable of love, incapable of feeling it, or of trusting it, or of inspiring it in a woman. And I say that if, on the other hand, he resists lust, he will pour all the energies of his being into the channels of affection and idealism. Instead of having his thoughts diverted by every passing female form, his energies will become concentrated upon the search for one woman who appeals to him in permanent and useful ways. We may be sure that nature has not made men and women incompatible, but on the contrary, has provided for fulfillment of the desires of both. The man will find some woman who is looking for the thing which he has to offer, that is, love. And now, what about the suppression of love? Here I am willing to go as far as any physician could desire, and possibly farther. Speaking generally, and concerning normal adult human beings, I say that the suppression of love is a crime against nature and life. I say that long-continued and systematic suppression of love exercises a devastating effect, 
not merely upon the body, but upon the mind and all the energies of being. I say that the doctrine of the suppression of love, no matter by whom it is preached, is an affront to nature and to life, and an insult to the creator of life. I say that it is the duty of all men and women not merely to assert their own right to love, but to devote their energies to a war upon whatever ideas and conventions and laws in society deny the love right. The belief that long-continued suppression of love does grave harm has been strongly reinforced in the last few years by the discovery of psychoanalysis, a science which enables us to explore our unconscious minds and lay bare the secrets of nature's psychic workshop. These revelations have made plain that sex plays an even more important part in our mental lives than we realized. Sex feeling manifests itself not merely in grown people, but in the tiniest infants. In these latters, it has, of course, no object in the opposite sex, but the physical sensations are there, and some of their outward manifestations, and... As the infant grows and realizes the outside world, the feelings come to center upon others, the parents first of all. These manifestations must be guided, and sometimes repressed, but if this is done violently by means of terror, the consequences may be very harmful. The wrong impulses or the terrors may survive as a complex in the unconscious mind and cause a long chain of nervous disorders and physical weaknesses in the adult. These things are no matter of guesswork. They have been proven as thoroughly as any scientific discovery, and are used in a new technique of healing. Of course, as with every new theory, there are unbalanced people who carry it to extremes. There are fanatics of Freudianism who talk as if everything in the human unconsciousness were sex. But that need not blind us to the importance of these new discoveries, and the confirmation they bring to the thesis that sane and normal love, wisely guided by common sense and reasoned knowledge, is at a certain period of life a vital necessity to every sound human being. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 Celibacy versus Chastity The ideal of the repression of the sex impulse as against the ideal of its guidance and cultivation. There are two words which we need in this discussion, and as they are generally used loosely, they must now be defined precisely. The two words are celibacy and chastity. We define celibacy as the permanent and systematic suppression of love. We define chastity, on the other hand, as the permanent and systematic suppression of lust. Chastity, as the word is here used, is not a denial of love, but a preparing for it. It is the practice and the ideal, necessary especially in the young, of consecrating their beings to the search for love and to becoming worthy for love. In that sense, we regard chastity as one of the most essential virtues in the young. It is widely taught today, but ineffectively, because unintelligently and without discrimination. Because, in other words, it is confused with celibacy, which is a perversion of life, and one of humanity's intellectual and moral diseases. The origin of the ideal of celibacy is easy to understand. At a certain stage in the human development, the eyes of the mind are opened, and to some man comes a revelation of the life of altruism and sympathetic imagination. To use the common phrase, the man discovers his spiritual nature. But under the conditions then prevailing, all the world outside him is in a conspiracy to strangle that nature, to drag it down and trample it into the mire. One of the most powerful of these destructive agencies, as it seems to the man, is sex. 
by means of sex he is laid hold upon by strange and terrible creatures who do not understand his higher vision but seek only to prey upon him and to use him for their convenience at the worst they rob him of everything money health time and reputation at best they saddle him and bridle him put him in harness and set him to dragging a heavy load in the words of a wise old man of the world francis bacon he who marries and has children gives hostages to fortune in a world wherein war pestilence and famine held sway the man of family had but slight chance of surviving as a philosopher or prophet or saint discovering in himself a deep-rooted and overwhelming impulse to fall into this snare he imagined a devil working in his heart so he fled away to the desert and hid in a cave and starved himself and lashed himself with whips and allowed worms and lice to devour his body in an effort to destroy in himself the impulse of sex so the world had monasteries and a religious culture not of much use but better than nothing and so we still have in the world celibate priesthoods and what is more dangerous to our social health we have the old degraded notions of the essential vileness of the sex relationship notions permeating all our thoughts our literature our social conventions and laws making it impossible for us to attain true wisdom and health and happiness in love i say the ideal of celibacy is an intellectual and moral disease it is a violation of nature and nature devotes all her energies to breaking it down and she always succeeds there never has been a celibate religious order no matter how noble its origin and how strict its discipline which has not sooner or later become a breeding place of loathsome unnatural vices and sooner or later the ideal begins to weaken and common sense to take its place and so we read in history about popes who had sons and we see about us priests who have nieces and attractive servant girls make the acquaintance of any police sergeant in any big city of america and get him to chatting on friendly terms and you will discover that it is a common experience for the police and their raids upon brothels to catch representatives of celibate religious orders as one old-timer in the tenderloin of new york said to me of course we don't make any trouble for the good fathers nor was this merely because the old sergeant was an irishman and a catholic it was because deep down in his heart he knew as every man knows that the craving of a man for the society and companionship of a woman is an overwhelming craving which will break down every barrier that society may set against it there's another form of celibacy which is not based upon religious ideas but is economic in its origin and purely selfish in its nature it is unorganized and unreasoned and is known as bachelorhood it has as its complements the institutions of old maidenhood and of prostitution both forms of celibacy the religious and the economic are entirely incompatible with chastity which is only possible where love is recognized and honored chastity is a preparation for love and if you forbid love whether by law or by social convention or by economic strangling you at once make chastity a utopian dream you may preach it from your pulpits until you are black in the face you may call out your billy sundays to rave and dance and go into convulsions you may threaten hellfire and brimstone until you throw whole audiences into spasms but you will never make them chaste on the contrary strange and horrible as it may seem those very excitements will turn into sexual excitements before your eyes so subtle is our ancient mother nature and so determined to have her own way the abominable old ideal of celibacy with its hatred of womanhood its distrust of happiness its terror of devils is not yet dead in the world it is in our very bones 
and is forever appearing in new and supposed to be modern forms. Take a man like Tolstoy, who gained enormous influence not merely in Russia, but throughout the world among people who think themselves liberal, humanitarians, pacifists, philosophic anarchists. Tolstoy's notions about sex, his teachings and writings, and likewise his behavior toward it, were one continuous manifestation of disease. All through his youth and middle years as an army officer, popular novelist, and darling of the aristocracy, his life was one of license, and the attitude toward women he thus acquired he never got out of his thoughts to his last day. Gorky, meeting him in his old age, reports his conversation as unpleasantly obscene, and his whole attitude toward women one of furtive and unwholesome slyness. But Tolstoy was in other ways a great soul, one of the great moral consciences of humanity. He looked about him at a world gone mad with greed and hate, and he made convulsive efforts to reform his own spirit and escape the power of evil. As regards sex, his thought took the form of ancient Christian celibacy. Man must repudiate the physical side of sex. He must learn to feel toward women a pure affection, the relationship of brother and sister. In his novel Resurrection, Tolstoy portrays a young aristocrat who meets a beautiful peasant girl and conceives for her such a noble and generous emotion, but gradually the poison of physical sex desire steals into his mind, he seduces her, and she becomes a prostitute. Later in life, when he discovers the crime he has committed, he humbles himself and follows her into exile and wins her to God and goodness by the unselfish and unsexual love which he should have maintained from the beginning. It was Tolstoy's teaching that all men should aspire toward this kind of love, and when it was pointed out to him that if this doctrine were to be applied universally, the human race would become extinct. His answer was that there was no reason to fear that, because only a few people would be good enough and strong enough to follow the right ideal. Here you see the reincarnation of the old Christian notion that we are conceived in sin and born in iniquity. We may be pure and good and cease to exist, or we may sin and let life continue. Some choose to sin, and these sinners hand down their sinful qualities to the future and so virtue and goodness remain what they have always been, a futile crying out in the wilderness by a few religious prophets, whom God has sent to call down destruction upon a world which he had made, through some mistake never satisfactorily explained. It is easy nowadays to persuade intelligent people to laugh at such a perverted view of life, but the truth is that this attitude toward sex is written not merely into our religious creeds and formulas, but into most of our laws and social conventions. It is this, which for convenience I will call the monkish view of love, which prevents our dealing frankly and honestly with its problems, distinguishing between what is wrong and what is right, and doing anything effective to remedy the evils of marriage plus prostitution. That is why I have tried so carefully to draw the distinction between what I call love and what I call lust, between the ideal of celibacy, which is a perversion, and the idea of chastity, which must form an essential part of any regimen of true and enduring love. End of chapter 37 Chapters 38 and 39 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 38 The Defense of Love Discusses passionate love, its sanction, its place in marriage, and its preservation in marriage. I have before me, as I write, a newspaper article by Robert Blatchford, a great writer and great man. 
he is dealing with the subject of love and marriage and his doctrine is summed up in the following sentences there is a difference between loving a woman and falling in love with her the love one falls into is a sweet illusion but that fragrant dream does not last in marriage there are no fairies this expresses one of the commonest ideas in the world passionate love is one thing and marriage is another and different thing and it is no more possible to reconcile them than to mix oil and water our notions of romantic love took their rise in the middle ages from the songs and narratives of the troubadours and this whole tradition was based upon the glorification of illegitimate and extramarital love that tradition has ruled the world of art ever since and rules it today i do not exaggerate when i say that it is the conventional view of grand opera and the drama of moving pictures and novels that impassioned and thrilling love is found before marriage and is found in adultery and in temptations to adultery but is never found in marriage i have a pretty varied acquaintance with the literature of the world and i have sat and thought for quite a while without being able to recall a single portrait of life which contradicts this thesis and certainly any one familiar with literature could name ten thousand novels and dramas and grand operas which support the thesis english and american puritanism have beaten a tradition down to this extent the novelist portrays the glories and thrills of young love and carries it as far as the altar and the orange blossoms and white ribbons and showers of rice and stops he leads you to assume that this delightful rapture continues forever after but he does not attempt to show it to you he would not dare attempt to show it because the general experience of men and women in marriage would make him ridiculous so he runs away from the issue if he tells you a story of married life it is a story of a triangle the thrills of love imperiling marriage and either crushed out or else wrecking the lives of the victims such is the unanimous testimony of all our arts today and i submit it as evidence of the fact that there must be something vitally wrong with our marriage system personally i am prepared to go as far as the extreme sex radical in the defense of love and the right to love i believe that love is the most precious of all gifts of life i accept its sanctions and its authority i believe that it is to be cherished and obeyed and not to be run away from or strangled in the heart i believe it is the voice of nature speaking in the depths of us and speaking from a wisdom deeper than we have yet attained or may attain for many centuries to come and when i say love i do not mean merely affection i do not mean merely the habit of living in the same home which is the basis of marriage as blatchford describes it what i mean is the love of the poets and the dreamers the young love which is thrill and ecstasy a glorification and a transfiguration of the whole of life i say that far from giving up this love for marriage it is the true purpose of marriage to preserve this love and perpetuate it to save repetition and waste of words let us agree that from now on when i use the word love i mean the passionate love of those who are in love i believe that it is the right of men and women to be in love and that there is no true marriage unless they are in love and stay in love I believe that it is possible to apply reason to love to learn to understand love and the ways of love to protect it and keep it alive in marriage blatchford writes the sentence matrimony cannot be all honeymoon i answer that assuredly it can be and if you ask me how i know i tell you that i know in the only way we really know anything 
because I have proven it in my own life. I say that if men and women would recognize the perpetuation of the honeymoon as the purpose of marriage, and would devote to that end one hundredth part of the intelligence and energy they now devote to the killing of their fellow human beings in war, we might have an end to the wretched romantic tradition, which makes the most sacred emotion of the human heart into a sneak thief, skulking in the darkness, entering our lives by the back alleys and secret stairways, while greed and worldly pomp, dullness and boredom, parade in by the front entrance. In the first place, what is love, young love, passionate love, the love of those who fall in? I know a certain lady, well versed in worldly affairs, who says that it is at once the greatest nonsense and the deadliest snare in the world. This lady was trained as a coquette. She, and all the young ladies she knew, made it their business to cause men to fall in love with them, and their prestige was based upon their skill in that art. So to them, love was a joke, and men in love were victims, whether ridiculous or pitiable. To this I answer that I know nothing in life that cannot be faked, but an imitation has value only as it resembles something that is real and that has real value. I am aware that it is possible for a society to be so corrupted, so given up to the admiration of imitations, of the paint and powder and silk stocking clad ankle kind of love, that true and genuine love interest, with its impulse to self-sacrifice and self-consecration, is no longer felt or understood. I am aware that in such a society it is possible for even the very young to be so sophisticated that what they take to be love is merely vanity, the worship of money, and the grace and charm which the possession of money confers. I have known girls who were head over heels in love and thought it was with a man, when quite clearly they were in love with a dress suit or a social position. In such a society it is hard to talk about natural emotions and deep and abiding and disinterested affections. Nevertheless, amid all the false conventions, the sham glories and cowardices of our civilization, there abides in the heart the craving for true love, and the idea of it leaps continually into flame in the young. In spite of the ridicule of the elders, in spite of blunders and tragic failures, in spite of dishonesties and deceptions, nevertheless, it continues to happen that out of a thousand maidens, the youth finds one whose presence thrills him with a new and terrible emotion, whose lightest touch makes him shiver, almost makes his knees give way. If you will recall what I have written about instinct and reason, you will know that I am not a blind worshipper of our ancient mother nature. I am not humble in my attitude toward her, but perfectly willing to say when I know more than she does. On the other hand, when I know nothing or next to nothing, I am shy of contradicting my ancient mother, and disposed to give respectful heed to her promptings. One of the things about which we know almost nothing at present is the subject of eugenics. We are only at the beginning of trying to find out what matings produce the best offspring. Meantime, we ought to consider those indications which nature gives us, just as we consider her advice about what food to eat and what rest to take. It is not my idea that science will ever take men and women and marry them in cold blood, as today we breed our cattle. What I think will happen is that young men and women will meet one another, as they do at present, and will find the love impulse awakening. They will then submit their love to investigation as to whether they should follow that impulse or should wait. In other words, I do not believe that science will ever do away with the raptures of love, but will make itself the servant of these raptures. Finding out what they mean, and how their precious essence may be preserved. 
I perfectly understand that the begetting of children is not the only purpose of love. The children have to be reared and trained, which means that a home has to be founded, and the parents have to learn to cooperate. They have to have common aims in life, and temperaments sufficiently harmonious so that they can live in the house together without tearing each other's eyes out. This means that in any civilized society all impulses of love have to be subjected to severe criticism. I intend, before long, to show just how I think parents and guardians should cooperate with young people in love, to help them to understand in advance what they are doing and how it may be possible for them to make their love permanent and successful. For the moment, I merely state, to avoid any possible misunderstanding, that I am the last person in the world to favor what is called blind love, the unthinking abandonment to an impulse of sex passion. What I am trying to show is that the passionate impulse, the passionate excitement of the young couple, is the material out of which love and marriage are made. Passion is a part of us, and a fundamental part. If we do not find a place for it in marriage, it will seek satisfaction outside of marriage, and that means lying or the wrecking of the marriage, or both. Passion is what gives to love and marriage its vitality, its energy, its drive. In fact, it gives these qualities to the whole character. It is a vivifying force, transfiguring the personality, and, if it is crushed and repressed, the whole life of that person is distorted. Yet it is a fact which every physician knows that millions of women marry and live their whole lives without ever knowing what passionate gratification is. As a consequence of this, millions of men take it for granted that there are good women and bad women, and that only the latter are interesting. This, of course, is simply one of the abnormalities caused by the supplanting of love by money as a motive in marriage. Love becomes a superfluity and a danger, and all the forces of society, including institutionalized religion, combine to outlaw it and drive it underground. Or we might say that they lock it in a dungeon and that the supreme delight of all painters, poets, musicians, dramatists, and novelists of all climes and all periods of history is to portray the escape of the young god from these imprisonments. The story is told in six words of an old English ballad. Love will find out the way. Is it not obvious that there must be something vitally wrong with our institutions and conventions in matters of sex, when here exists this eternal war between our moralists and our artists? Why not make up our minds, what we really believe, whether it is true that poets are, as Shelley said, the unacknowledged legislators of mankind, or whether they are, as Plato declared, false teachers and seducers of the young? If they are the latter, let us have done with them. Let us drive them from the state, together with lovers and all other impassioned persons. But if, on the other hand, it is truth the poets tell about life, then let us take the young god out of his dungeon and bring him into our homes by the front door, and cast out the false gods of vanity and greed and worldly prestige, which now sit in his place. End of chapter 38 chapter 39 birth control deals with the prevention of conception as one of the greatest of man's discoveries releasing him from nature's enslavement and placing the keys of life in his hands i assume that you have followed my argument and are prepared to consider seriously whether it may be possible to establish love in marriage as the sex institution of civilized society. If you really wish to bring such an institution into existence, the first thing you have to do is to accomplish the social revolution. 
that is you must wipe out class control of society and prestige based upon money exploitation but that is a vast change and will take time and meanwhile we have to live and wish to live with as little misery as possible so the practical question becomes this suppose that you as an individual wish to find as much happiness and love as may now be possible what counsel have i to offer if you are young you wish this advice for yourself while if you are mature you wish it for your children i will put my advice under four heads first marriage for love second birth control third early marriage fourth education for marriage the first of these we have considered at some length a part of the process of social revolution is personal conversion the giving up by every individual of the worldly ideal the surrender of luxury and self-indulgence the consecrating of one's life to self-education and the cause of social justice and do not think that that is an easy thing or an unimportant thing a thing to be taken for granted on the contrary it is something that most of us have to struggle with at every hour of our lives because respect for property and worldly conventions has become one of our deepest instincts our whole society is poisoned with it and i can count on the fingers of one hand the people i have known in my life who have completely escaped from it it is not merely a question of refusing to marry except for love it is a question of refusing to love except for honest and worthy qualities it is a question of saving our children from the damnable forces of snobbery which lay siege to their young minds and destroy the best impulses of their hearts while we in our blindness are still thinking of them as babies of the other three topics that i have suggested i begin with birth control because it is the most fundamental and most important without birth control there can be no freedom no happiness no permanence in love and there can be no mastery of life birth control is one of the great fundamental achievements of the human reason as important to the life of mankind as a discovery of fire or the invention of printing birth control is the deliverance of womankind and therefore of mankind also from the blind and insane fecundity of nature which created us animals and would keep us animals forever if we did not rebel ever since the dawn of history and probably for long ages before that our race has been struggling against this blind insanity of nature poor bewildered theodore roosevelt stormed at what he called race suicide thinking it was some brand new and terrible modern corruption but nowhere do we find a primitive tribe nowhere in history do we find a race which did not seek to save itself from overgrowth and consequent starvation they did not know enough to prevent conception but they did the best they could by means of abortion and infanticide and because today superstition keeps the priceless knowledge of contraception from the vast majority of women these crude savage methods still prevail and we have our million abortions a year in the united states assuming that something near one-fourth of our population consists of women capable of bearing children we have one woman in twenty-five going through this agonizing and health-wrecking experience every year they go through with it you understand regardless of everything all the moralists and preachers and priests with their hell-fire and brimstone they go through with it because we have both marriage without love and love without marriage also because we permit some ten or twenty per cent of our total population to suffer the pangs of perpetual starvation because more than half our farms are mortgaged 
or occupied by tenants, and some ten or twenty percent of our workers are out of jobs all the time. Some of our women know about birth control. They are the rich women who get what they want in this world. They object to the humiliations and inconveniences of childbearing, and some of them raise one or two children, and others of them raise poodle dogs. Also, our middle classes have found out, our doctors and lawyers and college professors, and people of that sort, but we deliberately keep the knowledge from our foreign populations, by the terrors which the church has at its command. And what is the practical consequence of this procedure? It is that while all our Anglo-Saxon stock, those who founded our country and established its institutions, are gradually removing themselves from the face of the earth. Our ignorant and helpless populations, whether in city slums or on tenant farms, are multiplying like rabbits. Read Jack London's The Valley of the Moon, and see what is happening in California. You will find the same thing happening in any portion of the United States where you take the trouble to use your own eyes. Now, I try to repress such impulses toward race prejudice as I find in myself. I am willing to admit, for the sake of this argument, that in the course of time all the races that are now swarming in America, Portuguese and Japanese, and Mexican and French Canadian and Polish and Hungarian and Slovakian, are capable of just as high intellectual development as our ancestors who wrote the Declaration of Independence. But no one who sees the conditions under which they now live can deny that it will take a good deal of labor, teaching them and training them, as well as scrubbing them, to accomplish that result. And what a waste of energy, what a farce it makes of culture, to take the people who have already been scrubbed and taught and trained for self-government, and exterminate them, and raise up others in their place. It seems time that we gave thought to the fundamental question whether or not there is something self-destroying in the very process of culture. Unless we can answer this, we might as well give up our visions and our efforts to lift the race. Theodore Roosevelt stormed at birth control for something like ten years, and it would be interesting if we could know how many Anglo-Saxon babies he succeeded in bringing into the world by his preachments. If what he wanted was to correct the balance between native and foreign births, how much more sensible to have taught birth control to those poor pathetic half-starved and overworked foreign mothers of our slums and tenant farms? I can wager that for every Anglo-Saxon baby that Theodore Roosevelt brought into the world by his preachings, he could have kept out 10,000 foreign slum babies if only he had lent his aid to Margaret Sanger. Ah, but he wanted all the babies to be born, you say. I see before me the face of a certain devout old Christian lady, known to me, who settles the question by the Bible quotation, be fruitful and multiply. But what avails it to follow this biblical advice if we allow one out of five of the newborn infants to perish from lack of scientific care before they are two years old? What avails it if we send them to school hungry, as we do 22% of the public school children in New York City? What avails it if we allow venereal disease to spread, so that a large percentage of the babies are deformed and miserable? What avails it if, when they are fully grown, we can think of nothing better to do with them than to take them by millions at a time and dress them up in uniforms and send them out to be destroyed by poison gases? Would it not be the part of common sense to establish universal birth control for at least a year or two until we have learned to take care of our newly born babies and to feed our school children and to protect our youths from vice and to abolish poverty and war from the earth these are the social aspects of birth control 
there are also to be considered what i might call the personal aspects of it because young people do not know about it and have no way to find out about it they dare not marry and so the amount of vice in the world is increased because married women do not know about it love is turned to terror and marital happiness is wrecked because the harmless and proper methods are not sensibly taught people use harmful methods which cause nervous disorders and wreck marital happiness and break up homes thorough and sound knowledge about birth control is just as essential to happiness in marriage as knowledge of diet is necessary to health or as knowledge of economics is necessary to intelligent action as a voter and citizen the suppression by law of knowledge of birth control is just as grave a crime against human life as ever was committed by religious bigotry in the blackest days of the spanish inquisition now this law stands on the statute books of our country and if i should so much as hint to you in this book what you need to know or even where you can find out about it i should be liable to five years in jail and a fine of five thousand dollars and every person who mailed a copy of this book or any advertisement of this book would be in the same plight but there is not yet a law to prohibit agitation against the law so the first thing i say to every reader of this book is that they should obtain a copy of the birth control review published at 104 fifth avenue in new york and also should join the voluntary parenthood league 206 broadway new york get the literature of these organizations and circulate them and help spread the light as to the knowledge which you need the only advice i am allowed to give is that you should seek it seek it and persist in seeking until you find it ask everyone you know and ask particularly among enlightened people those who are willing to face the facts of human life and trust in reason and common sense i do not know if i am violating the law and thus telling you how to find out about birth control one of the charming features of this law and others against the spreading of knowledge is that they will never tell you in advance what you may say but leave you to say it and take your chances i believe that i am not violating any law when i tell you that there are a half dozen simple inexpensive and entirely harmless methods of preventing undesired parenthood without the destruction of the marital relationship i am one of those who for many years believed that the destruction of the marital relationship was the only proper and moral method i was brought up to take the monkish view of love i thought it was an animal thing which required some outside justification i had been taught nothing else but now i have had personal experience of other justifications of love and i believe that love is a beautiful and joyful relationship which not merely requires no other justification but confers justification upon many other things in life i used to believe in that old ideal of celibacy thinking it is a fine spiritual exercise but since then i have looked out on life and have found so many interesting things to do so much important work calling for attention that i do not have to invent any artificial exercises for my spirit i have looked at humanity and brought myself to recognize the plain common sense fact that whatever superfluous energy i may have to waste upon artificial spirituality the great mass of the people have no such energy to spare they need all their energies to get a living for themselves and for their wives and little ones they have their sex impulses and will follow them and the only question is shall they follow them wisely or unwisely the religious people decide that sexual indulgence is wrong and they impose a penalty and what is that penalty 
a poor unwanted little waif of a soul which never sinned and had nothing to do with the matter is brought into a hostile world to suffer neglect perhaps starvation in order to punish parents who did not happen to be sufficiently strong-willed to practice continence in marriage i used to believe that there was benefit to health and increase of power whether physical or mental in the celibate life i have tried both ways of life and as a result i know that that old idea is nonsense i know now that love is a natural function of course like any other function it can be abused just as hunger may become gluttony sleeping may become sluggishness getting the money to pay one's way through life may become ferocious avarice but we do not on this account refuse ever to eat or sleep or get money to pay our debts i do not say that i believe i say i know that free and happy love guided by wisdom and sound knowledge is not merely conducive to health but is in the long run necessary to health people who condemn birth control always argue as if one wished to teach this knowledge indiscriminately to the young and perhaps it is natural that those who oppose the use of reason should assume that others are as irrational as themselves all i can say is that i no more believe in teaching birth control to the young than i believe in feeding beefsteak to nursing infants there is a period in life for beefsteaks or if my vegetarian friends prefer for lentil hash and peanut butter sandwiches in exactly the same way there is a time for teaching the fundamentals of sex and another time for teaching the art of happiness in marriage which includes birth control that brings me by a very pleasant transition to the other two subjects which i have promised to discuss early marriage and education for marriage end of chapter 39 Chapters 40, 41, and 42 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 40 Early Marriage Discusses love marriages, how they can be made, and the duty of parents in respect to them. I have shown how economic forces in our society make for later and later marriage and at the present time economic forces are so overwhelming that all other forces are hardly worth mentioning in comparison you are let us say the mother of a boy of eighteen and you have what you call common sense meaning thereby a grasp of the money facts of life if your darling boy of eighteen should come to you with a grave face and announce mother dear i have met a girl i love and we have decided that we want to get married you would consider that the most absurd thing you had ever heard in all your born days and you would tell the lad that he was a baby and to run along and play if he persisted in his crazy notion you and your husband and all the brothers and sisters and relatives and friends both of the boy and the girl would set to work by scolding and ridiculing to make life a misery for them and ninety-nine times out of a hundred you would break down the young couple's marital intention but now let us try another supposition let us suppose that your darling boy of eighteen should come to you again and say mother dear some of the boys are going to spend this evening in a brothel and i have decided to go along would you think that was the most absurd thing you had ever heard in all your born days or would you answer yes of course my boy that is what i had in mind when i made you give up the girl you loved no you would not answer that but here is the vital fact it does not matter what you would answer for you would never have a chance to answer when a mother's darling wants to get married he comes and asks his mother's blessing but never does a mother's darling ask the blessing before he goes with the other boys to a brothel 
he just goes and maybe he borrows the money from some other fellow and the next day tells you he went to the theater or maybe he picks up some poor man's daughter on the street and takes her into the park or up on the roof of a tenement some such thing he does to find satisfaction for an instinct which you in your worldly wisdom or your heavenly piety spurn and ridicule i do not wish to exaggerate if you are an exceptionally wise and tactful mother you may keep the confidence of your boy and guide him day by day through his temptations and miseries and keep him chaste but the more you try that the more apt you will be to come to my conclusion that late marriage is a crime against the race the more aware you will be of the danger either that his boy friends may break him down or that some lewd woman may come to his bedroom in the night-time never will you be able to be quite sure that he is not lying to you because of his shame and the pain he cannot bear to inflict upon you never will you be quite sure that he is not hiding some cruel disease sneaking off to some quack who takes his money and leaves him worse than before until finally he shoots off his head as happened to a nephew of an old and dear friend of mine such is the problem of the mother of a son and now what about the mother of a daughter this seems much simpler because your daughter is not generally troubled with sex cravings and if you teach her the proprieties and see that she is carefully chaperoned you may reasonably hope that she will be chaste but some day you expect that she will marry and then comes your problem if you are the usual mother you are looking for someone who can maintain her in the state of life to which she is accustomed if a fairy prince would come along or a plaster saint you would be pleased but failing that you will take a successful businessman one who has made his way in the world and secured himself a position but turn back to the figures i gave you a while ago if this man is thirty years of age there is at least a fifty-fifty chance that he has had some venereal disease and while the doctors claim to cure these diseases absolutely we must bear in mind that doctors are human and sometimes claim more than they perform every doctor will admit if you pin him down that these diseases burrow deeply into the tissues and many times are supposed to be cured when they are only hidden here is in a nutshell the problem of the mother of a daughter if you marry your daughter at seventeen to a lad of her own age you have a very good chance of marrying her to a person who is chaste if you marry her to a man of twenty-five you have perhaps one chance in a hundred if you marry her to a man of thirty-five you have perhaps one chance in ten thousand you may not like these facts i do not like them myself but i have learned that facts are none the less facts on that account you know the average society bud of eighteen and her attitude to a boy of the same age she regards him as a child and you think perhaps that it is natural for a girl to be interested in men of thirty-five or even forty-five but i tell you that it is not natural it is simply one of the perversions of pecuniary sex the girl is interested in such men because all her young life she has been carefully coached for the marriage market because she is dressed for it and solemnly brought out and introduced to other players of this exciting game of marriage for money with its incredible prizes of automobiles and jewels and palaces full of servants and magic checkbooks that never grow empty but suppose that instead of regarding her as a prize in a lottery you let her grow up naturally and taught her the truth about herself both body and mind suppose that instead of dressing her in ways deliberately contrived to emphasize her sex you put her in a simple uniform and taught her to be honest and straightforward instead of mincing and coy suppose she played athletic games with boys of her own age and invited them to her home not for jazz dancing and stuffing cake and candy 
but for the sharing of good music and literature and art. Don't you think that maybe this girl might become interested in a lad of her own age, and choose him with some understanding of his real self? You take it for granted that young people should not marry until they can afford it. But stop and consider. Is not this a relic of the old days? Always it takes time and deliberate effort of the reason to adjust our conventions to new facts. So face this fact. Marriage today does not necessarily mean children. It may just mean love. It involves little more expense because the young people need cost no more together than they cost in the separate homes of their parents. If they are children of the poor, they are already taking care of themselves. If they are the children of the moderately well-off, their parents expect to support them while they are getting an education. And why can they not just as well live together, and the parents of each contribute their share? Let the parents of the boy give him not merely what it costs to keep him at home, but also the sums which otherwise a boy would pay to the brothels. By this argument, I do not mean that I favor keeping young people financially dependent upon their parents. My own son is working his own way through college, and I should be glad to see every young man doing the same. All that I am saying is that if parents are going to support their children while they are getting an education, they might just as well support them married as single, instead of penalizing matrimony by making all allowances cease at that point. I know a certain ardent feminist, who is all for late marriage for women, and abhors my ideas on this subject. She wants women to get a chance to develop their personalities, whereas I want to sacrifice them to the frantic exigencies of the male animal. Young things of seventeen and eighteen have no idea what they are, or what they want from life. The mating impulse is a blind frenzy in them, and they must be taught to control it, just as they are taught not to kill when they are angry. In the first place, I point out that young ladies in colleges and in ballrooms give a lot of time and thought to sex, even though they do not call it by that inelegant term. I very much question whether, if we should apply our wisdom to the task of getting our young people happily mated before we sent them off to college, we should not get a lot more serious study out of them than we do now, with all their fussing and flirting and dancing. Second, I am willing to make heroic moral efforts where I see any chance of adequate results but I have examined the facts and definitely made up my mind that it is not worthwhile, in our present stage of culture, to preach to the mass of men the doctrine that they should abstain from sex experience until they are twenty-five or thirty years of age. You may storm at them, but they only laugh at you. You may pass laws and try to put them in jail, but you only provide a harvest for blackmailers and grafters. As to sacrificing a girl, my answer is simply that I believe in love, and in this I think the girl will agree with me, if you will let her. I have never heard any qualified person maintain that it hurts a girl to respond to love at the age of seventeen or eighteen, nor do I think that it hurts a boy, provided that he is taught the virtues of moderation and self-restraint. Without these, it will hurt him to eat, but that is no argument for starving him. As for the question of his maturity and power to judge, we are able at present to keep him from marrying anybody. So I think we might reasonably hope to keep him from marrying a wanton or a slut. Certainly we might find somebody better than the peroxide blonde he now picks up at the front of the moving picture palace. The question, at what ages we shall advise our young people to have children, is a separate one, depending upon many circumstances. First, of course, they should not have any until they are able financially to maintain them. As to the age at which it is physically advisable, that is a question to be settled by the physicians and the physiologists. 
I myself had the idea that the proper age would be when the woman had attained her full stature. But my friend Dr. William J. Robinson sends me some statistics from the Johns Hopkins Hospital Bulletin, which startle me. This publication for January 1922 gives the results in 500 childbirths, in which the mother's age was from 12 to 16 years inclusive. It appears that pregnancy and labor at these ages are no more dangerous than in older women. But on the other hand, the duration of the labor is actually shorter, and the size of the children is not inferior. These facts are so contrary to the general impression that I content myself with calling attention to them, and leave the commenting to be done by feminists and others who oppose themselves to the idea of early marriage. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 The Marriage Club Discusses how parents and elders may help the young to avoid unhappy marriages. I will make the assumption that you would like to have a trial of my cure for prostitution. You would like to do something right here and now, without waiting for this social revolution. Very well. I propose that you shall find a few other parents of boys and girls who are in revolt against our system of hidden vice, and that you will meet and form a modern marriage club. Only you won't call it that, of course. You will tactfully describe it as a literary society, or a social circle, or an Epworth League. The parents who run it will know what it is for, just as they do today. The only difference being that it will exist to promote love matches instead of money matches. It happens that I am myself a tactless sort of a person, not skillful at avoiding saying what I mean. So in this chapter I shall content myself with setting forth exactly what this marriage club will do, and leaving it to more clever people to supply the necessary camouflage. This club will begin by correcting the most stupid of all our educational blunders, the assumption of the necessary immaturity of the young. Our young people nowadays have ten times as much chance to learn and ten times as much stimulus to learn as we had, and it is a generally safe assumption that they know much more than we think they do, and are ready to learn every sensible and interesting thing. I am carrying on an epistolary acquaintance with a little miss of twelve, who has read half a dozen of my books, among the worst of them, and writes me letters of grave appreciation. I have talked on socialism to a thousand school children and had them question me for an hour and heard just as worthwhile questions as I have heard from an audience of bankers. Never in my life have I talked about real things with children that I did not find them proud to be treated seriously and eager to show that they were worthy of that honor. A great part of our foolishness with children is due to the emptiness of our own heads. These parents will delegate one man and one woman to make a thorough study of the sex education of the young. Of course, there is knowledge about sex which has to be given to the very youngest child, and more and more must be given as they grow older and ask more questions. But what I have in mind here is that detailed and precise knowledge which must be given to the young when they approach the period of puberty. At this age of fourteen or fifteen, the man will take each of the boys apart, and the woman will take each of the girls, and will explain to them what they need to know. This duty will not be trusted to parents, for parents have an imbecile fear of talking straight to their children and try to get by with rubbish about bees and flowers. Let every child know that the days of the hole-and-corner sex business is forever past, and that here is an instructed person who talks real American and knows what he is talking about, and will deal with facts instead of with evasions. This club will help to educate the youngsters and also to give them a good time developing both their minds and bodies and learning to know them 
thoroughly. When they are sixteen, each one will have another talk, this time about marriage and what it means, learning that it is not merely flirtations and delicious thrills, but a business partnership and the deepest and best of all friendships. So when John finds that he likes Mary best of all the girls he knows, this won't be a subject for kidding and sly innuendo and blushes and simpering on Mary's part, but an occasion for decent and sensible talk about what each of them really is and what each thinks the other to be. If they think they are in love, then there will be a council of the elder statesmen to consider that case and what are the chances of happiness in that love. This may sound forbidding, but it is actually what is done at present, only it is not done honestly and frankly, and therefore does not carry proper weight with the young people. I am an opponent of long engagements, but I am also an opponent of no engagements at all. I know no truer proverb than, marry in haste and repent at leisure. It would be my idea that a very young couple should announce their engagement, and then wait six months, and be consulted again about the matter, and have a chance to withdraw with no hard feelings, if either party thought best. If they wished to go on, they might be asked to wait another six months, if their elders felt very certain there were reasons to doubt the wisdom of the match. There are, of course, people who, because of disease or physical defect, should never be allowed to marry, and others who might marry, but should not be allowed to have children. There should be laws providing for such cases requiring physical examination before marriage, and in extreme cases providing for a simple and harmless surgical operation to prevent the hopelessly unfit from passing on their defects to the future. But dealing for the moment with normal young persons, members of our modern marriage club, I should say that if, after they have listened to the warning of their elders, and have waited for a decent interval to think things over, they still remain of the opinion that they can make a successful marriage, then it is up to the elders to wish them luck. I have known of young couples who have refused to heed warnings, and regretted it, but I have known of others who went ahead and had their own way and proved they were right. There is a form of wisdom called experience, and there is another form called love. I hear the worldly and cynical rail at the blindness of young love, and I can see the truth in what they say, but also I can see the deeper truth in the magic dreams of the young soul. Here is a youth who adores a girl, and you know the girl, and it is comical to you because you know she is not any of the things the youth imagines. But who are you that claim to know the last thing about a human soul? Look into your own and see how many different things you are. Look back, if you can, to the time when you were young, and remember the visions and hopes. They have lost all reality to you now. But who could say how many of them you might have made real if there had been one other person who believed in them and loved them and would not give them up? I write this, and then I think of the other side, the fools that I have known in love, the trusting women marrying rotten men to reform them the pitiful people who think that fine phrases and sentimentality can take place of facts. I implore my young couples to sit down and face the realities of their own natures, to decide what they are and what they want to be, and if there is going to be any change, let it be made and tried out before marriage. I implore them to begin now to control their desires, by their reason and judgment, to begin each of them at the very outset, to carry their share of the burdens and do their share of the hard work. I implore them to value independence and self-reliance in the other, and never, above all things, to marry from pity, which is a worthy emotion in its place, 
but has nothing to do with sex, which should be an affair between equals, a matter of partnership and not of parasitism. I think that, on the whole, the most dreadful thing in love is the use of it for praying, for the securing of favors and advantages of any sort, whether by men or by women. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 Education for Marriage Maintains that the art of love can be taught, and that we have the right and duty to teach it. I assume now that our young couple have definitely made up their minds, and that the wedding day is near. They are, therefore, both the man and the woman, in position to receive information as to the physical aspects of their future experience. This information is now, for the most part, possessed only by pathologists, who impart it too late, after people have blundered and wrecked their lives. The opponents of birth control ask in horror if you would teach it to the young. I am now able to answer just when I would teach it. I would teach it to these young couples about to marry. I would make it by law compulsory for every young couple to attend a school of marriage, and to learn not merely the regulation of conception, but the whole art of health and happiness in sex. Perhaps the words, a school of marriage, strike you as funny. When I was young, I remember that Pulitzer founded a school of journalism, and all newspaper editors made merry. They knew that journalism could only be learned in practice. But nowadays, every city editor gives preference to an applicant who has taken a college course in reporting. They have learned that journalism can be taught, just like engineering and accounting. In the same way, I assert that marriage can be taught, and the art of love, physical, mental, moral, and even financial. I think that the day will come when enlightened parents would no more dream of trusting their tender young daughter to a man who had not taken a course in sex than they would go up in an aeroplane with a pilot who knew nothing about an engine. The knowledge which I possess upon the art of love I would be glad to give you in this book, but unfortunately if I were to do so, my book would be suppressed, and I should be sent to jail. Some ten or twelve years ago I received a pitiful letter from a man who was in state's prison in Delaware, charged with having imparted information as to birth control. Under our amiable legal system, a perfectly innocent man may be thrown into jail and kept there for a year or two before he is tried, and, if he is without money or friends, he might as well be buried alive. I went to Wilmington to call on the United States attorney who had caused the indictment in this case, and had an illuminating conversation with him. The official was anxious to justify what he had done. He assured me that he was no bigot, but on the contrary, an extremely liberal man, a Unitarian, a progressive, etc. But Mr. Sinclair, he said, I assure you, this prisoner is not a reformer or humanitarian or anything like that. He is a depraved person. Look, here is something we found in his trunk when we arrested him, a pamphlet explaining about sex relations. See this paragraph? It says that the pleasure of intercourse is increased if it is prolonged. I looked at the pamphlet, and then I looked at the attorney. Do you think you have stated the matter quite fairly? I asked. Apparently, the purpose is to explain that the emotions of women are more slow to be aroused than those of men, and that husbands, failing to realize this, often do not gratify their wives. Well, said the other, do you consider that a subject to be discussed? Pardon me if I discuss it just a moment, I replied. Do you happen to know whether the statement is a fact? No, I don't. It may be, I suppose. You have never investigated the matter? The legal representative of our government was evidently annoyed by my persistence. I have not, he answered. 
but then suppose i were to tell you that thousands of homes have been broken up for lack of just that bit of knowledge that tens of thousands of marriages are miserable for lack of it surely mr sinclair you exaggerate not at all i could prove to you by one medical authority after another that if the desire of the woman in marriage is roused and then left ungratified the result is nervous strain and in the long run it may be nervous breakdown the above covers only one detail of the pamphlet in question i read some pages of it and argued them out with the attorney it was a perfectly simple straightforward exposition of facts about the physiology of sex and one of the reasons a man was to be sent to jail for several years was not that he had circulated such a pamphlet not that he had showed it to young people but merely that he had it in his trunk there is an honest and very useful book written by an english physician dr marie c stopes entitled married love published by dr william j robinson of new york a specialist of authority and integrity the book deals with just such vital facts in a perfectly dignified and straightforward manner yet dr robinson has been hounded by the post office department because of it he was convicted and forced to pay a fine of two hundred and fifty dollars and the book was barred from the mails i have so much else of importance to say in this book of love that it would not be sensible to jeopardize it by causing a controversy with our official censors of knowledge therefore i will merely say in general terms that men and women differ not merely as a sex but as individuals and every marriage is a separate problem every couple has to solve it in the intimacy of their love life and for this there are needed first of all gentleness on the part of the man especially in the first days of the honeymoon and on the part of both at all times consideration for each other's welfare and enjoyment and above all frankness and honesty in talking out the subject reticence and shyness may be virtues elsewhere but they have no place in the intimacies of the sex life if men and women will only ask and answer frankly they can find out by experience what makes the other happy and what causes pain we are dealing here with the most sacred intimacy of life and one of the most vital parts of life's problems it is here in the marriage bed that the divorce problem is to be settled and likewise the problem of prostitution for it is when men and women fail to understand each other and to gratify each other that one or the other turns cold and indifferent perhaps angry and hateful and then we have passions unsatisfied and ranging the world breaking up other homes and spreading disease so i would say to every young couple seek knowledge on this subject seek it without shame from others who have had a chance to acquire it seek it also from nature our wise old mother who knows so much about her children be natural be simple and straightforward and beware of fool notions about sex if you will look in the code of hammurabi which is over four thousand years old you will see the provision that a man who has intercourse with a menstruating woman shall be killed in leviticus you will read that both the man and the women are to be cast out from their people you will find that most people still have some such notion which is without any basis whatever in health and this is only one illustration of many i might give of ignorance and superstition in the sex life i would give this as one very good rule to bear in mind your love exists for the happiness and health of yourself and your partner and not for hammurabi nor moses nor jehovah nor your mother-in-law nor anybody else on the earth or above it great numbers of people believe that women are naturally less passionate than men and that marital happiness depends upon men's recognizing this of course there are defective individuals both men and women but the normal woman is every bit as passionate as a man if once she has been taught and if love 
is given its proper place in life, and monkish notions not allowed to interfere, she will remain so all through life, in spite of childbearing or anything else. I say to married couples that they should devote themselves to making and preserving passionate gratification in love, because this is the bright jewel in the crown of marriage, and if lovers solve this problem, they will find other problems comparatively simple. End of chapter 42 Chapters 43, 44, and 45 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43, The Money Side of Marriage, deals with the practical side of life partnership of matrimony. So far, we have discussed marriage as if it consisted only of love but it is manifest that this is not the case. Marriage is everyday companionship, and also it is partnership in a complicated business. In our school of marriage, therefore, we shall teach the rights and duties of both partners to the contract, and shall face frankly the money side of the enterprise. One of the first facts we must get clear is that the economics of marriage are in most parts of the world still based upon the subjection of women, and are therefore incompatible with the claims of woman as a partner and comrade. They will never be right until the social revolution has abolished privilege, and the state has granted to every woman a maternity endowment, with a mother's pension for every child during the entire period of the rearing and education of that child. Until this is done, the average woman must look to some man for the support of her child, and that, by the automatic operation of economic force, makes her subject to the whims of the man. What women have to do is to agitate for a revision of the property laws of marriage, and, meantime, to see that in every marriage there is an extra-legal understanding which grants to the woman the equality which laws and conventions deny her. When I was a boy, my mother had a woman friend who, if she wanted to go downtown, would borrow a quarter from my mother. This woman's husband was earning a generous salary, enough to enable him to buy the best cigars by the box and to keep a supply of liquors always on hand, but he gave his wife no allowance and if she wanted pocket money, she had to ask him for it, each time a separate favor. Yet this woman was keeping a home, she was doing just as hard work and just as necessary work as the man. Manifestly, this was a preposterous arrangement. If a woman is going to be a homemaker for the husband, it is a simple, common-sense proposition that the salary of the husband shall be divided into three parts. First, the part which goes to the home, the benefit of which is shared in common. Second, the part which the husband has for his own use. And third, the part which the wife has for hers. The second and third parts should be equal, and the wife should have hers, not as a favor, but as a right. If the two are making a homestead or running a farm or building up a business, then half the proceeds should be the woman's and it should be legally in her name, and this as a matter of course as any other business contract. If the woman does not make a home, but merely displays fine clothes at tea parties, that is of course another matter. Just what she is to do is something that had better be determined before the marriage, and if a man wants a life partner, to take an interest in his work, or to have a useful work of her own, he had better choose that kind of woman, and not merely one that has a pretty face and a trim ankle. The business side of marriage is something that has to be talked out from time to time. There have to be meetings of the board of directors, and at these meetings there ought to be courtesy and kindness, but also plain facts and common sense, and no shirking of issues. 
love is such a very precious thing that any man or woman ought to be willing to make money sacrifices to preserve it but on the other hand it is a fact that there are some people with whom you cannot be generous the more you give them the more they take and with such people the only safe rule is exact justice let married couples decide exactly what contribution each makes to the family life and what share of money and authority each is entitled to i might spend several chapters discussing the various rocks on which i have seen marriages go to wreck for example extravagance and worldly show clothes for women in paris there is a demi-monde a world of brutal lust combined with riotous luxury the women of this half-world are in touch with the world of art and fashion and when the rich costumers and women decorators want what they call ideas it is to these lust women they go the fashions they design are always depraved of course always for flaunting of sex never for the suggestion of dignity and grave intelligence at several seasons of the year these lust women are decked out and paraded at the race courses and other gathering places of the rich and their pictures are published in the papers and spread all over the world so forthwith it becomes necessary for your wife in oshkosh or kalamazoo to throw away all the perfectly good clothes she owns and get a complete new outfit because they are wearing something different of course the costume makers have seen that it is extremely different so as to make it impossible for your wife and children to be happy in their last season's clothes. I have a winter overcoat which I bought fourteen years ago, and, as it is still as good as new, I expect to use it another fourteen years, which will mean that it has cost me a dollar and a half per year. But think what it would have cost me if I had considered it necessary each year to have an overcoat cut as the keepers of French mistresses were cutting theirs. But then, suppose you put it up to your wife and daughters to wear sensible clothes, and they do so, and then they observe that on the street your eyes turn to follow the ladies in the latest disappearing skirt. The point is, you perceive, that you yourself are partly to blame for the fashions they appeal to a dirty little imp you have in your own heart. And when the decent women discover that, it makes them blazing hot. And that is one of the ways you may wreck your domestic happiness if you want to. Unless I am greatly mistaken, when the class war is all over, we are going to see in our world a sex war. But it is not going to be between the men and the women. It is going to be between the mother women and the mistress women, and the mistress women are going to have their hides stripped off. Men wreck marriage because they are promiscuous, and women wreck it because they are parasites. Woman has been for long centuries an economic inferior, and she has the vices of the subject people and tribes. Now, there are some who want to keep these vices, while at the same time claiming the new privileges which go with equality. Such a woman picks out a man who is sensitive and chivalrous, who knows that women suffer handicaps, pains of childbirth, physical weakness, and who therefore feels impelled to bear more than his share of the burdens. She makes him her slave, and by and by she gets a child, and then she has him because he is bowed down with awe and worship. He thinks that such a miracle has never happened in the world before, and he spends the rest of his life waiting on her whims and nursing her vanities. I note that at the recent convention of the Women's Party, they demanded their rights and agreed to surrender their privileges. There you have the final test by which you may know that women really want to be free and are prepared to take the responsibilities of freedom. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 The Defense of Monogamy Discusses the permanence of love and why we should endeavor to preserve it. So far in this discussion, we have assumed that love means monogamous love. 
we did so for the reason that we could not consider every question at once but we have promised to deal with all the problems of sex in the light of reason and so we have now to take up the question what are the sanctions of monogamy and why do we refuse sanction to other kinds of love first let us set aside several reasons with which we have nothing to do for example the reason of tradition it is a fact that anglo-saxon civilization has always refused legal recognition to non-monogamous marriage but then anglo-saxon civilization has recognized war and slavery and speculation and private property and land and many other things which we presume to describe as crimes if tradition cannot justify itself to our reason we shall choose martyrdom second the religious reason this is the one that most people give it is convenient because it saves the need of thinking suffice it here to say that we prefer to think if we cannot justify monogamy by the facts of life we shall declare ourselves for polygamy what are the scientific and rational reasons for monogamy first among them is venereal disease this may seem like a vulgar reason but no one can deny that it is real there was a time apparently when mankind did not suffer from these plagues and we hope there may be such a time again i shall not attempt to prescribe the marital customs for the people of that happy age i suspect that they will be able to take care of themselves confining myself to my lifetime and yours i say that the aim of every sensible man and woman must be to confine sex relations to the smallest possible limits i know of course that there are prophylactics and the army and navy present statistics to show that they succeed in a great proportion of cases but if you are one of the persons in whose case they don't succeed you will find the statistics a cold source of comfort to you john and mary go to the altar or to the justice of the peace and john says with all my worldly goods i thee endow but the formula is incomplete it ought to read and likewise with the fruits of my wild oats marriage is a contract wherein each of the contracting parties agrees to share whatever pathogenic bacteria the other party may have or acquire surely therefore the contract involves a right to each party to have a say as to how many chances of infection the other shall incur john goes off on a business trip and is lonesome and meets an agreeable widow and figures to himself that there is very little chance that so charming a person can be dangerous but maybe mary wouldn't agree with his calculations and maybe mary would not consider it a part of the marriage bargain that she should take the diseases of the agreeable widow what commonly happens is that mary is not consulted john revises the contract in secret making it read that mary shall take a chance at the diseases of the widow how can any thinking person deny that john has thus committed an act of treason to mary i know that there are people who don't mind running such chances that is one reason why there are venereal diseases all i can say is that the sex code set forth in this book is based upon the idea that to deliver mankind from the venereal plague we wish to confine the sex relationship within the narrowest limits consistent with health happiness and spiritual development and that to this end we take the young and teach them chastity and we marry them early while they are clean and then we call upon them to make the utmost effort to make a success of that union and to make it a matter of honor to keep marital faith we do this with some hope of effectiveness because we have made our program consistent with the requirements of nature the genuine needs of love both physical and spiritual the second argument for monogamy is the economic one we have dreamed a social order where every child will be guaranteed maintenance by the state 
and where women will be free from dependence on men. What will be the love arrangements of men and women under this new order is another problem which we leave for them to decide, in the certainty that they will know more about it than we do. Meantime, we are, for the present, under the private property regime, and have to love and marry and raise our children accordingly. The children must have homes, and if they are to be normal children, they must have both the male and female influence in their lives which means that their parents must be friends and partners, not quarreling in secret. This argument, I know, is one of expediency. I have adopted it, after watching a great number of people try other than monogamous sex arrangements, and seeing their chances of happiness and success wrecked by the pressure of economic forces. To rebel against social compulsion may be heroism, and again, it may be merely bad judgment. For my part, the world's greatest evil is poverty, the cause of crime, prostitution, and war. I concentrate my energies upon the abolishing of that evil, and I let other problems wait. The third reason is that monogamy is economical of human time and thought. The business of finding and wooing a mate takes a lot of energy, and adjustment after marriage takes more. To throw away the results of this labor, and do it all over again, is certainly not common sense. Of course, if you bake a cake and burn it, you have to get more material and make another try, but that is a different matter from baking a cake with the deliberate intention of throwing it away after a bite or two. The advocates of varietism in love will here declare that we are begging the question. We are assuming that love and the love chase are not worthy in themselves, but merely means to some other end. Can it be that love delights are the keenest and most intense that humans can experience, and that all other purposes of life are contributory to them? Certainly a great deal of art lends support to this idea, and many poets have backed up their words by their deeds. As Coleridge phrased it, All thoughts, all passions, all delights, whatever stirs this mortal frame, all are but ministers of love, and feed his sacred flame. This is a question not to be played with. Experimenting in love is costly, and millions have wrecked their lives by it. The sex urge in us is imperious and cruel. It wants nothing less than the whole of us, body, mind, and spirit, and oftentimes it behaves like the genie in the bottle. It gets out, and not all the powers in the universe can get it back. I have talked with many men about sex, and have heard them say that it presents itself to them as an unmitigated torment, something they would give everything they own to be free of. And these, mind you, not men living in monasteries trying to repress their natural impulses, but men of the world who have lived freely, seeking pleasure and taking it as it came. The primrose path of dalliance did not lead them to peace, and the pursuit of variety in love brought them only monotony. I stop and think of one after another of these sex-ridden people and I cannot think of one whom I would envy. I know one who in a frenzy of unhappiness seized a razor and castrated himself. I think of another, a certain classmate in college, whom I once stopped in a conversation, remarking, Did you ever realize what a state you have got your mind into? Everything means sex to you. Every phrase you hear, every idea that is suggested, you try to make some sort of pun to connect it somehow or other with sex. The man thought and said, oh, I guess that's true. The idea had never occurred to him before. He had just gone on letting his instincts have their way with him, without ever putting his reason upon the matter. That was a crude kind of sex, but I think of another man, an idealist and champion of human liberty. One of the forms of liberty he maintained was the right to love as many women as he pleased, 
and although he was a married man one hardly ever saw him that he was not courting some young girl as a result his mental powers declined and he did little but talk about ideas i do not know anyone today who respects him except a few people who live the same sort of life the thought of him brings to my mind a sentence of nietzsche a man who surely stood for freedom of personality i pity the lovers who have nothing higher than their love a question like this can be decided only by the experience of the race some will make love the end and aim of life and others will make it the means to other ends and we shall see which kind of people achieve the best results which kind are the most useful the most dignified the most original and vital i have seen a great many young people try the experiment of free love and i have seen some get enough of it and quit i could name among these half a dozen of our younger novelists i know others who are still in it and i watch their lives and find them to be restless jealous egotistical and idle my defense of monogamy is based upon the fact that i have never known any happy or successful free lovers of course i know some noble and sincere people who do not believe in the marriage contract and refuse to be bound by law but these people are as monogamous as i am even more tightly bound by honor than if they were duly married it seems to be in the very nature of true and sincere love to imagine permanence, to desire it, and to pledge it. If you aren't that much in love, you aren't really in love at all, and you had better content yourself with strolling together and chatting together and dining together and playing music together. So many pleasant ways there are in which men and women can enjoy each other's company without entering upon the sacred intimacy of sex you can learn to take sex lightly of course but if you do so you reduce by so much the chances that true and deep love will ever come to you for true and deep love requires some patience some reverence some tending at a shrine the animals mate quickly and get it over with but the great discoveries about love and the possibilities of the human soul in love have come because men and women have been willing to make sacrifices for it to take it seriously and more especially to take seriously the beloved person the rights and needs and virtues of that person from the lives of such we learn that love is nature's device for taking us out of ourselves and making us truly social creatures Early in my life as a writer, I undertook to answer Gertrude Atherton in her glorification of the sex corruptions of capitalist society. She indicted American literature for its bourgeois qualities, among these the fact that American authors had a prejudice in favor of living with their own wives. Mrs. Atherton set forth the joys of sex promiscuity as they are understood by European artists and I ventured in replying to remark that one woman can be more to a man than a dozen can possibly be. That sounds like a paradox, but it is really a profound truth, and the person who does not understand it has missed the best there is in the sex relation. There is a limit to the things of the body, but to those of the mind and spirit there is no limit and so there is no reason why true love should ever fall prey to boredom and satiety. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 The Problem of Jealousy Discusses the question, To what extent one person may hold another to the pledge of love? once upon a time i knew an anarchist shoemaker the same who had sent me to jail for playing tennis on sunday as i have narrated in the brass check 
I remember arguing with him concerning his ideas of sex, which were of the freest. I can hear the very tones of his voice as he put the great unanswerable question, What are you going to do about the problem of jealousy? And I had no response at hand, for jealousy is truly a most cruel and devastating and unlovely emotion. And yet, how can you escape it, if you are going to preserve monogamy? The anarchist shoemaker's solution was to break down all the prejudices against sexual promiscuity. Free and unlimited license was every person's right, and for any other person to interfere was enslavement. For any other person to criticize was superstition. But the power of superstition is strong in the world, and the shoemaker found men resentful of his teachings and disposed to confiscate the rights of their wives and daughters. Hence the shoemaker's disapproval of jealousy. Other men, less purely physiological in their attitude to sex, have wrestled with this same problem of jealousy. H. G. Wells has a novel, In the Days of the Comet, in which he portrays two men, both nobly and truly in love with the same woman. One, in a passion of jealousy, is about to murder the other, when a great social transformation is magically brought about, and the would-be murderer wakes up to universal love and the two men nobly and lovingly share the same woman. Shelley also dreamed this dream, inviting two women to share him. I have known others who tried it, but never permanently. I do not say that it never has succeeded, or that it never can succeed. In this book I am renouncing the future. I am trying to give practical advice to people for the conduct of their lives here and now. And my advice on this point is that polygamous and polyandrous experiments in modern capitalist society cost more than they are worth. I once knew a certain high school teacher who believed religiously in every kind of freedom. When she married, she and her husband, an artist, made a vow against jealousy. But as it worked out, this vow meant that the wife had a steady job and took care of the husband, while he loafed and loved other women. When finally she grew tired of it, he accused her of being jealous. Also, she had brought it down to the matter of money. I know another woman, an anarchist, widely known as a lecturer on sex freedom. She laid down the general principle of unlimited personal freedom for all, and she tried to live up to her faith. She entered into a free union with a certain man, and when she discovered that he was making love to another woman in the presence of a friend of mine, she threw a vase of flowers at his head. You see, her general principles had clashed with another general principle, to the effect that a person who feels deep and strong love inevitably desires that love to endure and cannot but suffer to see it preyed upon and destroyed. Let us first consider the question, just what are the true and proper implications of monogamous love? The Roman Catholic Church advocates monogamy, and understands thereby that a man and woman pledge themselves, till death do us part, and if either of them cancels this arrangement, it is adultery and mortal sin. I hope that none of my readers understands by monogamy any such system of spiritual strangulation. My own idea is rather what some churchman has sarcastically described by the term progressive polygamy. I believe that a man and woman should pledge their faith in love, and should keep that faith and endeavor with all their best energies to make a success of it. They should strive each to understand the other's needs and unselfishly to fulfill them within the limits of fair play. But if, after such an effort has been truly made, it becomes clear that the union does not mean health and happiness for one of the parties, that party has a right to withdraw from it. 
and for any government or church or other power to deny that right is both folly and cruelty now on the basis of this definition of monogamy or if you prefer of progressive polygamy we are in a position to say what we think about jealousy if two people pledge their faith and one breaks it and the other complains we do not call that jealousy but just common decency neither do we call it jealousy if one expects the other to avoid the appearance of guilt for love is a serious thing not to be played with and i think that a person who truly loves will do everything possible to make clear to the beloved that he is keeping and means to keep the plighted faith you may say that i am using words arbitrarily in endeavoring thus to distinguish between justifiable and unjustifiable jealousy and calling the former by some other name it does not make much difference about words provided i may clear my meaning i could point out a whole string of words which have good meanings and bad meanings and cannot be discussed without preliminary explanations and distinctions religion for example and morality and aristocracy and justice to name only a few most people's thinking about marriage and love has been made like a soup in a cheap restaurant by dumping in all kinds of scraps and notions from such opposite poles of human thought as christian monkery and renaissance license absurdly called romance so before you can do any thinking about a problem like jealousy you have to agree to use the word to mean something definite whether good or bad we shall take jealousy as a bad word and use it to mean the setting up by a man or woman of some claim to the love of another person which claim cannot be justified in the court of reason and fair play this includes in the first place all claims based upon a courtship not ratified by marriage it is to the interest of society and the race that men and women should be free to investigate persons of the other sex and to experiment with the affections before pledges of marriage are made if sensible customs of love and just laws of marriage were made there would be no excuse for a woman's giving herself to a man before marriage she should be taught not to do it and then if she does it the risk is her own and the disgusting perversion of veniality and greed known as the breach of promise suit should be unknown in our law the young should be taught that it is the other person's right to change his mind and withdraw at any time before marriage whatever pains and pangs this may cause must be borne in silence the second kind of jealousy is that which seeks to keep in the marriage bond a person who is not happy in it and has asked to be released the law sanctions this kind of cowardly selfishness which manifests itself every day on the front pages of our newspapers a spectacle of monstrous and loathsome passions unleashed and even glorified husbands set the bloodhounds of the law after wives who have fled with some other man and send the man to a cell and drag the woman back to a loveless home wives engage private detectives and trail their husbands to some love nest and then ensue long public wrangles with a washing of filthy linen and the matter is settled by a separation the virtuous wife who may have driven the man away by neglect or vanity or stupidity is granted a share of his earnings for the balance of her life and two more people are added to the millions who are denied sexual happiness under the law and are thereby impelled to live as law violators for this there is only one remedy conceivable we have banned cannibalism and slavery and piracy and dueling and we must 
ban one more ancient and cruel form of human oppression the effort to hold people in the bonds of sex by any other power save that of love i am aware that the reactionaries who read this book will take this sentence out of context and quote it to prove that i am a free lover i shall be sorry to have that done but even so i was not willing to live in slavery myself and i am not willing to advocate it for others i am aware that there are degenerate and defective individuals and that we have to make special provision for them as i shall presently set forth but the average normal human being must be free to decide what is love for him and what is happiness for him every person in the world will have to deny himself the right to demand love where love is not freely given and all lovers in the world will have to hold themselves ready to let the loved one go if and when the loved one demands it i am aware that this is a hard saying and a hard duty but it is one that life lays upon us and one that there is no escaping End of chapter 45「Chapters 46 and 47 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 46 The Problem of Divorce defends divorce as a protection to monogamous love and one of the means of preventing infidelity and prostitution you will hear sermons and read newspaper editorials about the divorce evil and you will find that to the preacher or editor this evil consists of the fact that more and more people are refusing to stay unhappily married it does not interest these moralizers if the statistics show that it is women who are getting most of the divorces and that the meaning of the phenomenon is that women are refusing to continue living with drunken and dissolute men to the clergy the breaking of a marriage is an evil per se and regardless of circumstances they know this because god has told them so and in the name of god they seek to keep people tied in sex unions which have come to mean loathing instead of love now i will assert it as a mathematical certainty that a considerable percentage of marriages must fail it is essential to progress that human beings should grow both mentally and spiritually and manifestly they cannot all grow in the same way if they grow differently must they not sometimes lose the power to make each other happy in the marital bonds who does not know the man who masters life and becomes a vital force while his wife remains dull and empty if such a man changes wives the world in general denounces him as a selfish beast but the world does not know nor does it care about those thousands of men who not caring to be branded as selfish beasts fulfill the needs of their lives by keeping mistresses in secret i knew a certain country school teacher one of the most narrowly conventional young women imaginable who was engaged to a middle-aged businessman he went to new york on a business trip and stayed a couple of months and wrote her that he had met some anarchists and had discovered that all he had read about them in the newspapers was false and that they were the true and pure idealists to whom the rest of his life must be devoted the young lady was horrified nor was she any happier when she came to new york and met her fiance's new friends she ought in common sense to have broken the engagement but she was in love and she married as many another fool woman does with the idea of reforming the man she failed and was utterly and unspeakably wretched 
I know another man, a conservative capitalist of narrow and aggressive temper, whose wife turned into an ardent Bolshevik. The man thinks that all Bolsheviks should be shut up in jail for life, while the wife is equally certain that all jails should be razed to the ground and all Bolsheviks placed in control of the government. These two people have got to a point where they cannot sit down to the breakfast table without flying into a quarrel. I know another case of a modern scientist, an agnostic, whose wife, a half-educated, sentimental woman, took to dabbling in mysticism and drove him wild by setting up an image of Buddha in their bedroom and consorting with swamis in long yellow robes. I know another whose wife turned into an ultra-pious Catholic and turned over the care of his domestic life to a priest. Is it not obvious that the only possible solution of such problems lies in divorce? Unless, indeed, we are all of us going to turn over the care of our domestic lives to the priests. Our grandfathers and grandmothers believed one thing, and believed the same thing when they were seventy as when they were twenty, so it was possible for them to dwell in domestic security and permanence till death did them part. But we are learning to change our minds, and whether what we believe is better or worse than what our ancestors believed, at least it is different. Also, we are coming to take what we believe with more seriousness. The intellectual life means more and more to us, and it becomes harder and harder for us to find sexual and domestic happiness with a partner who does not share our convictions, but, on the contrary, may be contributing to the campaign funds of the opposition party. I do not mean by this that people should get a divorce as soon as they find they differ about some intellectual idea. On the contrary, I have advocated that they should do everything possible to understand and to tolerate each other. But it is a fact that intellectual convictions are the raw materials out of which characters and lives are made. And it is inevitable that some characters and lives that fit quite well at twenty should fit very badly at thirty or forty. When we refuse divorce under such circumstances, we are not fostering marriage, as we fondly imagine. We are really fostering adultery. It is a fact that not one person in ten who is held by legal or social force in an unhappy sex union will refrain from seeking satisfaction outside. And because these outside satisfactions are disgraceful, and in some cases criminal, they seldom have any permanence. Therefore, it follows that strict divorce laws, such as the clerical propaganda urges upon us, are in reality laws for the promotion of fornication and prostitution. There is a short story by Edith Wharton, in which the divorce evil is exhibited to us in its naked horror. The story, called The Other Two, in the volume The Descent of Man. A society woman has been divorced twice and married three times, and by an ingenious set of circumstances, the woman and all three of the men are brought into the same drawing room at the same time. Just imagine, if you can, such an excruciating situation. A woman, her husband, and two men who used to be her husbands, all compelled to meet together and think of something to say. I cite this story because it is a perfect illustration of the extent to which the divorce problem is a problem of our lack of sense. Mrs. Wharton will, I fear, consider me a very vulgar person if I assert that there is absolutely no reason whatever why any of those four people in her story should have had a moment's discomfort of mind, except that they thought there was. There is absolutely nothing to prevent a man and woman who used to be married from meeting socially and being decent to each other, or to prevent two men from being decent to each other under such circumstances. I would not say that they should choose to be intimate friends, though even that may be possible occasionally. I know, because I have seen it happen. In Holland, I met a certain eminent novelist and poet, a great and lovable man. 
I visited his home, and met his wife and two little children, and saw a man and woman living in domestic happiness. The man had also two grown sons, and after a few days he remarked that he would like me to meet the mother of these young men. We went for a walk of a mile or so, and met a lady who lived in a small house by herself, and who received us with a friendly welcome, and talked with us for a couple of hours about music and books and art. This lady had been the writer's wife for ten years or so, and there had been a terrible uproar when they voluntarily parted. But they had refused to pay attention to this uproar. They understood why they did not wish to remain husband and wife any longer, but they did not consider it necessary to quarrel about it, nor even to break off the friendship which their common interests made possible. The two women in the case were not intimate, I gathered, but they frequently met at the homes of others, and found no difficulty in being friendly. I suggest to Mrs. Wharton that this story is at least as interesting as the one she has told, but I fear she will not care to write it because apparently she considers it necessary that people who are well-bred and refined should be the helpless victims of destructive manias. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 The Restriction of Divorce Discusses the circumstances under which society has the right to forbid divorce or to impose limitations upon it. We have quoted the old maxim, marry in haste and repent at leisure. And we suggested that parents and guardians should have the right to ask the young to wait before marriage and make certain of the state of their hearts. We have now the same advice to give concerning divorce, the same claim to enter on behalf of society, that it has and should assert the right to ask people to delay and think carefully before breaking up a marriage. What interest has society in the restriction of divorce? What affair is it of any other person if I choose to get a divorce and marry a new wife once a month? There are many reasons, not in any way based upon religious superstition or conventional prejudice. In the first place, there are or may be children and society should try to preserve for every child a home with a father and a mother in it. Second, there are property rights, of which every marriage is a tangle, and the settlement of which the law should always oversee. Third, there is the question of venereal disease, which society has an unquestionable right to keep down, by every reasonable restriction upon sexual promiscuity. And finally, there is the respect which all men and women owe to love. It seems to me that society has the same right to protect love against extreme outrage as it has to forbid indecent exposure of the person on the street. There is in successful operation in Switzerland a wise and sane divorce law based upon common sense and not upon superstition. A couple wish to break their marriage, and they go before a judge, and in private session, as to a friendly adviser, they tell their troubles. He gives them advice about their disagreement, and sends them away for three months to think it over. At the end of three months, if they still desire divorce, they meet with him again. If he still thinks there is a chance of reconciliation, he has the right to require them to wait another three months. But if, at the end of this second period, they are still convinced that the case is hopeless and that they should part, the judge is required to grant the divorce. You may note that this is exactly what I have suggested concerning young couples who become engaged. In both cases, the parties directly interested have the right to decide their own fate, but the rest of the world requires them to think carefully about it and to listen to counsel. Except for grave offenses, such as adultery, insanity, crime, or venereal disease, I do not think that anyone should receive a divorce in less than six months, nor do I think that any personal right is contravened by the imposing of such a delay. 
Next, what are we going to say to the right, or the claim to the right, on the part of a man or woman to be married once a year throughout a lifetime? In order to illustrate this problem, I will tell you about a certain man known to me. In his early life, he spent a couple of years in a lunatic asylum. He lays claim to extraordinary spiritual gifts and uses the language of the highest idealism known. He is a man of culture and good family, and thus exerts a peculiar charm upon young women of refinement and sensitiveness. To my knowledge, he was three times married in six years, and each time he deserted the woman and forced her to divorce him and to take care of herself, and in one case of a child. In addition, he had begotten one child out of marriage and left the mother and child to starve. For ten years or so I used to see him about once in six months, and invariably he had a new woman, a young girl of fine character, who had been ensnared by him and was in the agonizing process of discovering his moral and mental derangement. Yet there was absolutely nothing in the law to place restraint upon this man. He could wander from state to state, or to the other side of the world, preying upon lovely young girls wherever he went. This particular man happens to call himself a radical. But I could tell you of similar men in the highest social circles, or in the political world, the theatrical world, the sporting world. They are in every rank of life and are just as definitely and certainly menaces to human welfare and progress as pirates on the high seas or highwaymen on the road. Nor are they confined to the males. The world is full of women who use their sex charms for predatory purposes, and some of them are far too clever for any law that you or I can contrive at present. But I think we might begin by refusing to let any man or woman have more than two divorces in one lifetime, in any state or part of the world. If any man or woman tries three times to find happiness and love and fails each time, we have a right to assume that the fault must lie with that person, and not with the three partners. I think we may go further yet. Having made wise laws of love and marriage, taking into consideration all human needs, we have a right to require that men and women shall obey the laws. At present, the great mass of the public has sympathy for the law-breaker, just as, in old days, the peasants could not help admiring the outlaw who resisted unjust land laws and robbed the rich. Or, as today, under the capitalist regime, we cannot withhold our sympathy from political prisoners even though they have committed acts of violence which we deplore. But when we have made sex laws that we know are just and sensible, then we shall consider that we have the right to restrain sex criminals. And in extreme cases, we shall avail ourselves of the skill of science to perform a surgical operation which will render him unable in future to prey upon the love needs of people who are placed at his mercy by their best qualities, their unselfishness and lack of suspicion. We clear out foul-smelling weeds from our garden because we wish to raise beautiful flowers and useful herbs therein. There lives in California a student of plant life who has shown us what we can do, not by magic or by superhuman efforts, but simply by loving plants, by watching them ceaselessly, understanding their ways, and guiding their sex life to our own purposes. We can perform what to our ignorant ancestors would have seemed to be miracles. We can actually make all sorts of new plants, which will continue to breed their own kind and survive forever if we give them proper care. In other words, Luther Burbank has shown us that we can change plant nature. There flash back upon my memory all those dull, weary, sick human creatures who have repeated to me that dull, weary, sick old formula, you cannot change human nature. 
I do not think I am indulging either in religious superstition or in blind optimism, but am speaking precisely in saying that whenever human beings get ready to apply experimental science to themselves, they can change human nature just as they now change plant nature. By putting human bodies together in love, we make new bodies of children more beautiful than any who have yet romped on the earth. And in the same way, by putting minds and souls together, we can make new kinds of minds and souls, different from those we have previously known, and greater than either the man's soul or the woman's soul alone. Also, by the magic which is the law of mind and soul life, each new creation can be multiplied to infinity and shared by all other minds and souls that live in the present or may live in the future. We have shown elsewhere how genius multiplies to infinity the joy and power of life by means of the arts, and one of the greatest of the arts is the art of love. Consider the great lovers, the true lovers of history, how they have enriched the lives of us all. It does not make any difference whether these men and women lived in the flesh or in the brain of a poet. We learn alike from Dante and Beatrice, from Abelard and Eloise, from Robert and Elizabeth Browning, from Tristan and Isolde, from Romeo and Juliet. What is the depth and the splendor of this passion which lies hidden within us, and how it may enrich and vivify and glorify all life? End of chapter 47 End of section 3「Four, The Book of Society – Chapters 48 and 49 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 48 – The Ego and the world, discusses the beginning of consciousness in the infant and in primitive man, and the problem of its adjustment to life. We have now to consider the relationship of man to his fellows, with whom he lives in social groups. Upon this problem floods of light have been thrown by the new science of psychoanalysis. I will try to give, briefly and in simple language, an idea of these discoveries. One of the laws of biology is that every individual, in his development, reproduces the history of the race, so that impulses and mental states of a child reveal to us what our far-off ancestors loved and feared. The same thing is discovered to be true of neurotics, people who have failed in adjusting themselves to civilized life, and have gone back, in some or all of their mental traits, to infantile states. If we analyze the unconscious minds of nervous patients, and compare them with what we find in the minds of infants and in savages, we discover the same dreams, the same longings, and the same fears. The mental life of man begins in the womb. We cannot observe that life directly but we know that it is there, because there cannot be organic life without mind to direct it. And just as there is an unconscious mind that regulates the bodily process in adults, so in the embryo there must be an unconscious mind to direct the flow of blood, the building of bones, muscle, eyes, and brain. The mental life of that unborn creature is, of course, purely egotistical, it knows nothing outside itself, and it finds this universe an agreeable place, everything being supplied to it, promptly and perfectly, without effort of its own. But suddenly it gets its first shock. Pain begins, and severe discomfort, and the creature is shoved out into a cold world, yelling in protest against the unsought change. And from that moment on, the newborn infant labors to adjust itself to an entirely new set of conditions. Discomforts trouble it, and it cries, 
quickly it learns that these cries are answered and satisfaction of its needs is furnished somehow magically things appear warm and dry covering a trickle of delicious hot milk into its mouth at first the infant mind has no idea how all this happens but gradually it comes to realize objects outside itself and it forms the idea that these objects exist to serve its wants later on it learns that there are particular sounds which attach to particular objects and cause them to function the sound mama for example produces a goddess clothed in beauty and power performing miracles so the infant mind arrives at the period of magic gestures and the period of magic words corresponding to a certain type of myth and belief which we find in every race and tribe of human beings that now exists or ever has existed on earth all these stories about magic wishes and magic rings and magic spells of a thousand sorts and nowhere on earth a child which does not listen greedily to such fancies the reason is simply that the child has passed through this stage of mental life and so recently that the feelings are close to the surface of his consciousness but gradually the infant makes the painful discovery that not everything in existence can be got to serve him there are forces which are proof against his magic spells there are some which are hostile and these the infant learns to regard with hatred and fear sometimes hatred and fear are strangely mixed with admiration and love for example there is a powerful being known as father who is sometimes good and useful but at other times takes the attention of the supremely useful mother the source of food and warmth and life so father is hated and in fancy he is wished out of the way which to the infant is the same thing as killing out of this grows a whole universe of fascinating mental life which freud calls by the name the oedipus complex after the legend of the greek hero who murdered his father and committed incest with his mother and then when he discovered what he had done put out his own eyes there is a mass of legends old as human thought repeating this story we cannot be sure whether they have grown out of the greeds and jealousies of this early wish life of the infant or whether they had their base in the fact that there was a stage in human progress in which the father really was killed off by the sons this latter idea is discussed by freud in his book totem and taboo it appears that primitive man lived in hordes which were dominated by one old male who kept all the women to himself and either killed the young males or drove them out to shift for themselves so the young men would combine and murder their father the forming of human society of marriage and family depended upon one factor the decision of the young victors to live and let live the only way they could do this was to agree not to quarrel over the women of their own group but to seek other women from other groups this may account for what is known as exogamy an almost universal marriage custom of primitive man whereby a man named jones is barred by frightful taboos from the women named jones but is permitted relations with all the women named smith to return to our infant he is in the midst of a painful process of adjusting himself to the outside world discovering that sometimes all his magic words and gestures fail his wishes no longer come true there are beings outside him with wills of their own and power to enforce them he has to learn to get along with these beings and give up his pleasures to theirs these processes which go on in the infant soul the hopes and the terrors the griefs and the angers are of the profoundest significance for later adult life for nothing gets out of the mind that has once got into it the infantile cravings which are repressed and forgotten stay in the unconscious and work there 
and strive still for expression. The conscious mind will not tolerate them, but they escape in the form of fairy tales and stories, of dreams and delusions, slips of the tongue, and many other mental events which it is fascinating to examine. Also, if we are weakened by ill health, or nervous strain, these infantile wishes may take the form of neuroses, and fully grown people may take to stammering, or become impotent, or hysterical, or even insane, because of failures of adjustment to life that happened when they were a year or two old. These things are known, not merely as a matter of theory, but because as soon as by analysis these infant secrets are brought into consciousness and adjusted there, the trouble instantly ceases. So it appears that the whole process of human life, from the very hour of birth, consists of the correct adjustment of men and women in relation to their fellows. Not merely is man a social being, but all the prehuman ancestors of men for ages upon geologic ages, have been social beings. They have lived in groups, and their survival has depended upon their success in fitting themselves snugly into group relationships. Failure to make correct adjustments means punishment by the group, or by enemies outside the group, if the failure is serious enough. It means death. We may assert that the task of understanding one's fellow men, and making oneself understood by them, is the most important task that confronts every individual. And if we look about the world at present, the most superficial of us cannot fail to realize that the task is far from being correctly performed. So many people unhappy, so many striving for what they cannot get so many having to be locked behind bars like savage beasts because they demand something which the world is resolved not to let them have so many having to be killed by rifles and machine guns by high explosive shells and poison gas because they misunderstood the social facts about them and thought they could fulfill some wishes which the rest of mankind wanted them to repress as I read the psychoanalyst's picture of the newly born infant with its primitive ego, its magic cries and magic gestures, I cannot be sure how much of it is sober science and how much is mordant irony. A sketch of the mental states of the men and women I see about me, whole classes of men and women, yes, even whole nations. The effort of the following chapters will be to interpret to men and women the world which they have made, and to which they are trying to adjust themselves. More especially, we shall try to show how, by better adjustments, men may change both themselves and the world, and make both into something less cruel and less painful, more serene and more certain and more free. End of chapter 48. Chapter 49. Competition and Cooperation. Discuss the relation of the adult to society and the part which selfishness and unselfishness play in the development of social life. Pondering the subject of this chapter, I went for a stroll in the country and, seating myself in a lonely place, became lost in thought, when suddenly, my eye was caught by something moving. On the bare, hot, gray sand lay a creature that I could see when it moved and could not see when it was still, for it was exactly the color of the ground, and it fitted the ground tightly, being flat, and having its edges scalloped so that they mingled with the dust. It was a lizard, covered with heavy scales and with sharp horns, to make it unattractive eating. At the slightest motion from me, it vanished into a heap of stones, so quickly that my eye could scarcely follow it. This creature, you perceive, is in its actions and its very form an expression of terror, T 
terror of devouring enemies, of jackals that pounce and hawks that swoop, and also of the hot desert air that seeks to dry out its few precious drops of moisture. Practically all the energies of this creature are concentrated upon the securing of its own individual survival. To be sure, it will mate, but the process will be quick, and the eggs will be left for the sun to hatch out, and the baby lizards will shift for themselves. That is to say, they will be incarnations of terror from the moment they open their eyes to the light. The jackal seeks to pounce upon the lizard, and so inspires terror in the lizard. But when you watch the jackal, you find that it exhibits terror toward more powerful foes. You find that the hawk, which swoops upon the lizard, is equally quick to swoop away when it comes upon a man with a gun. This preying and being preyed upon, this mixture of cruelty and terror, is a conspicuous fact of nature. If you go into any orthodox school or college in America today, you will be taught that it is nature's most fundamental law and governs all living things. If you should take a course in political economy under a respectable professor, you would find him explaining that such cruelty terror applies equally in human affairs. It is the basis of all economic science, and the effort to escape from it is like the effort to lift yourself by your bootstraps. The professor calls this cruelty terror by the name competition, and he creates for his own purposes an abstract being whom he names the economic man a creature who acts according to this law and exists under these conditions. One of the professor's formulas is the so-called Malthusian law, that population presses always upon the limits of subsistence. Another is the law of diminishing returns of agriculture, that you can get only so much product out of a certain piece of land, no matter how much labor and capital you put into it. Another is Ricardo's Iron Law of Wages, that wages cannot rise above the cost of living. Another is embedded in the formula of Adam Smith, that competition is the life of trade. The professor enunciates these laws, coldly and impersonally, as becomes a scientist, but if you go into the world of business, you find them set forth cynically in scores of maxims and witticisms. Doggy dog. The devil take the hindmost. Business is business. Do others, or they will do you. Evidently, however, there is something in man which rebels against these natural laws. In our present society, man has set aside six days in the week in which to live under them, and one day in the week in which to preach an entirely different and contradictory code, that of Christian ethics, which bids you love your neighbor and do unto others as you would they should do unto you. Between these Sunday teachings and the weekday teachings, there is eternal conflict, and one who takes pleasure in ridiculing his fellow men can find endless opportunity here. The Sunday preachers are forbidden to interfere with the affairs of the other six days. That is called dragging politics into the pulpit. On the other hand, incredible as it may seem, there are professors of the weekday doctrine who call themselves Christians and believe in the Sunday doctrine too. They manage this by putting the Sunday doctrine off into a future world that is, we are to pounce upon one another and devour one another under the iron laws of economics so long as we live on earth. But in the next world, we shall play on golden harps and have nothing to do but love one another. If anybody is so foolish as to apply the Sermon on the Mount to present-day affairs, we regard him as a harmless crank. If he persists and sets out to teach others, we call him a communist or a pacifist and put him in jail for 10 or 20 years. In the Book of the Mind, I have referred to Kropotkin's mutual aid as a factor in evolution, 
which I regard as one of the epoch-making books of our time. Kropotkin clearly proves that competition is not the only law of nature. It is everywhere modified by cooperation, and in the great majority of cases cooperation plays a larger part in the relations of living creatures than competition. There is no creature in existence which is entirely selfish. In the nature of the case, such a creature could not exist, save in the imaginations of teachers of special privilege. If a species is to survive, some portion of the energies of the individual must go into reproduction. And steadily, as life advances, we find the amount of this sacrifice increasing. The higher the type of the creature, the longer is the period of infancy, and the greater the sacrifice of the parent for the young. Likewise, most creatures make the discovery that by staying together in herds or groups and learning to cooperate instead of competing among themselves, they increase their chances of survival. You find birds that live in flocks, and other birds like hawks and owls and eagles that are solitary and you find the cooperating birds a thousand times as numerous that is to say a thousand times as successful in the struggle for survival you find that all man's brain power has been a social product the supremacy he has won over nature has depended upon one thing and one alone the fact that he has managed to become different from the economic man, that product of the imagination of the defenders of privilege. It is evident that both competition and cooperation are necessary to every individual, and the health of the individual and of the race lies in the proper combination of the two. If a creature were wholly unselfish, if it made no effort to look after its own individual welfare, it would be exterminated before it had a chance to reproduce. If, on the other hand, it cannot learn to cooperate, its progeny stand less chance of survival against creatures which have learned this important lesson. We have a nation of 110 million people who have learned to cooperate to a certain limited extent. Some of us realize how vastly the happiness of these millions might be increased by a further extension of cooperation. But we find ourselves opposed by the professors of privilege, and we wish that these gentlemen would go out and join the lizards of the desert sands or the sharks of the sea, creatures which really practice the system of laissez-faire which the professors teach. The plain truth is that we cannot make a formula out of either competition or cooperation. We cannot settle any problem of economics, of business or legislation, by proclaiming, for example, that competition is the life of trade. Competition may just as well turn out to be the death of trade. It depends entirely upon the kind of competition and the stage of trade development to which it is applied. In the early 18th century, when that formula of Adam Smith was written, competition was observed to keep down prices and provide stimulus to enterprise, and so to further abundant production. But the time came when the machinery for producing goods was in excess, not merely of the needs of the country, but of the available foreign markets, and then suddenly the large-scale manufacturers made the discovery that competition was the death of trade to them. They proceeded, as a matter of practical common sense, and without consulting their college professors, to abolish competition by forming trusts. We passed laws forbidding them to do this, but they simply refused to obey the laws. In the United States, they have made good their refusal for 35 years, and, in the end, have secured the blessing of the Supreme Court upon their course. So now we have cooperation in large-scale production and marketing. It is known by various names, pools, syndicates, price-fixing, gentlemen's agreements. 
it is a blessing for those who cooperate but it proves to be the death of those who labor and also of those who consume and we see these also compelled to combine forming labor unions and consumer societies each side to the quarrel insists that the other side is committing a crime in refusing to compete and our whole social life is rent with dissensions over this issue manifestly we need to clear our minds of dead doctrines to think out clearly just what we mean by competition and what by cooperation and what is the proper balance between the two i have been at pains in this book to provide a basis for the deciding of such questions it is a practical problem the fostering of human life and the furthering of its development we cannot lay down any fixed rule we have to study the facts of each case separately we shall say this kind of competition is right because it helps to protect human life and develop its powers we shall say this other kind of competition is wrong because it has the opposite effect we shall say perhaps that some kind was right fifty years ago or even ten years ago because it then had certain effects but meantime some factor has changed and it is now having a different effect and therefore ought to be abolished there has never been any kind of human competition which men did not judge and modify in that way there is no field of human activity in which ethical codes do not condemn certain practices as unfair the average englishman considers it proper that two men who get into a dispute shall pull off their coats and settle the question at issue by pummeling each other's noses but let one of these men strike his opponent in the groin or let him kick his shins and instantly there will be a howl of execration likewise an anglo-saxon man who fights with his fists has a loathing for sicilian or greek or other mediterranean man who will pull a knife that kind of competition is barred among our breeds and also the kind which consists of using poisons or of starting slanders against your opponent if you look back through history you find many forms of competition which were once eminently respectable but now have been outlawed there was a time for example when the distinction we draw between piracy and sea war was wholly unknown the ships of the vikings would go out and raid the ships and seaports of other peoples and carry off booty and captives and the men who did that were sung as heroes of the nation the british sea captains of the time of queen elizabeth drake frobisher and the rest of them are portrayed in our school books as valiant and hardy men and the british colonies were built on the basis of their activities yet according to the sea laws enforced today they were pirates we regard a cannibal race with abhorrence yet there was a time when all vigorous races of men were cannibals and the habit of eating your enemies in battle may well have given an advantage to the races which practiced it on the other hand you find sentimental people who reject all competition on principle and would like to abolish every trace of it from society and especially from education but stop and consider for a moment what that would mean would you abolish for example the competition of love the right of a man to win the girl he wants you could not do it of course but if you could you would abolish one of the principal methods by which our race has been improved of course what you really want is not to abolish competition in love but to raise it to a higher form there is an old saying all's fair in love and war but no one ever meant that you would not admit that a man might compete in love by threatening to kill the girl if she preferred a rival you would not admit that he might compete by poisoning the other man you would not admit that he might compete by telling falsehoods about the other man 
on the other hand if you are sensible you admit that he has a right to compete by making his character known to the girl and if the other man is a rascal by telling the girl that would you abolish the competition of art the effort of men to produce work more beautiful and inspiring than has ever been known before would you abolish the effort of scientists to overthrow theories which have hitherto been accepted obviously not you make these forms of competition seem better by calling them emulation but you do not in the least modify the fact that they involve the right of one person to outdo other persons to supplant them and take away something from them whether it be property or position or love or fame or power in that sense competition is indeed the law of life and you might as well reconcile yourself to it and learn to play your part with spirit and good humor also you might as well train your children to it you will find you cannot develop their powers to the fullest without competition in fact you will be forced to go back and utilize forms of competition which are now out of date among adults i have told in the book of the body how i myself tried for ten years or more to live without physical competition and discovered that i could not i have had to take up some form of sport and hundreds of thousands of other men have had the same experience what is sport it is a deliberate going back under carefully devised rules to the savage struggles of our ancestors the very essence of real sport is that the contestants shall within the rules laid down compete with each other to the limit of their powers with what contempt would a player of tennis or baseball or whist regard the proposition that his opponent should be merciful to him and let him win now and then obviously these things have no place in the game and to be a good sport is to conform to the rules and take with enjoyment whatever issue of the struggle may come but then again suppose you are competing with a child obviously the conditions are different you no longer play the best you can you let the child win a part of the time but you do not let the child know this or it would spoil the fun for the child you pretend to try as hard as you know how and you cry out in grief when you are beaten and the child crows with delight and yet that does not keep you from loving the child or the child from loving you the purpose of this elaborate exposition is to make clear the very vital point that a certain set of social acts may be right under some conditions and desperately wrong under other conditions they may be right in play and not in serious things they may be right in youth and not in maturity they may be right at one period of the world's development while at another period they are destructive of social existence if therefore we wish to know what are right and wrong actions in the affairs of men if we wish to judge any particular law or political platform or program of business readjustment the first thing we have to do is to acquire a mass of facts concerning the society to which the law or platform or program is to be applied we need to ask ourselves exactly what will be the effect of that change applied in that particular way at that particular time in order to decide accurately we need to know the previous stages through which that society has passed the forces which have been operating in it and the ways in which they have worked but also we must realize that the lessons of history cannot ever be accepted blindly the principles of the founders apply to us only in modified form for the world in which we live today is different from any world which has ever been before and the world tomorrow will be different yet 
we are the makers of it and the masters of it and what it will be depends to some extent upon our choice in fact that is the most important lesson for all of us to learn the final purpose of all our thought about the world is to enable us to make it a happier and a better world for ourselves and for our posterity to live in end of chapter 49 Chapters 50, 51, and 52 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 50, Aristocracy and Democracy, discusses the idea of superior classes and races, and whether there is a natural basis for such a doctrine. In the letters of Thomas Jefferson is found the following passage. All eyes are open or opening to the rights of man. The general spread of the light of science has already laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favor few, booted and spurred, ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of God this which jefferson over a hundred years ago described as a palpable truth is still a long way from prevailing in the world we are trying in this book not to take anything for granted so we do not assume this truth but investigate it and we begin by admitting that there are many facts which seem to contradict it and which make it more difficult of proof than jefferson realized it is not enough to point out the lack of saddles on the backs and of boots and spurs on the feet of newly born infants for the fact is that men are not exploited because of saddles nor is the exploiting accomplished by means of boots and spurs it is done by means of gold and steel banks and credit system railroads machine guns and battleships and while it is not true that certain races and classes are born with these things on them, they are born to the possession of them, and the vast majority of mankind are without them all their lives, and without the ability to use them, even if they had them. The doctrine that all men are created equal, or that they ought to be equal, we shall describe for convenience as the democratic doctrine. It first came to general attention through Christianity, which proclaimed the brotherhood of all mankind in a common fatherhood of God. But even as taught by the Christians, the doctrine had startling limitations. It was several centuries before a church council summoned the courage to decide that women were human beings and had souls, and today many devout Christians are still uncertain whether Japanese and Chinese and Filipinos and Negroes are human beings and have souls. I have heard old gentlemen in the South gravely maintain that the Negro is not a human being at all, but a different species of animal. I have heard learned men in the South set forth that the sutures in the Negro skull close at some very early age and thus make moral responsibility impossible for the black race. And you will find the same ideas maintained not merely as to differences of race and color, but as to differences of economic condition. You will find the average aristocratic Englishman quite convinced that the lower orders are permanently inferior to himself, and this, though they are of the same Anglo-Saxon stock for convenience i will refer to the doctrine that there is some natural and irremovable inferiority of certain races or classes as the aristocratic doctrine i will probably startle some of my readers by making the admission that if there is any such natural or irremovable inferiority then a belief in political or economic equality is a blunder if there are certain classes or races which cannot think 
or cannot learn to think as well as other classes and races, those mentally inferior classes and races will obey, and they will be made to obey. And neither you nor I, nor all the preachers and agitators in the world, will ever be able to arrange it otherwise. Suppose we could do it. We should be committing a crime against life. We should be holding down the race and aborting its best development. Is there any such natural and irremovable inferiority in human beings? When we come to study the question, we find it complicated by a different phenomenon, that of racial immaturity, which we have to face frankly and get clear in our minds. One of the most obvious facts of nature is that of infancy and childhood. We have just pointed out that if you are competing with a child, you do it in an entirely different way and under an entirely different set of rules, and if you fail to do this, you are unfair and even cruel to the child. And it is a fact of our world that there are some races more backward in the scale of development than other races. You may not like this fact, but it is silly to try to evade it. People who live in savage huts and beat on tom-toms and fight with bows and arrows and cannot count beyond a dozen. Such people are not the mental or moral equals of our highly civilized races, and to treat them as equals and compete with them on that basis means simply to exterminate them. And we should either exterminate them at once and be done with it, or else make up our minds that they are in a childhood stage of our race, and that we have to guide them and teach them as we do our children. There is no more useful person than the wise and kind teacher. But suppose we saw some one pretending to be a teacher to our children, while in reality enslaving and exploiting them, or secretly robbing and corrupting them. What would we say about that kind of teacher? The name of that teacher is capitalist commercialism, and his profession is known as the white man's burden. His abuse of power is the cause of our present racial wars and revolts of subject peoples. A fair-minded man, desirous of facing all the facts of life, hardly knows what stand to take in such a controversy that is, hardly knows from which cause the colored races suffer more, the white man's exploitation or their own native immaturity. To say that certain races are in a childhood stage and need instruction and discipline is an entirely different thing from saying that they are permanently inferior and incapable of self-government. Whether they are permanently inferior is a problem for the man of science, to be determined by psychological tests, continued possibly over more than one generation. We have not as yet made a beginning. In fact, we have not even acquired the scientific impartiality necessary to such an inquiry. In the meantime, all that we can do is to look about us and pick up hints where we can in places like Massachusetts, where Negroes are allowed to go to college and are given a chance to show what they can do. They have not ousted the white man, but many of them have certainly won his respect, and one finds charming and cultured men among them who show no signs of prematurely closed-up skulls. And one after another we see the races which have been held down as being inferior developing leadership and organization and power of moral resistance. The Irish are showing themselves today one of the most vigorous and high-spirited of all races. The Hindus are developing a movement which, in the long run, may prove more powerful than the white man's gold and steel. The Egyptians, the Persians, the Filipinos, the Koreans are all devising ways to break the power of capitalist newspaper censorship. How sad that the subject races of the world have to get their education through hatred of their teachers instead of through love. Of course, these rebel leaders are men who have absorbed the white man's culture, 
at least in part, practically always, they are of the younger generation which has been to the white man's schools. But this is the very answer we have been seeking, as to whether the race is permanently inferior, or merely immature and in need of training. It is not only among the brown and black and yellow races that progress depends upon the young generations. That is a universal fact of life. In the course of this argument, we shall assume that the Christian or democratic theory has the weight of probability on its side, and that nature has not created any permanently and necessarily inferior race or class. We shall assume that the heritage of culture is a common heritage, open to all our species. We shall not go so far as the statement which Jefferson wrote into the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created free and equal, but we shall assert that they are created with certain inalienable rights, and that among these is the right to maintain their lives and to strive for liberty and happiness. Also, we shall say that there will never be peace or order in the world until they have found liberty and recognition of their right to happiness. End of chapter 50 Chapter 51 Ruling Classes Deals with authority in human society, how it is obtained, and what sanction it can claim. It is possible to conceive an order of nature in which all individuals were born and developed exactly alike and with exactly equal powers, such is apparently the case with lower animals, for example the ants and bees. But among human beings there are great differences. Some are born idiots, and some are born geniuses. Even supposing that we are able to do away with blindness and idiocy, it is not likely that we can ever make a race of uniform genius. There will always be some more capable minds who will discover new powers of life, and will compel the others to learn from them. It is to the interest of the race that this learning should be done as quickly as possible. In other words, the great problem of society is how to recognize superior minds and put them in authority. We look back over history and discover a few wise men and many rulers, but very, very rarely does it happen that the ruler is a wise man or a friend of wise men. Far more often we find the ruler occupied in suppressing the wise man and his wisdom. There was a ruler who allowed the mob to crucify Jesus, and another who ordered Socrates to drink the hemlock, and another who tortured Galileo, and another who chopped off the head of Sir Walter Raleigh, and so on through a long and tragic chronicle. And even when the accident of a wise ruler occurs, he is apt to be surrounded by a class of parasites and corrupt officials who are busy to thwart his will. The general run of history is this. Some group seizes power by force and holds it by the same means, and seeks to augment and perpetuate it. Those who win the power are frequently men of energy and practical sense, and do fairly well as governors. But they are never able to hand on their virtues, and their line becomes corrupted by sensuality and self-indulgence, and the subject classes are plundered and driven to revolt. Often the revolt fails, but in the course of time it succeeds, and there is a new dynasty, or a new ruling class, sometimes a little better than the old, sometimes worse. How shall one judge whether the new regime is better or worse? Obviously, this is a most important question. It has to do not merely with history, but with our daily affairs, our voting. As one who has read some tens of thousands of pages of history and has pondered its lessons with heart sickness and despair, I lay down this general law by which revolts and changes of power may be judged. If the change results in the holding of power by a smaller number of people, it is a reaction. 
but if the change results in distributing the power among a larger group of the community, then that community has made a step in advance. I have seen a sketch of the history of some Central American country, Guatemala, I think, which showed 130 revolutions in less than a 100 years. Some rascal gets together a gang and seizes the government and plunders its revenue. When he has plundered too much, some other rascal stirs up the people and gets together another gang. Such revolutions we regard as subjects for comic opera and for the Richard Harding Davis type of fiction. But we do not consider them as having any relationship to progress. We describe them as palace revolutions. But compare with this the various English revolutions. We write learned histories about them and describe England as the mother of parliaments. The reason for this is that when there was political discontent in England, the protesting persons proceeded to organize themselves and to understand their trouble and to remedy it. They had the brain power to do this. They maintained their right to do it, and when by violence or threats of violence they forced the ruling class to give way, they brought about a wider extension of liberty, a wider distribution of power. Tennyson has pictured England as a state where freedom slowly broadens down from precedent to precedent. We, today, reading its history, are inclined to put a sarcastic emphasis on the word slowly. But Tennyson would answer that it is better for a community to move forward slowly than to move forward rapidly and then move backward nearly as far. We have pointed out several times the important fact of biology, that change does not necessarily mean progress from any rational or moral point of view. Degeneration is just as real a fact as progress and it does not at all follow that because things change they are changing for the better. It is worth while to repeat this in discussing human society, for it is just as true of governments and morals as of living species. A nation may pile up wealth and multiply a hundredfold the machinery of wealth production and only be increasing luxury and wantonness and graft. A nation may change its governmental forms, its laws and social conventions, and boast noisily of these changes in the name of progress, while, as a matter of fact, it is following swiftly the road to ruin, which all the empires of history have traced. So far as I can discover, there is one test and only one by which you can judge, and that is the test already indicated. Is the actual effective power of the state wielded by a larger or a smaller percentage of the population than before the change took place. You will note the words actual effective power. Nothing is more familiar in human life than for forms to survive after the spirit which created them is dead. And nothing is more familiar than the use of these forms as masks to deceive the populace. There have been many times in history when people have gone on voting long after their votes ceased to count for anything. There have been many times when people have gone through the motions of freedom long after they have been slaves. Mexico, under Diaz, had one of the most perfect of constitutions, and was in reality one of the most perfect of despotisms. And we Americans are sadly familiar with political democracies, which do not work. Shall we, therefore, join the pessimists and say that history is a blind struggle for useless power and that the notion of progress is a delusion? I do not think so. On the contrary, I think it is easily to be demonstrated that there has been a steady increase in the amount of knowledge possessed by the race and in the spread of this knowledge among the whole population. I think that through most of the period of written history we can trace a real development in human society. I think we can analyze the laws of this development and explain its methods, 
and i think this knowledge is precious to us because it enables us to accelerate the process and to make the end more certain this task the analysis of social evolution is the task we have next to undertake end of chapter 51 chapter 52 the process of social evolution discusses the series of changes through which human society has passed we have now to consider briefly the history of man as a social being the groups he has formed and the changes in his group systems everything in life grows and human societies are no exception to the rule they have undergone a long process of evolution which we can trace in detail and which we find conforms exactly to the law laid down by herbert spencer a process whereby a number of single and similar things become different parts of one complex thing in the case of human societies the units are men and women and social evolution is a process whereby a small and simple group in which the individuals are practically alike grows into a large and complex group in which the individuals are widely different and their relations one to another are complicated and subtle there are two powerful forces pressing upon human beings and compelling them to struggle and grow the first of these forces is fear the need of protection against enemies the second is hunger the need of food and the means of producing and storing food the first causes the individual to combine with his fellows and establish some form of government and this is the origin of political evolution the second causes him to accumulate wealth and to combine industrially and this is the origin of economic evolution because the first force is a little more urgent we observe in the history of human society that evolution in government precedes evolution in industry i made the statement some twenty years ago in an article in collier's weekly i wrote to the effect that man's first care was to secure himself against his enemies and that when he had done this he set out to secure his food supply collier's called upon the late professor sumner of yale university a prize reactionary and tory of the old school to answer me and professor summer made merry over my statement declaring that man sought for food long before he was safe from his enemies some years later when sumner died one of his admirers wrote in the new york evening post that he had completely overwhelmed me and i had acknowledged my defeat by failing to reply something which struck me as very funny it was of course possible that sumner had overwhelmed me but to say that i had considered myself overwhelmed was to attribute to me a degree of modesty of which i was wholly incapable as a matter of fact i had had my usual experience with capitalist magazines collier's weekly had promised to publish my rejoinder to sumner but failed to keep the promise and finally when i worried them they tucked the answer away in the back part of the paper among the advertisements of cigars and toilet soaps professor sumner is gone but he has left behind him an army of pupils and i will protect myself against them by phrasing my statement with extreme care i do not mean to say that man first secures himself completely against his enemies and then goes out to hunt for a meal of course he has to eat while he is countering the moves of his enemies he has to eat while he is on the march to battle or in flight from it but ask yourself this question which would you choose if you had to choose to go a couple of days with nothing to eat or to have your throat cut by bandits and your wife and children carried away into slavery certainly you would do your fighting first and meantime you would scratch together any food you could while you were devoting your energies to putting down civil war or to making a treaty with other tribes or to preparing for a military campaign you would continue to get food in the way your ancestors had got it 
in other words your economic evolution would wait while your political evolution proceeded but when you had succeeded in putting down your enemies and had a long period of peace before you then you would plant some fields and domesticate some animals or perhaps discover some new way of weaving cloth and so your industrial life would make progress it is easy to see why professor sumner wished to confuse this issue he could not deny political evolution because it had happened he despised and feared political democracy but it was here and he had to speak politely to it as to a tiger that had got into the house but industrial democracy was a thing that had not yet happened in the world it was only a hope and a prophecy and therefore a prize old tory was free to ridicule it i remember reading somewhere his statement the notion that democracy had anything to do with industry or could in any way be applied to industry was a piece of silliness so of course he sought to demolish my idea that there was a process of evolution in economic affairs paralleling the process of political evolution which had already culminated in democracy let us consider the process of political evolution briefly and in its broad outlines take any savage tribe you find it composed of individuals who are very much alike some are a little stronger than others a little more clever more powerful in battle but the difference is slight and when the tribe chooses someone to lead them they might as well choose one man as another they all have a say in the tribe councils both men and women their rights in the tribe are the same they are of course slaves to ignorance to degrading superstition and absurd taboos but these things apply to everyone alike there is no privileged caste no hereditary inequality but little by little as the tribe grows in numbers and in power and intelligence as it comes to capture slaves in battle and to unite with other tribes there comes to be an hereditary chieftain and a group of his leading supporters his courtiers and henchmen when the society has evolved into the stage which we call barbarism there is a permanent superior caste there are hereditary priests who have in their keeping the favor of the gods and there is a subject population of slaves the society moves on into the feudal stage in which the various grades and classes are precisely marked off each with its different functions its different privileges and rights and duties the feudal principalities and duchies war and struggle among themselves they are united by marriage or by conquest and presently some stronger ruler brings a great territory under his power and we have what is called a kingdom a society still larger still more complex in its organization and still more rigid in its class distinctions take france under the ancient regime and compare a courtier or noble gentleman with a serf they are not only different before the law they are different in the language they use in the clothes they wear in the ideas they hold they are different even in their bodies so that the gentleman regards the serf as an inferior species of creature the kings warred among themselves and emperors arose the ultimate ideal in europe was a political society which should include the whole continent and this idea was several times almost attained but it is the rule of history that wherever a society is built upon the basis of privilege and enslavement the ruling classes prove morally and intellectually unequal to the burden put upon them they become corrupted and their rule becomes intolerable this happened in europe and there came political revolutions first in england which accomplished it by gradual stages and then in the french monarchy and quite recently in a dozen monarchies and empires large and small what precisely is this political revolution let us consider the case of france where the change was sudden and the issues precisely drawn king louis the fourteenth had said i am the state 
to a person of our time that might seem like boasting but it was merely an assertion of the existing political fact king louis was the state by universal consent and by divine authority as all men believed the army was his army the navy was his navy and wars when he made them were his wars everyone in the state was his subject and all the property of the state was his personal private property to dispose of as he pleased the government officials carried out his will and members of the nobility held the land and ruled in his name but now suddenly the people of france overthrew the king and put him to death and drove the nobles into exile they seized the power of the french state and proclaimed themselves equal citizens in the state with equal voices in its government and equal rights before the law so we call france a republic and describe this form of society as political democracy it is the completion of the process of political evolution and you will see that it moves in a sort of spiral having completed a circle and got back to where it was before but upon a higher plane the citizens of a modern republic are equal before the law just as were the members of the savage tribe but the political organization is vastly larger and infinitely more complicated and every individual lives his life upon a higher level because he shares in the benefits of this more highly organized and more powerful end of chapter fifty two chapters fifty three fifty four and fifty five of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifty three industrial evolution examines the process of evolution in industry and the stage which it has so far reached and now let us consider the process of industrial evolution we shall find it to be exactly the same thing reproducing the changes in another field of activity you may picture two gigantic waves sweeping over the ocean in some places the waves are far apart and in other places they are closer together for a time they may mingle and perhaps their bases always mingle it would be easy for a critic to point out how political affairs play a leading part in industrial evolution and vice versa it would be easy to argue that property rules the public state or again that the main function of the political state is to protect property as i have said man has to fight his enemies and he has to seek food and often he has to do the two things at the same time but nevertheless broadly speaking we observe two great waves sweeping over human society and most of the time these waves are clearly separated and easily distinguished industry in a savage tribe is like government simple and uniform all the members of the tribe get their living in the same way one may be a little more expert as a fisherman another as a gatherer of coconuts but the fisherman gathers coconuts and the coconut gatherer fishes in the days of primitive communism there is little economic strife and little change but as slavery comes in and the private property system there begins industrial war the members of the tribe trade with one another and argue over prices and gradually some get the better of others they accumulate slaves and goods and later on they appropriate the land to their private use of course the men who do this are often the rulers of the tribe and so politics and industry are mixed but even assuming that the state never interfered 
assuming that the government allowed business affairs to work themselves out in their own way, the tendency of competition is always to end in monopoly. The big fish eat the little fish. The strong gain advantage over the weak, the rich grow richer, and the poor grow relatively poorer. As the amount of trading increases, and men specialize in the arts of bargaining, we see again and again how money concentrates in the hands of a few. It does this even when the political state tries to prevent it, as, for example, when the princes and dukes of the Middle Ages would torture the Jewish moneylenders and take away their treasure. But the Jews never failed to grow rich again. It is when political evolution has completed itself and a republic has been set up that a free field is given to economic forces to work themselves out to their logical end. We have seen this in the United States, where we all started pretty much on the same economic level, and where political tyranny has had little hold. Our civilization is a civilization of the trader, the businessman as we call him, and we see how big business absorbs little business and grows constantly larger and more powerful. We are familiar with what we call graft, the use by businessmen of the powers of government to get trade advantage for themselves. And we have a school of old-time thinkers, calling themselves Jeffersonian Democrats, who insist that if only there had never been any government favors, economic equality and democracy would have endured forever in our country. But it is my opinion that government has done far more to prevent monopoly and special privilege in business than to favor it. And nevertheless, monopoly has grown. In other words, the tendency toward concentration in business, the absorption of small business by the big business, is an irresistible natural process, which neither can be nor should be hindered. The condition of competition, whether in politics or in industry, is never a permanent one, and can never be made permanent. It is a struggle which automatically brings itself to an end. Large-scale production and distribution is more economical than small-scale, and big business has irresistible advantages of credit and permanence over little business. As we shall presently show, the blind and indiscriminate production of goods under the competitive system leads to the glutting of markets and to industrial crises. At such times, the weaker concerns are weeded out and the strong ones take their trade. And as a result, we have the modern great corporation, the most powerful machine of production yet devised by man, and which corresponds in every aspect to the monarchy in political society. We are accustomed to speak of our captains of industry, our coal kings and beef barons and lords of steel, and we think we are using metaphors, but the universality of these metaphors points to a fundamental truth in them. As a matter of fact, our modern captain of industry fills in the economic world exactly the same functions as were filled in the ancient days by the head of the feudal state. He has won his power in a similar struggle, and he holds it by similar methods. He rules over an organization of human beings, arranged, economically speaking, in grades and classes, with their authorities and privileges and duties precisely determined as under the ancient regime. And just as King Louis said, I am the state, so Mr. Armour considers that he is Armour and Company, and Mr. Morgan considers that he is the House of Morgan, and that the business exists for him and is controlled by him under divine authority. If I am correct in my analysis of the situation, this process of industrial evolution is destined to complete itself, as in the case of the political state. The subject populations of industry are becoming more and more discontented with their servitude, more and more resentful of that authority which compels them to labor 
while others reap the benefit. They are organizing themselves and preparing for a social transformation which will parallel in every detail the revolution by which our ancestors overthrew the authority of King George III over the American colonies, and made inhabitants of those colonies no longer subjects of a king, but free and equal citizens of a republic. I expect to see a change throughout the world which will take the great instruments of production which we call corporations and trusts out of the hands of their present private owners and make them the property either of the entire community or of those who do the work in them. This change is the social revolution, and when it has completed itself, we shall have in that society an industrial republic a form of business management which constitutes economic democracy. The history of the world's political revolutions has been written almost exclusively by aristocratic or bourgeois historians, that is to say, by men who, whatever their attitude toward political democracy, have no conception of industrial democracy, and believe that industrial strife and enslavement are the normal conditions of life. If, however, you will read Kropotkin's Great French Revolution, you will be interested to discover how important a part was played in this revolution by economic forces. Underneath the political discontent of the merchants and middle classes lay a vast mass of social discontent of the peasants and workers. It was the masses of people who made the revolution, but it was the middle classes who seized it and turned it to their own ends, putting down attempts toward economic equality and confining the changes so far as possible to the political field. And everywhere throughout history, if you study revolutions, you will find that same thing happening. You find, for example, Martin Luther fighting for the right to preach the word of God without consulting the Pope. But when the peasants of Germany rose and sought to set themselves free from feudal landlords, Luther turned against them and called upon the princes to shoot them down. The ass needs to be beaten and the populace needs to be controlled with a strong hand. The landlords and property classes of England were willing to restrict the power of the king and to give the vote to the educated and well-to-do but from the time of Jack K. to our own, they shoot down the poor. But meantime, the industrial process continues. The modern factory system brings the workers together in larger and larger groups and teaches them the lesson of class consciousness. So the time of the workers draws near. The first attempt in modern times to accomplish the social revolution and set up industrial democracy was in the Paris Commune. When the French Empire collapsed after the war with Germany in 1871, the workers of Paris seized control. They were massacred, some 50,000 of them, and the propertied classes of France established the present bourgeois republic which has now become the bulwark of reaction throughout the continent of Europe. Next came the Russian Revolution of 1905, and this was an interesting illustration of the relation between the two waves of social progress. Russia was a backward country industrially, and according to theory, not at all prepared for the social revolution. But nowadays, the thoughts of men circulate all over the world, and the exiles from Russia had absorbed Marxian ideas and were not prepared to accept a purely political freedom. So in 1905, after the Japanese war, when the people rose and forced the Tsar to grant a parliament, the extremists made an effort to accomplish the social revolution at the same time. The peasants began to demand the land and the workers the factories, whereupon the capitalists and middle classes who wanted a parliament but did not want socialism went over to the side of reaction and both the political and social revolutions were crushed but then came the great war 
for which russia with her incompetent government and her undeveloped industry was unprepared the strain of it broke her down long before the other allies and in the universal suffering and ruin the russian people were again forced to rise the political revolution was accomplished the czar was imprisoned and the duma reigned supreme middle-class liberalism throughout the world gave its blessings to this revolution and hastened to welcome a new political democracy to the society of nations but then occurred what to orthodox democratic opinion had been the most terrifying spectacle in human history the russian people had been driven too far towards starvation and despair the masses had been too embittered and they rose again overthrowing not only their czar and their grand dukes but their capitalists and landowners for the first time in history the social revolution established itself and the workers were in control of a great state ever since then we have seen exactly what we saw in europe from seventeen eighty nine onward when the first political republic was established and all the monarchies and empires of the world banded themselves together to stamp it out we have witnessed a campaign of war blockade intrigue and propaganda against the soviet government of russia all pretending to be carried on in the name of the russian people and for the purpose of saving them from suffering but all obviously based upon one consideration and one alone the fear that an effort at industrial self-government might possibly prove to be a success whether or not the soviets will prove permanent no one can say but this much is certain just as the french revolution sent a thrill around the world and planted in the hearts of the common people the wonderful dream of freedom from kings and ruling classes just so the russian revolution has brought to the working masses the dream of freedom from masters and landlords everywhere in capitalist society this ferment is working and in one country after another we see the first pangs of new birth also we see capitalists and landlords who once found democracy free speech and equality before the law useful formulas to break down the power of kings and aristocrats now repudiating their old-time beliefs and going back to the frankest reaction we see in our own land of the free the government refusing to reprint the declaration of independence during the war and arresting men for quoting from it and circulating it we even see the department of justice refusing to allow people to reprint the sermon on the mount end of chapter fifty three chapter fifty four the class struggle discusses history as a battleground between ruling and subject classes and the method and outcome of this struggle there is a theory of social development sometimes called the materialistic interpretation of history and sometimes the economic interpretation of history it is one of the contributions to our thought which we owe to karl marx and like all the rest of marxian theory it is a subject of embittered controversy not merely between socialists and orthodox economists but between various schools of revolutionary doctrine for my part i have never been a great hand for doctrine whether ancient or modern i am not much more concerned with what marx taught than i am with what saint paul taught or what martin luther taught my advice is to look at life with your own eyes and to state in simple language the conclusions of your own thinking man is an eating animal he has also been described as a tool-making animal and might be described as an ideal-making animal there is a tendency on the part of those who specialize in the making of ideals to repudiate the eating and the tool-making sides of man which accounts for the quarrel between the marxians and the moralists all through history you find new efforts of man to develop his emotional and spiritual nature 
and to escape from the humiliating limitations of the flesh. These efforts have, many of them, been animated by desperate sincerity, but none of them have changed the fundamental fact that man is an eating animal, an animal insufficiently provided by nature against cold, and with an intense repugnance to having streams of cold water run down the back of his neck. The religious teachers go out with empty purse and take no thought for the morrow, but the forces of nature press insistently upon them, and little by little they make compromises. They take to shelter while they are preaching. They consent to live in houses, and even to own houses, and to keep a bank account. So they make terms with the powers of this world, and the powers of this world, which are subtle and awake to their own interest, find ways to twist the new doctrine to their ends. So the new religion becomes simply another form of the old hypocrisy, and it comes to us as a breath of fresh air in a room full of corruption when someone says, let us have done with aged shams and false idealisms. Let us face the facts of life and admit that man is a physical animal and cannot do any sane and constructive thinking until he has food and shelter provided. Let us look at history with unblinking eyes and realize that food and shelter, the material means of life, are what men have been seeking all through history and will continue to seek until we put production and distribution upon a basis of justice instead of a basis of force. Such is, as simply as I can phrase it, the materialistic interpretation of history. Put into its dress of scientific language, it reads, The dominant method of production and exchange in any society determines the institutions and forms of that society. I do not think I exaggerate in saying that this formula, applied with judgment and discrimination, is a key to the understanding of human societies. Wherever man has moved into the stage of slavery and private property, there has been some group which has held power and sought to maintain and increase it. This group has set the standards of behavior and belief for the community, and if you wish to understand the government and religion, the manners and morals, the philosophy and literature and art of that community, the first thing you have to do is to understand the dominant group and its methods of keeping itself on top. This statement applies not merely to those cultural forms which are established and ordained by the ruling class, it applies equally well to the revolutionary forms, the behavior and beliefs of those who oppose the ruling class. For men do not revolt in a vacuum. They revolt against certain conditions, and the form of their revolt is determined by the conditions. Take, for example, primitive Christianity, which was certainly an effort to be unworldly, if ever such an effort was made by man. But you cannot understand anything about primitive Christianity unless you see it as a new form of slave revolt against Roman imperialism and capitalism. The theory of the class struggle is the master key to the bewilderments and confusions of history. Always there is a dominant class, holding the power of the state, and always there are subject classes, and sooner or later the subject classes begin protesting and struggling for wider rights. When they think they are strong enough, they attempt a revolt, and sometimes they succeed. If they do, they write the histories of the revolt, and their leaders become heroes and statesmen. If they fail, the histories are written by their oppressors, and the rebels are portrayed as criminals. One of the commonest of popular assumptions is that if the rebels have justice on their side, they are bound to succeed in the long run. But this is merely the sentimental nonsense that is made out of history. It is perfectly possible for a just revolt to be crushed, and to be crushed again and again, just as it is possible for a child which is ready to be born to fail to be born and to perish miserably. The fact that the Huguenots 
had most of the virtue and industry and intelligence of France, did not keep them from being slaughtered by Catholic bigots, and reaction riveted upon the French people for a couple of hundred years. The fact that the Moors had most of the industry of Spain did not keep them from being driven into exile by the Inquisition, and the intellectual life of the Spanish people strangled for three hundred or four hundred years. Some eight hundred years ago, our ancestors in England brought a cruel and despotic king to battle, and conquered him, and on the field of Runnymede forced him to sign a grant of rights to Englishmen. That document is known as Magna Carta, or the Great Charter, and everyone who writes political history today recognizes it as one of the greatest of man's achievements, the beginning of a process which we hope will bring freedom and equality before the law to every human being on earth. And now we have come to the stage in our industrial affairs when the organized workers seek to bring the monarchs of industry into the council chamber and force them to sign a similar great charter which will grant freedom and self-government to the workers. Just as King John was forced to admit that the power to tax and spend the public revenue belonged to the people of England and not to the ruler, just so the workers will establish the principle that the finances of industry are a public concern, that the books are to be opened and prices fixed and wages paid by the democratic vote of the citizens of industry. If that change is accomplished, the historian of the future will recognize it as another momentous step in progress, and he will heed the protests of the lords of industry that they are being deprived of their freedom to do business and of their sacred legal rights to their profits as little as he heeded the protests of King John against the treason and usurpation and infringement of divine right by the rebellious barons. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 The Capitalist System Shows how wealth is produced in modern society and the effect of this system upon the minds of the workers. In the beginning, man got his living by hunting and fishing. Then he took to keeping flocks and herds, and later, by slow stages, he settled down to agriculture. With the introduction of slavery and the ownership of the land by ruling classes, there came to be a subject class of workers who toiled on the land from dawn to dark, year in and year out, and got, if they were fortunate, and existence for themselves and their families. Whether these workers were called slaves or serfs or peasants, whether their product was taken from them in the form of taxes by the king or of rent by the landlord made no difference. The workers were bound to the soil like the beasts with which they lived in intimate contact. They were drafted into armies and made to fight for their lords and masters. They suffered pestilence and famine, fire and slaughter, but with infinite patience they would rebuild their huts and dig and plant again, whether for the old master or for a new one. In the early days these workers made their own crude tools and weapons, but very early there must have been some who specialized in such arts, and with the growth of towns and communications came a new kind of labor based upon a new system. Some enterprising man would buy slaves or hire labor and obtain a supply of raw material and manufacture goods to be bartered or sold. He would pay his workers enough to draw them from the land and would sell the product for what he could get, and the difference would be his profit. That was capitalism, and at first it was a thing of no importance, and the men who engaged in it had no social standing. But princes and lords needed weapons and supplies for their armies, and the men who could furnish these things became more and more necessary, and the states which encouraged them were the ones which rose to power. Merchants and sea traders became the intimates of kings, 
and by the time of the roman empire capitalism was a great world power dominating the state using the armies of the state for its purposes it went down with the rest of roman civilization but in the middle ages it began once more to revive and by the end of the eighteenth century the merchants and money-lenders of france with their retainers the lawyers and journalists were powerful enough to take control of society then in the beginning of the nineteenth century came the invention of machinery and of the power process capitalism began to grow like a young giant among pygmies in the course of a century it has ousted all other methods of production and all other forms of social activity a hundred years ago the british house of commons was a parliament of landlords today it is a merchants and manufacturers association out of the seven hundred seven members of the british house of commons three hundred and sixty one are members of the federation of british industries the labor smashing organization of british big business and the same is true of every other parliament and congress in the modern capitalist state and practically all the wealth of the world today is produced by the capitalist method and distributed under capitalist supervision and therefore capitalist ideas prevail in our society to the practical exclusion of all other ideas i have shown in the prophets of religion how these ideas dominate the modern church and in the brass check how they dominate the modern press i plan to write two books to show how they dominate education and literature a hundred years ago an industry consisted of a half a dozen or a dozen men working under the personal supervision of an owner and using crude hand tools today it consists of a gigantic trust owning and managing scores and perhaps hundreds of mills and factories each employing thousands of workers a corporation like the steel trust owns enough of the sources of its raw material to give it practical monopoly it owns a fleet of vessels specially designed for ore carrying it owns its private railroads to deliver the ore to the mills through its system of dummy directorates it has practical control of the main railroads over which it distributes its products also of banks and trust companies and insurance companies to gather the money of the public to finance its undertakings it owns huge office buildings and vast tracts of land upon which the homes of its workers are built it has a private army for the defense of its property a complete army of cavalry infantry and artillery including a large and highly efficient secret service department with a host of informers and spies it has newspapers for the purpose of propaganda and it controls the government of every village town and city in which it has important interests if you will take the trouble to visit a steel town and make inquiries among public officials newspaper men and others who are on the inside you will discover that those in authority consider it necessary and proper that steel should control and are unable to conceive any other condition of affairs if you go to other parts of the country where other great industries are located you will find it taken for granted that copper should control or lumber or coal or oil or whatever it may be under the system of large-scale capitalism labor is a commodity bought and sold in the market like any other commodity some years ago congress was requested to pass a law contradicting this fundamental fact of world capitalism congress passed a law very carefully worded so that no one could be sure what it meant and a few years later the supreme court nullified the law but all through this political and legal controversy the status of labor remained exactly the same there was a labor market consisting of those members of the community who in the formula of marx had nothing but their labor power to sell these competed for recognition at the factory gates and highly skilled foremen selected those who offered the largest quantity of labor power for the stated wage 
so entirely impersonal is this process that there are great industries in america in which ninety per cent of the common labor force is hired and fired all over again in the course of a year these men are put to work in gangs under a system which enables one picked man to set the pace and compel all the others to keep up with him under penalty of being discharged this process is known as speeding up and its purpose is to obtain from each worker the greatest quantity of energy in exchange for his daily wage in the steel industry men work twelve hours a day for six days in the week and then finish with a twenty-four hour day if they do not work so long in other industries it is because experience has proven that the greatest quantity of energy can be obtained from them in a shorter time there are very few men who can stand this pace for long those who are not crippled or killed in accidents are broken down at forty and all the great corporations recognize this fact their foremen pick out the younger men and practically all concerns have an age rule and never hire men above forty or forty-five i shall not in this book go into details concerning the fate of the worker under the profit system i have written two novels the jungle and king cole in which the facts are portrayed in detail and it seems the part of common sense to refer the reader to these textbooks it will suffice here to set forth the main outlines of the situation in every capitalist country of the world the masses of the people are herded into industries in whose profits they have no share and in whose welfare they have no interest they do not know the people for whom they work they have no human relationship either with their work or with their employers they see the surplus of their product drawn off to maintain a class of idlers whose activities they know only through the scandals of the divorce courts and the luxury love of the moving picture screen they compete with one another for jobs and bid down one another's wages and if they attempt to organize and end this competition their efforts are broken up by newspaper propaganda and policemen's clubs at the same time they know that monopoly open or secret prevails in the fixing of prices and so they find the struggle to get ahead a losing one in america it used to be possible for the young and energetic to go west but now the wave of capitalism has reached the pacific coast and been thrown back and there is no more frontier the man who works on the land has been through all the ages a solitary man he is better friends with his horse and his cow than with his fellow humans he is brutalized by incessant toil he lives amid dirt and the filth of animals he is in the words of edwin markham a thing that grieves not and that never hopes stunted and stunned a brother to the ox he is a victim of natural forces which he does not understand and inevitably therefore he is superstitious being alone he is helpless against his masters and only utter desperation drives him to revolt but consider the capitalist system how different the conditions of its workers here they are gathered into city slums and their wits are sharpened by continual contact with their fellows the printing press makes cheap the spread of information and the soap-box makes it even cheaper any man with a grievance can shout aloud and be sure of an audience to listen and he can get a great deal said before the company watchman or the policeman could throttle him moreover the modern worker is not struggling with drought and tempest and hail he does not see his labors wiped out by a volcanic eruption or lightning stroke he is dealing with machinery something that he himself has made and that he fully understands if a machine gets out of order he does not fall down upon his knees and pray to god to fix it all the training of his life teaches him the relationship of cause and effect the adjustment of means to ends so the modern worker as a necessary consequence of his daily work is practical skeptical and unsentimental in his psychology and what is more he is making all the rest of society of the same temperament he is building roads out into the country 
and building machines to roll over them. He is running telephone lines and sending newspapers and magazines and moving picture shows to the peasant and the farmer. So the young peasants and farmers hunger for the city, and they learn to fix machinery instead of praying to God. Such is the psychology of the modern working class, and the supreme achievement of their sharpened wits is an understanding of the capitalist process. As a matter of fact, they did not make this discovery for themselves. It was made for them by middle-class men, lawyers and teachers and writers, Fourier, Owen, Marx, LaSalle. The modern doctrine is called by various names, socialism, communism, anarchism, Bolshevism, syndicalism, collectivism. Later on, I shall define these various terms and point out the distinctions between them. For the moment, I emphasize the factor they all have in common, which is fundamental. They wish to break the power of class ownership and control of the instruments and means of production. They wish to replace private capitalism by some system under which the instruments and means of production are collectively owned and operated. And they look to the non-owning class, the proletarian, as the mode of power by which this change is to be compelled. I shall in future refer to this as the social revolutionary doctrine, taking pains to explain that the word revolutionary is to be divested of its popular meaning of physical violence. It is perfectly conceivable that the change may be brought about peaceably, and I shall try to show before long that in modern capitalist states the decision as to whether it is brought about peaceably or by violence rests with the present masters of industry. End of chapter 55「Chapters 56, 57, and 58 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 56 The Capitalist Process How Profits Are Made Under the Present Industrial System and What Becomes of Them We have next to examine the structure of our capitalist order basing our arguments on facts which are admitted by everyone, including the most ardent defenders of the present system. All men have to have certain material things, which we describe as goods. As these goods do not produce themselves, it is necessary that some should work. The workers must have tools. Also, they must have access to the land and the sources of raw materials. These means of production are owned by some individuals in the community, and this ownership gives them power to direct the work of the rest. Those who own the land and the natural sources of wealth we call capitalists, or businessmen, and those who do not own these things, or whose share in them is insignificant, are the proletariat, or working class. If you state to the average American that there is a capitalist class and a proletariat in this country, he will point out that many who are now members of the capitalist class were originally members of the proletariat. They have worked hard and saved and accumulated property. But this is merely confusing the issue. The fact that some proletarians turn into capitalists, and some capitalists into proletarians, is important to the individuals concerned. But it does not alter the fact that there are two classes, capitalist and proletarian. Consider by way of illustrating a field with trees growing on it. We have earth and we have trees. And the distinction between them is unmistakable. The roots of the trees go down into the earth and take up portions of the earth and turn it into tree. The leaves and the dead branches fall and in the course of time are turned once more to earth. There are all sorts of stages between earth and tree, and between tree and earth. But you would not therefore say that the word earth and the word tree are misnomers. The working men go to the businessman and apply for work. 
the businessman gives them work and takes their product and offers it in the market at a price which allows him a profit above cost if he can sell at a profit he repeats the process and the worker has a job if he cannot sell at a profit the worker is out of a job here and there may be a benevolent businessman who rather than turn his workers out of a job will sell his goods at cost or even for a short time at a loss but if he keeps the factory going simply for the benefit of his workers and with no expectation of ever making a profit that is a form of charity and not the common system under which our business is now carried on so it appears that the worker is dependent for his wages upon the ability of the businessman to make a profit the worker's life is inextricably bound up with the profit of the capitalist no profit for the capitalist no life for the worker the capitalist going out to look for markets for his goods is seeking not merely profit for himself but life for his workers now the businessman pays a certain percentage of his total receipts for labor another percentage for raw materials another percentage for his overhead charges and the rest is profit in various forms rent to the landlord interest to the bondholder dividends to the stockholder all this total sum goes to human individuals and each has thus a certain amount of money to spend they pay it over to other individuals for goods or services and so the money keeps circulating and business keeps going that is as deep as the average mind probes into the process but let us probe a little deeper it is evident that in the course of all this exchanging of goods some individuals get a larger share than other individuals our government collects an income tax and thus we have statistics representing what people are willing to admit about the share they get in 1917 it appeared that speaking roughly one family out of six had an income of over one thousand dollars a year and one family out of twelve had an income of over two thousand but there were nineteen thousand families which admitted incomes of over fifty thousand a year and three hundred with over a million dollars a year now the families that get less than a thousand dollars a year obviously have to spend the greater part of their income upon their immediate living expenses but the families that get fifty thousand dollars a year do not need to spend everything and most of them take the greater part of their income and reinvest it that is they spend it upon the creating of new machinery of production railroads mills factories office buildings the whole elaborate structure of capitalist industry exactly what proportion of the total product of industry is thus taken and reinvested no one can say but this we know our cities are growing at an enormous rate our manufacturing power is increasing by leaps and bounds we are perfecting processes which enable one man to do the work of a hundred men which increase the product of one man's labor a hundredfold all this goes on blindly automatically a niagara of goods of all sorts is poured out and we call it prosperity but then suddenly a strange and bewildering thing happens all at once and without warning orders fall off values begin to drop business collapses factories are shut down and millions of men are thrown out of jobs merchants look at one another with blanched faces each one has been counting on paying his bills with the profits he was going to make and now his profits are gone and he can't pay the newspapers and magazines keep insisting that it can't be true that business is going to revive next week that prosperity is just ahead but the factories stay shut and the millions of men stay idle this is the condition in which we find ourselves as i write this book 
it has been happening regularly in our history every ten years or so ever since america started we have had a hundred years to reflect upon it and to probe into the causes of it and such is business intelligence in the most enlightened country in the world you may search the pages of our newspapers from the first column of millionaire divorce suits to the last column of situations wanted and nowhere can you find one word to explain this mysterious calamity of hard times how it comes to happen to our social system or what could be done to prevent it to supply this deficiency in present-day thinking is our next task end of chapter fifty six chapter fifty seven hard times explains why capitalist prosperity is a spasmodic thing and why abundant production brings distress instead of plenty let us picture a small island inhabited by six men one of these men fishes another hunts another gathers coconuts another raises goats for clothing and so on the six men among them produce by their labor all the necessities of their lives and they exchange their products with one another the island is productive and each of the men is free and makes his exchanges on equal terms on that basis the industry of the island can continue indefinitely and there will never be any trouble there may sometimes be overproduction but it will not cause anyone to starve if the fisherman is unusually lucky one day he will be able to take a vacation for a few days living on his fish and the products he exchanges for his fish for the sake of convenience in future reference i will describe this happy island as a free society meaning that each of the members of this society has access on equal terms to the sources of wealth and each owns the product of his own labor without paying tribute to anyone else for the right to labor or to exchange his products but now let us suppose that one of the men on the island is strong and aggressive he takes a club and knocks down the other five men and compels them to sign a piece of paper agreeing that hereafter he is the president of the land development company of the island the chief stockholder in the goat raising company and owner of the fishing concession and the coconut grove also that hereafter goods shall not be bartered in any kind but shall be exchanged for money and that he is the banker and also the government with the right to issue money in this society you will find that the real work the actually productive work is done by five men instead of by six and these five do not get the full value of their labor the fisherman will fish but his product will no longer belong to himself he will get part of it as wages while the businessman takes charge of the balance so when there is a lucky day there will be prosperity in the fishing industry but this prosperity will not benefit the fisherman he will have only his wage and when he has caught too many fish he will not have a few days vacation but will be out of a job and exactly the same thing will happen to the goat herd he will probably have work all year round because goats have to be tended but he will get barely enough to keep him alive and the surplus skins and milk will go to the owner of the no longer happy island perhaps it will occur to the owner that the man who raises coconuts might also keep an eye on the goats and so the goat herd will be permanently out of a job and will turn into what is called a tramp or a vagrant inasmuch as everything to eat on the island belongs to the owner the ex-goat herd will be tempted to become a criminal and so it will be necessary for the owner to arm the coconut man with a club and make him into a policeman or perhaps he will organize the fisherman and the hunter into a militia for the preservation of law and order they will be glad to serve him because 
owing to the extreme productivity of the island they will be out of jobs for a great part of the time and but for the generosity of the businessman would have no way of earning a living but suppose that the coconut man should invent a machine for gathering a year's supply of nuts in a week suppose the fisherman should devise a scheme to fill his boat with fish in a few minutes and suppose that as a result of these inventions the businessman got so rich that he moved to paris and no longer saw his workers or even knew their names under these conditions you can see that overproduction and unemployment might increase on the island and also the businessman might seem less human and lovable to his wage slaves and might need a larger police force it might even happen that he would discover the need of a propaganda department in order to keep his police force loyal and a secret service to make sure that the agitators did not get into the schools the five islanders having filled all the barns and storehouses would be turned out to starve and when they asked the reason they would be told it was because they had produced a surplus of food this may sound grotesque but it is what is being said to five million men in america as i write there are clothing workers who are going about in rags and they are told it is because they have produced too much clothing there are shoe workers whose shoes are falling off their feet and they are told it is because they have produced too many shoes there are carpenters who have no homes and they are told that a great many homes are needed but unfortunately it doesn't pay the builders to go ahead just now this may sound like a caricature but it happens to be the most prominent single fact in the consciousness of five million americans at the close of the year nineteen twenty one no wonder they are discontented with the present order the solution of the mystery is so simple that the five million unemployed cannot be kept permanently from understanding it the reason the five men on the island are starving is because one man owns the island and the others own nothing if the island were community property the five men would each own a share of the contents of the barns and storehouses and would not be starving if one hundred million people of america own the productive machinery of america then instantly the unemployment crisis would pass like an evil dream the farm workers who need shoes would exchange their food with the starving shoe workers and the starving shoe workers would have jobs they would want clothing and so the clothing makers would start to work and so on all the way down the line there is only one thing necessary to make this possible and that is the thing which we have agreed to call the social revolution End of chapter fifty seven chapter fifty eight the iron ring analyzes further the profit system which strangles production and makes true prosperity impossible we have seen that in an exploiting society there is a surplus which is taken by the exploiter and that under the modern system this surplus must be sold at a profit before production can continue the vital fact in such a society is that the worker has not the money to buy back all that he produces therefore it is inevitable that a surplus product should accumulate when this happens production must be cut down and during that period the worker is without a job and without a means of living the fact that he needs the product does not help him the point is that he has not the money to buy it in such a society the productive machinery is never used to the full the machinery is controlled by a profit-seeking interest seeking an opportunity to make sales and restricting production according to the prospect of sales so the actual product bears no relationship to the possible product 
and people who live in an exploiting society can form no conception of true prosperity for you see the market is limited by the competitive wage system we have seen that in our own rich prosperous country only one family out of six has more than one thousand dollars a year income only one family out of twelve has two thousand dollars a year it does not make any difference that the warehouses are bursting with goods a family constitutes a market of so many dollars a year and then so far as the profit system is concerned that family is non-existent that family stops consuming and the productive machinery is halted to that extent i have been accustomed to portray the profit system under the simile of an iron ring riveted about the body of a baby that ring would cause the baby some discomfort at the beginning but it would not be serious and the baby would get used to it but as the baby grew the trouble caused by the ring would increase and finally there would come a time when the baby would be suffering from a whole complication of troubles and for each of these troubles there would be but one remedy break the ring does the baby cry all the time break the ring is its digestion defective break the ring is it threatened with convulsions or with blood poisoning break the ring here is our industrial society growing at a rate never equaled by any human baby and here is this iron ring riveted about its middle here is poverty here is unemployment here is graft here is crime here is war and plague and famine and for all these evils there is but one cause and but one remedy break the ring set production free from the strangulation of the profit system i will admit that there may have been a time in the history of the social infant when this ring was necessary i admit that if the great industrial machine was to be constructed it was necessary that the mass of the people should consume only part of what they produced and should allow the balance to be reinvested as capital but now it has been done and the process is complete we have a machine capable of producing many times more than we can consume shall we still go on building that machine shall we go on starving ourselves to save the money to multiply over and over again the products in order that we may be thrown out of work and be starved even more completely a few generations ago we had in colonial america a society that in part at least was free in that society everybody got the necessities of life they did not have the modern sunday supplement and the moving picture show but they had bread and meat and good substantial clothing and furniture so well made that we still preserve it the children in those days grew up to be strong and sturdy men and women who would have seen nothing to envy in the bodies or minds of the slum population of new york and chicago in short they had all the true necessities of life and yet their work was done by hand the power process was unknown and undreamed of now comes modern machinery and multiplies the productive power of the hand laborer by five by ten sometimes by a hundred here for example is the appeal to reason selling millions of cheap books for ten cents apiece and making a profit on it installing a gigantic press which takes paper sheet after sheet prints one hundred and twenty eight pages of a book at one impression and folds and stitches and binds the books all in one process and turns them out complete at the rate of ten thousand copies per hour here is a factory which turns out one hundred thousand automobiles a month here is a mill which turns out many millions of yards of cloth a month if our colonial ancestors had been told about these marvels they would have said instantly then of course everybody in that society will have all the books they want and all the clothing they want and all the automobiles 
everybody in that society will have five or ten or one hundred times as much goods as we have imagine the bewilderment of our colonial ancestor if he had been told the majority of the people in that society will not have so much of the real necessities of life as you have they will have a few cheap trinkets designed to tickle their senses they will have cheap newspapers carefully contrived to keep their minds vacant and to keep them contented with their lot they will have moving picture shows constructed for the same purpose but all their material things will be flimsy put together for show and not for permanence their food will be adulterated their clothing will be shoddy everything they have will be made not for their service but for the profit of someone who lives by selling to them the average wage earned by those who do the work of this new machine civilization will be less than half the amount necessary to purchase the necessities of a decent life and one-tenth of the total population will be living in such poverty that they are unable to maintain physical fitness or to rear their children into full-sized men and women end of chapter fifty eight chapters fifty nine sixty and sixty one of the book of life by upton sinclair this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 59. Foreign Markets Considers the efforts of capitalism to save itself by marketing its surplus products abroad, and what results from these efforts. If our analysis of present-day society is correct, we have the enormous populations of the modern industrial countries living always on the verge of starvation their chance for survival depending at all times upon the ability of their employers to find a profitable market for a surplus of goods at first the employer seeks that market at home but when the home markets are glutted he goes abroad and so develops a phenomenon of foreign trade and rivalry for foreign trade as the basic fact of capitalism and the fundamental cause of modern war let us get clear a simple distinction concerning foreign trade there is a kind of trade which is normal and would thrive in a free society in the united states we can produce nearly all the necessities of life but there are a few which we cannot produce rubber for example and bananas and good music these things we wish to import we buy them from other countries and incur a debt which we pay with products which the other countries need from us wheat for example and copper and moving pictures with cowboys in them this is equal exchange and a natural phenomenon a free society would produce such surplus goods as were necessary to procure the foreign products that it desired what it had produced that much the workers would stop and take a vacation until they wanted more foreign products but under capitalism we have an entirely different condition we produce a surplus of goods which we have to sell in order to keep our factories running and to keep our working population from starving and note that it does not help us to get back an equal quantity of foreign goods in exchange we must have what we call a favorable balance that is we must have other people going into debt to us so that we can be continually shipping out more goods than we take back continually piling up credits which we can negotiate or turn into cash so that we can go on and repeat the process of making more goods selling them for more profits and putting the surplus into the form of more machinery to make still more goods and still more profits and then after a while we come upon this embarrassing phenomenon nations which buy and do not sell must either do it by sending us gold or by our giving them credit the sending of gold cannot go on indefinitely 
because then we should have all the gold, and if other nations had none, that would destroy their credit. On the other hand, business cannot be done by credit indefinitely, for the very essence of credit is a promise to pay, and payment can only be made in goods, and how can we take the goods without ruining our own industry? Fifteen years ago I pointed this out in a book. The argument was irrefutable, and the conclusion inescapable, but the few critics who noted it repeated their usual formula about dreamers and theorists. Now, however, the business mills have ground on, and what was theory has become fact before our eyes. We have trusted the nations of Europe for some ten billion dollars worth of goods, and they are powerless to pay, and if they did pay, they would bankrupt American industry. France wishes to collect an enormous indemnity from Germany, but nobody can figure out how this indemnity can be paid without ruining French industry. The French have demanded coal from Germany, and have got more than they can use, and are dumping it in Belgium and Holland, with the result that the British coal industry is ruined. The French clamor that the Germans must pay for the destruction they wrought in northern France, and the Germans offer to send German workmen to rebuild the ruined towns, but the French denounce this as an insult. It would deprive French working men of their jobs. So I might continue for pages, pointing out the manifold absurdities which result from a system of industry for the profit of a few, instead of for the use of all. Ever since I first began to read the newspapers, some twenty-five or thirty years ago, all our political life has been nothing but the convulsions of a social body tortured by the constricting ring of the profit system. Everywhere one group struggling for advantage over another group, and politicians engaging in playing one interest against another interest. My boyhood recollections of public life consist of campaign slogans having to do with the tariff, production and prosperity, reciprocity, the full dinner pail, the foreigner pays the tax, etc. The working man, under the profit system, is like a man pounding away at a pump. He can get a thin trickle of water from the spout of the pump if he works hard enough, but in order to get it, he has to supply ten times as much to someone who has tapped the pipe. But the tapping has been done underground, where the working man cannot see it. All the working man knows is that there is no job for him if the products of cheap foreign labor are allowed to be dumped on the American market. That is obvious, and so he votes for a tax on foreign imports, high enough to enable his own employer to market at a profit. He does not realize that he is thus raising the price of everything that he buys, and so leaving himself worse off than he was before. All governments are delighted with this tariff device because they are thus enabled to get money from the public without the public's knowing it. The foreigner pays the tax, we are told, and as a result of this arrangement the Steel Trust, just before the war, was selling its product at a high price to the American people and taking its surplus abroad and selling it to the foreigner at half the domestic price. And we see this same thing in every line of manufacture, and all over the world. We see one nation after another withdrawing itself as a market for manufactured products, and entering the lists as a marketer. One more nation now able to fill all its own needs, and go out hungrily to look for foreign customers, adding to the glut of the world's manufactured products and the ferocity of international competition. At the close of the Civil War, the total exports of the United States averaged approximately $300 million, and the total imports were about the same. In 1892, the exports first touched $1 billion, while the imports were about nine-tenths of that sum. In the year 1913, 
the exports were nearly two billion five hundred million dollars while the imports were six hundred billion less and in the year 1920 our exports were over eight billion dollars and our imports a little over five billion dollars so we have a favorable balance of almost three billion dollars a year and as a result we are on the verge of ruin this iron ring of overproduction and lack of market exercises upon our industrial body a steady pressure a slow strangling but because the body is in convulsions struggling to break the ring the pressure of the ring is worse at some times than at others we have periods of what we call prosperity followed by periods of panic and hard times you must understand that only a small part of our business is done by means of cash payments whether in gold or silver or paper money close to ninety nine per cent of our business is done by means of credit and this introduces into the process a psychological factor the business man expects certain profits and he capitalizes these expectations business booms because everybody believes everybody else's promises credit expands like a huge balloon with the breath of everybody's enthusiasm but meantime real business the real market remains just what it was before it cannot increase because of the iron ring which restricts the buying power of the mass of the people by the competitive wage so presently the time comes when somebody realizes that he has overcapitalized his hopes he curtails his orders he calls in his money and the impulse thus started precipitates a crash in the whole business world we had such a crash in 1907 and i remember well a wall street man explaining it in a magazine article entitled somebody asked for a dollar we learned one lesson by that panic at least the big financial men learned it and had congress pass what is called the federal reserve act a provision whereby in times of need the government issues practically unlimited credit to banks this of course is fine for the banks it puts the credit of everybody else behind them and all they have to do is to stop lending money except to the big insiders and sit back and wait while the little men go to the wall and the mass of us live on our savings or starve we saw this happen in the year 1920 and for the first time we had hard times without having a financial panic but instead we see prices staying high because the banks have issued so much paper money and bank credits end of chapter 59 chapter 60 capitalist war shows how the competition for foreign markets leads nations automatically into war in a discussion of the world's economic situation published in 1906 the writer portrayed the ruling class of germany as sitting in front of a thermometer watching the mercury rising and knowing that when it reached the top the thermometer would break this thermometer was the german class system of government and the mercury was a socialist vote in 1870 the vote was 30,000 in 1884 it was 549,000 in 1893 it was 1,876,000 in 1903 it was 3,800,000 in 1907 it was 3,250,000 in 1911 it was 4,250,000 writing between 1906 and 1913 i again and again pointed out that this increase was the symptom of social discontent in germany caused by the overproduction of invested capital throughout the world and the intensification of the competition for world markets i pointed out that a slight increase in the vote 
would be sufficient to transfer to the working class of germany the political power of the german state and i said that the ruling class of germany would never permit that to happen when it was ready to happen germany would go to war to seize the trade privileges of some other nation there was a time when wars were caused by national and racial hatreds there are still enough of these venerable prejudices left in the world but no student of the subject would deny that the main source of modern wars is commercial rivalry in nineteen seventeen we sent eugene v debs to prison for declaring that the late world war was a war of capitalist greed but two years later president wilson who had waged the war declared in a public speech that everybody knew it had been a war of commercial rivalries the aims of modern war makers are two first capitalism must have raw materials including coal and oil the sources of power and gold and silver the basis of credit parts of the world which are so unfortunate as to be rich in these substances become the bone of contention between rival financial groups organized as nations some sarcastic writer has defined a backward nation as one which has gold mines and no navy we are horrified to read of the wars of the french monarchs caused by the jealous quarrels of mistresses but in 1905 we saw russia and japan go to war and waste a million lives because certain russian grand dukes had bribed certain chinese mandarins and obtained concessions of timber on the yalu river we now observe france and germany vowed to undying hate because of iron mines in lorraine and the efforts of france to take the coal mines of silesia from germany and give them to poland which is another name for french capitalism the other end sought by the war makers is markets for manufactured products and control of trade routes coaling stations and cables necessary to the building up of foreign trade england has been the mistress of the seas for some three hundred years which meant that her traders had obtained most of these advantages but then came germany with her newly developed commercialism shoving her rival out of the way the englishman was easy-going he liked to play cricket and stop and drink tea every afternoon but the german worked all day and part of the night he trained himself as a specialist he studied the needs of his customers all of which to the englishman was unfair competition but here were the populations of the crowded slums dependent for their weekly wage and their daily bread upon the ability of the factories to go on turning out products here was the ever blackening shadow of unemployment the mutterings of social discontent the agitators on the soap boxes the workers listening to them with more and more eager attention and the journalists and politicians and bankers watching this phenomenon with a ghastly fear so came the great war social discontent was forgotten overnight and england and france plunged in to down their hated rival once and for all time now they have succeeded germany's ships have been taken from her and likewise her cables and coaling stations the berlin baghdad railroad is a forgotten dream the british sit in constantinople and the traffic goes by sea american capitalism wakes up and rubs its eyes after a debauch of presbyterian idealism and discovers that it has paid out some twenty billion dollars in order to confer all these privileges and advantages upon its rivals ever since i can remember the world there have been peace societies i look back in history and discover that ever since there have been wars there have been prophets declaiming against them in the name of humanity and god as i write there is a great world conference on disarmament in session in washington and all good americans hope that war is to be ended and permanent peace made safe 
all that i can do at this juncture is to point out the fundamental and all-controlling fact of present-day economics that for the ruling class of any country to agree to disarmament and the abolition of war is for that class to sign its own death warrant and cut its own throat american capitalism can survive on this earth only by strangling and destroying japanese capitalism and british capitalism and doing it before long the far-sighted capitalists on both sides know that and are making their preparations accordingly what the members of the peace societies and the diplomats of the disarmament conferences do is to cut off the branches of the tree of war they leave the roots untouched and then when the tree continues to thrive they are astounded i conclude this chapter with a concrete illustration cut from my morning newspaper we went to war against german militarism and to make the world safe for democracy meaning thereby capitalist commercialism we commanded the german people to beat their swords into plowshares that is to set their krupp factories to making tools of peace and they did so we saddled them with an enormous indemnity making them our serfs for a generation or two and compelling them to hasten out into the world markets to sell their goods and to raise gold to pay us and now how does their behavior strike us do we praise their industry and fidelity to their obligations here are the headlines of a news dispatch published by the los angeles times on december tenth nineteen twenty one at the top of the front page right hand column the most conspicuous position in the paper read it and understand the sources of modern war new attack by berlin dumping goods by wholesale cheap german trash puts thousands of americans out of employment glove plants shut down and potash industry killed by teuton intrigue End of chapter 60 Chapter 61 The Possibilities of Production Shows how much wealth we could produce if we tried, and how we proved it when we had to. One of the commonest arguments in defense of the present business system runs as follows. The amount of money which is paid to labor is greatly in excess of the amount which is paid to capital. Suppose that tomorrow you were to abolish all dividends and profits and divide the money up among the wage workers. How much would each one get? The sum is figured for some big industry, and it is shown that each worker would get one or two hundred dollars additional per year. Obviously, this would not bring the millennium. It would hardly be worthwhile to take the risk of reducing production in order to gain so small a result. But now we are in a position to realize the fallacy of such an argument. The tax which capital levies upon labor is not the amount which capital takes for itself, but the amount which it prevents labor from producing. The real injury of the profit system is not that it pays so large a reward to a ruling class. It is the iron ring which it fastens about industry barring the workers from access to the machinery of production except when the product can be sold for a profit labor pays an enormous reward to the businessman for his management of industry but it would pay labor to reward the businessman even more highly if only he would take his goods in kind and would permit labor after this tax is paid to go on making those things which labor itself so desperately need but you see the businessman does not take his goods in kind the owner of a great automobile factory may make for himself one automobile or a score of automobiles but he quickly comes to the limit where he has no use for any more and what he wants is to sell automobiles and make money he does not permit his workers to make automobiles for themselves or for anyone else he reserves the product of the factory for himself 
and when he can no longer sell automobiles at a profit, he shuts the workers out, and automobile making comes to an end in that community. Thus it appears that the iron ring which strangles the income of labor strangles equally the income of capital. It paralyzes the whole social body, and so limits production that we can form no conception of what prosperity might and ought to be. Consider the situation before the war. We were, all of us, at work under the competitive system, with the exception of a few parasites, and everybody was occupied pretty close to the limit of his energy. If any one had said that it would be possible for our community to pitch in and double or treble our output, you would have laughed at him. But suddenly we found ourselves at war, and in need of a great increase in output, and we resolved one and all to achieve this end. We did not waste any time in theoretical discussions about the rights of private capital or the dangers of bureaucracy and the destruction of initiative. Our government stepped in and took control. It took the railroads and systematized them. It took the big factories and told them exactly what to make. It took the raw materials and allotted them where they were needed. It fixed the prices of labor and ordered millions of men to this or that place, to this or that occupation. It even seized the foodstuffs and directed what people should eat. In a thousand ways, it suppressed competition and replaced it by order and system. And what was the result? We took five million of our young men, the very cream of our industrial force, and withdrew them from all productive activities. We put them into uniforms and put them through a training, which meant that they were eating more food and wearing more clothing and consuming more goods than nine-tenths of them had ever done in their lives before. We built camps for them and supplied them with all kinds of costly products of labor, such as guns and cartridges, automobiles and airplanes. We treated two million of them to an expensive trip to Europe, and there we set them to work, burning up and destroying the products of industry to the value of many billions of dollars. And not only did we supply our own armies, we supplied the armies of all our allies. We built millions of dollars worth of ships, and we sent over to Europe, whether by private business or by government loans, some ten billion dollars worth of goods more than ten years of our exports before the war. All the labor necessary to produce all this wealth had to be withdrawn from industry, so far as concerned our domestic uses and needs. It would not be too much to say that from domestic industry we withdrew a total of ten million of our most capable labor force. I think it would be reasonable to say that two-thirds of our productive energies went to war purposes, and only one-third was available for home use. And yet, we did it without a particle of real suffering. Many of us worked hard, but few of us worked harder than usual. Most of us got along with less wheat and sugar, but nobody starved, nobody really suffered ill health, and our poor made higher wages and had better food than ever in their lives before. If this argument is sound, it proves that our productive machinery is capable, when properly organized and directed, of producing three times the common necessities of our population. Assuming that our average working day is nine hours, we could produce what we at present consume by three hours of intelligently directed work per day. Let us look at the matter from another angle. Just at present, the hero of the American businessman is Herbert Hoover, and Mr. Hoover recently appointed a committee, not of socialists and utopians, but of engineering experts, to make a study of American productive methods. The report showed that American industry was only 35 or 40 percent efficient. Incidentally, this committee on waste assessed in the case of the building industry, 65% of the blame against management and only 21% against labor. In six fundamental industries, it assessed 50% of the blame against management and less than 25% against labor. 
fifteen years ago a professor of engineering sidney a reeve by name made an elaborate study of the wastes involved in our haphazard and planless industrial methods and embodied his findings in a book the cost of competition his conclusion was that of the total amount of energy expended in america more than seventy per cent was wasted we were doing one hundred per cent of work and getting thirty per cent of the results if we would get one hundred per cent of the results we should produce three and one-third times as much wealth and the income of our workers would be increased one or two thousand dollars a year robert blatchford in his book merry england has a saying to the effect that it makes all the difference when half a dozen men go out to catch a horse whether they spend their time catching the horse or keeping one another from catching the horse our next task would be to point out a few of the ways in which good honest american businessmen and working men laboring as intelligently and conscientiously as they know how waste their energies in keeping one another from producing goods end of chapter 61、Chapter、62 63 64 Life by Upton Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Chapter 62 the cost of competition discusses the losses of friction in our productive machine those which are obvious and those which are hidden the united states government is by far the largest single business enterprise in the united states and a study of congressional appropriations in nineteen twenty made by the united states bureau of standards reveals the fact that ninety three per cent of the total income of the government went to paying for past wars or preparing for future wars we have shown that modern war is a product of the profit system and if civilized nations would put their industry upon a cooperative basis they could forget the very idea of war and we should then receive fourteen times as much benefit from our government as we receive at present we should have fourteen times as good roads fourteen times as many schools fourteen times as prompt a post office and fourteen times as efficient a congress what it would mean to industry to abolish war is something wholly beyond the power of our imagination to conceive for along with ninety-three per cent of our government money there goes into military preparation the vast bulk of our intellectual energy and inventive genius our moral and emotional equipment next strikes and the losses incidental to strikes and the costs of preparing against strikes this includes not merely the actual loss of working time it includes police and militia private armies of gunmen and great secret service agencies whose total income runs up into hundreds of millions of dollars per year industrial warfare is simply the method by which capitalists and workers determine the division of the product of industry as if two men should cooperate in raising poultry and then fall to quarreling over the ownership of the eggs and settle the matter by throwing the eggs at each other's heads next bankruptcy statistics show that regularly some ten per cent of our business enterprises fail every year take any block occupied by little businessmen grocers and haberdashers and notions and you will see that they are always changing each change represents a human tragedy and the total is a frightful waste of human energy it happens because we think of no better way to distribute goods than to go through the work of setting up a business and then discover that it cannot succeed because the neighborhood is already overstocked with that kind of goods next fires which are a result of bankruptcy you may laugh perhaps thinking that i am making a joke but every little man who fails in business knows that he has a choice of going down in the social scale or of setting fire to his stock some night and having a big insurance company set him on his feet again 
the result is that a certain percentage of bankrupts do regularly set fire to their stores some fifteen years ago there was published in the colliers weekly a study of costs to society of incendiary fires the fire underwriters association estimated the amount as a quarter of a billion dollars a year and all this cost you understand is paid out of the pockets of those who insure their homes and their stores and do not burn them down from this follows the cost of insurance and the whole insurance industry which is inevitable under the profit system but its entire waste so far as two production is concerned big enterprises like the steel trust do not carry insurance and neither does the united states post office they are wealthy enough to stand their own losses a national cooperative enterprise would be in the same position and the whole business of collecting money for insurance and keeping records and carrying on lawsuits would be forgotten next advertising it would be no exaggeration to say that seventy per cent of the material published in american newspapers and magazines today is pure waste and therefore seventy per cent of the labor of all the people who cut down forests and manufacture and transport paper and set up type and print and distribute publications is wasted there is of course a small percentage of advertising that is useful but most of it is boasting and falsehood and even where it tells the truth it simply represents the efforts of a merchant to persuade you to buy in his store instead of in a rival store an achievement which is profitable to the merchant but utterly useless to society as a whole this same statement applies to all traveling salesmen and to a great percentage of middlemen it applies also to a great part of the delivery service if you live in a crowded part of any city you see a dozen milk wagons pass your door every morning doing the work which could be done exactly as well by one that is only one case out of a thousand i might name next crime i have already discussed the crime of arson and i might discuss the crimes of pocket-picking burglary forgery and a hundred others in the same way i am aware of the fact that there may be a few born criminals there may be a few congenital cheats whom we should have to put in hospitals but we have only to consult the crime records during the war and after in order to see that when jobs are hunting men there are few criminals and when men are hunting jobs there are many criminals i have no figures as to the cost of administering justice in the united states policemen courts and jails but it must be hundreds of millions of dollars every year i have discussed at great length the suppression of the productive power of society i should not fail to mention the suppression of the inventive power of society a factor less obvious but equally in the long run even greater everyone familiar with the inside of a big industry knows that hundreds and even thousands of useful processes are entirely suppressed because it would not pay one particular concern to stand the expense of the change involved you know how during the war our government brought all the makers of engines together and perfected in triumph a liberty motor but now we have gone back to private interest and competition and each concern is jealously engaged in guarding its own secrets and depriving the industry as a whole of the benefit of everything that it learns each is spying upon the others stealing likewise from those who invent new ideas and thus discouraging them from inventing any more i use the word discourage and i might write a chapter upon it what human imagination can conceive the amount of social energy that is lost because of the factor of discouragement directly caused by the competitive method who can figure what it means to human society that a great percentage of the people in it should be haunted by fear of one sort or another the poor in fear of unemployment sickness and starvation 
the little businessman in fear of bankruptcy and suicide, the big businessman in fear of hard times and treachery of his competitors, the idle rich in fear of robbery and blackmail, and the whole community in fear of foreign war and domestic tumult. Anyone might go on and elaborate these factors that I have named, and think of scores of others. Anyone familiar with business life or with industrial processes would be able to put his finger on this or that enormous savings, which he would be able to make if he and all his rivals could combine and come to an agreement. This has been proven over and over again in large-scale industry. It is the fact which has made of large-scale industry an overwhelming power sucking all the profits to itself, reaching out and taking in new fields of activity, and setting in naught all popular clamor and even legal terrors. How can anyone, seeing these facts, bring himself to deny that if we did systematize production and make it one enterprise, precisely adapted to one end, we should enormously increase the results of human labor and the benefit to all who do the world's work? A good deal of this waste we can stop when we get ready, and other parts of it our bountiful mother nature will replace. When in a world war we kill some ten or twenty millions of the flower of our young manhood, we have only to wait several generations, and our race will be as good as ever. But on the other hand, there is some waste that can never be repaired, and this is the thing truly frightful to contemplate. When we dig the iron ore out of the bowels of the earth and rust it away in wars, we are doing something our race can never undo. And the same is true of many of our precious substances, phosphorus, sulfur, potash. When we cut down the forests from our mountain slopes and lay bare the earth, we not merely cause floods and washouts and silt up our harbors, we take away from the surface of our land the precious life-giving soil and make a habitable land into a desert which no irrigating and reforesting can ever completely restore the chinese have done that for many centuries and we are following in their footsteps more than six hundred million wagon loads of our best soil are washed down to the sea every year if you wish to know about these matters i send you to a book on board the good ship earth by herbert quick it is one of the most heartbreaking books you ever read, yet it is merely a quiet statement of the facts about our present commercial anarchy. End of chapter 62 Chapter 63 Socialism and Syndicalism Discusses the idea of the management of industry by the state, and the idea of its management by the trade unions let us now assume that we desire to abolish the wastes of the competitive method and to put our industry on a basis of cooperation how should we effect the change and how should we run our industry after it was done let us take the united states steel corporation what change would be necessary to the socializing of this concern united states steel is owned by a group of stockholders and governed by a board of directors elected by them. The owners are now to be bought out with government bonds, and the board of directors retired. It may also be necessary to replace a certain number of the higher executive officials, who are imbued entirely with the point of view of this board, and have to do with finance rather than with production. Of course, some other governing authority would have to be put in control, what would this authority be? There are several plans before the world, several different schools of thought, which we shall consider one by one. First, the socialist program. The socialist says, Consider the post office, how that is run. It is run by the president, who appoints a postmaster general as his executive. Let us therefore turn the steel industry over to the government, and let the president appoint another member of his cabinet, a director of steel, or let there be a commission similar to the Interstate Commerce Commission or the various war industry boards. 
any form of management of the steel industry which provides for its control and operation by our united states government is socialism of one sort or another there has been of late a great deal of dissatisfaction with government on the part of the general public and also of labor the post office clerks for example complain that they are inadequately paid and autocratically managed deprived of their rights not merely as workers but as citizens the steel workers complain that when they go on strike against their masters the government sends in troops and crushes their strike regardless of the rights or wrongs of it in order to meet such tactics labor goes into politics and elects here and there its own representatives but these representatives become mysteriously affected by the bureaucratic point of view and even where they try hard they do not accomplish much for labor therefore labor becomes disgusted with the political process and labor men do not welcome the prospect of being managed by government if you ask such men they will say no the politicians don't know anything about industry and can't learn the people who know about industry are those who work in it the true way to run an industry is through an organization of the workers both of hand and brain the true way to run the steel trust is for all the workers in it men and women high and low to be recognized by law as citizens of that industry each shop must elect its own delegates to run that shop and elect a delegate to a central parliament of the industry and this industry in turn must elect delegates to a great parliament or convention of all the delegates of all the industries in such a central gathering everyone would be represented because every person would be a producer of some sort and whether he was a steel worker or a street sweeper or a newsboy he would have a vote at the place where he earns his living and would have a say in the management of his job the great central parliament would elect an executive committee and a president and so we should have a government of the workers by the workers for the workers this idea is known as syndicalism derived from the french word zundika meaning a labor union since the russian revolution it has come to be known as soviet government soviet being the russian word for trade council now take these two ideas of socialism and syndicalism it is evident that they may be combined in various ways and applied in varying degrees it is perfectly conceivable for example that the people of the united states might elect a president pledged to call a parliament of industry and to delegate the control of industry to this parliament he might delegate the control to a certain extent and provide for its extension step by step so our society might move into syndicalism by the way of socialism you have only to put your mind on the possibilities of the situation to realize that one method shades into the other with a great variety of stages consider next the stages between capitalism and socialism we have in the united states some industries which are purely capitalistic for example the steel trust which is privately owned and has been powerful enough not merely to suppress every effort of its workers to organize but every effort of the government to regulate it on the other hand the united states post office represents state socialism although the workers have been forbidden to organize and the management of the industry is so arbitrary that i have always preferred to call it state capitalism likewise the united states army and navy represent state socialism when we had the job of putting the kaiser out of business we did not hire mr rockefeller to do it it never once occurred to our advocates of individualism of capitalist enterprise and initiative to suggest that we should hire out our army and navy or employ the steel trust or the powder trust to organize its own army and navy to do the fighting for us likewise for the most part we run the job of educating our children by the method of municipal socialism we run our libraries in the same way and likewise our job of fire protection 
it is interesting to note how in every country the line between capitalism and socialism is drawn in a different place in america we run practically all our libraries for ourselves but it would seem to us preposterous to think of running our theaters in europe however they have state-owned theaters which set a far higher standard of art than anything we know at home also they have state-owned orchestras and opera houses something we americans leave to the subscriptions of millionaires in europe it seems perfectly natural to the people that the state should handle their telegrams in connection with the post office but if you urge government ownership of the telegraphs in the united states they tell you that the proposition is socialistic and that saves the need of thinking about it we take it for granted that our cities could run the libraries even though we were glad when carnegie came along and saved us the need of appropriating money for buildings just why a city should be able to run a library and should not be able to run an opera house or a newspaper is something which has never been made clear to me let us next examine the stages between capitalism and syndicalism a great many large corporations are making experiments in what they call shop management allowing the workers membership in the boards of directors and a voice in the conditions of their labor this is syndicalism so far as it goes likewise it is syndicalism when the clothing workers and the clothing manufacturers meet together and agree to the setting up of a permanent committee to work out a set of rules for the conduct of the industry and to fix wages from time to time obviously these things are capable of indefinite extension and in europe they are being developed far more rapidly for example in italy the agricultural workers are organized and are gradually taking possession of the great estates which are owned by absentee landlords they wage war upon these estates by means of sabotage and strikes and then they buy up the estates at bargain prices and develop them by cooperative labor this has been going on in italy for ten years and has become the most significant movement in the country it is a triumph of pure syndicalism and such is the power of pure capitalism in the united states that the american people have not been allowed to know anything about this change next what are the stages between socialism and syndicalism these also are infinite in number and variety as a matter of fact there are very few socialists who advocate state socialism without any admixture of syndicalism the regular formula of the socialist party is the social ownership and democratic control of the instruments and means of production and what the phrase democratic control means is simply that you introduce into your socialist mixture a certain flavoring of syndicalism greater or less according to your temperament in the same way there are many syndicalists who are inclined towards socialism in every convention of radical trade unionists such as for example the iww you find some who favor political action and these will have the same point of view as the more radical members of the socialist party who urge a program of industrial as well as political action End of chapter 63. Chapter 64. Communism and Anarchism. Considers the ideas of goods owned in common and the idea of a society without compulsion and how these ideas have fared in Russia. The Russian Revolution has familiarized us with the word communism. In the beginning of the revolutionary movement, communism denoted what we now call socialism. For example, the Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels became the platform of the social democratic parties. But because most of these parties supported their governments during the war, the more radical elements have now rejected the word socialism and taken up the old word communism. 
in the russian revolution the communists went so far as to seize all the property of the rich and so the word communism has come to bear something of its early christian significance it is obvious that here too it is a question of degree and socialism will shade into communism by an infinite variety of stages depending upon what forms of property it is decided to socialize the socialist formula commonly accepted is that goods socially used shall be socially owned and goods privately used shall be privately owned if you own a factory it will be taken by the state or by the workers and made social property like the post office but no socialist wants to socialize your clothing or your books any more than he wants to socialize your toothbrush but when you come to apply this formula you run quickly into difficulties suppose you are a millionaire and own a palace with one or two hundred rooms and a hundred servants do you use that socially or do you use it privately and suppose there is a scarcity of houses and thousands of children are dying of tuberculosis in crowded tenement rooms you own a dozen automobiles and do you use them all privately i point out to you that in time of emergency the capitalist state does not hesitate over such a problem it seizes your palace and turns it into a hospital it takes all your cars and uses them to carry troops it should be obvious that a proletarian state would be tempted by this precedent the communists also have a formula which reads from each according to his ability to each according to his necessity i do not see how any sensitive person can deny that this is an extremely fine statement of an ideal in social life we take it quite for granted in family life if you knew a family in which that rule did not apply you would consider it an unloving and uncivilized family i believe that when once industry has been socialized and we have a chance to see what production can become we shall find ourselves quickly adopting that family custom as our law for all except a few congenital criminals and cheats we shall find that we can produce so much wealth that it is not worth while keeping count of unimportant items if today you meet someone on the street and ask him for a match or a pin you do not think of offering to pay him this is an automatic consequence of the cheapness of matches and pins once upon a time you were stopped on the road every few miles and made to pay a few cents toll i remember seeing toll gates when i was a boy but i don't think i have seen one for twenty years in exactly the same way under socialized industry we shall probably make street car traffic free then railroad traffic we shall abolish water meters and gas meters and electric light meters also telephone charges except perhaps for long distances and telegraph tolls for personal messages then presently we shall find ourselves with such a large wheat crop that we shall make bread free and then music and theaters and clothing and books at present we use furniture and clothing as a means of manifesting our economic superiority to our fellow men one of the most charming books in our language is veblen's theory of the leisure class in which these processes are studied we shall of course have to raise up a new generation unaccustomed to the idea of class and of class distinction before we could undertake to supply people with all the clothing they wanted free of charge the russian theorists made haste to carry out these ideas all at once they tried to leap several centuries in the evolution of russian society they ordained complete communism in the land but the peasants would have nothing to do with such notions each wanted his own land and what he produced on it the soviets have now been forced to give way not merely to the peasants but to the traders and so we see once again that it is better to take one step forward than to take several steps forward and then several steps backward 
the Russian Revolution is not yet completed, so no one can say how many steps backward it will be forced to take. This revolution was an interesting combination of the ideas of socialism and syndicalism. The trade unionists seized the factories and made an effort at democratic control of industry. At the same time, the state was overthrown by a political party, the Bolsheviks, who set up a dictatorship of the proletariat. Because of civil war and outside invasion, the democratic elements in the experiment have been more and more driven into the background, and the authority of the state has correspondingly increased. This causes us to think of the Soviet system as necessarily opposed to democracy. But this is not in any way a necessary thing. There is no inevitable connection between industrial control by the workers and a dictatorship over the state. In Germany, the state is proceeding to organize a national parliament of industry and to provide for management of the factories by the labor unions. The Italian government has promised to do the same thing. These, of course, are capitalist governments, and they will keep their promises only as they are made to. But it is a perfectly possible thing that in either of these countries a vote of the people might change the government and put in authority men who would really proceed to turn the industry over to the control of the workers. That would be the Soviet or syndicalist system, brought about by democratic means without dictatorship or civil war. Another group of revolutionary thinkers whose theories must be mentioned are the anarchists. The word anarchy is commonly used as a synonym for chaos and disorder, which it does not mean at all. It means the absence of authority, and it is characteristic of people's view of life that they are unable to conceive of there being such a thing as order unless it is maintained by force. The theory of the anarchist is that order is a necessity of the human spirit, and that people would conform to the requirements of a just order by their own free will and without external compulsion. The anarchists believe that the state is an instrument of class oppression and has no other reason for being. He wishes the industries to be organized by free associations of the people who work in them. Some of the greatest of the world's moral teachers have been anarchists. Jesus, for example, and Shelley, and Thoreau, and Tolstoy, and in our time, Kropotkin. These men voice the highest aspirations of the human spirit, and the form of society which they dreamed is the one we set before us as our final goal. But the world does not leap into perfection all at once, and meantime here we have the capitalist system and the capitalist state, and what attitude shall we take to them? There are impassioned idealists who refuse to make any terms with injustice or to submit to compulsion, and these preach the immediate destruction of the capitalist government and capitalist government responds with prison and torture, and so we have some anarchists who throw bombs. There are those who call themselves philosophic anarchists, wishing to indicate thereby that they preach this doctrine but do not attempt to carry it into action as yet. Some among these verge toward the communist point of view and call themselves communist anarchists. Such was Kropotkin, whose theories of social organization you will find in his book, The Conquest of Bread. There are others who call themselves syndicalist anarchists, finding their centers of free association in the radical labor unions. After the Russian Revolution, the anarchists found themselves in a dilemma and their groups were torn apart like every other party and class in Russia. Here was a new form of state set up in society, a worker's state, and what attitude should the anarchists take toward that? Many of them stood out for their principles, and resisted the Bolshevik state, and put the Bolsheviks 
under the embarrassing necessity of throwing them into jail. We good orthodox Americans, who are accustomed to dump socialists and communists and syndicalists and anarchists all together into one common kettle, took Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman and shipped them over to Russia, where we thought they belonged. Now our capitalist newspapers find it strange that these anarchists do not like the Russian government any better than they like the American government. On the other hand, a great many anarchists have suddenly found themselves compelled by the Russian situation to face the facts of life. They have decided that a government is not such a bad thing after all, when it is your own government. Robert Miner, for example, has recanted his anarchist position and joined the communists in advocating the dropping of all differences among workers, all theories as to the future, and concentrating upon the immediate task of overthrowing capitalist government and keeping it overthrown. In every civilized nation, the Russian Revolution has had this effect upon the extreme revolutionists. It has given them a definite aim and a definite program upon which they can unite. It has presented to capitalist government the answer of force to force. It has shown the masters of industry in precise and definite form what they have to face, unless they set themselves immediately and in good faith to the task of establishing real democracy in industry. End of chapter 64 Chapters 65, 66, and 67 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 65 Social Revolution How the Great Change is Coming in Different Industries, and How We May Prepare to Meet It. From a study of the world's political revolutions, we observe that a variety of governmental forms develop, and that different circumstances in each country produce different institutions. Suppose that back in the days of the French monarchy, someone asked you how France was going to be governed as a political republic. How would elections be held? What would be the powers of the deputies? Who would choose the premier? Who would choose the president? What would be the duties of each? Who can explain why in France and England the executive is responsible to the parliament and must answer its questions, while in the United States the executive is an autocrat responsible to no one for four years? Who could have foreseen that in England, supposed to remain a monarchy, the constitution would be fluid, while in America, supposed to be a democracy, the constitution would be rigid? and the supreme power of rejecting changes in the laws would be vested in a group of reactionary lawyers appointed for life. There will be similar surprises in the social revolution, and similar differences between what things pretend to be and what they are. I used to compare the social revolution to the hatching of an egg. You examine it, and apparently it is all egg, but then suddenly something begins to happen, and in a few minutes it is all chicken. If, however, you investigate, you discover that the chicken had been forming inside the egg for some time. I know that there is a chicken now forming inside our social egg. But having realized the complexity of social phenomena, I no longer venture to predict the exact time of the hatching, or the size and color of the chicken. Perhaps it is more useful to compare the social revolution to a childbirth. A good surgeon knows what is due to happen, but he knows also that there are a thousand uncertainties, a thousand dangerous possibilities, and all he can do is to watch the process and be prepared to meet each emergency as it arises. The birth process consists of one pang after another. No one can say which pang will complete the birth, or whether it will be completed at all. 
Karl Marx is the author of saying that force is the midwife of progress. So you may see that I am not the inventor of this simile of childbirth. There are three factors in the social revolution, each of which will vary in each country, and in different parts of the country, and at different periods. First, there is the industrial condition of the country, a complex set of economic factors. The industrial life of England depends primarily on shipping and coal. In the United States, shipping is of less importance and railroads take the place. In the United States, the eastern portion lives mainly by manufacture, the western by agriculture, while the south is held a generation behind by a race problem. In France, the great estates were broken up, and agriculture fell into the hands of peasant proprietors, who are the main support of French capitalism. In Prussia, the great estates were held intact, and remained the basis of a feudal aristocracy. In America, land changes hands freely, and therefore one-third of our farms are mortgaged, and another third are worked by tenants. In Russia, there was practically no middle class, while in the United States, there is practically nothing but middle class. The rich have been rich for such a short while that they still look middle class and act middle class, in spite of all their efforts, while the working class hopes to be middle class and is persuaded that it can become middle class. Such varying factors produce in each country a different problem and make inevitable a different process of change. The second factor is the condition of organization and education of the workers. This likewise varies in every country, and in every part of every country. There is a continual struggle on the part of the workers to organize and educate themselves, and a continual effort on the part of the ruling class to prevent this. In some industries in America, you find the workers 100% organized, and in other industries, you find them not organized at all. It is obvious that in the former case, the social change, when it comes, will be comparatively simple, involving little bloodshed and waste. In the latter case, there will be social convulsions, rioting, and destruction of property, disorganization of industry, and widespread distress. The third factor is the state of mind of the propertied classes, the amount of resistance they are willing to make to social change. I have done a great deal of pleading with the masters of industry in my country. I have also written appeals to Vincent Astor and John D. Rockefeller, to capitalist newspapers and judges and congressmen and presidents. I have been told that this is a waste of my time, that these people cannot learn and will not learn, and that it is foolish to appeal either to their hearts or to their understanding. But I perceive that the class struggle is like a fraction. It has a numerator and a denominator, and you can increase the fraction just as well by decreasing the denominator as by increasing the numerator. To vary the simile, here are two groups of men engaged in a tug of war, and you can affect the result just as decisively by persuading one group to pull less hard, as by persuading the other group to pull harder. Picture to yourself two factories. In factory number one, the owner is a hard, driving businessman, an active spirit in the so-called open shop campaign. He believes in his divine right to manage industry, and he believes also in the gospel of all that the traffic will bear. He prevents his men from organizing and employs spies to weed out the radicals and to sow dissensions. When a strike comes, he calls in the police and the strike-breaking agencies, and in every possible way he makes himself hated and feared by his workers. Then some day comes the unemployment crisis, and a wave of revolt sweeping over the country. 
the workers seized that factory and set up a dictatorship of the proletariat and a red terror. If the owner resists, they kill him. In any case, they wipe out his interest in his business and do everything possible to destroy his power over it, even to his very name. They run the business by a shop committee, and you have, for that particular factory, a syndicalist or even anarchist form of social reconstruction. Now for factory number two, whose owner is a humane and enlightened man, studying social questions and realizing his responsibility, and the temporary nature of his stewardship. He gives his people the best possible working conditions, he keeps open books and discusses wages and profits with them, he educates the young workers, he meets with their union committees on a basis of free discussion. When the unemployment crisis comes and the wave of revolt sweeps the country, this man and his workers understand one another. He says, I can no longer pay profits, and so I can no longer keep going under the profit system. But if you are ready to run the plant, I am ready to help you the best I can. Manifestly, this man will continue the president of the corporation. And if he trains his sons wisely, they will keep his place. So, instead of having in that factory a dictatorship and a terror, you will have a constitutional monarchy gradually evolving into a democratic republic. End of chapter 65. Chapter 66. Confiscation or Compensation? Shall the workers buy out the capitalists? Can they afford to do it? And what will be the price? The problem of whether the social revolution shall be violent or peaceable depends in great part upon our answer to the question of confiscation versus compensation. We are now going to consider first the abstract rights and wrongs of the question, and second, the practical aspects of it. There is a story very popular among single taxers and other advocates of freedom of the land. An English landowner met a stranger walking on his estate and rebuked him for trespassing. Said the stranger, You own this land? Said the other, I do. And how did you get it? I inherited it from my father. And how did your father get it? He inherited it from his father. So on for half a dozen or more ancestors, until at last the Englishman answered, He fought for it. Whereupon the stranger took off his coat and rolled up his sleeves and said, I'll fight you for it. This is all there is to say on the subject of the abstract rights of land titles. There is no title to land which is valid on a historical basis. Everything rests upon fraud and force continued through endless ages of human history. We in the United States took most of our land from the Indians. And in the process, our guiding rule was that the only good engine was a dead engine. We first helped the English kings to take large sections of our country from the French and Spanish, and then we took them from the English king by a violent revolution. We purchased our southwestern states from Mexico, but not until we had taken the precaution of killing some thousands of Mexicans in war which had the effect of keeping down the purchase price. It would be a simple matter to show that all public franchises are similarly tainted with fraud. Prudhon laid down the principle that property is theft. And from this principle, it is an obvious conclusion that society has the right to scrap all paper titles to wealth and to start the world's industries over again on the basis of share and share alike. But stop and consider for a moment, property is theft, you say. But go to your corner grocery and tell the grocer that you deny his title to the sack of prunes which he exhibits in the front of his counter. He will tell you that he has paid for them. But you answer 
that the prunes were raised on stolen land and shipped to him over a railroad whose franchise was obtained by bribery. Will that convince the grocer? It will not. Neither will it convince the policeman or the judge, nor will it convince the voters of the country. Most people have a deeply rooted conviction that there are rights to property, now definitely established and made valid by law. If you have paid taxes on land for a certain period, the land belongs to you. And I am sure you might agitate from now to kingdom come without persuading the American people that New Mexico ought to be returned to Mexico, or the western prairies to the Indian tribes. Such are the facts. Now, let us apply them to the right of exploitation, embodied in the ownership of a certain number of bonds or shares of stock in the United States Steel Corporation. Pass a law, says the socialist, providing for the taking over of United States Steel by the government. At once to every owner comes one single thought, are you going to buy the stock or are you going to confiscate it? If you attempt confiscation, the courts will declare the law unconstitutional, and you either have to defy the courts, which is revolutionary action, or to amend the Constitution. If you adopt the latter course, you have before you a long period of agitation. You have to carry both houses of Congress by a two-thirds majority, and the legislatures of three-fourths of the states. You have to do this in the face of the most bitter and infuriated opposition of those who are defending what they regard as their rights. You have to meet the arguments of the entire capitalist press of the country, and you have the certainty of widespread bribery of your elected officials. The prospect of doing all this under the forms of law seems extremely discouraging. So come the syndicalists, saying, let us seize the factories and stop the exploitation at the point of production. So come the communists saying, let us overthrow capitalist government and break the net of bourgeois legality and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat, which will put an end to privilege and class domination all at once. What are we to say to these different programs? Suppose we buy out the stockholders of United States Steel, and issue to them government bonds. What have we accomplished? Nothing, say the advocates of confiscation. We have changed the form of exploitation. But the substance of it remains the same. The stockholders get their money from the United States government instead of from United States Steel Corporation. But they get their money just the same. The product not of their labor, but of the labor of the steel workers. Suppose we carried out the same procedure all along the line. Suppose the government took over all industries and paid for their securities with government bonds. Then we should have capitalism administered by a capitalist government instead of by our present masters of industry. We should have a state capitalism instead of a private capitalism. We should have the government buying and selling products and exploiting labor and paying over the profits to an hereditary, privileged class. The capitalist system would go on just the same, except that labor would have one all-powerful tyrant instead of many lesser tyrants, as at present. So argue the advocates of confiscation. And the advocates of purchase reply that in buying the securities of United States Steel, we should fix the purchase price at the present market value of the property, and that price, once fixed, would be permanent. All future unearned increment of the steel industry would belong to the government instead of to private owners. Consider, for example, what happened during the World War. When I was a boy, Soon after the Steel Trust was launched, its stock was down to something like six dollars, and I knew small investors who lost every dollar they had put in. But during the war, 
steel stock soared to a hundred and thirty six dollars per share it paid dividends of some thirty per cent per year and accumulated enormous surpluses besides the same thing was true of practically all the big corporations according to the secretary of the treasury mikado there were coal companies which paid as high as eight hundred per cent per year that is to say the profits in one year were eight times the total investment assuming that our government bonds paid five per cent it appears that the owners of these coal companies got one hundred and sixty times as much under our present private property system as they would have got under a system of state purchase even completely dominated by capitalism as our courts are today they would not dare require us to pay for industries more than six per cent on the market value of the investment and from what i know of the inside graft of american big business that would be restricting the private owners to less than one-fourth of what they are getting at present we have already pointed out the economies that can be made by putting industry under a uniform system but all these important as they are amount to little in comparison with the one great consideration which is that by purchasing large-scale industry we should break the iron ring we should thenceforth be able to do our manufacturing for use instead of for profit and so we should put an end to unemployment our cheerful workers would throng into the factories to produce for themselves instead of for masters and in one year of that we should so change the face of our country that a return to the system of private ownership would be unthinkable in one year we could raise production to such a point that the interest on the bonds we had issued would be like the crumbs left over from a feast end of chapter sixty six chapter sixty seven expropriating the expropriators discusses the dictatorship of the proletariat and its chances for success in the united states i am aware that the suggestion of paying for the industries we socialize will sound tame and uninspiring to a lot of ardent young radicals of my acquaintance they will shake their heads sadly and say that i am getting middle-aged and tired we have seen in russia and hungary and other places so many illustrations of the quick and easy way to expropriate the expropriators that now there is in every country a considerable group of radicals who will hear to no program less picturesque than barricades and councils of action in considering this question i set aside all considerations of abstract right or wrong the justification for violence and the overthrow of capitalist society i put the question on the basis of cash pure and simple it will cost a certain amount of money to buy out the owners and that money will have to be paid as it is paid at present out of the labor of useful workers the workers don't want to pay any more than they have to the question they must consider is which way will they have to pay most the advocates of the dictatorship of the proletariat are lured by the delightful prospect of not having to pay anything and if that were really possible it would undoubtedly be the better way but we have to consider this question is the program of not having to pay anything a reality or is it only a dream suppose it should turn out that we have to pay anyhow and that in the case of violent revolution we pay much more and in addition run serious risk of not getting what we pay for here are enormous industries running at full blast and it is proposed that some morning the workers shall rise up and seize them and turn out the owners and managers and run the industries themselves will anybody maintain that this can be done without stopping production in those factories for a single day certainly production must stop during the time you are fighting for possession 
and the cruel experience of russia proves that it will stop during the further time you are fighting to keep possession and to put down counter-revolutionary conspiracies also alas it will stop during the time you are looking for somebody who knows how to run that industry it will stop during the time you are organizing your new administrative staff you may discover to your consternation that it stops during the time you are arranging to get other industries to give you credit and to ship you raw materials also during the time you are finding the workers in other industries who want your product and are able to pay for it with something that you can use or that you can sell in a badly disorganized market and all the time that you are arranging these things you are going to have the workers at your back not getting any pay or being paid with your paper money which they distrust and growling and grumbling at you because you are not running things as you promised you see the mass of the workers are not going to understand because you haven't made them understand you have brought about the great change by your program of a dictatorship of action by an enlightened minority and now you have the terror that the unenlightened majority may be won back by their capitalist masters and may kick you out of control or even stand you up against the wall and shoot you by a firing squad and all the time you are worrying over these problems who can estimate the total amount the factory might have been producing if it had been running at full blast whatever that difference is remember it is paid by the workers and might that sum not just as well have been used to buy out the owners if we were back in the old days of hand labor and crude unorganized production i admit that the only way to benefit the slaves might be to turn out the masters by force but here we have a social system of infinite complexity a delicate and sensitive machine which no one person in the world and no group of persons understands thoroughly in the running of such a machine a slight blunder may cost a fortune and certainly all the skill all the training all the loyal services of our expert engineers and managers is needed if we are to remodel that machine while keeping it running the amount of wealth which we could save by the achieving of that feat would be sufficient to maintain a class of owners in idleness and luxury for a generation and so i say with all the energy and conviction i possess pay them pay them anything that is necessary in order to avoid civil war and social disorganization pay them so much that they can have no possible cause of complaint that the most hide-bound capitalist-minded judge in the country cannot find a legal flaw in the bargain pay them so that every engineer and efficiency expert and manager and foreman and stenographer and office boy will stay on the job and work double time to put the enterprise through pay them such a price that even judge gary and john d rockefeller will be willing to help us do the job of social readjustment ah yes my radical friends will say that sounds all very beautiful but it's the old utopian dream of brotherhood and class cooperation that will never happen on this earth until you have first abolished capitalism my answer is it could happen tomorrow if we had sufficient intelligence to make it happen that it does not happen is simply absence of intelligence and will anyone maintain that it is the part of an intelligent man to advocate a less intelligent course than he knows what is the use of our intelligence if we abdicate its authority and give ourselves up to programs of action which we know are blind and destructive and wasteful we may see a great vessel going on the rocks we may feel certain that it is going in spite of everything we can do but shall we fail to do what we can to make those in the vessel realize how they might get safely into harbor we have had the russian revolution before us for four years 
mankind will spend the next hundred years in studying it and still have much to learn but the broad outlines of the great experiment are now plain before our eyes russia was a backward country and she tried to fight a modern war and it broke her down she had practically no middle class and her ruling class was rotten and so the revolutionists had their chance and they seized it perhaps it would be more correct to say that they came to the rescue of russia saving her from the hands of those who were trying to force her to fight when she was utterly exhausted and incapable of fighting anyhow here was your dictatorship of the proletariat it turned out all the executive experts or nearly all of them because they were tainted with the capitalist psychology and then straightway it had to call them back and make terms with them because industry could not be run without them and of course these engineers and managers sabotaged the revolution every non-proletarian sabotaged it both inside russia and outside you denounced this and protested against this but all the same it happened it was human nature that it should happen and it is one of the things you have to count on in any and every country where you attempt the social revolution by minority action they have got power in russia and they dream of getting power in america in the same way but there is no such disorganization in our country as there was in russia and it would take a generation of civil strife to bring us to such a condition we have a middle class powerful thoroughly organized and thoroughly conscious moreover this class has ideals of majority rule which are bred in its very bones and while they have never realized these ideals they think they have and they are prepared to fight to the last gasp in that belief all that the leaders of moscow have to do is to bring about an attempt at forcible revolution and they will discover in american society sufficient power of organization and of brutal action to put their movement out of business for a generation a hundred years ago we had chattel slavery firmly fixed as the industrial system of one half of the united states to far-seeing statesmen it was manifest that chattel slavery was a wasteful system and that it could not exist in competition with free labor there was a great american henry clay who came forward with a proposition that the people of the united states through their government should raise the money about a billion dollars and compensate the owners of all slaves and set them free for most of his lifetime henry clay pleaded for this plan but the masters of the south were making money fast they knew how to handle the negro as a slave they could not imagine handling him as a free laborer and they would not hear to the plan on the other side of mason and dixon's line were fanatical men of principle who said the slavery was wrong and that was the end of it there is a stanza by emerson discussing this question of confiscation versus compensation pay ransom to the owner and fill the bag to the brim who is the owner the slave is owner and ever was pay him this you see is magnificent utterance but as economic philosophy it is reckless and unsound the abolitionists of the north took up this poem and the slave power of the south answered with a battle song war to the hilt theirs be the guilt who fetter the freemen to ransom the slave and so the issue had to be fought out it cost a million human lives and five billions of treasure and it set american civilization back a generation and now we confront exactly the same kind of emergency and are coming to exactly the same method of solution we have white wage slaves clamoring for their freedom and we have businessmen making money out of them and exercising power over them and finding it convenient and pleasant they are going to fight it out in a civil war and which side is going to win i am not sure but when the historians come to write about it a couple of generations from now 
let them be able to record that there were a few men in the country who pleaded for a sane and orderly and human solution of the problem, and who continued to voice their convictions even in the midst of the cruel and wasteful strife. End of chapter 67 Chapters 68 and 69 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 68 The Problem of the Land Discusses the land values tax as a means of social readjustment and compares it with other programs. The writer of this book has been watching the social process for twenty years, trying to figure out one thing, how the change from competition to cooperation can be brought about with a minimum of human waste. He has come to realize that the first step is a mental one, to get the people to want the change. That means that the program must be simple, so that the masses can understand it. As a social engineer, you might work out a perfect plan but find yourself helpless because it was hard to explain. As illustration of what I mean, I cite the single tax, a theory which has a considerable hold in America, but which politically has been utterly ineffective. A few years ago, a devoted enthusiast in Southern California, Luke North, started what he called the Great Adventure, to set free the idle land. In the campaign of 1918, I gave my help to this movement, and when it failed, I went back and took stock and revised my conclusions concerning the single tax. Theoretically, the movement has a considerable percentage of right on its side. Land, in the sense that single taxers use it, meaning all the natural sources of wealth, is certainly an important basis of exploitation. And if you were to tax land values to the full extent, you would abolish a large portion of privilege. Just how large would be hard to figure. I was perfectly willing to begin with that portion, so I helped with the great adventure. But a practical test convinced me that it could never persuade a majority of the people. The single tax proposal is to abolish all taxes except the tax on land values. Then come the associations of the bankers and merchants and real estate speculators, crying in outraged horror, What? You propose to let the rich man's stocks and bonds go free? You propose to put no tax on his cash in the vaults and on his wife's jewels? You propose to abolish the income tax and the inheritance tax and put all the costs of the government on the poor man's lot? Now, of course... I know perfectly well that the rich man dodges most of his income tax and most of his inheritance tax. I know that he pays a nominal pittance on his cash in the bank and on his wife's jewels, and likewise on his stocks and bonds. I know that the corporations issuing these stocks and bonds would be far more heavily hit by a tax on the natural resources they own. They could not evade this tax, and they know it and that is why they are moved to such deep concern for the fate of the poor man and his lot. I know that the tax on the poor man's lot would be infinitesimal in comparison with the tax on the great corporation. But how can I explain all this to the poor man? To understand it requires a knowledge of the complexities of our economic system which the voters simply have not got. How much easier to take the bankers and speculators at their word to answer, All right, gentlemen, since you like the income and inheritance taxes, the taxes on stocks and bonds and money and jewels, we will leave these taxes standing. Likewise, we assent to your proposition that the poor man should not pay taxes on his lot. While there are rich men and corporations in our state holding 20 million acres of land out of use for purposes of speculation, we will therefore arrange a land values tax on a graduated basis, after the plan of the income tax, 
we will allow one or two thousand dollars worth of land exempt from all taxation, provided it is used by the owner, and we will put a graduated tax on all individuals and corporations owning a greater quantity of land, so that, in the case of individuals and corporations owning more than ten thousand dollars worth of land, we will take the full rental value, and thus force all idle land into the market. Now, the provision above outlined would have spiked every single argument used by the opposition to the great adventure in California in 1918. It would have made the real intent of the measure so plain as to win automatically the additional votes needed to carry the election. But I tried, for three years, without being able to persuade a single one of the great adventure leaders to recognize this plain fact. The single taxer has his formula, the land values tax and no other tax, and all else is heresy. Actually, the president of a big single tax organization in the East declared that by the advocacy of my idea I had betrayed the single tax. We may take this as an illustration of the difference between dogmatism and science in the strategy of the class struggle. I first suggested my program immediately after the war, with the provision that the land thrown on the market should be purchased by the state, and used to establish cooperative agricultural colonies for the benefit of returned soldiers. But we have preferred to have our returned soldiers stay without work, or to displace the men and women who had been gallantly doing their bit. By this means, we soon had five million men out of work and many other millions bitterly discontented with their wages. Again, I took up the proposition for a graduated land tax, with the suggestion that the money should be used to provide a pension, first for every dependent man or woman over sixty years of age in the country, and second for every child in the country whose parents were unable properly to support it, whether because they were dead or sick or unemployed. You may note that in advocating this program, you would not have to convert anybody to any foreign theories, nor would you have to use any long words. You would not have to say anything against the Constitution, nor to break any law, nor to give occasion for patriotic mobs to tar and feather you. To every poor man in your state you could say, if you own your own house and lot, this bill will lift the taxes from both and therefore it will mean fifty or a hundred dollars a year in your pocket. If you do not own a home, it will take millions of idle acres out of the hands of the speculators and break the price of real estate so that you can have either a lot in the city or a farm in the country with ease. Furthermore, you could say, this measure will have the effect of drawing the unemployed from the cities at once, and so stopping the downward course of wages. At the same time that wages hold firm, the cost of food will go down, because there will be millions more men working on the land. In addition to that, the state will have an enormous income, many millions of dollars a year, taken exclusively from those who are owning and not producing. This money will be expended in saving from suffering and humiliation the old people of the country who have worked hard all their lives and have been thrown on the scrap heap, also in making certain that every child in the country has food enough and care enough to make him into a normal and healthy human being, so that he can do his share of the work in the world and pay his own way through life. I submit the above measure to those who believe that the road to social freedom lies by some sort of land tax. But before you take it up, I invite you to consider whether there may not be some other way even easier. There is a homely old saying to the effect that molasses catches more flies than vinegar. And I am always looking for some way that will get the poor what they want without frightening the rich any more than necessary. I know a certain type of radical whom this question always exasperates. 
he answers that the opposition will be equally strong to any plan the rich will do anything for the poor except to get off their backs and so on in reply i mention that among the most ardent radicals i know are half a dozen millionaires i know one woman who is worth a million who pleads day and night for social revolution while the people who work for her are devoted and respectful wage slaves herbert spencer said that his idea of a tragedy was a generalization killed by a fact i shall not say that the existence of millionaire socialists and parlor bolsheviks kills the theory of the class struggle but i certainly say that it compels us to take thought of the rich as well as of the poor in planning the strategy of our campaign and manifestly if we want to consider the rich the very last device we shall use is that of a tax nobody likes to pay taxes everybody agrees in classifying taxes with death each feels that he is paying more than his share already each knows that the government which collects the tax is incompetent or worse and stop and recall what we have proven about the iron ring the possibilities of production latent in our society realize the bearings of this all-important fact that we can offer to mankind a social revolution which will make everybody richer instead of making some people poorer exactly how to do this is the next thing we have to inquire end of chapter sixty eight chapter sixty nine the control of credit deals with money the part it plays in the restriction of industry and may play in the freeing of industry how is it that the rich are becoming richer the single taxer answers that it is by monopoly of the land the natural sources of wealth the socialist answers that it is by the control of the machinery of production but if you go among the rich and make inquiry you speedily learn that these factors large as they are amount to little in comparison with another factor the control of credit there are hosts of little capitalists and businessmen who deal in land and produce goods with machinery but the men who make the real fortunes and dominate the modern world are those who control credit and whose business it is not the production of anything but speculation and the manipulation of markets money makes the mare go our ancestors used to say and money today determines the destiny of empires what is money we think of it as gold and silver coins and pieces of engraved paper promising to pay gold and silver coins but the report of the u.s comptroller of the currency for 1919 shows that the business of the country was done five per cent by such means and ninety five per cent by checks so for practical purposes we may say that money consists of men's willingness to trust other men or groups or organizations of men when they make written promises to pay in other words money is credit and the control of credit means the control of industry the problem of social readjustment is mainly but the problem of taking the control of credit out of the hands of private individuals and making it a public or social function who controls credit today the bankers and how do they control it we give it to them we the masses of the people who take them our money and leave it with them and very little real money in hand becomes under our banking system the basis of a great amount of imaginary money the federal reserve law requires the bank shall hold in reserve from seven to thirteen per cent of demand deposits which means in substance that when you leave a dollar with the banker the banker is allowed under the law to turn that dollar into anywhere from seven to thirteen dollars and lend those dollars out 
in addition he deposits his reserves with the federal reserve bank and that bank keeps only thirty five per cent in reserve in other words the seven to thirteen imaginary dollars are multiplied again by three under the stress of war this process of credit inflation has been growing like the genie let out of the bottle under the law the federal reserve banks are supposed to hold a gold reserve of forty per cent to secure our currency but in december nineteen nineteen these banks held a trifle over a billion dollars worth of gold while our paper money was over four billion in addition our banks have over thirty three billions of deposits and all these are supposed to be secured by gold in addition there are twenty five billions of government bonds and uncounted billions of private notes bonds and accounts all supposed to be payable in gold so it appears that about one per cent of our outstanding money is real and the rest is imaginary that is it is credit the point for you to get clear is this the great mass of this imaginary money is created by law and we have the power to abolish it or to change the ownership of it at any time we develop the necessary intelligence let us consider the ordinary paper money the one and two and five and ten dollar bills with which we plain people do most of our business these are federal reserve notes and there are about three billions of them how do they come to be why we grant to the national banks by law the right to make this money the government prints it for them and they put it into circulation and what does it cost them they pay one per cent for the use of the money in some cases they pay only one half of one per cent and then they lend it to us the people and what do they charge us the answer is available in a recent report of the u s comptroller of the currency as follows i have the record of the loans made by one texas national bank to a hard-working woman who owned a little farm in a few miles from town she borrowed in the aggregate two thousand three hundred seventy five dollars making about thirty loans during the year listen to the details of the robbery one hundred and sixty two dollars fifty for thirty days at thirty six per cent three hundred and seventy seven dollars for thirty four days at forty four per cent six hundred and twenty dollars and twenty five cents for twenty three days at seventy seven per cent eleven dollars for thirty days at one hundred twenty per cent twenty one dollars fifty cents for thirty days at ninety per cent thirty three dollars for two days at ninety three per cent twenty seven dollars for fifteen days at one hundred ninety five per cent one hundred and ten dollars for thirty days at one hundred twenty per cent that was to buy a horse for her ploughing twenty dollars for forty eight days at one hundred eighty seven per cent six dollars for ten days at seven hundred twenty per cent seven dollars for three days at two thousand per cent and so on every cent paid off by what sweat and struggle only god knows in oklahoma where the legal rate of interest is six per cent with ten per cent as the maximum under special contract harassed farmers paid all the way from twelve to two thousand four hundred per cent with forty per cent as the average in the case of one bank the comptroller proved that not a single solitary loan had been made under fifteen per cent he cited one particular case that he asked to be regarded as typical in the spring the farmer went to the bank and arranged for a loan of two hundred dollars out of his necessity he was compelled to pay fifty five per cent interest charge unable to meet the note at maturity he had to agree to one hundred per cent interest in order to get the renewal the next renewal forced him to pay up to one hundred twenty five per cent for four years the thing went on and all the drudgery of the father and the mother and the six children could never keep down the terrible interest 
or wipe out the principal. As a finish, the bank swooped down and sold him out. The wretched man, barefoot and hungry, went to work clearing a swamp, caught pneumonia, and died. The county buried him, and neighbors raised a purse to send the widow and children back to friends in Arkansas. This is the thing called the money trust in action, and this is the power we have to take out of private control. It is our first job, and all other jobs are in comparison hardly worth mentioning. How are we going to do it? The farmers of North Dakota have shown one way. They took the control of their state government into their own hands, and the most important and significant thing they did was to start a public bank. The interests fought them tooth and nail, not merely the interests of North Dakota, not merely of the Northwest, but of the entire United States. They fought them in the law courts up to the United States Supreme Court, which decided in favor of the people of North Dakota. Therefore, make note of this vital fact, the most important single fact in the strategy of the class struggle Every state can, under the Constitution, have a public bank. Every city and town can have one, and no court can ever forbid it. Therefore, I say to all socialists, labor men, and social reformers of every shade and variety, nail at the top of your program of action the demand for a public bank in your community, to take the control of credit out of the hands of speculators and use it for the welfare of the people. Make it your first provision that every dollar of public money shall be deposited in this bank, and every detail of public financing handled by this bank. Make it your second provision that the purpose of this bank shall be to put all private banks out of business, and to take over their powers for the people. At present, you understand, it is taken for granted that the first purpose of the government is to foster the private credit system. Take, for example, the Postal Savings Bank. The private banks fought this for a generation, and finally they allowed us to have it, on condition that it should be turned into a device for collecting money for them. Our postal bank turns over all its money to the private banks at the grotesque rate of two percent interest and recently i read of the director of the postal bank appearing before a convention of bankers asking for some small favor and humbly explaining that it was not his idea to make the postal bank a rival of the private savings banks why should he not do so let us nail it to our radical program that the postal savings bank is to fight for business just as do the private banks and lend its funds direct to the people on good security. Let our federal banking system also become the servant of the public welfare, and let its energy be devoted to breaking the stranglehold of predatory finance on our industry. Let the government issue all the money, and use it for the transfer of industry from private into public hands. Do we want to socialize our railroads, our coal mines, our telegraphs and telephones? Do we want to buy them in order to avoid the waste of civil war and insurrection? We have agreed that we do, and here we have the way of doing it. If the bankers can create out of our willingness to trust them billions upon billions of imaginary money, then so can we. The people of the United States create money out of our willingness to trust ourselves. And do not let anybody fool you for a single second by talking about fiat money and inflation of currency. If you are paying twice as much for everything as you did before the war, you are paying it because the bankers have doubled the amount of money in circulation. For that reason and that alone. That double money the bankers own. The only question now to be decided is, who is to own the double money that will be created tomorrow? Make note of the fact that it costs nothing to start a public bank. If you want to put the steel trust out of business by competition, 
you have several hundred thousand dollars worth of rolling mills and ore land to buy but the banks can be put out of business by nothing but a law the material parts of a bank the white marble columns and bronze railings and mahogany trimmings are as nothing compared with the inner soul of a bank its control of the life-blood of your business and mine and this we can have for the taking we can keep our own credit instead of sending it to wall street where the speculators use it to bleed us white we could set it to building up our own community under the direction of officials whom we select also we can have our gigantic national bank controlling all our thirty three billions of dollars of deposits and likewise the hundreds of billions of credit built upon them the first time you suggest this plan to a banker or businessman you will be told that increase of money by the government does not benefit labor or the general consumer inflation of currency causes prices to go up correspondingly to this i will furnish an effective reply that at the same time the government issues new money the government will also fix prices and then watch the face of your banker or businessman if he is a man who can really think and is not just repeating like a parrot the formulas he has learned from others he will perceive that the combination of currency inflation and price fixing would catch him as the two parts of a nutcracker catch a nut and he will know that you can take the meat out of him any time you please he may argue that it is not fair but point out to him that it is exactly what the big banks and trusts have been doing to us right along increasing the amount of money in circulation and at the same time raising the prices we pay for goods and so taking out the meat from us nuts we have agreed that we do not mean to be unfair either to the banker or the manufacturer we are simply going to stop their being unfair to us we are going to convince them that their power to catch us in a nutcracker is forever at an end we allow them six per cent on their investments and guarantee them this by turning over to them some of our new money that is government bonds when we have thoroughly convinced them that they can't get any more they will take these bonds and quit and thus simply without violence or destruction of property we shall slide from our present system of commercial cannibalism into the new cooperative commonwealth we have had cheap money campaigns in the united states many times and as this book is written it becomes evident that we are to have another henry ford is advocating the idea and so is thomas a edison the present writer would like to make plain that in supporting such a program he does it for one purpose and one only the taking over of the industries by the community the creation of state credit for that purpose is the next step in the progress of human society whereas the creation of state credit for the continuance of the profit system is a piece of futility amounting to imbecility this distinction is fundamental and is the test by which to judge the usefulness of any new program and the intelligence of those who advocate it End of chapter 69chapters 70 71 and 72 of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 70 the control of industry discusses various programs for the change from industrial autocracy to industrial democracy the program of the railway workers for the democratic management of their industry is embodied in the plum plan you may learn about it by addressing the weekly paper of the railway brotherhoods which is called labor and is published in washington dc 
it appears that our transportation industry can be at once socialized because of a clause in the constitution which gives the national government power over roads and communications through decades of mismanagement under the system of private greed the railroads have been brought to such a financial condition that they will be forced into nationalization whenever we stop them from dipping their fingers into the public treasury under the plum plan the government is to purchase the roads from their present owners paying with government bonds the management is to be under the control of a board consisting in part of representatives of the government and in part of the workers this being a combination of the methods of socialism and syndicalism the same program can be applied constitutionally to telegraphs and telephones to interstate trolley systems express companies oil pipelines and all other means of interstate communication and distribution the plum plan also deals with coal and steel and other great industries this could not be nationalized without a constitutional amendment but it appears that in the majority of the constitutions of the states are provisions that all corporate charters are held subject to the power of the legislature to amend modify or revoke the same that gives us a right to take over these corporations through state action the only preliminary is to elect state administrations which will represent us instead of representing the corporations also most state constitutions contain the provision that no corporation shall issue its stocks or bonds except for money labor or property actually received the word labor gives the opening wedge for the plum plan the state can purchase these industries giving bonds in exchange and can issue to the workers labor stock which stock will carry part control of the industry also the railroad brotherhoods have started their own bank in cleveland ohio and it is proving an enormous success make note of this point every large labor union can have its own bank to finance its industries and its propaganda stop and consider how preposterous it is that the five million organized workers of the united states should deposit their hundreds of millions of savings in capitalist banks to be used to finance private undertakings which crush unions and hold labor in bondage let every big labor union have its own building its own banking and insurance business its own vacation camp in the country its own school for the training of its future leaders also let every labor council in every big city start a labor daily to tell the workers the truth and point the way to freedom let every farmer's organization follow suit and let these groups get together to exchange their products upon a cooperative basis already the railway men are arranging with the farmers to buy the farm products and distribute them cooperatively they are getting together with the clothing workers to have the latter make clothing for them and with the shoe workers to make shoes this is the cooperative movement which has become the largest single industry in great britain and is the backbone of industrial democracy and sound radicalism it is spreading rapidly in america now it is taking the money of the people out of the control of the profit system and diverting it into channels of public service it is training men to believe in brotherhood instead of in greed it is giving them business experience so that when the time comes the taking over of our industrial machine will not have to be done by amateurs but by men who know what cooperation is and how to make a success of it this work will go on more rapidly yet when the workers have united politically and brought into power a government which will assist them instead of assisting the bankers a most interesting program for the development of working-class financial credit is known as the douglas plan which is advocated by a london weekly the new age 
and is explained in two books called Economic Democracy and Credit Power and Democracy by Douglas and Orage. This program is in brief that the furnishing of credit shall become a function of organized labor based upon the fact that the true and ultimate basis of all credit is the power of hand and brain labor to produce wealth. The labor unions, or guilds, shall pay the management of industry and pay capital for the use of the industrial plant, and shall finance production and new industrial development out of their credit power, their ability to promise production, and to keep their promises. This Douglas plan seeks to break the money trust by the method of syndicalism. Another method of breaking it, through state regulation of bank loans, you will find most completely set forth in an extremely able book, The Stranglehold, by H. C. Cutting, an American businessman whom you may address at San Lorenzo, California. Another method, utilizing the third factor in industry, the consumer, is the method of banking by consumers' unions. Such are the Raffeisen banks, widely known in Germany, and a specimen of which exists in the single tax colony at Arden, Delaware. Those who wish to know about the cooperative bank or other forms of cooperation may apply to the Cooperative League of America, 2 West 13th Street, New York, whose president is Dr. James P. Warbasa. Information concerning public ownership may be had from the Public Ownership League, 127 North Dearborn Street, Chicago. Also from the Socialist Party, 220 South Ashland Boulevard, Chicago, and from the Bureau of Social Research of the Rand School of Social Science, New York. Also, I ought to mention the very interesting plan for social reconstruction set forth by Mr. King C. Gillette, inventor of the safety razor. This plan you may find in your public library in two encyclopedic volumes, Gillette's Social Redemption and Gillette's World Solution. The politician seeks to solve the industrial problem by means of the state, and the labor leader seeks to solve it by the unions. It is to be expected that Mr. Gillette, a capitalist, should seek to solve it by means of the corporation. He points out that the modern trust is the greatest instrument of production yet invented by man, and he asks why the people should not form their own trust to handle their own affairs and to purchase and take over the industries from their present private masters. It is interesting to note that Mr. Gillette's solution is fully as radical and thoroughgoing as those of the state socialists or the syndicalists. The People's Corporation, which he projects and plans some day to launch upon the world, would be a gigantic consumer's union, whose credit power would speedily dominate and absorb all other powers in modern society. It would make us all stockholders, and give us our share of the benefits of social productivity. End of chapter 70 Chapter 71 The New World Describes the Cooperative Commonwealth beginning with its money aspects, the standard wage, and its variations. It has been indicated that the new society will be different in different countries and in different parts of the same country, in different industries, and at different times. No one can predict exactly what it will be, and anyone who tries to predict is unscientific. But every man can work out his own ideas about the most economical and sensible arrangements for a cooperative society, and in these final chapters I set forth my ideas. One of the first things people ask is, will there be money in the new society, or how will labor be rewarded and goods paid for? I answer that there will be money, and the business methods of the new society will be so nearly the same as at present 
that in this respect you would hardly realize there had been any change. The only difference will be that in the new society you will be paid several times as much for your labor, or, if you prefer to put it the other way, you will be able to buy several times as much with your money. Why should we waste our time working out systems of credit cards, when we already have a system in the form of gold and silver coins and paper currency? Why should we bother with labor checks, when we have a banking and clearinghouse system, understood by everyone but the illiterate? The only difference we shall make is that nobody can get gold and silver coins or paper currency except by performing labor to pay for them. Nobody can have money in the bank and draw checks against it until he has rendered to society an equivalent amount of service. When you have earned your money in the new world, you'll spend it wherever you please and for whatever you please, the only difference being that the price you pay will be the exact labor cost of producing that article, with no deduction for any form of exploitation. As I wrote 16 years ago in the Industrial Republic, you will be able to get, if you insist upon it, a seven-legged spider made of diamonds. And the only question society will ask is, have you performed services equivalent to the material and labor necessary to the creating of that unusual article of commerce? Of course, society won't put you in that complicated formula. It will simply ask, have you got the price? Which, you observe, is exactly the question society asks you at present. The next thing that everybody wants to know is, shall we all be paid the same wages? I answer, yes and no, because there will be three systems of payment. There will be a basic wage, which everybody will get for every kind of useful service necessary to production. This will be, as it were, the foundation of our economic structure. On top of this will be built a system of special payments for special services, which are of an intellectual nature and cannot be standardized and dealt with wholesale. In addition, there will be, for a time, a third arrangement applying to agricultural work, which is in a different stage of development, and to which different conditions apply. Let us take first our standard wage. The census of our utopian commonwealth reveals that we have 10 million able-bodied workers engaged in mining, manufacturing, and transportation. This including, of course, office work and management, everything that enters into these industries. By scientific management, the best machinery, and the elimination of all possible waste, we find that they produce $80 million worth of goods an hour. A portion of this we have to set aside to pay for the raw materials which they do not produce, and for the upkeep of the plant, and for margin of error, what our great corporations call a surplus. We find that we have $50 million per hour left, and that means that we can pay for labor $5 per hour, or $20 for the regular four-hour day. This is our standard wage, received by all able-bodied workers. But quickly, we find that our industries are not properly balanced. A great many men want to work at the jobs which are clean and pleasant, such as delivering mail. And very few want to work at washing dishes in restaurants and cleaning the sewers. There is no way we can adjust this except by paying a higher wage or by reducing the number of hours in the working day, which is the same thing. The only other method would be to have the state assign men to their work, and that would be bureaucracy and slavery, the essence of everything we wish to get away from in our cooperative commonwealth. What we shall have, so far as concerns our basic industries, is a government department registering with mathematical accuracy the condition of supply and demand in all the industries of the country. 
our demand for shoes is increasing. For some reason or other, a thousand more shoe workers are needed. Therefore, the price of labor in the shoe industry is increased five cents per day, or whatever amount will draw that number of workers from other occupations. On the other hand, there are too many people applying for the job of driving trucks. Therefore, we reduce slightly the compensation for this work. There are more men who want jobs in Southern California than in Alaska. Therefore, the payment for the same grade of work in Alaska has to be higher. All this is not merely speculation. It is not a matter of anybody's choice. It is an automatic, self-adjusting system, subject to precise calculations. The only change from our present system is from guesswork to exact measurement. At present, we do not know how many shoes our country will require next season. Neither do we know how many shoes are going to be made. Neither do we know how many people can make shoes, nor how many would like to learn, nor how many would like to quit that job and take to farming. It would be the simplest matter in the world to find out these things, far simpler than it was to register all our possible soldiers and examine them physically and mentally and train them and feed them and ship them overseas to can the Kaiser. Of course, we drafted the men for this war job, but in the new world, nobody is drafted for anything. It is any man's privilege to starve if he feels like it. It is his privilege to go out into the mountains and live on nuts and berries if he can find them. Nobody makes him go anywhere or makes him work at anything, unless, of course, he is a convicted criminal. To the free citizen, all that society has to say is, if he buys any products, he must pay for those products with his own labor, and not with some other man's labor. Of course, he may steal or cheat, as under capitalism. Our new world has laws against stealing and cheating, and does its best to enforce them. The difference between the capitalist world and our world is merely that we make it impossible for any man to get money legally without working. Under these conditions, the average man wishes to work, and the only question remaining is, how shall he work? If he wants to work by himself, and in his own way, nobody objects to it. He is able to buy anything he pleases, whether raw materials or finished products. If he wants to buy leather and make shoes after his own pattern, no one stops him, and if he can find anyone to buy these shoes, he can earn his living in that way. He is able to get land for as long a time as he wants it, by paying to the state the full rental value of that land. And if he wants to farm the land, he can do so, and sell his products. As a matter of theory, he is perfectly free to hire others to farm the land for him, or with him. There is no law to prevent it, Neither is there any law to prevent his renting a factory and buying machinery and hiring labor to make the shoes. But, as a matter of practical fact, it is impossible for him to do this because the community is in the business of making shoes, and on an enormous scale, with great factories run democratically by the workers, and there is very small chance of any private businessman being able to draw the workers away from these factories. The community factories have all the latest machinery, they apply the latest methods of scientific management, and they turn out standard shoes at such a rate that private competition is unthinkable. Of course, there may be some special kind of shoes involving an intellectual element in which there can be private competition. This kind of manufacture is covered in our second method of payment. But before we discuss it, let us settle the problem of our most important basic industry, which is agriculture. End of chapter 71. Chapter 72 agricultural production, discusses the land in the new world and how we foster cooperative farming and cooperative homes. 
farming the land is a very ancient industry and while its tools have been improved its social forms have been the same for a long time the worker on the land is conservative and the russian bolsheviks who tried to rush their peasants into communism found that they had only succeeded in stopping the production of food we make no such blunder in our new society we have found a way to abolish speculation in land and exploitation based on land ownership while leaving the farmer free to run his business in the old way if he wants to in our new society we take the full rental value of all land which is not occupied and used by the state the farmer and the city dweller alike own their land in the sense that they have the use of it for as long as they please but they pay to the state the rental value of the land minus the improvements so they cannot speculate in the land or rent it out to others they can only use it and they only pay for what they actually use they may put improvements on the land with full assurance of having the use and benefit thereof and they may sell the improvements and the new owner enters into possession with no obligation but to pay the rental value of the unimproved land to the state the farmer goes on raising his products and if he wants to drive to town to deliver them to his customers he may do so but he finds it cheaper to market them through the great labor cooperatives and state markets as there is no longer any private interest involved in these activities no one has any interest in cheating him and he gets the full value of the products less the cost of marketing if the farmer wishes to continue all his life in his old style individualistic method of working the land he is free to do so but here is what he sees going on within a few miles of his place the state has bought a square mile of land and has taken down the fences and established an agricultural cooperative for purposes of experiment and demonstration the farm is run under the direction of experts the soils are treated with exactly the right fertilizers for each crop the best paying crops are raised the best seed is used and the best machinery the workers of this new agricultural cooperative receive the standard wage and they live in homes specially built for them with all the conveniences made possible by wholesale production also these cooperators live in a democratic community they determine their own conditions of labor being represented on the governing board along with the experts appointed by the state the farmer watches this experiment at first with suspicion but he finds that his sons have less suspicion than he has and his sons keep pointing out to them that their little farm is not making the standard wage or anything like it and moreover the standard wage is constantly increasing whereas the price of farm products is dropping and here is the state ready to direct new cooperative ventures inviting a score of farmers in the community to combine and buy out the unwilling ones and establish a new cooperative sooner or later the old farmer gives way or he dies and his sons belong to the new world so ultimately we have our national agricultural system in which all the requirements of our people are studied and all the possibilities of our soil and climate and the job of raising the exact quantities of food that we need both for our own use and for expert is worked out as one problem we know how much lumber we need and we raise it on all our hillsides and mountain slopes and so protect ourselves from floods and the denuding of our continent we know where best to raise our wheat and where best to raise our potatoes and our cabbages and we do not do this by crude hand labor nor by the labor of women and children from daybreak till dark we have special machines that plant each crop and other machines that reap it or dig it out of the ground and prepare it for market a few days ago i read a discussion in the chamber of commerce of calcutta 
someone called attention to the wastes involved in the current method of handling rubber one consignment of rubber had been sold more than three hundred separate times and the cost of these transactions amounted to three times the value of the rubber this is only one illustration and i might quote a thousand if you doubt my figures as to the possibility of production in the new society remind yourself that a large percentage of the things you use have been bought and sold many scores of times before you get them consider the cabbage for which you pay six or eight cents a pound in the grocery store and for which the farmer gets say half a cent a pound in this new world the state has an enormous income derived from its tax on land values it no longer has to send around men once a year to ask you how many diamond rings your wife has and to tax you on your honesty if you have any it no longer has to make its money by such lying devices as a tariff therefore its moral being is no longer poisoned by a tariff lobby it taxes every citizen for the right to use that which nature created and leaves free from taxation that which the citizens own labor created this kind of taxation is honest and fair to all because no one can evade it the state uses the proceeds of this land tax in the public services the libraries and research laboratories and information bureaus in free insurance against fire and flood and tempest and in a pension to every member of society above the working age of fifty-five or below the working age of eighteen of course the state might leave it to every man to save up for his old age but not all men are this wise and the state cannot afford to let the unwise ones starve it is more convenient for the state to figure out that all men or nearly all are going to be old and to hold back some of their money while they are young and strong in the certainty that when they are old they will appreciate this service also the state takes care of the sick and incapacitated and the mentally or physically defective but we do not leave these latter loose in the world to reproduce their defects we have in our new world some sense of responsibility to the future and there is nothing to which we devote more effort than making certain that nothing unsound or abnormal is allowed entrance into life the problem of the care of children is a complicated one and our new society is in process of solving it we look back on the old world in which the having of children was heavily taxed in the form of an obligation to care for these children until they were old enough to work then the parents were allowed to exploit the labor of the children so that among the very poor the raising of children was a business speculation like the raising of slaves or poultry but in our new world we consider the interest of the child and of the society in which that child is to be a citizen we decide that this society must have citizens and that the raising of the future citizens is a work just exactly as necessary and useful as a raising of a crop of cabbages therefore we pay a pension to all mothers while they are raising and caring for children at the same time we assert the right to see that this money is wisely spent and that the child is really cared for if it is neglected we are quick to take it away from its parents and put it in one of our twenty-four hour a day schools we realize that the home is an ancient industry even more ancient than agriculture and we do not try to socialize it all at once but just as we demonstrate to farmers that the individual farm does not pay so we demonstrate to mothers the wastefulness of the single laundry the single kitchen the single nursery we establish community laundries community kitchens community nurseries and invite our women to help in these activities and to learn there under expert guidance the advantages of domestic cooperation we convince them by showing better results in the health and happiness of the children 
and in the time and strength of the mothers. So, little by little, we widen the field of cooperative endeavor and increase the total product of human labor and the total enjoyment of human life. End of chapter 72 Chapter 73 and 74 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 73 Intellectual Production discusses scientific, artistic, and religious activities as a superstructure built upon the foundation of the standard wage. Karl Kautsky, intellectual leader of the German social democracy, gives in his book, The Social Revolution, a useful formula as to the organization of the future society. This formula is communism in material production, anarchism in intellectual production. It will repay us to study this statement and see exactly what it means. Material production depends directly upon things, and as there is only a limited quantity of things in the world, if any one person has more than his share, he deprives some other person to that extent. So there have to be strict laws concerning the distribution of material products. But with intellectual things, exactly the opposite is the case. There is no limit in quantity and any one person can have all he wants without interfering with anybody else. Everybody in the world can perform a play by Shakespeare or a play a sonata by Beethoven, and everybody can enjoy it as much as he pleases without keeping other people from enjoying it all they please. Also, material production can be standardized. We can have great factories to turn out millions of boxes of matches, each match like every other match, and the more like they are, the better. But in intellectual affairs, we want everyone to be different, or at least we want everyone to be free to be different. And if someone can become much better than the others, this is the most important kind of production in the world. For he may make over our whole intellectual and moral life. For the production of material things, our new society has great factories owned in common and run by majority vote of the workers, and we place the products of that factory at the disposal of all members of society upon equal terms. That is our communism in material production. On the other hand, in our intellectual production, we leave everybody free to live his own life and to associate himself with others of like aims, and we place as few restrictions as possible upon these activities. This is the method of free association, or anarchism in intellectual production. Our problem would be simple if material and intellectual production never had to mingle, but as it happens, Every kind of intellectual production requires a certain amount of material, and every kind of material production involves an intellectual element. Therefore, our two methods have to be combined, and we have a complex problem which we have to solve in a variety of different ways, and upon which we must experiment with open minds and scientific temper. First, let us take the intellectual elements involved in the production of purely material things, such as matches and shoes and soap. Let us take invention. Naturally, we do not want to go on making matches and shoes and soap in the same old way forever. On the contrary, we want to stimulate all the workers in these industries to use their wits and improve the processes in every possible way. The whole of society has an interest in this, and the soap workers have an especial interest. Our soap industry has an invention department, with a group of experts appointed by the executive committee of the National Council of Soap Workers. All soap workers are taxed, say, five cents a day, 
for the support of this activity. Likewise, the state contributes a generous sum out of its income toward the work of soap research. In addition to this, the soap industry offers prizes and scholarships for suggestions as to the improvement of every detail of the work, and at meetings of every local of soap workers, somebody makes new suggestions as to methods of stimulating their intellectual life, not merely as regards soap, but as regards citizenship and art and literature and human life in general. Our soap workers, you must understand, are no longer wage slaves, brutalized by toil and poverty. They are free citizens of a free society. Our soap workers local in every city has its own theater and concert hall and lecture bureau and publishes its own magazine. Every industry has its immediate intellectual problems its trade journals in which these are discussed, and its research boards in which they are worked out. The ambitions of the young workers in that industry are concentrated upon getting into this intellectual part of their trade. Examinations are held, and tests are made to discover the most competent men, and written suggestions are considered by boards of control. It is, of course, of great importance to every worker that the channels of promotion should be kept open, and that the man who really has inventive talent shall get not merely distinction and promotion, but financial reward, so that he may have time and materials to continue his experiments. This research department, you perceive, is a part of superstructure, built upon the foundation of our standard wage. And this same simile applies to numerous other forms of intellectual production. For example, our community paper mills turn out paper, and our community printers are prepared to turn out millions of books. How shall we determine what is to be the intellectual content of these material books? There are many different methods. First, there is the method of individualism. A man has something to say and he writes a book. He works in the soap factory and saves a part of his standard wage, and when he has money enough, he orders the community printers to print his book and the community booksellers to handle it for him and the community post office to deliver it for him. Again, a group of men organize themselves into an association or club or scientific society and publish books. The Authors League takes up the work of publishing the writings of its members, and the Poetry Society does the same. This is the method of anarchism, or free association. But there is no reason why we should not have alongside it the method of socialism. There is no reason why we should not have state publishing houses, just as we have state universities and state libraries. The state should certainly publish standard works of all sorts, Bibles and dictionaries and directories and cheap editions of the classics. In this new world, our school boards are not chosen by businessmen for the purpose of graft. They are chosen by the people to educate our children. So it seems to us perfectly natural that the National Education Association should conduct a publication department and order the printing of the school books which the children use. In the same way, anyone is free to write a play, or to put on a play, and invite people to come and see it. But, like the individual farmers and the individual mothers of families, the play producer in our society is in competition with great community enterprises, which set a high standard and make competition difficult. The same thing applies to the opera, and to concerts, and to all the arts and sciences. You can start a private hospital if you wish, but you will be in competition with public institutions. And you can only succeed if you are a man of genius, that is, if you have something to teach, too new and startling for the public boards of control to recognize. You try your new method, and it works and that becomes a criticism of the public boards of control, 
and before long the people by their votes turn out the old board of control and put you in that is politics you say but we in our new world do not use the word politics as one of contempt we really believe that public sentiment is in the long run the best authority and the appeal to public sentiment is at once a social privilege and a social service what we strive to do is to clear the channels of appeal and avoid favoritism and stagnation to that end we maintain in every art and every science and every department of human thought endless numbers of centers of free independent cooperative activity so that every man who has an inspiration or a new idea can find some group to support him or can form a new group of his own this is our anarchism in intellectual production and it is the method under which in capitalist society men organize all their clubs and societies and churches devout members of the roman catholic church will be startled to be told that theirs is an anarchist organization but nevertheless such is the case the catholic church owns a great deal of property and speculates in real estate and to that extent it is a capitalist institution it holds a great many people by fear and to that extent it is a feudal institution but in so far as members of the church believe in it and love it and contribute of their free will to its support they are organizing by the method which all anarchists recommend and desire to apply to the whole of society anarchist clubs and christian churches are both free associations for the advocacy of certain ideas the only difference being in the ideas they advocate in our new world such organizations have been multiplied many fold and form a vast superstructure of intellectual activity built upon the foundation of the standard wage in this new world all the people are free they are free not merely from oppression but from the fear of oppression they have leisure and plenty and they take part naturally and simply in the intellectual life the old of course have not got over the dullness which a lifetime of drudgery impressed upon them but the young are growing up in a world without classes and in which it seems natural that everyone should be educated and everyone should have ideas they earn their standard wage and devote their spare time to some form of intellectual or artistic endeavor and spend their spare money in paying writers and artists and musicians and actors to stimulate and entertain them these latter are the ways of distinction in our new society these are the paths to power the only rich men in our world are the men who produce intellectual goods the great artists orators musicians actors and writers who are free to serve or not to serve as they see fit and can therefore hold up the public for any price they care to charge just now there is eager discussion going on in our world as to whether it is proper for an opera singer or a moving picture star or a novelist to make a million dollars our newspapers are full of discussions of the question whether anyone can make a million dollars honestly and whether men of genius should exploit their public some point out that our most eminent opera singer spends his millions in endowing a conservatory of art but others maintain that it would be better if he lowered his prices of admission and let the public use its money in its own way the extremists are busy founding what they call the ten cent society whose members agree to boycott all singers and actors who charge more than ten cents admission and all moving picture stars who receive more than a hundred thousand dollars a year for their service these ten centers do not object to paying the money but they object to the commercializing of art and declare especially 
that the moral effects of riches is such that no rich person should ever under any circumstances be allowed to influence the youth of the nation in this some of the greatest writers join them and renounce their copyrights and agree to accept a laureateship from some union of workers who pay them a generous stipend for the joy and honor of being associated with their names the greatest poet of our time began life as a newsboy and so the national news vendors society has adopted him and taken his name and pays him ten thousand dollars a year for the privilege of publishing his works End of chapter 73 Chapter 74 Mankind Remade Discusses human nature and its weaknesses and what happens to these in the new world. We have briefly sketched the economic arrangements of the cooperative commonwealth. Let us now consider what are the effects of these arrangements upon the principal social diseases of capitalism. The first and most dreadful of capitalism's diseases is war, and the economic changes here outlined have placed war, along with piracy and slavery, among the half-forgotten nightmares of history. We have broken the iron ring, and are no longer dependent upon foreign concessions and foreign markets for the preservation of our social system and the aggrandizement of a ruling class. We can stay quietly at home and do our own work, and as we produce nearly everything we need, we no longer have to threaten our neighbors. Our neighbors know this, and therefore they do not arm against us, and we have no pretext to arm against them. We take toward all other civilized nations the attitude which we have taken toward Canada for the past hundred years. We have a small and a highly trained army, a few regiments of which are located at strategic points over the country. This army we regard and use as we do our fire department. When there is widespread damage by fire or flood or storm or earthquake, we rush the army to the spot to attend to the work of rescue and rebuilding. Also, we have a small navy in international service. For, of course, we are no longer an independent and self-centered nation. We have come to realize that we are part of the world community and have taken our place as one state in the International Socialist Federation. We send our delegates to the World Parliament, and we place our resources at the disposal of the world government. However, it now takes but a small army and navy to preserve order in the world. We govern the backward nations, but the economic arrangements of the world are such that we are no longer driven to exploit and oppress them. We send them teachers instead of soldiers. And, as there are really very few people in the world who fight for the love of fighting, we have little difficulty in preserving peace. We pay the backward peoples a fair price for their products, which we need. Our world government takes no money out of these countries, but spends it for the benefit of those who live in the countries to teach them and train their young generations for self-government. Next, what are the effects of our new arrangements upon political corruption and graft? The social revolution has broken the prestige of wealth. Money will buy things, but it no longer buys power, the right to rule other men. It no longer buys men's admiration. Everybody now has money, and nobody is any longer afraid of starvation. It is no longer the fashion to save money, any more than it is the fashion to carry revolvers in drawing rooms or to wear chain mail in place of underclothing so our political life is cleansed of the money influence. People now get power by persuading their fellows, not by buying them or threatening them. The world is no longer full of men ravenous for jobs and ready to sell their soul for a position. So it is no longer possible to build up a machine based on desire for office. 
the changes have resulted in an enormous intensification of our political activities we have endless meetings and debates we have so many propaganda societies that we cannot keep track of them and some of these societies like the catholic church have a large membership and large sums of money at their disposal but a few experiments at carrying elections by a campaign chest have convinced everybody that to have the facts on your side is the only permanent way to political power our new society is jealous of attempts to establish any sort of ruling class and the surest way to discredit yourself is to advocate any form of barrier against freedom of discussion or the right of the people's will to prevail next what is the status of crime we have too recently escaped from capitalism to have been able to civilize entirely our slum population and we still have occasional crimes of violence especially crimes of passion but we have almost entirely eliminated those classes of crimes which had to do with property and we have discovered that this was ninety five per cent of all crime we have eliminated them by the simple device of making them no longer profitable anybody can go into our community factories and under clean and attractive working conditions and without any loss of prestige or social position can earn the means of satisfying his reasonable wants by three hours of work a day almost everybody finds this easier than stealing or cheating but more important yet as a factor in abolishing crime is the abolition of class domination and the prestige of wealth we no longer have in our community a ruling class which lives without working and which offers to the weak-minded and viciously inclined the perpetual example of luxury we no longer set much store on jewels and fine raiment we do not make costly things except for public purposes where all may enjoy them and nobody stores great quantities of money because everyone has a guarantee of security from the state so we are gradually putting our policemen and jailers and judges and lawyers to constructive work next what about disease the diseases of poverty are entirely done away with we are now able to apply the knowledge of science to the whole community and so we no longer have to do with tuberculosis and typhoid or with rickets and anemia in children or with heavy infant mortality we have sterilized our unfit the degenerates and the defectives and so do not have to reckon with millions of children from these wretched stocks we now give to the question of public health that prominence which in the old days we used to give to war and the suppression of crime and social protest our public health officers now replace our generals and admirals and we really obey their orders next as to prostitution just as in the case of crime we are still too close to capitalism not to have among us the victims of social depravity both men and women we still have a great deal of vice which springs from untrained animal impulse and we have some cultivated and highly sophisticated pornography but we have entirely done away with the commercial vice and we have done it by cutting the root which nourished it women in our communities are really free and by that we do not mean the empty political freedom which existed in the days of wage slavery we mean that women are permanently delivered from economic inferiority by the recognition on the part of the state of the money value of their special kind of work the bearing and training of children this kind of work not merely receives the standard wage it also receives the best surgical and nursing treatment free housework and homemaking are legally recognized services and the woman before marriage and after her children have been nursed is free to go into the community factories and earn for herself the standard wage with no loss of social position consequently no woman sells her sex and no man buys it 
this does not mean of course that we have solved the sex problem in our new society there are two great social problems with which we have to deal the first of these being the sex problem and the second the race problem our scientists are occupied with eugenics and we are finding out how to guide our young people in marriage so that our race may be built up and the ravages of capitalism remedies as quickly as possible also we are trying to find out the laws of happiness and health in love we are founding societies for the purpose of protecting love and as hinted in the book of love we have a determined social structure between two groups of women the mother women and the mistress women those who take love gravely as a means of improving the race and those who take it as a decoration a form of play our men are embarrassed by having to choose between these groups and occupy themselves with trying to keep the struggle from turning into civil war second the race problem our economic changes have of course done away with some of the bitterest phases of this strife white working men in the north no longer mob and murder negro working men for taking their jobs and in the south our land values tax prevents the landlord from exploiting either white or negro labor but our white race is still irresistibly bent upon preserving its integrity of blood and the more far-seeing among the negroes have come to realize that there can never be any real happiness for them in a society where they are denied the higher social privileges there is a movement for the development of a genuine negro republic in africa and for mass emigration also there is a proposition soon to be settled at an election for the dividing of the united states into three districts upon racial lines first there are to be in the far south three or four states which are inhabited and governed solely by negroes and to which white men may come only as temporary visitors a large group of states in the north which are white states and to which negroes may come only as visitors and finally a middle group of states in which both whites and blacks are allowed to live as at present but with the proviso that no one may live there who takes part in any form of racial strife or agitation this program gives to race conscious negroes their own land their own civilization their own chance of self-realization it gives to race-conscious white men the same opportunity and it leaves to those who are not troubled by the problem a country where black and white may dwell in quite good fellowship finally what has been the effect of our economic changes upon the purely personal vices which gave us so much trouble and unhappiness in the old days what for example has been the effect upon vanity you should see our new crop of children in our high schools there are no longer any social classes among them the rich ones do not arrive in private automobiles to make the poor ones envious and they do not isolate themselves in little snobbish cliques they arrive in community automobiles and all wear uniforms one of the simple devices by which we repress the impulse of the young toward display of personal egotism they are all full of health and happy play and their heads are busily occupied with interesting ideas our girls are trained to thinking instead of to personal adornment they are developing their minds instead of catching a rich husband by sexual charms so we have been able in a single generation of training to make a real and appreciable difference in the amount of vanity and self-consciousness to be found among our young people and the same thing applies to a score of other undesirable qualities which under the system of competitive commercialism were overstimulated in human beings in those old days everyone was seeking his own survival and certain qualities which had survival value became the principal characteristics of our race those qualities were greed and persistence in acquisitiveness cunning and subtlety also bragging and self-assertiveness 
in that old world people destroyed their fellows in order to make their own safety and power they wasted goods in order to be esteemed to preserve what they called their social position but now we have cut the roots of all these vile weeds we have so adjusted the business relationships of men that we do not have to have hysterical religious revivals in order to keep the human factors alive in their hearts we have established it as a money fact which everyone quickly realizes that it pays better to cooperate there is more profit and less bother in being of service to others so we have prepared a soil in which virtues grow instead of vices and we find that people become decent and kindly and helpful without exhortation and with no more moral effort than the average man can comfortably make of course we have still personal vices to combat and new virtues to discover and to propagate but this has to do with the future whereas we are here confining ourselves to those things which have been demonstrated in our new society end of chapter 74 end of the book of life by upton sinclair